The Neruda Interviews 1 through 5. Sarah's notes on Dr. Neruda written May 27, 1998 What follows are some of my notes taken while in earnest discussions with Drive. Neruda from the ACIO Advanced Contact Intelligence Organization during the last two weeks of December 1997, before he disappeared at least off my radar. Screen Dr. Neruda is about 6 feet tall, perhaps 170 pounds, has relatively long black hair, and by all appearances, seems of Peruvian descent or at least from somewhere in South America though I never asked what specific city or village he grew up in. I would guess he was about 50 years old with just a few tinges of gray hair. He called me out of the blue one day in mid-December 1997. His opening line to me was something like, my name is Dr. Neruda, and I have secret information about the future of humankind that proves the existence of time travel. Technology. Being a journalist by profession, it got my attention, though the whole time I spent on the phone with him my skeptical nature was in high gear. I always assume stories of a fantastical nature are false in reality, though the perceiver can think them to be true. And so that's how I operated with Drive. Neruda. I felt him to be genuine and sincere, but probably misguided or in error. However, he was convincing enough to secure a meeting with me, and so we met. A few days later at a coffee shop near my home. He didn't fit my stereotypical view of a scientist. He was much more sophisticated and even elegant in his demeanor, and looked as much like an executive of a Fortune 100 company as anything else. His charisma and articulate manner immediately impressed me. And I sensed that he was not a man of mental instability prone to wild claims. He told me that he had no recollection of his mother, and that his father brought him to the ACIO at an early age. A high-ranking member of the ACIO had taken him under his wing, so a considerable portion of his life was involved in one way or another with the ACIO. His father raised him as a single parent. He had been told that his mother had died from breast cancer shortly after his birth when he was only about two years old. He had attended the best private schools, and additionally had been provided with special tutors, which he later learned were from the ACIO. At the age of 14 he came under the formal tutelage of his future colleagues from the ACIO. By the time he was 17 he had left school and decided to pursue an internship at the ACIO, though he said that at the time, it was simply called the NSA Special Projects Laboratory and was an unacknowledged deprint of the NSA. His internship lasted for two years and he never pursued a formal degree at a page 6 university, though he claimed to have knowledge about physics and the life sciences that is far in advance of the curriculums at the best universities. He stated that he believed himself to have possessed average intelligence until he began his training and internship at the ACIO. He said that they had technologies that stimulated certain aspects of the central nervous system and brain that increased raw intelligence by as much as 500 percent. In addition, he claimed that there was a genetic implant technology that increased the ability to memorize and retain information to the point where the entire scientific core of the ACIO had perfect photographic memory. This enabled them to build their group intelligence beyond the genius of any one individual. These technologies he claimed were of extraterrestrial origin derived from a friendly source that had been visiting Earth for thousands of years, but had arrangements with the ACIO dating from 1959 that were secret even from our government and its intelligence agencies. The alien race, which he called the Cordium, had infiltrated the ACIO in 1958. And though he wasn't specific about how this occurred, he did say that the Cordium are still working with the ACIO to seed technologies on Earth that are superior to our native technologies. The technologies to accelerate and enhance intelligence were the first technologies to be transferred and these were to enable the ACIO scientists to assimilate and utilize subsequent technologies that the Cordium brought to the ACIO. In exchange for these technologies, the Cordium were provided safe haven within the ACIO intelligence structure. 
In other words, the Cordium were permitted access to all of the information. Systems of the ACIO, which are considerable according to Dr. Neruda. They were also able to use the facilities of the ACIO including their laboratories, considerable land holdings, and scientific brain power. This unfettered access to ACIO intelligence provided the Cordium leaders with insight into the structure of world government, where the power centers were, who the real leaders were, and how critical decisions were made for the world's people. According to Dr. Neruda, the Cordium are benevolent and had no ulterior motives to take over the earth and rule in dictatorship. In fact, they were much more interested in establishing diplomatic ties to the various world governments through the United Nations at the appropriate time, which was considered to be shortly after the year 2011. The existence of the Cordium was kept from the NSA, and even most ACIO personnel were unaware of their existence though I don't know how this was accomplished. Within the ACIO, there are 14 distinct levels of security clearance. Those who are at level 12 and above are aware of the Cordium technology transfer program TTP, and they, according to Dr. Neruda, are about 120 inches number, and are primarily in India, Belgium, and the United States. There are only seven who have level 14 clearance, and they are the directors of intelligence, security, research, special projects, operations, information, systems, and communications. These directors report to the executive director, who is known simply as page 7. 15, which is the unique classification that is reserved for the head of the ACIO. 15, in the eyes of Dr. Neruda, is the most powerful human on the planet, and what I think he meant by powerful is that 15 is able to deploy technologies that are well in advance to any that our world's governments have access to. However, Dr. Neruda portrayed 15 and his seven directors as a benevolent force, not a hostile or controlling force. The eight people who comprise this inner sanctum of the ACIO are in possession of radical technologies that have been part of the Cordium TTP. However, there were also other extraterrestrial technologies that had been derived from recoveries of spacecraft or other alien artifacts, including various discoveries contained in ancient texts that have never been revealed before. All of this information and technology has been collected and developed within the ACIO Scientific Corps all of whom possess clearances of level 12 or higher. This scientific corps is called the Labyrinth Group, and consists of both men and women who have utilized the Cordium Intelligence Accelerator technologies to their advantage, and have created a secret organization within the ACIO. When Dr. Neruda was explaining this to me, it got so complicated that I asked him if he could draw me a visual diagram of how all of these organizations worked. The Labyrinth Group consists of all the personnel within the ACIO that qualify for levels 12, 13, and 14 clearances. 15 is the leader of this most secret organization. It was split from the ACIO to enable secrecy from the NSA and lower ranking members of the ACIO, which would facilitate the Labyrinth Group's agenda to create its own applications of the Cordium TTP. The Labyrinth Group is in possession of the pure technologies derived from the Cordium TTP. It takes these technologies and dilutes them to the point where the ACIO or Special Projects Laboratory will sell them to private industry and government agencies, which includes the military. The secret organization is the most powerful organization on earth in drive. Neruda's opinion, but they do not choose to exercise their power in a way that makes them visible. Thus, their power is only discernible to their members. For about 40 years they have accumulated considerable wealth apart from the NSA's oversight. They have managed to build their own security technologies that prevent detection from intelligence agencies like the CIA or MI5. They are, for all practical purpose, in total control of their agenda. Perhaps this is what makes them a unique organization. Dr. Neruda had a clearance of level 12 and was still kept from vital information that only the director level was aware. And it was assumed that even 15 kept vital information from his directors, 
though this was never a certainty. The symbol used by the labyrinth group is four concentric circles, each circle representing a clearance level 12, 13, 14, and 15. And each circle had a unique insight into the agenda of the labyrinth group, and its coordination with the cordium. 15 was an enigma to everyone within the labyrinth group. He had been a page 8 physicist before he became the executive director of the ACIO. He was a renegade because he never interacted with the protocols in the political environment of academia. He operated outside of the institutions and was selected to be part of the ACIO because of his combination of brain power, independence, and relative obscurity within scientific circles. He was one of the first to make contact with the Cordium and establish communication with them. The Cordium essentially appointed 15 as their liaison to the ACIO, and 15 became the first to utilize the intelligence accelerator technologies that the Cordium initially offered. These technologies not only enhance cognitive abilities, memory, and higher order thinking skills, but also enhance the consciousness of the individual so that they can utilize the newly gained intelligence in a non-invasive manner. Meaning, they don't exploit their intelligence for personal gain at the expense of others. This apparent increase in both 15's IQ and ethical consciousness caused him to create the Labyrinth Group in order to retain the pure state technologies of the Cordium TTP from the NSA. What technologies are released to the NSA are diluted forms of the pure state technology which are significantly less potent in their military and surveillance applications. What I expected to hear from Dr. Naruto was a secret organization of intelligent, evil elitist individuals intent on exploitation and control. Why else would they want to hide beneath the cloak of such incredible secrecy? The answer, according to Dr. Naruto, was surprising. The Labyrinth Group View themselves as the only group with sufficient intellect and technology to develop a specific form of time travel technology. They are essentially focused on this agenda because they desire to prevent future hostilities that they believe will occur unless this technology is developed. The Cordium is assisting, but despite their considerable intellects, they have been unable to develop this technology. What I am about to tell you will seem impossible to believe, but again, I'm only reporting what my notes say based on my initial conversations with Dr. Naruda. He explained to me that there are as many as 12 different extraterrestrial races currently involved in the past, present, and future of Earth and its destiny. The ACIO, because of its mission with the NSA, is the most knowledgeable group about the various agendas of these 12 alien races. Apparently there is an extraterrestrial race that may have hostile intent in the technological potential to disrupt the human social order and overtake it, as well, as Earth itself. This concern is what motivated 15 to assign the labyrinth, groups intellect and collective energy to create the ultimate defense weapon, which they refer to as blank slate technology BST or a form of time travel. I don't pretend to understand all of what Dr. Naruto described regarding BST. My Notes are a bit vague because he was talking so far over my head I didn't even know what to write in many instances. When the ancient Arrow project came under the control of the ACIO, it was like all projects carefully scrutinized to determine if there were any technologies that Page 9 could help in the overall agenda of developing BST. When it was determined that the ancient Arrow project was in fact a time capsule from a future aspect of Humanity, the Labyrinth Group seized the project from the ACIO and essentially began a misinformation campaign back to the NSA. Dr. Naruto was one of two scientists that held a level 12 clearance and was asked to lead in the translation of the Wing Maker's language and decode their various communication symbols. In this process, he became aware of how to decode their language and began to understand what they were trying to communicate. He became convinced that the wing makers were time travelers and possessed a form of BST. He also became convinced that there were six additional time capsules stored in various places around the globe, and that they held the technologies or insights that would enable the development of BST. 
The reason he defected was that somehow in the process of translating the wingmaker's language, he became a sympathizer of their philosophy. He felt that the wingmakers were communicating with him and had selected him as their liaison. And when he acknowledged this to his superiors, he was felt to be a risk to the project's secrecy. Apparently, wing personnel, regardless of clearance or rank become known as security risks, they are given a memory therapy that essentially removes problematic experiences from their mind. Dr. Neruda felt certain that he was going to receive this therapy imminently, and could not fathom the results of losing his memories of the wing maker's experience. Thus, he defected from the ACIO in the Labyrinth Group, the first to ever do so. When he had contacted me, he had defected only the day before. He told me that I would have to wait for him to contact me again to set up a rendezvous time and place. Three days later he called and we met that same afternoon. I wasn't prepared to believe him, but I thought it was a provocative story and was worth spending an hour or two investigating. Anyway, what he proceeded to tell me in that first meeting is largely contained in this journal entry. He showed me photographs and documents from the ancient Aero project that appeared authentic to my eyes. He also showed me some of the technologies that were in development by the ACIO concerning holographic fractal objects or HFOs as he called them. These were incredible to observe and equally impossible to explain and I must admit that my first impression after seeing HFOs in action was that any organization that could develop this technology was operating at a level well outside of the mainstream. It felt alien to me. It was then I became at least a partial believer. I called my employer and told them that I needed to take some personal leave. I took one week off and spent a significant portion of it with Dr. Neruda, asking a thousand questions, which, for the most part, he had ready answers to. Gradually I became a reluctant believer. With a healthy streak of skepticism, at the end of the week he asked me to take some of his materials and publish them. There were times that I honestly felt he was an extraterrestrial, and even now I'm not certain that he isn't. This from a person who six short months ago would page 10 have disputed ETs and any other bump in the night phenomena. He was convinced that the ACIO would not allow him to defect with his memory intact. He was fearful of their remote viewing technology and was certain that they would try to track him down. He wanted me to have possession of the materials only if I volunteered to do so and was willing to publish them. And through all of this, he wasn't absolutely certain that the Labyrinth Group and their ET friends, the Cordium, were intending anything bad. He just didn't want his memory tampered with. I think he was mostly interested in exposing the Wing Maker's time capsule and its philosophy and communication symbols. He never seemed that interested in exposing the ACIO and its secret organization the Labyrinth Group. He told me about this entity only to impress upon me that he was part of an organization that had unusual powers and technologies, and to the extent they wanted to keep things under wrap, they would use their considerable powers to do so, which was why he had picked me at random to help him in getting this story out. Dr. Neruda was the most sincere individual I have ever met. Someone I would love to count among my friends. I was so impressed with his manners communication skills, and intellect. At one time, I asked him what his IQ was. And with all humility intact, he simply answered that there is no way to test it. And that the Labyrinth Group's members are not interested in IQ so much as what he called fluid intelligence, or the speed with which alternative, creative, solutions to a problem can be generated. He claimed this was the most important form of intelligence, and without it, one would not be able to time travel. In other words, he was convinced that time travel was not an independent technology, but was integral to the traveler. The time traveler must have a certain degree of fluid intelligence in order to withstand the stress inherent in time travel, and the best way to handle the stress was by having a high level of fluid intelligence. 
The thing I found so fascinating about Dr. Neruda was his descriptions of how information about ETs, new physics, cosmology, prophecies, and the galactic hierarchy were hidden from the public, government, and even intelligence organizations. He told me that only one man had ever really tried to write about the NSA's special project laboratory and that was back in 1950, and according to my notes it was written by Wilbur Smith, who I believe was a journalist from Canada. Everything else that has been written is done so on the basis of pure speculation. Dr. Neruda said that when this paper was circulated it was the genesis of the ACIO in order to build another layer of what he called an acknowledged deference. He said that an acknowledged deference are rare in intelligence agencies but those that do exist often telescope into greater levels of secrecy in order to remain hidden from public and private scrutiny. He also inferred that there were corporate members of the military-industrial complex that were involved in these unacknowledged deprints. He claimed that the ACIO or its sister organization, the Special Projects Laboratory, would sell diluted page 11 technologies to private corporations and laboratories, which in turn would be commercialized for the military, and in some instances, even consumer use. Dr. Neruda permitted me to tape record five formal interviews with him. These are probably the best way to understand his perspective and the story that he has to tell. Even now as I'm writing this letter, I find myself doubting much of what he told me, while at the same time I can't imagine why he'd go to all this trouble. If it were just a game or charade of some kind, it just doesn't make any sense in that context. So I'm stuck somewhere in the middle of belief and disbelief. I can only tell you that if only a small percentage of a story is accurate, then citizens and their politicians need to wake up according to Dr. Neruda, even our highest ranking government officials and military intelligence officers lack access to the information that he was privy to. But if these unacknowledged secret deprints exist, and private contractors working on behalf of the military are involved with these secret organizations. Some organization should be investigating this, and they should have powers to grant witness protection, immunity, and a variety of other inducements to get these secrets out to the public or, at the very least, our government officials. I have approximately 60 pages of notes from my initial discussions with Drive. Naruta and then five transcripts from the five interviews I conducted. I'd encourage anyone who's serious about understanding these issues to read the interview transcripts. There probably are best records of what's going on behind closed doors relative to the ET phenomena, secret organizations, and time travel. Page 12 The first interview of Dr. Jamison Naruta The first interview of Dr. Jamison Naruta by Sarah What follows is a session I recorded of Dr. Naruta on December 27, 1997. He gave permission for me to record his answers to my questions. This was the first of five interviews that I was able to tape record before he left or disappeared. I have preserved these transcripts precisely as they occurred. No editing was performed, and I've tried my best to include the exact words and grammar used by Dr. Neruda. Sarah, are you comfortable? Dr. Neruda, yes, yes, I'm fine and ready to begin when you are. Sarah, you've made some remarkable claims with respect to the Ancient Arrow project. Can you please recount what your involvement in this project was and why you chose to leave it of your own free will? Dr. Neruda I was selected to lead the decoding and translation of the symbol. Pictures found at the site. I have a known expertise in languages and ancient texts. I am able to speak over 30 different languages fluently and another 12 or so languages that are officially extinct. Because of my skills in linguistics and my abilities to decode symbol pictures like petroglyphs or hieroglyphs, I was chosen for this task. I had been involved in the Ancient Arrow project from its very inception, when the ACIO took over the project from the NSA. I was initially involved in the site discovery and its restoration along with a team of seven other scientists from the ACIO. We restored each of the 23 chambers of the Wingmaker's time 
capsule and cataloged all of their attendant artifacts. As the restoration was completed, I became increasingly focused on decoding their peculiar language in designing the translation indexes to English. It was a particularly vexing process because an optical disc was found in the 23rd chamber, which was initially impregnable to our technologies. We assumed that the optical disc held most of the information that the wing makers desired us to know about them. However, we couldn't figure out how to apply the symbol pictures found in their chamber paintings to unlock the disc. I decided to leave the project after I was successful in deducing the access code for the optical disc, and felt that the ACIO was going to prevent the public from accessing page 13. The information contained within the ancient arrow site. There were other reasons, but it's too complicated to explain in a concise response. Sarah what did 15 do when he found out you were leaving? Dr. Naruto you never had a chance to respond directly to me because I left. Without a word. But I'm certain that he's angry and feels betrayed. Sarah tell me about 15. What's he like? Dr. Naruto 15 is a genius of unparalleled intelligence and knowledge. He's the leader of the Labyrinth Group and has been since its inception in 1963. He was only 22 years old when he joined the ACIO in 1956. I think he was discovered early enough before he had a chance to establish a reputation in academic circles. He was a renegade genius who wanted to build computers that would be powerful enough to time travel. Can you imagine how a goal like that in the mid-1950s must have sounded to his professors? Needless to say, he was not taken seriously, and was essentially told to get in line with academic protocols and perform serious research. Fifteen came to the ACIO through an alliance it had with Bell Labs. Somehow Bell Labs heard about his genius and hired him, but he quickly outpaced their research agenda and wanted to apply his vision of time travel. Sarah why was he so interested in time travel? Dr. Naruto no one is absolutely sure. And his reasons may have changed over time. The accepted purpose was to develop blank slate technology or BST BST is a form of time travel that enables the rewrite of history at what are called intervention points. Intervention points are the causal energy centers that create a major event like the breakup of the Soviet Union or the NASA space program. BST is the most advanced technology and clearly anyone who is in possession of BST can defend themselves against any aggressor. It is, as 15 was fond of saying, the freedom key. Remember that the ACIO was the primary interface with extraterrestrial technologies and how to adapt them into mainstream society, as well as military applications. We were exposed to ETs and knew of their agenda. Some of these ETs scared the hell out of the ACIO. Sarah Why? Dr. Naruto there were agreements between our government specifically the NSA to cooperate with an ET species commonly called the Greys in exchange for their cooperation to stay hidden and conduct their biological experiments under the cloak of secrecy. There was also a bungled technology transfer program, but that's page 14. Another story, however, not all the greys were operating within a unified agenda. There were certain groups of greys that looked upon humans in much the same way as we look upon laboratory animals. They're abducting humans and animals, and have been for the past 48 years. They're essentially conducting biological experiments to determine how their genetics can be made to be compatible with human and animal genetic structure. Their interests are not entirely understood, but if you accept their stated agenda, it's to perpetuate their species. Their species is nearing extinction and they're fearful that their biological system lacks the emotional development to harness their technological prowess in a responsible manner. 15 was approached by the Greys in his role at the ACIO, and they desired to provide a full-scale technology transfer program, but 15 turned them down. He had already established a TTP with the Cordium, and felt that the Greys were too fractured organizationally to make good on their promises. Furthermore, the Cordium technology was superior in most regards to the Greys. 
with the possible exception of the Gray's memory implant in their genetic hybridization technologies. However, 15 and the entire Labyrinth group carefully considered an alliance with the Greys if for no other reason than to have direct communication with regard to their stated agenda. 15 like to be in the know. So eventually, we did establish an alliance, which consisted of a modest information exchange between us. We provided them with access to our information systems relative to genetic populations and their unique predisposition across a variety of criteria, including mental, emotional, and physical behaviors. And they provided us with their genetic findings. The greys, and most extraterrestrials for that matter, communicate with humans exclusively through a form of telepathy, which we called suggestive telepathy. Because to us it seemed that the greys communicated in a such a way that they we're trying to lead a conversation to a particular end. In other words, they always had an agenda, and we were never certain if we were upon of their agenda or we arrived at conclusions that were indeed our own. I think that's why 15 didn't trust the Greys. He felt they used communication to manipulate outcomes to their own best interest in favor of shared interests. And because of this lack of trust, 15 refused to form any Alliance or TTP that was comprehensive or integral to our operations at either the ACIO or the Labyrinth Group. Sarah did the Greys know of the existence of the Labyrinth Group? Dr. Neruda I don't believe so. They were generally convinced that humans were not clever enough to cloak their agendas. Our analysis was that the Greys had invasive technologies that gave them a false sense of security as to their enemies' weaknesses. Page 15 and I'm not saying that we were enemies, but we never trusted them. And this. They undoubtedly knew. They also knew that the ACIO had technologies and. Intellects that were superior to the mainstream human population, and they had a. Modicum of respect perhaps even fear of our abilities. However, we never showed them any of our pure state technologies or engaged. Them in deep dialogues concerning cosmology or new physics. They were clearly interested in our information databases and this was their primary agenda with respect to the ACIO. 15 was the primary interface with the Greys because they sensed a comparable intellect in him. The Greys looked at 15 as the equivalent of our planet's CEO. Sarah how did 15 become the leader of both the ACIO and the Labyrinth group? Dr. Neruda he was the director of research in 1958 when the Cordium first became known to the ACIO. In this position, he was the logical choice to assess their technology and determine its value to the ACIO. The Cordium instantly took a liking to him, and one of 15's first decisions was to utilize the Cordium Intelligence Accelerator technologies on himself after about three months of experimentation most of which was not in his briefing reports to the then current executive director of the ACIO. 15 became infused with a massive vision of how to create BST. The executive director was frightened by the intensity of 15's BST agenda and felt that it would divert too much of the ACIO's resources to a technology development program that was dubious. 15 was enough of a renegade that he enlisted the help of the Cordium to establish the Labyrinth Group. The Cordium were equally interested in BST for similar reasons as 15. Freedom Key, as it was sometimes called, was established as the prime agenda of the Labyrinth Group, and the Cordium and 15 were its initial members. Over the next several years, 15 selected the cream of the crop from the scientific core of the ACIO to undergo a similar intelligence accelerator program, as he had, with the intention of developing a group of scientists that could in cooperation with the Cordium successfully invent BST. The ACIO, in the opinion of 15, was too controlled by the NSA and he felt the NSA was too immature in its leadership to responsibly deploy the technologies that he knew would be developed as an outgrowth of the Labyrinth Group. So 15 essentially plotted to take over the ACIO and was assisted by his new recruits to do so. This happened a few years before I became affiliated with the ACIO as a student and intern. 
My stepfather was very sympathetic to 15's agenda and was helpful in placing 15 as the executive director of the ACIO. There was a period of instability when this transition occurred, but after about a year, 15 was firmly in control of the agendas of both the ACIO and the Labyrinth Group. Page 16. What I said earlier. That he was viewed as the CEO of the planet. That's essentially who he is. And of the ETs who are interacting with humankind, only the Cordium understand the role of 15. He has a vision that is unique in that. It is a blueprint for the creation of BST, and is closing in on the right technological and human elements that will make this possible. Sarah what makes BST such an imperative to 15 in the labyrinth? Group? Dr. Neruda the ACIO has access to many ancient texts that contain prophecies of the earth. These have been accumulated over the past several hundred years through our network of secret organizations of which we are a part. These ancient texts are not known in academic institutions, the media, or mainstream society. They are quite powerful in their depictions of the 21st century. 15 was made aware of these texts early on when he became director of research for the ACIO, and this knowledge only fueled his desire to develop BST. Sarah, what were these prophecies and who made them? Dr. Neruda, the prophecies were made by a variety of people who are, for the most part, unknown or anonymous, so if I told you their names you would have no recognition. You see, time travel can be accomplished by the soul from an observational level. That is to say, that certain individuals can move in the realm of what we call vertical time and see future events with great clarity, but they are powerless to change them. There are also those individuals who have, in our opinion, come into contact with the wing makers and are provided messages about the future which they had recorded in symbol pictures or extinct languages like Sumerian, Mayan, and Chukobson. The messages or prophecies that they made had several consistent strands or themes that were to occur in the early part of the 21st century, around the year 2011. Chief among these was the infiltration of the major governments of the world, including the United Nations, by an alien race. This alien race was a predator race with extremely sophisticated technologies that enabled them to integrate with the human species. That is to say, they could pose as humanoids. But they were truly a blend of human and android in other words, they were synthetics. This alien race was prophesied to establish a world government and rule as its executive power. It was to be the ultimate challenge to humankind's collective intelligence and survival. These texts are kept from the public because they are too fear-provoking and would likely result in apocalyptic reprisals and mass paranoia. Sarah are you saying what I think you're saying? That anonymous prophets from God know where and when have seen a vision of our future takeover by a race of robots? I mean you do realize how how unbelievable that sounds. Page 17. Dr. Neruda yes. I know it sounds unbelievable, but there are diluted versions of this very same prophecy in our religious texts, it's just that the alien race is portrayed as the Antichrist, as if the alien race was personified in the form of Lucifer. This form of the prophecy was acceptable to the gatekeepers of these texts, and so they allowed a form of the prophecy to be distributed, but the notion of an alien race was eliminated. Sarah Why? And who exactly is it who's censoring what we can read and can't? Are you suggesting there's a secret editorial committee that previews books before their distribution? Dr. Neruda this is a very complicated subject and I could spend a whole day just acquainting you with the general structure of this control of information. Most of the world's major libraries have collections of information that are not available to the general public. Only scholars are authorized to review these materials, and usually only on site. In the same way, there are manuscripts that were controversial and posited theories that were sharply different than the accepted belief systems of their day. These manuscripts or writings were banished by a variety of sources, including the Vatican, universities, 
governments, and various institutions. These writings are sought out by secret organizations that have a mission to collect and retain this information. These organizations are very powerful and well-funded, and they can purchase these original manuscripts for a relatively small amount of money. Most of the writings are believed to be hocus-pocus. Anyway, so libraries are often very willing to part with them for an endowment or modest contribution. Also, most of these are original writings having never been published, being that they originated from a time before the printing press. There is a network of secret organizations that are loosely connected through the financial markets and their interests in worldly affairs. They are generally centers of power for the monetary systems within their respective countries, and are elitists of the first order. The ACIO is affiliated with this network only because it is rightly construed that the ACIO has the best technology in the world, and this technology can be deployed for financial gain through market manipulation. As for an editorial committee, no, this secret network of organizations doesn't review books before publication. Its holdings are exclusively in ancient manuscripts and religious texts. They have a very strong interest in prophecy because they believe in the concept of vertical time and they have a vested interest in knowing the macro-environmental changes that can affect the economy. You see for most of them, the only game on this planet that is worth playing is the acquisition of ever-increasing wealth and power through an orchestrated manipulation of the key variables that drive the economic engines of our world. Sarah, so if they're so smart about the future, and they believe these prophecies, what are they doing to help protect us from these alien invaders? Page 18. Dr. Naruta, they help fund the ACIO. This collective of organizations has enormous wealth, more than most governments can comprehend. The ACIO provides them with the technology to manipulate money markets and rake in hundreds of billions of dollars every year. I don't even know the scope of their collective wealth. The ACIO also receives funding from the sale of its diluted technologies to these organizations for the sake of their own security and protection. We've devised the world's finest security systems, which are both undetectable and impregnable to outside forces like the CIA and the former KGB. The reason they fund the ACIO is that they believe 15 is the most brilliant man alive and they're aware of his general agenda to develop BST. They see this technology as the ultimate safeguard against the prophecy and their ability to retain relative control of the world and national economies. They also know 15's strategic position with alien technologies and hope that between his genius and the alien technologies that the ACIO is assimilating, that BST is possible to develop before the prophecy occurs. Sarah but why the sudden interest in the wing maker's time capsule? How does it play a role in all of this BST stuff? Dr. Naruta initially, we didn't know what the connection was between the ancient arrow project and the BST imperative. You have to understand that the time capsule was a collection of 23 chambers literally carved inside of a canyon wall in the middle of nowhere about 80 miles northeast of Truco Canyon in New Mexico. It is, without a doubt, the most amazing archaeological find of all time. If scientists were allowed to examine this site, with all of its artifacts intact, they would be in awe of this incredible find. Our preliminary assumptions were that this site was a time capsule of sorts left behind by an extraterrestrial race who had visited Earth in the 8th century. But we couldn't understand why the art was so clearly representative of Earth if it were a time capsule. The only logical conclusion was that it represented a future version of humanity. But we weren't certain of this until we figured out how to access the optical disk and translate the first set of documents from the disk. Once we had a clear understanding of how the wing makers wanted to be understood, we began to test their claims by analyzing their chamber paintings, poetry, music, philosophy, and artifacts. This analysis made us fairly certain that they were authentic, which meant that they were not only time travelers, but that 
they were also in possession of a form of BST. Sarah why did you assume they had BST? Dr. Naruto we believed it took them a minimum of two months to create their time capsule. This would have required them to open and hold open a window of time and page 19. Physically operate within the selected time frame. This is a fundamental requirement of BST. Additionally, it is necessary to be able to select the intervention points with precision both in terms of time and space. We believed they had this capability, and they had proven it with their time capsule. Furthermore, the technological artifacts they had left behind were evidence of a technology that was so far in advance to our own that we couldn't even understand them. None of the extraterrestrial races we were aware of had technologies so advanced that we could not probe them, assimilate them, and reverse engineer them. The technologies left behind in the ancient Aero site were totally enigmatic and impervious to our probes. We considered them so advanced that they were quite literally indiscernible and unusable which, though it may sound odd is a clear sign of an extremely advanced technology. Sarah so you decided that the wing makers were in possession of BST, but how did you think you were going to acquire their knowledge? Dr. Naruto we didn't know, and to this day, the answer to that question is elusive. The ACIO placed its best resources on this project for more than two intensive months. I posited the theory that the time capsule was an encoded communication device. I began to theorize that when one went through the effort to interact with the various symbol pictures and immerse themselves in the time capsule's art and philosophy, it affected the central nervous system in a way that it improved fluid intelligence. It was, in my opinion, the principal goal of the time capsule to boost fluid intelligent so that BST was not only able to be developed, but also utilized. Sarah you lost me. What is the relationship between BST and fluid? Intelligence? Dr. Naruto BST is a specific form of time travel. Science fiction treats time. Travel is something that is relatively easy to design and develop, and relatively one-dimensional. Time travel is anything but one-dimensional. As advanced in technology as the Cordium and Grays are, they have yet to produce the equivalent of BST. They are able to time travel in its elemental form, but they can interact with the time that they travel to. That is to say, they can go back in time, but once there, they cannot alter the events of that time because they are in a passive, observational mode. The Labyrinth Group has conducted seven time travel experiments over the past 30 years. One clear outcome from these tests is that the person performing the time travel is an integral variable to the technology used to time travel. In other words, the person and the technology need to be precisely matched. The labyrinth group, for all it knows, already possesses BST, but lacks the time traveler equivalent of an astronaut who can appropriately finesse the technology in real time and make the split-second adjustments that BST requires. Page 20 The first interview of Dr. Jamis and Naruta The Labyrinth Group has never seriously considered the human element of BST and how it is integral to the technology itself. There were some of us who were involved in the translation indexes of the wing makers who began to feel that that was the nature of the time capsule to enhance fluid intelligence and activate new sensory inputs that were critical to the BST experience. Sarah but I still don't understand what it was that led you to that conclusion. Dr. Naruto when we had translated the first 30 pages of text from the optical disc, we learned some interesting things about the wing makers and their philosophy. Namely, that they claimed that the three-dimensional five sensory domain that humans have adjusted to is the reason we are only using a fractional portion of our intelligence. They claimed that the time capsule would be the Bridge from the three-dimensional five-sensory domain to the multidimensional seven-sensory domain. In my opinion, they were saying that in order to apply BST, the traveler needed to operate from the multidimensional seven-sensory domain. Otherwise, BST was the proverbial camel through the eye of the needle or in other words, impossible. Sarah this at least seems plausible to me, 
Why was it so hard to believe for the ACIO? Dr. Neruda this initiative was really conducted by the Labyrinth Group and not the ACIO, so I'm making that distinction just to be accurate, and not to be critical of your question. For 15, it was hard to believe that a time capsule could activate or construct a bridge that would lead someone to become a traveler. This seemed like an extraordinarily remote possibility. He felt that the time capsule may hold the technology to enable BST, but he didn't believe it was merely an educational or developmental experience. Also, and more importantly, the true identity of the wing makers became clear as we deployed our RV technologies. Sarah first, what are RV technologies? Dr. Neruda think of it as psychic spying. The ACIO has a deprint that specializes in remote viewing technology, and within this deprint was a woman of unparalleled capability as an RV. She was assigned to the project as its RV, and she was a critical element in determining the identity and purpose of the wing makers. Sarah can we come back to the RV technology? Just tell me what she discovered as to the identity of the wing makers. Page 21. Dr. Neruda she was very attuned to the first artifact we recovered, which turned out to be a homing device that essentially led us to the ancient aero site. We conducted two official RV sessions one that I monitored and another that 15 monitored. She was able to make contact with the original planners of the ancient aero site. Through these two RV sessions we were able to determine that the identity of the wing makers was an ancient the most ancient race of humankind. Sarah when you say most ancient, what do you mean? Dr. Neruda we know of them mostly through a few ancient manuscripts that were reputedly channeled by these beings. There are a few myths in Mayan and Sumerian texts that refer to these beings as well. But the most definitive text comes from the Cordium who defined them, in our terms, as the central race. Sarah how can they be so ancient if they're so technologically advanced? Dr. Neruda the central race resides in the most primeval galaxies nearest the centermost part of the universe. According to Cordium cosmology, the structure of the universe is segmented into seven super-universes that each revolve around a central universe. The central universe is the material home of first source or the creator. According to the Cordium, in order to govern the material universe, first source must inhabit materiality and function in the material universe. The central universe is the material home of first source and is eternal. It's surrounded by dark gravity bodies that make it essentially invisible even to those galaxies that lie closest to its periphery. The Cordium teach that the central universe is stationary and eternal, while the seven super-universes are creations of time and revolve around the central universe in a counterclockwise rotation. Surrounding these seven super-universes is outer or peripheral space, which is non-physical elementals consisting of non-baryonic matter or antimatter, which rotates around the seven super-universes in a clockwise rotation. This vast outer space is expansion room for the super-universes to expand into the known universe that your astronomers see is mostly a small fragment of our super-universe and the expansion space at its outermost periphery. Hubble-based astronomy extrapolates, based on a fractional field of view, that there are 50 billion galaxies in our super-universe, each containing over 100 billion stars. However, most astronomers remain convinced that our universe is singular. It is not according to the Cordium. On the fringe of the central universe resides the central race, which contain the original human DNA template of creation. However, they are such an ancient race that they appear to us as gods, when indeed they represent our future selves. Time and space are the only variables of distinction. The central race is known to some as the creator gods who developed the primal template of the human species and then, working in conjunction with the life carriers, seeded the galaxies as the universe is expanded. Each of the seven super-universes has a distinctive purpose and relationship. Page 22. With the central universe via the central race based on how the central race 
experimented with the DNA to achieve distinct, but compatible physical embodiments to be soul carriers. Sarah I don't even know what to ask next. Dr. Naruta the central race is divided into seven tribes, and they are master geneticists and the progenitors of the humanoid race. In effect, they are our future selves. Quite literally they represent what we will evolve into in time and towards in terms of space. Sarah so, you're saying that the wing makers are our future selves and that they're building these time capsules in order to communicate with us? Dr. Naruta the Labyrinth Group believe that the wing makers are representatives of the central race, and that they created our particular human genotype to become suitable soul carriers in our particular universe. The ancient Aero site is part of a broader, interconnected system of seven sites installed on each continent. Together, we believe this system constitutes a defensive technology. Sarah so there are seven ancient Aero sites? Dr. Naruda yes. Sarah and you know where they are? Dr. Naruda I know generally where the remaining six are, but I don't know their specific location. They remain undiscovered so far as I know. Sarah why would the most advanced race or future version of humanity play such a sophisticated array of technologies and artifacts on our planet? What are they afraid of? Dr. Naruta they have an ancient, formidable enemy, which 15 calls the Animus. Sarah we're back to the synthetics. Dr. Naruta one in the same. Sarah so, the wing makers are protecting their human genetics from the invasion of the Animus and they placed these sites or defensive technologies on Earth to somehow prevent them from taking over the planet? Page 23. Dr. Naruta that's essentially what we believe. However, it's more than human DNA. It includes all the higher order animals, humans being one of a collective of about 120 species. Sarah and you know all of this because of a psychic's vision, a few ancient manuscripts, and the cordium? Dr. Naruda I admit it sounds implausible, but yes, we know all of this from sources that no one in the public domain can access or corroborate. Sarah so the wing makers, or central race, created us and presumably hundreds of other species, planted us on Earth, and then built a complex defensive system to protect their genetics. Is that the situation? Dr. Naruda the best way to conceptualize who these beings are, is to consider them as geneticists who were the first born of first source. The galaxies in which the central race resides are approximately 18 billion years old and their genetics are measurably more developed than our own. They are the optimal soul carrier in that they can coexist in the material world and the non-material dimensions simultaneously. This is because their genetic blueprint has been fully activated. Sarah you sound like you're a believer in this philosophy, but I don't understand why you're such an authority if it's the Cordium cosmology. Did they teach you this? Dr. Naruta part of our TTP with the Cordium extended to their cosmology, and they have the equivalent of our Bible called Liminal Cosmogony that I translated. It was our first detailed exposure to the central race and their behind the scenes influence of genetic evolution and transformation. Sarah what do you mean behind the scenes? Dr. Naruta the wing makers have created a DNA template that is form fitted to each of the seven super universes, enabling a unique and dominant soul carrier to emerge within each of the super universes. This soul carrier in our case is the human genotype. Within our genetic substrate is the inborn structure that will ultimately deliver our species to the central universe as a perfected species. The wing makers have encoded this within our DNA, and set forth the natural and artificial trigger points that cause our genetic structures to alter and adapt. In this process, it activates parts of our nervous system that feed the brain with a much richer stream of data from our five senses and two additional senses that we have yet to consciously activate. Sarah it sounds a little too manufactured. Dr. Naruta what do you mean? Page 24. Sarah just that humans will one day aspire to the heights of the wing makers. But our salvation is something invisible that's encoded in our genes. It feels like 
we are manufactured to attain the same view or perspective of our creators. What? Happened to free will? Dr. Naruta you raise a good question, Sarah. I can defend this system of belief. I can recite any passage you want from the books that I know, but it's just someone's opinion who's taken the time to write it down. I can tell you that in my experience, the wider the range of possibilities as one moves toward more of a multidimensional thought stream and activity path, the narrower one's choices become as they pertain to rightful living. You could even say that free will diminishes as one becomes realized to all possibilities. Sarah I know you're trying to help, but you lost me but don't try to explain. Again. Let us just chalk it up to my dense brain getting in the way. Dr. Naruta if it's anything, it's my poor explanation. It's difficult to define. These things in a way that can enter your consciousness at its preparation point. Sarah you said earlier that the wing makers encoded trigger points that were both natural and artificially stimulated. What did you mean? Dr. Naruta again, I want to emphasize that this is all according to the cordium. We have very little proof of any of this from our own empirical research. However, the labyrinth group has a high degree of trust in the cordiums. Cosmological systems of belief because of their history as an explorer race, and their superior application of physics. Our human DNA is design. It did not evolve from forces of time, matter, and energy. It was designed by the central race, and part of this design was to encode within the DNA template certain supersensory capabilities that would enable a human to perceive itself in a very specific way. Sarah in what way? Dr. Naruta is a soul carrier that is connected to the universe like a ray of light. Is connected to a spectrum of colors as it passes through a prism. Sarah could you be a bit more concrete? Dr. Naruta laughing I'm sorry, sometimes I quote passages it's easier than coming up with my own explanation every time. Page 25 WINGM Acres TL Sarah no doubt one of the curses of having a photographic memory. Dr. Naruta perhaps you're right. I'll try in my own words. Our DNA is designed to respond to natural imagery, words, tones, music, and other external forces. Sarah what do you mean by respond? Dr. Naruta it can activate or deactivate certain components of its structure that Enable adaptation in both the biological and higher states of being. Sarah like? Dr. Naruta like the state of enlightenment as described by some of our planets. Spiritual teachers. Sarah I've never heard of enlightenment as something that one adapts to. Dr. Naruta that's only because mystics and scientists alike do not understand. This aspect of the human DNA template. Everything, whether it's a biological environment or a state of mind requires adaptation on the part of the person undergoing the experience. Adaptation is the primary intelligence design within our genetic code, and it is this intelligence that is awakened or triggered with certain stimuli. The stimuli can be artificially induced, that is to say, the central race has encoded adaptation to higher vibratory frequencies within our DNA that they can trigger through catalytic images, words, or sounds. Sarah okay, so now you're coming full circle to the purpose of the artifacts found at the ancient Aero site. Correct? Dr. Naruda I believe they're related. To what extent I'm not sure. But from reading the information contained within the optical disc, I'm quite certain that the wing makers intend the music, art, poetry, and philosophy to be catalytic. Sarah but for what purpose? Dr. Naruta let's save that for a later time. I promise we'll get to that, but it's a very long story. Sarah let's take a short break and resume after we've had a chance to grab some more coffee. Okay? Dr. Naruta okay. Page 26. Break for about 10 minutes. Resume interview Sarah during the break I asked you about the network of secret organizations. You mentioned that the ACIO is part of. Can you elaborate on this network and what its agenda is? Dr. Naruta there are many organizations that have noble exteriors and secret interiors. In other words, they may have external agendas that they promote to their employees, members, and the media, but there is also a secret and well 
hidden agenda that only the inner core of the organization is aware of. The outer rings or protective membership as they're sometimes referred to, are simply window dressing to cover up the real agenda of the organization. The INF, Foreign Relations Committee, NSA, KGB, CIA, World Bank, and the Federal Reserve are all examples of these organizational structures. Their inner core is knitted together to form an elitist, secret society, with its own culture, economy, and communication system. These are the powerful and wealthy who have joined forces in order to manipulate world political, economic, and social systems to facilitate their personal agenda. The agenda, as I know it, is primarily concerned with control of the world economy and its vital resources oil, gold, gas reserves, platinum, diamonds, etc. The secret network has utilized technology from the ACIO for the purpose of securing control of the world economy. They're well into the process of designing an integrated world economy based on a digital equivalent of paper currency. This infrastructure is in place, but it is taking more time than expected to implement because of the resistance of competitive forces who don't understand the exact nature of the secret network, but intuitively sense its existence. These competitive forces are generally businesses and politicians who are affiliated with the transition to a global, digital economy, but want to have some control of the infrastructure development, and because of their size and position, in the marketplace can exert significant influence on the secret network. The only organization that I'm aware of that is entirely independent as to its agenda, and therefore the most powerful or alpha organization, is the Labyrinth Group. And they're in this position because of their pure state technologies and the intellect of its members. All other organizations whether part of the secret network of organizations or powerful multinational corporations are not in control of the execution of their agenda. They are essentially locked in a competitive battle. Sarah but if this is all true, then is 15 essentially running the secret network? Page 27. Dr. Narud Dano. He's not interested in the agenda of the secret network. He's bored by it. He has no interest in power or money. He's only attracted to the Mission of building BST to thwart hostile alien attacks that have been prophesied for 12,000 years. He believes that the only mission worth deploying the Labyrinth Group's considerable intellectual power is the development of the ultimate defensive weapon or freedom key. He's convinced that only the Labyrinth Group has a chance to do this before it's too late. You have to remember that the Labyrinth Group consists of 118 humans and approximately 200 cordium. The intellectual ability of this group, aligned behind the focused mission of developing BST before the alien takeover, is truly a remarkable undertaking that makes the Manhattan Project look like a kindergarten social party in comparison. And perhaps I'm exaggerating a bit for effect but I'm pointing out that 15 is leading an agenda that is far more critical than anything that has been undertaken in the history of humankind. Sarah so, if 15 is running his own agenda, and it's just as you say it is, why would you defect from such an organization? Dr. Naruta the ACIO has a memory implant technology that can effectively eliminate select memories with surgical precision. For example, this technology could eliminate your recall of this interview without disrupting any other memories before or after. You would simply sense some missing time perhaps. But nothing more would be recalled if that my intuition cautioned me that I was a candidate to have this procedure because of the behaviors I was exhibiting in deference to the wing makers. In other words, I was believed to be a sympathizer of their culture, philosophy, and mission what I knew of it. That made me a potential risk to the project. The Labyrinth Group, in a very real sense, feared its own membership because of their enormous intellects and ability to be cunning and clever. This imprinted a constant state of paranoia which meant that technology was deployed to help ensure compliance to the agenda of 15. Most of these technologies were invasive, and the members of the Labyrinth Group willingly submitted to the invasion in order to more effectively cope with the paranoia. 
Several months ago I began to systematically shut down these invasive technologies in part to see what the reaction of 15 would be, and partly because I was tired of the paranoia. As I was doing this, it became obvious to me that the suspicions were escalating. And it was simply a matter of time before they would ask me to subject myself to an MRP Sarah MRP? Page 28. Dr. Neruda yes, MRP stands for Memory Restructure Procedure. What I had learned from the Wingmaker's time capsule is not something I want to forget. I don't want to give this information up. It has become a central part of what I believe and how I want to live out my life. Sarah couldn't you have simply defected and not sought out a journalist who will want to get this story out? I mean, couldn't you have simply gone to an island and lived out your life and never disclosed the existence of the labyrinth group and the wing makers? Dr. Neruda you don't understand. The labyrinth group is untouchable. They have no fears about what I divulge to the media, their only concern is the terrible precedence of defection. I'm the first. No one has ever left before. And their fear is that if I defect and get away successfully, others will too. And once that happens, the mission is compromised and BST may never happen. Fifteen and his directors take their mission very seriously. They are fanatics of the First Order, which is both good and bad. Good in the sense that they're focused and working hard to develop BST, bad in the sense that fanaticism breeds paranoia. My reasons for seeking out a journalist like you and sharing this knowledge is that I don't want the Wing Maker's time capsules to be locked away from humanity. I think its contents should be shared. I think that was their purpose. Sarah this will seem like a strange question, but why would the Wing Makers hide their time capsule and then encode its content in such an extraordinarily complex way if they wanted this to be shared with humanity if the average citizen had found this time capsule or even a government laboratory, what's the chance they would have been able to decipher it and access the optical disk? Dr. Neruda it's not such a strange question actually. We asked it ourselves. It seemed clear to the Labyrinth group that it had been the chosen organization to unlock the optical disk. To answer your question directly, had the time capsule been discovered by another organization, chances are excellent that its optical disk would never be accessed. Somehow, this coincidence that the time capsule ended up in the hands of the Labyrinth group seems to be an orchestrated process. And even 15 agreed with that assessment. Sarah so 15 felt that the wing makers had selected the Labyrinth group to decide the fate of the time capsule's content? Dr. Neruda yes. Sarah then wouldn't it be reasonable to assume that 15 wanted to learn more about the contents of the time capsule before he released it to the public through the NSA or some other government agency? Page 29. Dr. Neruda no. It's doubtful that 15 would ever release any information about the ancient Arrow project to anyone outside of the ACIO. He's not one to share information that he feels is proprietary to the Labyrinth group, particularly if it has anything to do with BST. Sarah so now that you've made these statements, isn't it going to affect the ACIO? Isn't someone going to ask questions and start poking around looking for answers? Dr. Naruta perhaps. But I know too much about their security systems, and there's no way that a political inquiry will find them. And there's no way the secret network of organizations I mentioned earlier could exert any influence over them. They're completely indebted to the ACIO for technologies that permit them to manipulate economic markets. They, the ACIO and Labyrinth Group, are, as I said before, untouchable. Their only concern will be defection the loss of intellectual capital. Sarah what effect will your defection have on the ACIO or the Labyrinth group? Dr. Neruda very little. Most of my contributions with respect to the time capsule have been completed. There are some other projects having to do with encryption technologies that I developed and these will be more significant in their impact. Sarah back to the wing makers for a moment, if they're so advanced. 
Technologically, why time capsules? Why not just appear one day and announce? Whatever it is they want to share. Why this game of hide and seek and hidden? Time capsules? Dr. Naruta their motives are not clear. I think they left behind these time. Capsules is their way to bring culture and technology from their time to ours. We also believe that these sites represent a defensive weapon. A very sophisticated defensive weapon. As for why don't they just show up and give us the information? This, I think, is their genius. They've created seven time capsules and placed them in various parts of the world. I believe this is all part of a master plan or strategy to engage our intellects and spirits in a way that has never been done before to demonstrate how art, culture, science, spirituality, how all of these things are connected. I believe they want us to discover this. Not to be told. If they simply arrived here in your living room and announced they were the wing makers from the centermost sector of the universe, I suspect you'd be more amazed about their personalities and physical characteristics and what life is like in their world. That's assuming you even believe them. The aspects of what they wanted to impart culture, art, technology, philosophy, spirituality, these items could get lost in the phenomenon of their presence. Page 30 also, in the text that we had translated, it was apparent that the wing makers had time traveled on many occasions. They interacted with people from many different times and called themselves culture bearers. They were probably mistaken as angels or even gods. For all we know, their reference in religious texts may indeed be frequent. Sarah so you think they intend that these time capsules be shared with the whole of humanity? Dr. Neruda you mean the wing makers? Sarah yes? Dr. Neruda I don't know with absolute certainty. But I think they should be shared. I don't have anything to personally gain from getting this information out to the public. It goes against everything I've been trained for and places me at risk and at the very least, disrupts my lifestyle irreparably. To me, the ancient arrow time capsule is the single greatest discovery in the history of humankind. Discoveries of this magnitude should be in the public domain. They shouldn't be selfishly secured and retained by the ACIO or any other organization. Sarah then why are these discoveries in the whole situation with ETs kept from the public? Dr. Neruda the people who have access to this information like the sense of being unique and privileged. That's the psychology of secret organizations and why they flourish. Privileged information is the ambrosia of elitists. It gives them a sense of power and the human ego loves to feed from the trough of power. They would never confess to this, but the drama of the ET contact and other mysterious or paranormal phenomenon is extremely compelling and of vital interest to anyone who is of a curious nature, particularly politicians and scientists. And by keeping these subjects in private rooms behind closed doors, with all the secrecy surrounding it, it creates a sense of drama that is missing in most of their other pursuits. So you see, Sarah, the drama of secrecy is very addictive. Now of course, the reason that they would tell you for keeping this out of the public domain is for purposes of national security, economic stability, and social order. And to some extent, I suppose there's truth to that. But it's not the real reason. Sarah does our president know about the ET situation? Dr. Neruda yes. Page 31. Sarah what does he know? Dr. Neruda he knows about the Greys. He knows about ET bases that exist on planets within our solar system. He knows about the Martians. Sarah good God, you are not going to tell me that little green men from Mars actually exist are you? Dr. Neruda if I were to tell you what I know about the ET situation, I'm afraid I would lose my credibility in your eyes. Believe me, the reality of the ET situation is much more complex and dimensional than I have time tonight to report, and if I give you a superficial rendering, I think you'd find it impossible to believe. So I'm going to tell you partial truths, and I'm going to be very careful in my choice of words. 
the Martians are a humanoid race fashioned from the same gene pool as we. They live in underground bases within Mars, and their numbers are small. Some have already immigrated to Earth, and with some superficial adjustments to their physical appearance, they could pass for a human in broad daylight. President Clinton is aware of these matters and has considered alternative ways to communicate with ETs. To date, a form of telepathy has been used as the primary communication interface. However, this is not a trusted form of communication, especially in the minds of our military personnel. Virtually every radio telescope on the globe has been, at one time or another, used to communicate with ETs. This has had mixed results, but there have been successes, and our president is aware of these. Sarah Den is Clinton involved in the secret network you mentioned earlier? Dr. Nehru did not knowingly, but he is clearly an important influencer, and is treated with great care by high-level operatives within the network. Sarah so you're saying he's manipulated? Dr. Neruda it depends on your definition of manipulation. He can make any decision he desires, ultimately he has the power to make or influence all decisions relative to national security, economic stability, and social order. But he generally seeks inputs from his advisors and high-level operatives from this secret network advises advisors. The network and its operatives seldom gets too close to political power because it's in the media fishbowl, and they disdain the scrutiny of the media and the public in general. Clinton therefore is not manipulated, but simply advised. The information he receives is sometimes doctored to lead his decisions in the direction that the network feels is most beneficial to all of its members. To the extent that information is doctored, then I think you could say that the president is manipulated. He has precious little time to. Page 32 The first interview of Dr. Jamison Naruta performed fact-checking and fully evaluate alternative plans, which is why the advisors are so important and influential. Sarah OK, so he's manipulated at least by my definition. Is this also happening with other governments like Japan and Great Britain for instance? Dr. Naruta Yes, this network is not just national or even global. It extends to other races and species. So its influence is quite broad, as are the influences that impinge upon it. It is a two-way street. As I said before, the Labyrinth Group operates the only agenda that is truly independent, and because of its goal, it's permitted to have this independence though in all honesty, there's nothing that anyone could do to prevent it, with the possible exception of the wing makers. Sarah so all the world's governments are being manipulated by the secret network of organizations. Who are these organizations? You mentioned some of them, but who are the rest? Is the mob involved? Dr. Neruda I could name most of them, but to what end? Most you wouldn't recognize or find any reference to. They're like the Labyrinth Group. Had you ever heard of it before? Of course not. Even the current management of the NSA is not aware of the ACIO. At one time, they were, but that was over 35 years ago, and people circulate out of the organization, yet still retain their alliance to the secret and privileged information network. And no, absolutely there is no mob or organized crime influence in this network. The network uses organized crime as a shield in some instances, but Organized crime operates through intimidation, not stealth. Its leaders possess average intelligence and associate with information systems that are obsolete and therefore non-strategic. The organized crime network is a much less sophisticated version of the network I was referring to. Sarah OK, back to the wing makers for a moment and I apologize for my scattered questions tonight. It's just that there's so much I want to know that I'm Finding it very difficult to stay on the subject of the ancient arrow project. Dr. Neruda you don't need to apologize. I understand how this must sound to you. I'm still wide awake, so you don't have to worry about the time. Sarah OK. Let's talk a little bit about your impressions or insights into the ET. Situation that you spoke of earlier. To me, 
This is the part that's most fascinating. Dr. Naruta first of all, I want to explain that the ETs that interact with our world's governments are not the same ones that interact with the labyrinth group. Page 33. Sarah but I thought you said that the Greys were involved with the ACIO, or at least one of its factions. Dr. Naruta yes, they're also known as the Zetas, but as I said, there are many different factions of the Greys and the one that the ACIO is working with are the Alpha Faction, and they don't operate with our government organizations because they are too suspicious of them, and frankly, don't view them as intelligent enough to even warrant their time. Sarah what about the Cordium? Dr. Naruta the Cordium are a very sophisticated culture, integrating technology, culture, and science in a very holistic manner. For different reasons. They're not involved with our governments either, mainly because of their role with the Federation. Sarah what's the Federation? I haven't heard you talk about it before. Dr. Naruta each galaxy has a Federation or a loose-knit organization that includes all sentient life forms on every planet within the galaxy. It would be the equivalent of the United Nations of the galaxy. This Federation has both invited members and observational members. Invited members are those species that have managed to behave in a responsible manner as stewards of their planet and combine both the technology, philosophy, and culture that enable them to communicate as a global entity that has a unified agenda. Observational members are species who are fragmented and are still wrestling with one another over land, power, money, culture, and a host of other things that prevent them from forming a unified world government. The human race on Planet Earth is such a species, and for now, it is simply observed by the Federation, but is not invited into its policy-making and economic systems. Sarah are you saying that our galaxy has a form of government and an economic system? Dr. Naruta yes, but if I tell you about this you will lose track of what I really wanted to share with you about the wing makers. Sarah I'm sorry for taking us off track again. But this is just too amazing to Ignore. If there's a federation of cooperative, intelligent species, why couldn't they take care of these hostile aliens in the year 2011 or at least help us? Dr. Naruta the federation doesn't intrude on a species of any kind. It is truly a facilitating force not a governing force with a military presence. That is to say, they will observe and help with suggestions, but they will not intervene on our behalf. Page 34 Sarah is this like the Prime Directive as it's portrayed on Star Trek? Dr. Naruda no. It's more like a parent who wants its children to learn how to fend for themselves so they can become greater contributors to the family. Sarah but wouldn't a hostile takeover of Earth affect the Federation? Dr. Naruda most definitely. But the Federation does not preempt a species own responsibility for survival and the perpetuation of its genetics. You see, at an Atomic level our physical bodies are made quite literally from stars. At a sub. Atomic level, our minds are non-physical repositories of a galactic mind. At a. Sub sub atomic level, our souls are non-physical repositories of God or the. Intelligence that pervades the universe. The Federation believes that the human species can defend itself because it is of. The stars, galactic mind, and God. If we were unsuccessful and the hostility spread to other parts of our galaxy, then the Federation would take notice and its members would defend their sovereignty, and this has happened many times and in this process of defense new technologies arise, new friendships are forged, and new confidence is embedded in the galactic mind. That's why the Federation performs as they do. Sarah doesn't EST exist somewhere within the Federation? Dr. Naruta perhaps in one of the planets closer to our galactic core. Sarah so why doesn't the Federation help? You said they could help didn't you? Dr. Naruta yes, they can help. And the Cordium are IMs or invited members. And they are helping us. But they themselves do not possess the BST technology. This is a very special technology that's permitted to be acquired by a species that intends to use it only as a defensive weapon. And herein is the challenge. 
Sarah who does the permitting are you saying the Federation decides when a species is ready to acquire BST? Dr. Naruda no. I think it has to do with God. Sarah I don't know why, but I have a hard time believing that you believe in God. Dr. Naruda well, I do. And furthermore, so does everyone within the labyrinth. Group including 15. We've seen far too many evidences of God or a higher page 35. Intelligence that we can't dispute its existence. It would be impossible to deny. Based on what we've observed in our laboratories. Sarah so God decides when we're ready to responsibly use BST. Do you think? He'll decide before 2011? I admit there was a tone of sarcasm in this question. Dr. Naruda you see, Sarah, the labyrinth group is hopeful that the readiness of the entire species isn't the determining factor, but that a subgroup within the species might be allowed to acquire the technology as long as it was able to protect it from all non-approved forces. This subgroup is hoped to be the labyrinth group, and it's one of the reasons why 15 has invested so much of the ACIO's resource into security systems. Sarah you didn't really answer my question though. Do you think it can be developed in 12 years? Dr. Naruda I don't know. Certainly I hope so, but BST is not our only line of defense. The Labyrinth Group has devised many defensive weapons, not all of which I'll describe to you. The Animus have visited Earth before, approximately 300 million years ago, but they didn't find anything present on our planet to cause them to invest the time and resources to colonize our planet. When their probes return in 13 years, they will think differently. Our analysis is that they will befriend our governments and utilize the United Nations as an ally. They will set about orchestrating a unified world government through the United Nations. And when the first elections are held in 2018, they will overtake the United Nations and rule as the world government. This will be done through trickery and deception. I mention our analysis taken from three different RV sessions because they're quite specific as to the dates, and so we have the equivalent of 19 years to produce and deploy BST. Ideally, yes, we'd like to have it completed in order to interface with the intervention points for this race when it decided to cross over into our galaxy. We would like to cause them to choose a different galaxy or abandon their quest altogether. But it may be impossible to determine this intervention point. You see, the memory implant technology developed by the Labyrinth Group can be utilized in conjunction with BST. We can define the intervention point. When our galaxy was selected as a target to colonize, enter that time and place and impose a new memory on their leadership to divert them from our galaxy. Sarah either I'm getting tired, or this just got a lot more confusing. You're saying that the Labyrinth Group already has scenarios to nip this thing in the bud. To prevent this marauding group of aliens from even entering our galaxy? How? Do you know where they are? Page 36. Dr. Naruda to answer your question, I would need to explain with much more granularity the precise nature of BST and how it differs from time travel. I'll try to explain it as simply as I can, but it's complex, and you need to let go of some of your preconceived notions of time and space. You see time is not exclusively linear as when it's depicted in a timeline. Time is vertical with every moment in existence stacked upon the next and all coinciding with one another. In other words, time is the collective of all moments, of all experience simultaneously existing within non-time, which is usually referred to as eternity. Vertical time infers that one can select a moment of experience and use time and space as the portal through which they make their selection real. Once the selection is made, time and space become the continuity factor that changes vertical time into horizontal time or conventional time. Sarah you lost me. How is vertical time different from horizontal time? Dr. Naruda vertical time has to do with the simultaneous experience of all time. And horizontal time has to do with the continuity of time in linear, moment by moment experiences. Sarah so you're saying that every experience I've ever had or will ever have 
exists right now that the past and future are actually the present, but I'm just too brainwashed to see it. Dr. Naruta as I said before, this is a complex subject, and I'm afraid that if I spend the time explaining it to you now, we'll lose track of more important information like BST. Perhaps if I were to explain the nature of BST, most of your questions would be answered in the process. Sarah okay, then tell me what blank slate technology is? Given the title, I assume it means something like wipe out an event and change the course of history. Right? Dr. Naruta let me try to explain it this way. Time travel can be observational in nature. In this regard, the ACIO and other organizations even individual citizens have the ability to time travel. But this form of time travel is passive. It's not equivalent to BST. In order to precisely alter the future you have to be able to interact with vertical time, paging through it like a book, until you find the precise page or intervention point relevant to your mission. This is where it gets so complex because to interact with vertical time means you will alter the course of horizontal time and understanding the alterations and their scope and implication requires extremely complex modeling. This is why the Labyrinth Group aligned itself with the Cordium its computing. Technology has processing page 37 capabilities that are about 4,000 times more powerful than our best supercomputers. This enables us to create organic, highly complex scenario models. These models tell us the most probable intervention points once we've gathered the relevant data, and what the most probable outcomes will be if we invoke a specific scenario. Like most complex technologies, BST is a composite technology having five discrete and interrelated technologies. The first technology is a specialized form of remote viewing. This is a technology that enables a trained operative to mentally move into vertical time and observe events and even listen to conversations related to an inquiry mode. The operative is invisible to all people within the time they are traveling to, so it's perfectly safe and unobtrusive. The intelligence gained from this technology is used to determine the application of the other four technologies. This is a equivalent of intelligence gathering. The second technology that is key to BST is the equivalent of a memory implant. As I mentioned earlier, the ACIO refers to this technology as a memory. Restructure procedure or MRP MRP is the technology that allows a memory to be precisely eliminated in the horizontal time sequence and a new memory inserted in its place. The new memory is welded to the existing memory structure of the recipient. You see, events small and large occur from a single thought, which becomes a persistent memory, which in turn becomes a causal energy center that leads the development and materialization of the thought into reality, into horizontal time. MRP can remove the initial thought and thereby eliminate the persistent memory that causes events to occur. The third technology consists of defining the intervention point. In every major decision, there are hundreds, if not thousands, of intervention points in horizontal time as a thought unfolds and moves through its development phase. However, in vertical time, there is only one intervention point or what we sometimes call the causal seed. In other words, if you can access vertical time intelligence you can identify the intervention point that is the causal seed. This technology identifies the most probable intervention points and ranks their priority. It enables focus of the remaining technologies. The fourth technology is related to the third. It's a scenario modeling technology. This technology helps to assess the various intervention points as to their least invasive ripple effects to the recipients. In other words, which intervention point if applied to a scenario model produces the desired outcome with the least disruption to unrelated events? The scenario modeling technology is a key element of BST because without it, BST could cause significant disruption to a society or entire species. Page 38. The fifth and most puzzling technology is the interactive time travel technology. The Labyrinth Group has the first four technologies in a ready state waiting for 
the interactive time travel technology to become operational. This technology requires an operative or a team of operatives to be able to physically move into vertical time and be inserted in the precise space and time where the optimal intervention point has been determined. From there the operatives must perform a successful MRP and return to their original time in order to validate mission success. Sarah I've been listening to this explanation and I think I even understand some of it, but it sounds so surreal to me, Dr. Naruda. I'm I'm at a loss to explain how I'm feeling right now. This is all so strange. It's so big. Enormous. I can't believe this is going on somewhere on the same planet that I live. Before this interview, I was worried about balancing my checkbook and when my damn car would ever be fixed. This is just too strange. Dr. Naruda, maybe we should take another break and warm up our coffee. Sarah signing off for a coffee break. Break for about 15 minutes. Resume interview Sarah if the Labyrinth Group has four of the five technologies ready to go, and is only awaiting the interactive. The interactive part, they must have scenario. Models and intervention points already established for how they plan to deal with this animus race. Do they? Dr. Naruda, yes. They have about 40 scenario models and perhaps as many as eight intervention points defined. Sarah and if there are that many, there must be a priority established. What's the most probable scenario model? Dr. Naruda, I will be brief on this point because it's such classified information that only the SL-14 personnel and 15 know this. My classification is SL-13, and so I get diluted reports and quite possibly misinformation with regard to our scenario modeling. About all I can tell you is that we know from both the prophecies and our remote viewing technology a significant amount of information about this race. For example, we know that it hails from a galaxy that our Hubble telescope has examined as thoroughly as possible and we've charted it as extensively as possible. We know that it's 37 million light years away and that the species is a synthetic race a mixture of genetic creation and technology. It possesses a hive mentality, but individual initiative is still appreciated as long as it is aligned with the explicit objectives of its leaders. Page 39. Because it's a synthetic race, it can be produced in a controlled environment and its population can be increased or decreased depending on the whims of its leaders. It is Sarah didn't you just say it's from a galaxy that's 37 million light years away? I mean, assuming they were able to travel at the speed of light it would take them 37 million years to come to our planet. And you said earlier that they hadn't even crossed into our galaxy yet, right? Dr. Naruda the Cordium come from a planet that is 15 million light years away, and yet they can come and go between their planet and our planet in the time it takes us to travel to the moon a mere 250,000 miles away. Time is not linear, nor is space. Space is curved, as your physicists have recently learned, but it can be artificially curved through displacement. Energy fields that collapse space and the illusion of distance. Light particles do not displace or collapse space, they ride a linear line through space, but there are forms of electromagnetic energy that can modify or collapse space. And this technology makes space travel even between galaxies not only possible, but also relatively easy. Sarah why did you say, you're physicists just then? Dr. Naruda I apologize. It's just a part of the conditioning of being isolated from mainstream society. When you operate for 30 years in a secret organization like the Labyrinth Group, you tend to look at your fellow humans as not your fellow humans, but as something else. The principles of science that the Labyrinth Group has embraced are very different from those taught within your there I go again, within our universities. I must be getting tired. Sarah I didn't mean to criticize you. It's just the way you said it, it sounded as though an alien or an outsider said it. Dr. Naruda I qualify as an outsider, but certainly not an alien. Sarah okay, 
Back to this prophecy or alien race. What do they want? I mean, why travel such a far distance to rule Earth? Dr. Naruta this seems such a funny question to me. Excuse me for laughing. It's just that humans do not understand how special Earth is. It is truly, as planets are concerned, a special planet. It has such a tremendous biodiversity and a complex range of ecosystems. Its natural resources are unique and plentiful. It's a genetic library that's the equivalent of a galactic zoo. The animus desire to own this planet in order to own its genetics. As I've already mentioned, this is a synthetic race. A species that can clone itself and fabricate more page 40 and more of its population to serve the purpose of its colonization program. However, it desires more than the expansion of its empire. It desires to become a sole carrier something reserved for pure biological organisms. Synthetic organisms are not able to carry the higher frequencies of soul, which absolutely require an organic nervous system. Sarah so they want a soul? Dr. Naruta they want to expand throughout the universe and develop their organic nature through genetic re-engineering. They want to become soul carriers in order to achieve immortality. They also want to prove what they already believe, that they are superior to all other pure organics. Sarah so where are they right now? Dr. Naruta the Animus? Sarah yes. Dr. Naruta I assume they remain in their home world. To the best of our knowledge their probes haven't crossed into our galaxy yet. Sarah and when they arrive, how will the ACIO or Labyrinth group know? Dr. Naruta as I said, the ACIO has already done a significant amount of intelligence gathering and even selected scenarios and intervention points. Sarah so what's the plan? Dr. Naruta the most logical approach would be to travel to the time and place. When the causal thought was born to explore the Milky Way, and through MRP, expunge it from the memory of the race. Essentially, convince them that of all the wonderful, life-inhabited galaxies, the Milky Way is a poor choice. The Labyrinth group would implant a memory that would lead this race to conclude that our galaxy was not worthy of their serious exploration. Sarah so some other galaxy becomes their next target? Wouldn't we bear the responsibility of their next conquest? Aren't we then perpetrators ourselves? Dr. Naruta this is a fair question, but I'm afraid I don't know how to answer it. Sarah why couldn't we using this MRP technology simply implant a memory not to be aggressive? To tell this race to stop trying to colonize new worlds that aren't theirs to own like property. Why couldn't we do this? Page 41 The first interview of Dr. Jamis and Naruta Drive Naruta perhaps we will. I don't really know what 15 has in mind. I am, though, confident in this approach and its efficacy. Sarah but you said earlier that you feared for your life. That 15 is probably trying to hunt you down even as we speak. Why are you so confident in his sense of morality? Dr. Naruta in the case of 15, morality doesn't really play a role. He operates in his own code of ethics, and I don't pretend to understand them all. But I'm quite certain of his mission to avert takeover by this alien race, and I'm equally confident that he will choose the best intervention point with the least influence to the animus. It's the only way he can acquire BST. And he knows this. Sarah we re back to God again. Aren't we? Dr. Naruta yes. Sarah so God and 15 have this all figured out? Dr. Naruta there's no certainty if that's what you mean. And there's no alliance. Between 15 and God, at least not that I'm aware of. This is part of the belief. System that the Labyrinth group formalized along the path to developing BST. It's logical to us that God is all powerful and all knowing because it operates as the universal minefield that interpenetrates all life, all time, all space, all energy, and all existence. This consciousness isn't partial, but certainly it's in a position to deny things or, perhaps more accurately, delay their acquisition. Sarah if God exists everywhere as you say, then why wouldn't he stop this marauding alien race and keep them in their place? Dr. Naruta again, a fair question, 
but one that I can't answer. I can only tell you that the God I believe in is, as I said before, impartial. Meaning that it allows its creation to express themselves as they desire. At the highest level where God operates, all things have a purpose. Even aggressive species that desire to dominate other species and planets. It was 15's belief that God orchestrated nothing but understood everything in the universal mind. Remember when I was talking about the galactic mind? Sarah yes. Dr. Neruda there are planetary minds, solar minds, galactic minds, and a singular universal mind. The universal mind is the mind of God. Each galaxy has a collective consciousness or mind field that is the aggregation of all of the species present within that galaxy. The universal mind creates the initial blueprint for each of the galaxies page 42 related to its galactic mind or composite consciousness. This initial blueprint creates the predisposition of the genetic code seated within a galaxy. We, the labyrinth group, believe that God designed each galaxy's genetic code with a different set of predispositions or behaviors. Sarah and why would this be so? Dr. Naruto so diversity is amplified across the universe, which in turn permits God to experience the broadest continuum of life. Sarah why is this so important? Dr. Naruto because God loves to experiment and devise new ways of experiencing life in all of its dimensions. This may very well be the purpose of the universe. Sarah you know you're talking like a preacher? You speak like these are certainties or truths that are just self-evident. But they're just beliefs aren't they? Dr. Naruto yes, they're beliefs, but beliefs are important don't you think? Sarah I'm not sure I mean my beliefs are changing every day. They're not stable or anchored in some deep truth that's constant like bedrock or something. Dr. Naruto well, that's good. I mean that they change. The labyrinth group evolve a very specific set of beliefs some of these were based on our experiences as a result of the Cordium Intelligence Enhancement Technologies. Some were based from ancient texts that were studied, and some were borrowed from our ET contacts. Sarah so now you're going to tell me our friendly neighborhood ETs are religious zealots? Dr. Naruda no. No, I don't mean that they were trying to convert us to their beliefs, we simply asked and they related them to us. Upon hearing them, they seemed quite a bit more like science than religion actually. I think that's the nature of a more evolved species. They finally figure out that science and religion converges into cosmology. That understanding the universe in which we live also causes us to understand ourselves which is the purpose of religion and science or at least should be. Sarah okay, this is getting a little too philosophical for my tastes. Can we return? To a question about the wing makers? If, as you say, there's a galactic federation that governs the Milky Way, how do the wing makers factor into this federation? Dr. Neruda I'm impressed by the nature of your questions. And I wish I could answer them all, but here again, I don't know the answer. Page 43. Sarah but if you can use your remote viewing technology to eavesdrop on this alien race in an entirely different galaxy. Why can't you observe the Federation? Dr. Neruda is for the Federation, they're fully aware of our remote viewing capability, and in fact, we can eavesdrop on the Federation because they're able to detect our presence if we observe them through remote viewing. So, in deference to their privacy and trusting their agenda, we never imposed our technology on the Federation. Perhaps only once or twice. Sarah you'll have to forgive me Dr. Neruda. But I find all of this a little hard to believe. We've skimmed the surface of about a hundred different subjects through the course of this interview, and I keep coming back to the same basic issue why? Why would the universe be set up this way and no one on earth know about it? Why all the secrecy? Does someone think we humans are so stupid that we couldn't understand it? And who the hell is this somebody? Dr. Neruda unfortunately. There are so many conspiracies to keep this vital information out of the public domain, that what ends up in the hands of the public is diluted to the point of uselessness. 
I can understand your frustration. I can only tell you that there are people who know about these things, but only 15 knows about the larger reality of what we've touched on tonight. In other words, and this is to your point, Sarah, there are some people within the military, government, secret network, NSA, CIA, etc., that know parts of the whole, but they don't understand the whole. They aren't equipped with the knowledge to stand before the media and explain what's happening. They fear that they would be made to appear feeble by the fact that they only know pieces of what's going on. It's like the story of the three blind men who are all touching different parts of an elephant and each thinks it is something different. 15 withholds his knowledge from the media and the general public because he doesn't want to be seen as a savior of humanity the next messiah. And he especially doesn't want to be seen as some fringe lunatic that should be locked up, or worse yet, assassinated because he is so misunderstood. The instant he stepped forward with what he knows he would lose his privacy and his ability to discover BST. And this he'll never do. Most people who know about this greater reality are fearful of stepping into the public scrutiny because of the fear of being ridiculed. You have to admit that the general public is frightened by what it doesn't understand, and they do kill the messenger. Sarah but why can't we get even partial truths about this picture of reality? About ETs in the Federation? Someone, the media or government or someone else is page 44 keeping this information from us. Like the story you were telling me about the Martians. If this is true and Clinton knows about this, why aren't we being told? Dr. Neruda there's a cynical part of me that would say something like, Why do you watch six hours of television every day? Why do you feed your minds exclusively with the opinions of others? Why do you trust your politicians? Why do you trust your governments? Why do you support the destruction of your ecosystems and the companies and governments that perpetrate this destruction? You see, because the whole of humanity allows these things to occur, the wool is pulled over your eyes and it's easy to ration information and direct your attention to mundane affairs like the weather and Hollywood. Sarah that's fine for you to say someone whose IQ can't be charted but for those of us with average intelligence, what are we supposed to do differently that would give us access to this information? To this larger reality? Dr. Neruda I don't know. I honestly don't know. I don't pretend to have the answers. But somehow humans need to be more demanding of their governments and even the media. Because the media is a big part of this manipulation, though they're not aware of how they've become pawns of the information cover-up. The truth of the matter is that no one entity is to blame. Elitists have always existed since the dawn of man. There have always been those who had more aggression and power and would dominate the weaker of the species. This is a fundamental structure that has bred this condition of information cover-up, and it happens in every sector of society, including religion, government, military, science, academia, and business. No one created this playing field to be level and equal for all. It was designed to enable free will and reality selection based on individual preferences. And for those who have the mental capacity to probe into these secrets behind the secrets, behind the secrets, they usually find pieces of this larger reality as you put it. It's not entirely hidden. There are books and individuals and even prophesies that corroborate much of what I've spoken of here tonight. And these are readily available to anyone who wants to understand this larger universe in which we live. So, to answer your question, what are we supposed to do differently? I would read and study. I would invest time learning about this larger universe and turn off the television and disconnect from the media. That's what I would do. Sarah maybe this is a good place to wrap things up. Unless you have anything else you'd like to add. Dr. Naruto only one thing, and that is that if anyone ever reads this interview, please do so with an empty mind. If you bring a mind full of learning and education page 45 and opinion, you'll find so much to argue with in what I've said that you'll not hear anything. And I'm not interested in arguing with anyone. 
I'm not even that interested in convincing anyone of what I've said. My life will go on even if no one believes me. The wing makers have built a time capsule of their culture and it's magnificent. I wish I could take people to the original site so they could stand before each of the 23 chambers and witness these wall paintings in person. If you were to do this, you would understand that art can be a portal that transports the soul to a different dimension. There is a certain energy that these paintings have that could be translated in mere photographs. You really need to stand inside these chambers and feel the purposeful nature of this time capsule. I think if I could do that, you would believe what I've said. Sarah could you take someone like me to the site? Dr. Naruda no. Unfortunately, the security system surrounding the site is so sophisticated, the site entrance, for all intents and purposes, is invisible. All I have are my photographs Sarah you're saying that if I walk right up to the site, I wouldn't be able to see it? Dr. Naruda cloaking technology is not just a science fiction concept. It's been developed for more than 10 years. It's used much more frequently than people realize. And I'm not talking about its diluted version of stealth technology. I'm talking about the ability to superimpose a reality construction over an existing reality that's desired to be hidden. For instance, you could walk right up to the entrance of the ancient arrow site and see nothing that would look like an entrance or opening to the observer it would be a flat wall of rock and it would have all the characteristics of rock texture hardness and so forth but it's actually a reality construction that is superimposed on the mind of the observer in reality the entrance is there but it can't be observed because the mind has been duped into the projected reality construction Sarah great so there's no way to enter this site and experience this time capsule so once again us little humans are prevented from the experience of proof. You see, the reason why this is so hard to believe is that nothing is ever proven. Dr. Naruda but isn't proof in the eye of the beholder? In other words, what is proof for you may not convince another or vice versa. Isn't this the way of all religions and even science? Scientists claim to have proof of this theory or that theory, and then some years later, Another scientist comes along and disproves the previously held theory. And on and on this goes. Page 46 Sarah So what's your point? Dr. Naruta proof is not absolute. It's not even objective. And what you're looking for is an experience that is permanent and perfect in its expression of truth and such an experience, if it indeed exists, is not owned or possessed by any secret network or elitist organization or a galactic federation for that matter. You could have this experience of absolute proof tomorrow, and the very next day, doubt would begin to creep in and in a matter of weeks or months this proof, or absolute truth, that you aspire to possess. It would be just a memory, and probably not even a powerful memory because so much doubt would be infused into it. No, I can give you or anyone absolute proof. I can only tell you what I know. To be true for me and try to share it as accurately as I know how with anyone who's interested. I'm less interested in trying to relate the cosmology of the universe than I am in getting the story of the wing makers and the artifacts of their time capsule into the public attention. The public should know about this story. It's a discovery of unparalleled importance and it should be shared. Sarah you do realize don't you? that you've made me the messenger? You've asked me to be the one who takes the public scrutiny and suspicions, and has to endure all of the ridicule. Dr. Naruda I'm not asking you to do anything against your will, Sarah. If you never do anything with the materials I've given you, I'd understand. All I'd ask is that you return them to me if you're not going to get them out. If I step forward as the messenger, I would lose my freedom. If you step forward, this story could catapult your career and you're only doing your job. You're not the messenger, you're the transmitter. The media. But you must do what you think best. And I'd understand your decision. Whatever you decide. Sarah okay, let's wrap it up there. 
I don't want you to get the wrong impression that I'm a total disbeliever. But I'm a journalist and it's my responsibility to validate and cross-check stories before I publish them. And with you, I can do this. And what you're telling me, if it's true, is the biggest story ever to be told. But I can't take this to the media at least not the company I work for, because they would never publish it. No validation. No story. Dr. Naruta, yes, I understand. But I've shown you some of the ACIO technologies and photos of the site and its contents, so these must be some form of validation. Sarah, for me, it validates that something is going on that I've never heard about. Namely, the ACIO is a new organization that's never been talked about. At least not in page 47 the first interview of Dr. Jamison Neruda my journalistic circles. But your photographs and stories don't validate what you've explained tonight. They're in the category of teasers. Something the National Enquirer is fond of broadcasting, but this isn't the brand of journalism I subscribe to. Dr. Neruda let's talk some more in the next few days. Take the time to read some of the materials translated from the optical disc, and in the meantime, just be neutral. Sarah don't assume I'm not interested, or too much a skeptic to do anything with this stuff. I just need some time to get my bearings as to what I should do with this story and the evidence you've provided. Dr. Neruda I promised you several interviews before I left. Are we still on for tomorrow night? Sarah yes. But how much more is there than what you've already explained? Dr. Neruda we've only touched on the surface of a small portion of the story. Sarah that's a little hard to believe, but let's pick up tomorrow night, then. Dr. Neruda thanks for your interest in my story, Sarah, I know it sounds outlandish, but at least you've shown restraint in writing me off as a lunatic. And for that, you have my thanks. Sarah you're very welcome. End of session OK? PAGE 48 By Sarah what follows is a session I recorded of Dr. Neruda on December 28, 1997. He gave permission for me to record his answers to my questions. This is a transcript of that session. This was one of five times I was able to tape record our conversations. I have preserved these transcripts precisely as they occurred. No editing was performed and I've tried my best to include the exact words, phrasing, and grammar used by Dr. Neruda. It's recommended that you read the December 27, 1997, interview before reading this one. Sarah, before we begin tonight's session, I wanted to tell you that I've listened to last night's tape and have used it to formulate some new questions. I noticed that I was all over the place with regard to my questions, and tonight I'm going to try and stay more focused. So I'm just warning you that if I get off track, again, remind me to stay on course. Okay? Dr. Neruda I'll certainly do my best, although I'm not sure what your course is. Sarah well, I guess I'd like to stay more centered on the wing makers and the artifacts of their time capsule. Dr. Neruda that's fine with me but let me make one clarification first. The ancient aerosite was labeled initially as an extraterrestrial time capsule, or etc., however, it is not actually, in my opinion, a time capsule. Sarah Good, let's start right there. What exactly is it, in your opinion? Dr. Neruda the site is part of a larger structure that's interconnected through some means I don't understand. We know there are seven sites that have been constructed on Earth presumably in the 9th century. We know that these sites have some defensive purpose, and we know that the site's planners represent themselves as culture bearers, and are most likely representatives from the central race. Sarah I hear a lot about defensive weapon, but how can these wall paintings or the music artifacts be considered part of a defensive weapon? Dr. Naruto we know from our RV sessions that the wing makers design these sites to be more than a defensive weapon, otherwise, as you point out, the cultural page 49 artifacts wouldn't make any sense. However, it also doesn't make sense that they'd be completely unrelated to the objectives of a defensive weapon. I'd make 
the hypothesis that their DNA triggers. Sarah you mean they activate something within our DNA? As you were. Describing last night? Dr. Naruta correct. Sarah and how does this relate to a defensive weapon? Dr. Naruta it was our hypothesis that the cultural artifacts, if studied or examined, would somehow activate parts of our DNA. For what purpose we weren't certain, but I intuit that it has something to do with stimulating our fluid intelligence and enabling sensory inputs that have been dormant within our central nervous system. Sarah and do you have a hypothesis as to why? Dr. Naruta presumably the enhancements to the central nervous system make the defensive weapon more effective. Sarah it's so damn easy to get sidetracked when talking with you, but I'm going to resist the temptation to move into a line of neurological discourse, not that I know anything about it anyway. Tell me more about your role with the Wingmaker's time capsule or whatever you want to call it. Dr. Neruda I think for accuracy and consistency, we can refer to it as the ancient aerosite. As I said before, I'm confident that it's not a time capsule. To your question, though, I was working with a computer we called ZEMI, helping to translate the data contained on the optical disk found in the 23rd chamber of the site. It contained text, symbol pictures, mathematical equations, and what turned out to be music files. Once the site was located, my primary focus was to decode the optical disk and make the data there insensible and, as much as possible, applicable to BST. Sarah did any of it apply to BST? Dr. Naruda not directly, at least nothing that I've read. The text was of a more philosophical nature. I was the first one to read their language. Once we unlocked the optical disk, we printed out 8,045 pages of symbol pictures like the ones contained in their artwork, except much more varied, and, in some instances, much more complex. Page 50. There were 23 chapters of text or symbol pictures each consisting of about 350 pages. I read the first segment or chapter of this text and was amazed to find that there were passages of text in the introduction that were only readable to me. This was additional confirmation that I had a role to play in getting this information into the public domain. Sarah are you saying that the text you read disappeared after you read it or that you deleted it? Dr. Neruda it disappeared. It deleted itself. Sarah so only the first eyes would see the message? Dr. Neruda correct. Sarah so what did it say? Dr. Neruda I can recite the exact words if you like, but it would take a few minutes. Sarah give me a summary. Dr. Neruda the essence of this passage was validating what the ACIO had already known that the Animus were sending probes in 2011, and it was written in the form of a warning. It stated that the wing makers had installed a defensive weapon on Earth that would render the planet invisible to the Animus probes. Sarah invisible? How? Dr. Neruda they didn't explain with any precision. They wrote that higher frequencies were emanating from the central universe, and that these seven sites comprised a collective technology that somehow coordinated these frequencies or higher energies to bring about a shift in the planet's vibratory structure enabling life on the planet to survive the shift and remain undetected by the animus. Sarah all life forms? Dr. Neruda technically, the text didn't specify. Sarah and this was for your eyes only? Dr. Neruda yes, the ZEMI operator did not find any evidence of this section of the text. It completely disappeared. Page 51. Sarah what else did it say? Dr. Neruda it confirmed that we're dealing with the central race, and that they want the cultural artifacts from the seven sites to be shared with the public. These elements were connected to the effectiveness of the defensive weapon. Sarah in what way? Dr. Neruda in the sense that the materials activate aspects of our DNA that make the shift easier, or perhaps possible, I'm not certain because they were a bit vague. Sarah so. By reading the philosophy I'm supposed to be able to become invisible? Dr. Neruda I think it's more holistic than that. They left behind poetry, music, paintings, and even a glossary. 
it seems to me that all of these elements in addition to the philosophy are connected. Also, I'm suggesting that something fundamentally changes when these materials are absorbed, and perhaps this change, whatever it is, resonates with the technology from the seven sites. Sarah sounds far-fetched to me. Why do you believe this? Dr. Neruda I've absorbed the materials and I've noticed changes. Sarah such as? Dr. Neruda I defected from the ACIO. To me, that's the biggest change. Imaginable. Sarah you're not implying that the materials you've read induced you to defect. Are you? Dr. Neruda it was a combination of many things, but it certainly had a significant impact on my decision. Did you read any of the materials I left last? Night? Sarah I read the first section and a little of the glossary. I didn't understand it. It was too abstract. It did have an effect on me though. It managed to put me to sleep. Dr. Neruda I know it's a little intense, but you have to admit, it's very interesting if for no other reason than they're representative of how our distant ancestors think and believe. Sarah and you have a copy of all the pages of text? Dr. Neruda yes. Page 52. Sarah and can I see it? Dr. Neruda yes, but it's not something I carry around with me. Sarah tell me a little bit about the translation process since you were involved. In it? Dr. Neruda the translation is the key to the usefulness of the optical disc, and using a carefully sequenced set of experiments, conducted by ZEMI, we were able to access the disc's data files in five days. Sarah how do you know that the translation is accurate? Dr. Neruda within the disk, once it was accessed, were translation indexes that enabled their text to print out in perfect English, or about 60 other languages. It took us two days to figure out how to access the disk, but once we did, we were able to access the 24 sections of text in the span of 17 hours. The most vexing of the translations, and the one in which we have the least Confidence is the music. Sarah Good, I'm glad you brought up the music because I don't understand that element of the time capsule. Dr. Neruda how do you mean that? Sarah was the music already on the optical disc and you simply captured it from the disc, or was it basically produced by the labyrinth group based on the musical notations? Dr. Neruda actually, it was a bit of a combination of the two. Their musical Notations were very precise and they left digital samples of each of their instruments even vocals. So we simply translated their digital samples to a MIDI standard and produced our own version of their music. Sarah so were you involved in the music translations as well? Dr. Neruda yes. I helped in the initial discovery of their musical notation and helped with the translation indexes. I wasn't involved in its production phase. Though I was very curious as to what it would sound like. Sarah can I hear any of these compositions? Dr. Neruda yes, of course. When I left, the ACIO had successfully translated 10 of the 23 music compositions. I have these. And they've been converted to page 53. Both CD and cassette standards. I also have complete files of the remaining 13 compositions in their raw deconstructed form. Sarah how were they produced exactly? Dr. Neruda do you mean that technically or artistically? Sarah I guess both. Dr. Neruda on the technical end we needed to step their samples down to a resolution of 384 bit in order to use them in our computer systems. When we first heard the samples of instrumentation, we were somewhat relieved to hear familiar sounds. There were some that were different, but for the most part, Digital samples that were encoded on the optical disc were the same as contemporary musical instruments heard around the world. Once we had captured their samples and organized them into octaves, we took their compositional notations and essentially let the computer select the digital instrumentation based on their samples. Eventually this all had to be stepped down to a 24-bit commercial CD mastering system, which was them pressed on a CD and recorded onto a cassette tape. As for the artistic production, there really wasn't much that we did. The 
Computers did all the interpretative work and essentially performed the production for that matter. We had some of our staff perform overdubs on various versions to experiment with the compositions. The music was very popular, particularly when you listened to it at a sampling resolution of 384-bit. Sarah didn't anyone wonder why the time capsule included a musical construction kit instead of just having a recording of the music? I mean, why? Have us bring an artistic interpretation to their music? Dr. Neruda everything was wondered about in the Ancient Era project. Everything. We didn't know why they did it the way they did it, but again our hypothesis was that the wing makers didn't have a way to bring their music into our world. Because we lacked the technology to listen to it. So they disassembled their music. Into as you put it a construction kit, which enabled us to reconstruct the music so it could be listened to on our technology. It's the most logical reason. There were several of us who were able to experience Chambers 1 and 2 as a completely integrated form of expression and it was a very powerful experience, to say the least. When you hear the music in 384-bit resolution with the original paintings, page 54, standing inside the actual chamber in which they were placed, it is a very moving and spiritual experience, unlike any I've ever had. Sarah, in what way? Dr. Neruda just at the sense of being pulled out of your body and into the portal of the painting is irresistible. There is a very strong sense of movement into and beyond these paintings, and the music and paintings are only two of the art forms, the third, the poetry is also part of the experience. Sarah so tell me about the poetry. Dr. Neruda the poems are expressive of a wide range of subjects. To most of us at the ACIO. They could have been written by any contemporary poet. There was really nothing that caused them to stand out as representing a culture billions of years older than our own. Many of the same themes about spirituality, love, relationships, and death were evident in their poems as well. There are actually two poems for each chamber painting, so there's a total of 46 poems. Sarah, that's interesting. Everything else the paintings, music, artifacts, and philosophy is placed one per chamber. Why do you suppose they have placed two poems in each chamber instead of one? Dr. Neruda in my opinion it was to provide a broader perspective into the particular theme represented by a specific chamber. The poetry appears to be designed in such a way to provide both a personal and universal perspective in each of the chambers but again, it's just a working hypothesis at this time. Sarah I assume from the examples you left me, that the poetry is also a bit less abstract when compared to their philosophy and paintings. Have you considered how the poetry is related to the paintings? Dr. Neruda yes. And I believe the poetry and the paintings have the strongest connection of all the objects in each of the chambers. I think the paintings illustrate in some subtle way the themes represented in the poetry. In some instances, when the painting represents an assemblage of abstract objects, the poetry is also more abstract. When the painting is more illustrative, the poetry seems more like prose. Sarah are you saying then that the poetry carries the central meaning of each chamber? Dr. Neruda I'm not sure, but it does seem that the poetry is somehow implied symbolically in the chamber painting that it's associated with. The problem is that the poetry is so highly interpretive that it's impossible to know precisely what its theme is intended to be. Also, and I should have mentioned this before, but the grammar and page 55 syntax of their language is very different from ours in that they have no end to their language punctuated with periods. In other words, if we made a literal translation, there would be no sentence structure. More like a logic syntactical approach which simply means an abstracted language flow which would be, for most people, very difficult to understand. When I was doing the translations of the poetry, I placed it in a sentence structure that fragmented its meaning so that it could be better understood. Perhaps in the process I unintentionally changed the meaning, but it was either that or the poetry would be too abstracted to understand. 
Sarah is there a connection between the poetry and the philosophy of each chamber? Dr. Neruda, my colleague, and I felt that all of the objects within a specific chamber were connected, probably in ways we couldn't fathom. We were constantly worried that the translation indexes were somehow inaccurate, and that this was limiting our ability to see the linkages between the various objects. And of course the most puzzling connection was the technology artifacts because we had no way to probe or reach any conclusions about their purpose or function. Sarah let's talk a little bit about the artifacts found in each chamber. The only one that I've really heard about was the one found in the 23rd chamber. The optical disc. I know you've shown me some photos of the others, but could you describe them better? Dr. Neruda the optical disc is the only artifact of the 23rd we found that the ACIO had successfully accessed, at least that I'm aware of. The other artifacts were all taken to the Labyrinth Group's research laboratory in Southern California immediately after they were discovered. These were never acknowledged to anyone below a security level 12 clearance. They were Rumors within the broader ACIO that there were technologies within the ancient Aero site, but these never gained any serious consideration, and certainly not by the NSA. The technology artifacts were of the greatest curiosity to 15 because they represented possible solutions to BST. And, as I mentioned earlier, 15 and most of the Labyrinth group for that matter, felt that the wing makers may not allow the Labyrinth group to deploy BST. Hence, 15 considered the wing makers as possible foes, instead of allies. Sarah but what I've seen doesn't look very advanced or based in high technology. They could pass for crystals or rocks or something organic. Why? Was the Labyrinth group so intrigued by them? Dr. Neruda the crystalline structures that were found, in most cases, did look quite page 56. Ordinary in the sense that when they were examined by the eye, they appear to be crystals, but when you looked at them through various molecular and atomic analyses, it was obvious that they were man-made objects. In other words, they were synthetic crystalline structures, and we held the hypothesis that they were encoded with information much like the optical disc or the paintings. We also held the hypothesis that they were potentially connected to the optical disc since it was the last of the artifacts and seemed the equivalent of a keystone or master key. Sarah did any of the text translated from the optical disc refer to the other artifacts? Dr. Neruda no, to our disappointment, there were no references. Sarah you didn't answer my question about whether you felt there was a connection between the technology artifacts and the specific cultural artifacts related to each chamber. Dr. Neruda sorry, I guess it's my turn to get sidetracked tonight. Anyway, yes. There were connections. We were certain of this, but at the same time, because we couldn't get inside the artifacts and probe them, we couldn't prove our theory. Consequently, we placed all of our time and energy on the optical disc because it seemed to be the most important of the artifacts as well as the one we had the best chance of accessing through our technology. Sarah Why? Dr. Neruda you must bear in mind that the technology artifacts were extremely alien to our technologies. Other than the optical disc, the other technologies were a combination of synthetic materials based on organic structures, and in some instances actually possessed human DNA within their structures. These were... Sarah you're saying that the technologies were in part human? Dr. Neruda yes, in a way. But what I was going to say, is that these artifacts seem to have molecular based computer systems that activated by a specific human touch. And we weren't certain whether it was literally a specific human, or a specific type of human, or perhaps any human in a specific state of emotion, or mind. We had 115 possible experiments developed for testing and all failed. Sarah but this is real odd. Why would human DNA be inside a technology and this talk about synthetic crystals? It leaves me cold. Dr. Neruda we had some similar misgivings until we were able to translate some of the text within the optical disc. The philosophical papers from Chambers 
1 and 2 convinced us that the wing makers could indeed be authentic and we had no other page 57 reason to disbelieve their story. That's not to say that we suspended all of our disbelief or caution, but the philosophy was a breakthrough to our understanding of their perceived mission with contemporary humankind. Sarah I don't know. I read the first two philosophy papers you left for me, and I could believe that they're from an alien race. I could also believe that they're from a deceptive race that uses philosophy and all this cultural stuff to lull us into believing they're benevolent when in fact they're not at all. I mean isn't that part of the prophecy you spoke about last night? Dr. Naruto well, I see you remain the ever skeptical journalist. I'm actually glad to see that reaction. Sarah, all I can tell you is that when you take into account all of the cultural artifacts found within the ancient Aero site, and you immerse yourself in their content and philosophy, it's hard to believe they originate from evil intent. Sarah unless that's exactly what they wanted you to believe. Dr. Naruta perhaps. It's hard to debate such a thing. I think at some point it's an individual decision. The Labyrinth Group and I'm including the Cordium. When I say that was an agreement that it was an authentic disclosure from the central race and felt confident that we were not dealing with deception. But we never closed the door to that possibility. Our security and operations directors put contingency plans in place in the event evidence was accumulated that increased the probability of fraud or deception. Sarah one of things that seemed odd to me, having looked at the photographs of the chamber paintings, was how similar they all were. They were clearly done by the same artist or I suppose a group of artists. But when I think of a time capsule, I would think you would include a variety of art from a diverse assortment of artists that represent a variety of perspectives and so forth. And that isn't the case here. Why do you suppose? Dr. Neruda I don't think their motive was to inform us about their artists or the diversity of their artistic culture. I think they intend that the art function initially as a form of communication, and subsequently as a form of time travel or moving out of the body consciousness. The continuity of the 23 paintings seen as a whole seem to be inviting the consciousness of the observer to quite literally step into the world of the wing makers. As though they were portals, and I have experienced this myself. The paintings are incredibly brilliant in their colors. You really can't imagine how much impact they have when you see them in person, particularly after their cleaning and restoration was completed. But even when they were first discovered without any page 58 touch-up, it was eerie how luminous they were and vibrant in their colors after 1150 years. There were many times when those of us who were involved in restoration and cataloging of the artifacts would sit in the chambers and stare at these paintings. On several occasions I did this for hours just letting my eyes wander through the painting and imagining the mind of the artist and what they were trying to communicate. It was a very powerful experience. Sarah I think they'd scare me a little bit. Dr. Neruda I'm only laughing because I had such an experience. One night, after a long day of working in the artifact chambers, I was left as the last one inside the site. I had been so absorbed in what I was doing I scarcely remembered being told to activate the security system on my way out. About a half hour went by, and I finally realized I was alone inside the time capsule. The silence was incredible. At any rate, I was walking down the corridor that connected all of the 23 chambers, and past each chamber and I began to feel a presence that was overwhelming. Every time I would come upon one of the chambers I expected something from the painting to jump out at me. They literally seemed alive. Our lighting was a very high quality portable halogen system and every chamber was outfitted precisely the same. When I got to the bottom of the corridor what we called the spiral staircase and looked into chamber 2, I clearly saw motion and nearly jumped out of my skin. Not necessarily out of fear but out of excitement I suppose, though there was fear as well. But this motion was simply a blurred image of something stepping out of the painting. 
and then disappearing into thin air. I couldn't really. Sarah what was it? Was it human? Dr. Neruda I couldn't see it clearly enough to tell you what it was, but I began to theorize that some of the chamber paintings may have purposes beyond just visual stimulation. Our RV also had some experiences of sensing motion in the paintings, feeling as though she was being pulled out of her body. Sarah this may seem to be an odd, off-the-wall question, but how do you know this wasn't all a hoax? That someone or some group created this whole thing to look like an alien or a future time capsule just for the fun of playing with your minds? Dr. Neruda the one thing we know for certain is that this is not a hoax. The ancient arrow site consists of an enormous rock structure that has literally been hollowed out in the form of a helix that deters every 10 meters into a separate chamber 23 to be exact. The entire structure would have taken an incredible technology to build. We have accurate dating of when the chamber paintings were created, and they were conclusively produced in the 9th century, and we're certain that this technology didn't exist then. Page 59. Sarah I'm not trying to argue with you but if these artifacts are really from the central race, it just seems so odd that they'd be buried inside a huge rock in the middle of nowhere in New Mexico of all places. And it also seems odd that they'd go to all this work, but make it so damn hard to understand what the hell they were trying to say. Do you see what I mean? Dr. Neruda yes, I understand, and I don't take your questions as argumentative. But the point I'm making is that this site is indeed a set of real objects. And these objects don't even correspond to the same time frame. For example, while the paintings were created about 1100 years ago, the artifacts do not even respond to our carbon dating or biochemical analysis. To complicate matters. The pictographs in and around the ancient arrow site were determined to have been created in the past 50 years, and could very well have been done in the year, or month, the site was discovered. These real objects are admittedly an enigma, but they are not a hoax to my eyes. The real question is whether the wing maker's identity and purpose is as they represented. Sarah okay, let's say it's not a hoax. Then tell me why are you so convinced it's a defensive weapon. It seems to me, that it might be more of a communication device or perhaps an educational tool of some kind. Why a weapon? Dr. Neruda the text from the optical disc states this. And we had an RV session that corroborated it. Sarah so, Earth is this genetic library that the animus want to use in order to recreate themselves as soul carriers, as you put it? And the ancient arrow site and its six companion sites is going to protect Earth and all of us from these marauding aliens? How am I doing so far? Dr. Neruda I can't say that your specific conclusions are right or wrong. I can only tell you that the animus are a real threat and that the wing makers intend to protect their genetics. Sarah okay, then tell me, why would the central race, who lives trillions of light years away, care about what happens to us? Dr. Neruda the central race is responsible for seeding and cultivating higher life forms throughout the universe, they're vitally interested in protecting their genetics from the animus. Earth isn't the only genetic repository that they protect. In this manner, our RV sessions uncovered a database of planets throughout our super-universe that was incalculably large. Sarah so this is just standard operating procedure for this race. To install a Defensive weapon on the planets they seed with life? Page 60. Dr. Neruda I believe so. Sarah I looked the word animus up in the dictionary this morning. It's a real word. How did a race whose most recent visit to Earth was some 300 million years ago become an entry in Webster's dictionary? Dr. Neruda their name is known even by the wing makers. They used the same word in their translation indexes. There are certain words that have been purposely seeded within our language by the wing makers. Sarah so now you're saying that wing makers actually place words into our dictionaries? Dr. Neruda no. Remember when I told you that the wing makers were culture bearers? Sarah yes. 
Dr. Neruda they have encoded the discovery of language, mathematics, music, and so forth into our genetic structures. As we evolve, certain forerunners of our species people like you and I activate a part of their DNA before the rest of us. These forerunners are able to retrieve this encoded information and share it with the species. In subsequent generations, this insight is transmitted, and pretty soon, the entire species encompasses this new information or skill. Sarah so you're really saying that the word animus was encoded into our sense of language, and someone invented the word, not realizing it was the name of this alien synthetic race? Dr. Neruda yes, something like that. Sarah I also read the memo that Dr. Sothers a colleague of Dr. Neruda wrote about a global culture being an outcome of this technology from the wing makers sites. But how could these objects be used to build a global culture? It seems a little naive to me. Dr. Neruda all I can tell you is that it's related to the internet and a new communication technology that the wing makers refer to as Olin or the one language intelligent network. If you read the glossary section that I left behind, you'll see it referenced there. The wing makers seem to feel confident that the Olin technology will help create the global culture through the internet. This incidentally is consistent with prophecies that the Labyrinth Group was privy to, dating as far back as 1,500 years ago. Of course the enabling technology wasn't called Olin, but the notion of a global culture and unified governance has been predicted for many centuries. Page 61 Sarah this is what George Bush used to call the New World Order isn't it? Dr. Neruda yes, but there have been four other presidents who've acknowledged this concept. Sarah what would make the world's people decide to unify under one governing body, or for that matter, create a global culture? Whatever that means. I just can't envision it happening not in my lifetime. Dr. Neruda according to the wing makers it will happen through the digital economy and then through the Internet's Olin technology platform. And through this global network, entertainment and educational content will be globalized. This is the basis of a global culture with unified commerce, content, and communities. Once these pieces of the infrastructure are in place, then the need to govern this infrastructure will loom as the preeminent issue of the day. And the United Nations is the logical ruling body for such an endeavor. As long as the world's people allow the digitization of the economy and embrace the Olin technology platform, a global government and culture is virtually assured to emerge. Sarah and as you said last night, this is supposed to occur in 2018? Dr. Neruda according to prophecy, that's when the United Nations will hold initial elections for a unified world government. And it won't be an all-powerful centralized authority, but rather a global public policy decision and enforcement organization for issues that affect the world at large. Issues like pollution, global warming, border disputes, space travel, terrorism, trade, commerce, Olin, technology upgrades, and general technology transfer programs. Sarah saw what will happen to national sovereignty in this new role of the United Nations? Dr. Neruda I'm willing to answer your question in the form of a speculative response, but I'm also aware that you had asked me at the outset of this interview to remind you if you got off course. What would you like Sarah No, you're absolutely right. Sorry. Let's go back to the artifacts. What was the condition of the site when you first entered or better still, why don't you just describe your first encounter going inside the site? Dr. Neruda I was one of five from the ACIO who made the trip to New Mexico to explore the site after it was initially determined to have potential ET implications. None of us at the time knew anything that would have led us to conclude that the ancient Aero site would become such an important discovery. Page 62 the only real clue we had was an artifact that had been recovered near, what was determined much later, as the entrance of the interior chamber of the time capsule. It was this artifact that brought the project under the control of the ACIO because the artifact was considered by the NSA to have potential ET origins. Sarah what specifically led the NSA to conclude the artifact was alien? 
Dr. Neruda like all the other artifacts it showed no response to carbon dating analysis and it had peculiar markings or symbols that seemed otherworldly. It was a pure grade composite of unknown origin. Also, and perhaps more importantly, there was no obvious way to activate the artifact or access its interior controls. Its interior was impervious to various spectrum analyses. Even simple X-rays were unable to penetrate the object. At any rate, this artifact was essentially handed over to the ACIO, which deemed it to be of ET origins, and then proceeded to investigate the region in which it was found. We discovered that the outside casing of the artifact held a detailed topographical map that defined the region in which it was discovered. We begin to think the artifact might activate or become more useful if taken to the region depicted on its casing. Sarah is this the artifact you showed me pictures of? Dr. Neruda no. This artifact destroyed itself after it led us to the ancient arrow site. Sarah why did you think it was important to activate it where it was found? Dr. Neruda because it was thought to be a form of a compass or homing beacon. We weren't sure, but we couldn't determine any functional purpose in the laboratory, so it seemed like a logical experiment to see how the device would function in the area in which it was discovered. Also, the original people who found the artifact complained that it induced a hallucinogenic experience when it was held near the stomach area. The exploration team from the ACIO figured out how to use this device to locate the entrance to the interior of the canyon wall in which the ancient arrow site was hidden. The device, when activated, seemed to pass thought waves or mental pictures of where it wanted the person to go. The RV assigned to our team was the one holding the device when it was first activated, and she immediately began to see pictures. I did as well. Ultimately, it led us into a cave. Like structure tucked 20 to 30 meters inside one of the clefts of the canyon. Wall. Sarah was there an entrance already, or did you have to blast your way inside? Dr. Neruda the way into the interior was cleverly hidden behind a natural made cavern which in its own right was well hidden by natural underbrush. This cavern was page 63. About 25 meters deep and led inside the canyon wall we presumed it was an Indian dwelling of some kind that had long been abandoned. Towards the end of this cavern there was a corridor that jutted off to the side, and at the back of this corridor there was another chamber. A large, flat rock on the floor hid the entrance to the site. Sarah so you were convinced there was something underneath the rock? Dr. Neruda yes. After removing the rock, we were able to determine a tunnel was indeed underneath it. The tunnel was in the form of AJ and was about one meter in diameter. I slid down first through the tunnel and crawled my way to the entrance of the site. Sarah so all five of you were inside this. The site, looking around with flashlights. What was running through your mind at the time? Dr. Neruda we were all very excited and somewhat apprehensive as well. We thought we might find an ET site, and were half aware that it could be an active site, which kept us all on guard. Sarah and this whole thing was carved out of rock? Dr. Neruda it was completely man-made or alien and we knew it the instant we got out of the transition tunnel. It was like being born into a completely new world. It was absolutely silent. The air was cool, but not uncomfortably cold. There were no signs of life, and it seemed like everything took on a new purpose. An intelligent purpose that we couldn't wait to unravel. What was so remarkable was the incredible sense of walking into a surreal world, a world that was created by something completely alien. We assumed it was of ET construction from the moment we stepped out of the J-Tunnel. Sarah but how did you immediately know it was an artificial construction, and not a natural set of chambers or caves? Dr. Neruda at the beginning of the spiral staircase there were ornate petroglyphs carved in the stone with a precision never before seen by our eyes. Also, the entire tunnel system was clearly too smooth almost polished to be of natural construction. There was a sense of architecture, a sense that someone designed it with extreme care and purpose. 
Amazingly there was nothing on the floor. Not even a pebble or a grain of sand. Every surface was completely clean, smooth, and polished. There was dust, but... Only dust. And something like a polymer coating had been applied to every... Square centimeter of the structure including the ceilings. Page 64. When we arrived at the first chamber, which is only about 30 meters from... The entrance, I can clearly recall a sense of awe or something approaching a... Religious experience I suppose. No one spoke for a long time after our lights hit. The first chamber painting. Everyone's flashlight converged on the painting and... We all just stared for about 40 seconds in the incredible silence of this... Tomb-like structure. Sarah did you find all the chambers that same day? Dr. Naruta yes. We went from chamber to chamber, each time feeling like we... Had stumbled into an alien natural history museum. You have to understand that. Our lighting was not very good because we hadn't expected to need anything. More than basic flashlights. I vividly remember seeing each of the chamber. Paintings for the first time and just staring at them. Mesmerized by the incredible. Anachronism of the place. I've never been in such a surreal environment. It was. Both eerie and completely enchanting at the same time. Sarah so how large were the chambers and the paintings themselves? Dr. Naruta the chambers themselves were relatively small. About 4 meters. In diameter with fairly high ceilings, in some instances as high as 6 meters. Sarah so, judging from the photographs I've seen of the chamber paintings, the paintings themselves must be fairly large? Dr. Naruta yes, they're large and always face the entrance of the chamber. If you stand just outside the entrance of a particular chamber, you can't see the whole painting. It's too large. You have to walk into the chamber in order to see the whole composition. Sarah what, in the opinions of the labyrinth group, are the artistic merits of these paintings? Dr. Naruda no one within the labyrinth group claims to be an art critic I can assure you. I think it's fair to say that of those who saw the chamber paintings in their original environment found the artistic merits to be very compelling, even captivating. I think those who saw them only represented in photographs thought they were less art and more of a cog in some masterfully designed wheel like an illustration in a children's book. Sarah not to change the subject, but I keep wondering how you came to choose me. I mean, I know you said it was completely random, but why did you Select an average journalist to share this story? Why not a scientist or someone who could at least ask you more sophisticated questions? I have to confess that I feel completely inadequate to interview you, mostly because I don't even know what questions I should be asking you. Page 65. Dr. Naruto you're doing a fine job. Absolutely fine. You shouldn't worry about your questions. They're insightful. And most people, who will read this information, will be more interested in the things you've inquired about than the physics or science involved anyway. Sarah perhaps, but I have this nagging feeling that if I could ask you the scientific questions then you could more easily prove your story or credibility. I think I'm handicapping you in some way. Dr. Naruto what is it exactly that you feel you're not asking me? Sarah I guess it's mostly things related to time travel and BST. Last night you talked about some things that when I reread them earlier today, I felt like I should have asked more in-depth questions. Dr. Naruta like. Sarah that's the problem, I don't know. Dr. Naruta Sarah, the reason I selected you was simple. I needed to find someone who knew how to access the mainstream media and yet be relatively obscure. Had I chosen the science editor from a major newspaper, I may have ended up with more scientific questions and less about the cultural, artistic, and social implications of the ancient era project. Of my random selections, I knew that you had no established image to protect, that you knew how to access the media, and could ask sound questions that wouldn't betray your identity. That's why we're talking right now and the fact that you didn't think I was crazy. Sarah I never asked you this before, but I'm just curious, was I the first 
journalist do you talk with, or did someone turn you down before you found me? Dr. Naruda no, you were the first and only person outside of the labyrinth group whom I've talked with about this story. Sarah I'd like to change the topic slightly and ask you about 15s. Personality is that okay? Dr. Naruda yes, that's fine. Sarah what's he like as a leader? Dr. Naruda is extremely focused and demands everyone he works with to be similarly focused. He's a workaholic, sleeps about 4 hours a night and works the rest of his time on some aspect of BST. If there's research or development of new page 66 technologies that don't have a specific and strategic impact on BST, he's not involved in it. He won't even ask questions about projects of that nature, and generally within the ACIO, there are always three or four projects that are unrelated to BST. Within the Labyrinth group, every project is related to BST. Sarah what's he look like? Dr. Naruto is about average height and has fairly long gray hair down to his shoulders which he usually wears in a ponytail. He's always reminded me of Pablo Picasso with long hair. He has those same penetrating eyes. He's originally from Spain, so it's no coincidence that he looks like Picasso. His most notable feature is his eyes. They're mischievous like you'd expect from a child who's done something wrong on the surface, but underneath, they've created something wonderful. It's just that nobody understands the wonderful part yet. That's what you see going on behind his eyes. Sarah I may have already asked you this, but how old is he? Dr. Naruto is about 60 years old I think or at least he looks about that old. I've never heard anyone say his age. I know when he was a student, he was supposed to look old for his age. I think he started getting gray hair when he was in his early 20s, and that's probably why he was often mistaken for a professor rather than a student. Sarah you said earlier that he was kicked out of school. Why? Dr. Naruto remember, he was, even at an age when most kids are concerned about dating and parties, working on BST, or at least early versions of time travel. He's one of those rare visionaries that enter the physical world and knew at a very early age what he came to do. 15 was born to time travel. Period. End of story. That's all he's ever cared about. In the 50s, researching BST was considered a waste of time, no pun intended. It was simply too theoretical and disconnected from anything practical. I think. 15 also rubbed his professors the wrong way because he was so bright as a student that he intimidated most of them. He's also very stubborn, and when the professors told him to change his research to something more practical, 15 apparently told them they were small-minded or something to that effect. Later, that semester he was forcibly expelled as the story was told to me. However, Bell Labs hired him for a short stint because his research on quantum objects and how they could be influenced by consciousness interested them. Sarah forgive me, but what exactly are quantum objects? Page 67. Dr. Naruda they're elementals like electrons or neutrons. Quantum objects are fundamental building blocks of matter, and they can appear both as a wave and a particle. Sarah okay, so 15 was trying to prove that quantum objects are influenced by consciousness. Why was that so dangerous to a research university? Dr. Naruda that in itself wasn't so radical, but it was only a small part of his total research into how to construct BST using the new physics that was being introduced rapidly in the community of quantum physics. 15 has always maintained that Einstein's general theory of relativity was flawed, which is not a popular position to take. In somewhat the same way that Newton's theory of the mechanistic universe became too constricted and unable to explain so much of the phenomenon of what we call today complexity or chaos theory, 15 felt that Einstein's theories underestimated the influence that consciousness had on quantum objects. In the 50s and 60s, this was tantamount to heresy, particularly because it wasn't possible to prove by mathematical modeling or formula. Consequently, 
15 just continued to develop his theories in secret and began to become noticed by the ACIO when he became involved in a project having to do with heuristic learning systems based on a technology that the ACIO had re-engineered from the Greys. The project leader from the ACIO recognized his intellect and rogue creativity and began to develop a relationship with the young man. Several months later, 15 was recruited to join the ACIO and essentially left his identity behind, quickly rising to the position of director of research. He was later introduced to the Cordium Intelligence Accelerator technology, and the rest is history as day. Say, Sarah how exactly does this Cordium technology accelerate or expand the intelligence? Dr. Naruto few people realize that their conscious mind only processes about 15 bits of information per second of linear time. However, in vertical time, the unconscious mind is processing approximately 70 to 80 million bits of information. Thus, in normal consciousness, humans are aware of only an infinitesimal amount of the information that is constantly being fed to them at the unconscious level. The Cordium technology was designed to reduce the filtering aspects of the conscious mind and enable the higher frequency information packets to be fed to the conscious mind. In parallel with this effort, the brain circuitry of fuel is rewired to handle the higher voltage of the information that is being fed to the consciousness, allowing capabilities like photographic memory and abstract thought to coexist. These capabilities become the matrix filter that draws from the unconscious repositories the page 68 most relevant information at any particular time based on the problem or task at hand Sarah if I were a behavioral scientist I'd be able to ask you about a thousand questions right now but I'm lost in what you say I mean how many bits of information can you process right now Dr. Naruta it's not really a simple question of the quantity of information processing but rather the relevance of the information in linear time based on the intention of the individual. When one goes through the process of the Cordium technology, their ability to tune into information packets that are relevant to a situation or a problem is vastly improved. In most people, when a given situation confronts them they access their conscious mind and pull out a solution that has served them in the past. Thus, people fall into ruts and pattern behavior, which closes down their access to the unconscious information packets that are based on real-time situation analysis and have extremely high relevancy. This technology accelerates the circulation of information between the conscious and unconscious aspects of the mind to flow in the pattern of an ascending spiral rather than the pattern of a repetitious circle. And because of this, it unleashes the innate intelligence of the individual. So you see, the cordium technology doesn't increase raw intelligence, it simply facilitates the natural intelligence of the individual. Sarah this is very cool. I wish I could undergo this regimen of the cordium intelligence accelerator so I could really ask you some zinger questions. And with that, let's take a short break. 10 minute break. Dr. Naruta since you have the tape recorder on now, let me repeat myself. Cordium technology was the single most influential element in helping 15 become the executive director of both the ACIO and the Labyrinth Group. Granted, he had a brilliant mind before he underwent the Cordium Intelligence Enhancement process, but for some reason, the technology seemed to enhance his intelligence more than anyone else by a significant degree. Sarah did anyone ever suspect that the Cordium and 15 were somehow a separate force from the labyrinth group. I mean, did anyone consider the possibility that they had a separate agenda? Maybe BST wasn't their ultimate goal? Dr. Naruda no, there was, and I presume still is, absolute faith in both 15 and the Cordium. You have to understand that the Cordium are a benevolent race. We never saw any evidence that they had anything but good intentions to assist us, and to the extent possible, we tried to assist them in return. It was a courteous and completely reciprocal partnership. Page 69. Sarah you said last night that the Cordium were part of the Labyrinth Group. 
but only a couple hundred or so were actual members. How did they become? Part of the Labyrinth Group? Dr. Naruta actually, I don't know for certain. I can only tell you what I was. Told when I asked the same question of one of the directors who sponsored me. For entry into the Labyrinth Group. He told me that 15 had been selected by the Cordium to be their liaison with the ACIO. They singled him out as the one through which they would initiate their technology transfer program with humans. 15 agreed to subject himself to the intelligence enhancement technology the Cordium offered. It was from this experience that 15's vision of how BST could be developed was crystallized. He essentially created the framework and design blueprint. One of the things that the Cordium have in abundance is logical intelligence. They are very adept in terms of scientific inquiry and logical reasoning. By their own admission, where they lack ability is in the creative visionary aspect of discovery. This is precisely where 15 excels. Sarah but you're talking about a race that is superior to us in their technologies. How can they lack creative insights? Dr. Naruta these things are all relevant. Compared to virtually all other humans, the Cordium are creative and visionary. But there are formative principles of physics that reside in a dimensional matrix that are completely foreign to all beings except the most penetrating intellects. And 15 has such an intellect. The Cordium are hoping that 15, and more generally, the Labyrinth Group, can develop BST because the Cordium have their own application for this technology. Sarah but last night you said there are other races within our galaxy that may already have time travel capabilities, why don't the Cordiums simply go to these races and make a deal with them? Dr. Naruta as I said before, a species that has, of their own initiative, developed time travel will be unwilling to share it with another race. It is truly the most guarded of all technologies. And one doesn't simply ask to borrow the technology when they need it. Even when the need seems compelling and true. It's so easy to become dependent on the technology itself. Furthermore, as I tried to explain last evening, there's a considerable difference between time travel and BST. I'm not aware of any species that possesses the form of BST that the Labyrinth Group is attempting to develop. It's like this, Sarah, BST requires a suite of interdependent, but discrete, technologies that require a developer to apply new theorems, new laws of physics, that have never page 70 been discovered before, and then to build this suite of technologies based fundamentally on a new matrix of how the world works. It's a daunting task. Everything previously held to be true needs to be destroyed, needs to be reinvented reformulated, and then integrated into this new matrix. This is the very nature of BST, you start with a blank slate and reinvent, reformulate, and recreate the consciousness of matter. Sarah slow down. You just lost me. The consciousness of matter? Dr. Naruto remember what I said earlier about quantum objects and how they're influenced by consciousness? Sarah yes. Dr. Naruta quantum objects become increasingly granular or refined until they become pure light energy and cease to have mass. They are not of physical reality, but rather of a pure state energy. This energy is further segmented into octaves of vibration. In other words, this light energy vibrates, and just like music, there are fundamentals and harmonics. The harmonics resonate with the Fundamental energy vibration in the whole energy packet seems like a choir. Except its voice is light. This singing, if you will, is the equivalent of a consciousness that pervades all matter. Every physical object in the entire universe. 15 has successfully proven this all-pervasive consciousness or what he calls the light encoded reality matrix or LERM, for those of us who like shorthand. Anyway, LERM is just one of the new theorems that were required in order to devise a way to prove that BST was indeed a possibility, and not just a fanciful vision inside the mind of 15. Sarah this all pervasive consciousness you mentioned, are you really talking about spirit or God? Dr. Naruta exactly. 
Sarah now you've really crossed over the line. You're going to tell me that. 15 discovered God that he has proof of God? Dr. Neruda yes, in a way, but but God isn't what we call it. It's L-E-R-M. And 15 was quite emphatic that we never refer to L-E-R-M as God or even God. Like. He preferred to think of L-E-R-M as the shadow of God. The light that casts. The shadow, and the object of the shadow itself, he believes is impossible to. Proof through science or any other objective form of inquiry. Sarah okay. Okay. But listen to me for a minute. If L-E-R-M is the shadow of. God, as you put it, then it proves the existence of God, right? Page 71. Dr. Neruda to those of us within the labyrinth group who understand the work of 15, the answer is yes. Sarah so isn't this even more important than the ancient arrow project? I mean, if someone had proof of God, isn't it their moral responsibility to share this information with the public? Dr. Neruda perhaps, but the only way this could be shared with the public is to disclose who the labyrinth group is, and that isn't something that 15 even likes to contemplate doing. He's afraid of the ridicule and misunderstanding that would result, and firmly believes that no one would believe him anyway because there are so many hidden technologies that led him to his findings, and he has no interest in disclosing these technologies to academia, government institutions, or the media. He'd become the next messiah or devil, depending on your perspective. Sarah so he's trapped in his own secrecy. Dr. Neruda in a way, but he's not feeling trapped. He's simply so far removed from the social fabric and scientific communities of academia that he has, for practical purposes, burned his bridges and has no intention of ever crossing the chasm that separates himself from all that he's left behind. Sarah he must be incredibly lonely. Dr. Neruda I don't think so. He seems extremely energized and basically happy. He's doing exactly what he wants to do, I can't say I've ever seen him depressed. Maybe disappointed, but never depressed. Sarah I still don't see the connection between LERM and BST. Dr. Neruda you see, if matter ultimately dissolves into octaves of light, and light dissolves into octaves of consciousness, and consciousness dissolves into octaves of reality, then matter, light. Consciousness, and reality are all interdependent like an ecosystem. And like an ecosystem, if you change one element you affect the whole. Isolating any of the elements contained within LERM, and changing it, it can change reality. And this is a fundamental construct of BST. Does that answer your question? Sarah I'm not sure. I don't know, maybe all of this doesn't matter. Again. I'm feeling out of my territory. I find this interesting, but at the same time, it's frustrating. I even find myself feeling pissed off that all of this stuff is going on in my world and I don't know about it. Well, I mean I didn't know about it until just now. It seems like an injustice to me. It's the old haves and have-nots story. All over again. Can you appreciate how someone would feel? Hearing all of this, for the first time, and feeling so left out? Page 72. Dr. Neruda yes, I understand. Sarah to you, you can take all of this for granted. After all, you're in the know. But the rest of us, we muddle through our little lives thinking the world is this. And that, when really we're just bumping into each other in the dark. We're essentially clueless, aren't we? Dr. Neruda I don't know. Maybe. Maybe you're right, it doesn't matter. I simply know what I know and I believe what I believe. Any more than that, it's as mysterious to me as it is to you. It would be a great mistake to think that the Labyrinth Group, or any of its members, including 15 and Accordium, understands it all. They don't. But they work hard to get the answers, Sarah. I mean really hard. They've devoted their entire lives to this mission of BST. They didn't simply fall into the knowledge by accident. They tried and failed at thousands of different experiments until they found the existence of LERM, and 
they'll probably fail another thousand times before they find the solution to BST. But believe me, these individuals didn't arrive at their knowledge casually or because it was gifted to them by some higher force. Sarah no, I didn't mean it that way. I'm glad for the labyrinth group. I mean it. I'm happy that someone on this planet has figured this out, or at least is trying. It's just unfair that so few have the proof, the knowledge, the opportunity to understand all of this. Their lives are so different. They might as well be living on some other planet. They might as well be extraterrestrials. Dr. Neruda I'm only laughing because that's been a fear of 15s from the start. That if someone ever did find out about the labyrinth group and its agenda, they would be regarded as ETs. And here you are, confirming that fear. Sarah in a way, I wish you hadn't selected me. My life is so different now. This is all I can think about. It consumes me every waking minute. I have no idea how I'm going to get this story out. I have no idea. None. Dr. Naruta Sarah, do you remember the first time we talked and I mentioned the cordium? Your first question was, what do they look like? Sarah yes. And your point is? Dr. Naruta these are the natural questions that people will have. L-E-R-M-A. Interest a few scientists, but I doubt it. What's portrayed in these interviews is so superficial that I doubt any scientist would take it very seriously. And those that would, would find it to be a noble gesture to authenticate monistic idealism, and nothing more. So you see, your initial instincts should be trusted. Ask the questions that people would be interested in that appeal to their basic sense of curiosity. And don't worry about page 73 changing the world through anything I have to say. I don't need that weight on my shoulders. Sarah okay, you're right. You're absolutely right. Besides, I'm not sure about the truth of all of this. I'm still not convinced of what you say. Just for the record. Dr. Naruta and I'm still not trying to convince you or anybody else. I'm just answering your questions as truthfully as I know how. Sarah Touche. Now, for the benefit of those who read this interview eventually, what do the cordium look like? Dr. Neruda I thought you'd never ask. They stand nearly three meters high and have very elongated heads and bodies. Their skin is very fair. Almost translucent. Like you might expect from a cave dweller. Their eyes are relatively large and have various colors just like our own except the cordium have different colors to their eyes depending on their age and, in some instances, their emotional state. What's very unique about the cordium is that they have an incredibly articulate nervous system that enables them to process virtually everything that occurs within their environment, including the thoughts of another. Which means that, when you're in their presence, you need to have control of your thoughts or else you'll potentially offend them. They're very sensitive emotionally. Sarah how do they communicate with you? Dr. Neruda they speak perfect English or French, Italian, Spanish, or most any other language for that matter. They're very gifted linguists and can acquire average language skills in a matter of a few weeks and operate as masters of the language within a few months. Their minds are like sponges, but like I said before, while they possess incredible mental powers to absorb new information and synthesize it with previous information, they're not necessarily adept at creating new information totally unrelated to existing information. That's precisely what impressed them so much with 15. Sarah what's their interest in the ancient Arrow project? Dr. Neruda no different than 15's I presume. They're completely absorbed in the efforts to create BST and hope that there's some technology or theorem within the ancient arrow site that can help accelerate the development of BST. Sarah and what do the cordium want to do with BST? Page 74. Dr. Neruda the cordium have a planetary system that's in a very fragile state because its protective atmosphere is degenerating at an alarming rate. Their atmosphere protects them, just as our own, from harmful light waves that are generated from their local sun, and, to a lesser extent, 
their closest stars. Anyway, this condition has led them to become nocturnal, only venturing outside at night. And even then, only for as short a time as necessary. Over many generations, this has left them increasingly susceptible to the very condition that they're trying to solve. Their outer skins become more and more sensitive while their atmosphere becomes less protective. Their scientists predict it's only about 10 to 20 years before they'll have to stay in underground communities year-round. This has had a major impact on their standard of living, economy, social structure, every possible aspect of their society has been affected and mostly in a negative way, at least by their own measure. They hope that BST will enable them to install a technology that they've recently discovered to prevent the deterioration of their atmosphere. Sarah why can't they simply deploy this technology now? Dr. Neruda it's not a regenerative technology, it's a preventative technology. Regenerative technologies are impossible once a system reaches a certain retrograde trajectory. In their scenario, only BST would restore their environment. Sarah obviously they have space travel technology, why don't they pick out another planet and colonize it? Dr. Neruda they have tried, but every planet they've found that's suitable for their species is occupied. And they're not interested in being assimilated into an existing culture or society. They want their own identity and social structure. Also, what they deem suitable for habitation is extremely particular. For example, they have the same problem with Earth as they have with their own planet in. Fact, it's worse here. They have to live in our underground base in order to survive on our planet. It required that we build a special way station for their spacecraft. Sarah, do they want to interact with our governments and our people? Dr. Neruda, initially I think they did. And in fact they tried. But they were quickly escorted to the ACIO and we convinced the NSA and all other interested parties that the Cordium had left Earth fearful of their lives. So as far as our operatives within the NSA are concerned, the Cordium are long gone, and fortunately the NSA at the time were quite preoccupied with other ET issues. Anyway, namely the Greys. Sarah I want to return to the Wing Makers for a moment. What do the Cordium Think of the Wing Maker's site, I assume they've seen everything? Page 75 Dr. Neruda yes, they've been involved from the beginning. The Cordium are as integral to the Labyrinth group as any of its human members, so nothing is hidden from them. The leader of the Cordium mission to Earth is called in English Mahanai, and he happens to be an artist first and foremost, an A. Scientist is his secondary nature. He was always excited to see and hear about our findings. He asked if we could create a way station to the ancient Aero site so he could visit the site himself, but it just wasn't practical to do so without drawing attention to the site. Sarah I have a few oddball questions, so bear with me. First, every time you mention a member of the ACIO, Labyrinth Group, or Accordium, it's always a male reference. Are there any women in any of these organizations? And second, why would an artist be the leader of a space mission of the Cordium? That seems very strange to me. Dr. Neruda, in answer to your first question, it's true that the Labyrinth group is mostly male. I'm not aware of this being by design, but rather by accident. One of the directors is a woman, she's in charge of communications, and, as a Director has a level 14 clearance. We also have 9 females who are in the 12 or 13 clearance categories, all of them are extremely bright and capable and share responsibility with their male counterparts without any form of discrimination. At least that I've ever been aware of. We even have one married couple. Each person regardless of sex is paid the identical sum of money and has all the same privileges. There's no distinction whatsoever within the ranks of the Labyrinth group, and that's at 15's insistence. As for the Cordium, they're all males. Their culture is much more role-defined than our own. And it's not to say that the females are treated as the lesser sex. No. In fact it may be quite the opposite, 
it's just that space travel and interaction with other species is left to the male sex until species interaction procedures are brought into play. That's so their children can retain access to their mothers and their families can remain more intact. Most, if not all, of the members of the Cordium contingent are married. As for your second question, the Cordium look at science, religion, and art as three equal members of a unified belief system that defines their social order. As I understand it, leadership varies between each of these three elements of their social order, depending on the contact that is made with an alien race. When they first made contact with humans it was decided that the leadership should come from the ranks of the artistic side because they felt we were more of an equal in this domain and thus the leader could more appropriately understand our motivations and desires. Sarah that's interesting. They actually thought we were more artistic than scientific or spiritual. I guess now that I think about it, I can understand that. As a race, we probably are more inclined in that way than the others. Dr. Neruda that was their assessment anyway. Page 76. Sarah I'd like to go back to the artifacts for a minute. The artifacts that are technology based, where are they right now? Dr. Neruda after the initial discovery of the ancient Aero site, all of the physical artifacts that could be removed from the site were carefully packed in shipping crates and shipped to the ACIO Research Lab in Southern California, and are held by the Labyrinth Group in its own laboratory. That's where they still are. To the best of my knowledge, Sarah and only the homing device found outside the site and the optical disc have been, to some extent, understood. Dr. Neruda that's correct. Sarah so we really don't know whether BST is possible, do we? Dr. Neruda we know it's possible, but it's like anything that is extremely complicated and interdependent, one needs a fine grain understanding of the total environment that encompasses the problem before they can modify or change the environment to solve the problem and this requires an understanding of LERM that is still evolving within the labyrinth group and I dare say may yet require years of experimentation before its understanding is sufficient to identify intervention points and time splice in such a way to minimize undesirable effects Sarah so we're back to the shadow of God discussion or LERM as you affectionately call it. Why is the understanding of LERM so fundamental to achieving BST? Dr. Neruda because LERM is the equivalent of genetics for consciousness, and consciousness is the equivalent of reality formulation for sentient beings. So if LERM is understood, one understands the causal system that operates in non- time and non-space, which fundamentally constructs the reality framework of space, time, energy, and matter. Quantum objects operating in the construct of LERM have an existence that is entirely different from macro objects like this table or chair. Quantum objects in their true state have never been seen by a human. Scientists have witnessed the effects and some of the properties of quantum objects but their causal nature is not visible through scientific instruments. No matter how powerful they are, because scientific instruments are physical and therefore have a relationship to space and time. Whereas quantum objects have no relationship to time and space other than through an observer. Page 77. Sarah so you're saying that the building blocks of matter, these quantum objects, have no existence unless someone is observing them. The consciousness makes them appear real and fixed in time and space? Is that what you're saying? Dr. Neruda in a way, but not exactly. Let me try and explain it like this. Consciousness stems or originates from non-time and non-space as a form of energy that is a basic building block of LERM. Consciousness becomes localized as it becomes physical. In other words, consciousness becomes human, or animal, or plant or some object that has physical characteristics. Are you with me? So far? Sarah yes. Dr. Neruda good. As consciousness becomes a localized physical object, it essentially orchestrates LERM to conform to a reality matrix that has been 
encoded into the genetic or physical properties of the object it has become. In other words, consciousness moves from non-space and non-time to become matter, and then it orchestrates LERM to produce a physical reality consistent to the encoded genetic properties of the physical object it has become. If that object is a human being, then the genetic triggers that are uniquely human become the tools of consciousness from which it constructs its reality. LERM is essentially an infinite field of possibilities or, as Aristotle referred to it, potentia. This potentia is like fertile soil from which physical objects are created. Those who can orchestrate LERM through the application of their consciousness are able to manifest reality and not simply react to it. This manifestation can be instantaneous because again, quantum objects originate in non-time and non-space. Sarah not to get overly religious here, but what you're really talking about is what Jesus or other prophets have done. Essentially manifest things like turning water to wine or curing the sick. Right? Dr. Neruda yes. It's the same principle only I described it instead of performed it. It's much easier to perform than describe. Sarah so now you're going to tell me you can turn water into wine? Dr. Neruda actually I've never tried that before, but yes, all of the members of the labyrinth group can manifest physical objects from out of LERM. This was actually one of the outcomes of 15's discovery. The process of orchestrating LERM and manifesting physical objects on demand. Sarah okay, now you've definitely got my interest, but I'm feeling a little guilty. Because I swore I was going to stay on the subject of the wing makers and the ancient arrow project. So tell me, can you teach me how to manifest things out of thin air? Page 78. Dr. Neruda yes, but it would take some time. Probably a few weeks or so. Sarah can you show me some examples of how you do it? Dr. Neruda how is this? Sarah for purposes of those reading these transcripts. Dr. Neruda just made a ball of twine appear out of nowhere. He just made it disappear as well. Now it has reappeared again. This is incredible. He's not holding it, so it's not like a magician who's making this appear from his sleeve or from behind his hands. Somehow, it's quite literally appearing and disappearing on a table about three feet in front of him, which is about six feet away from me. I can see it all very clearly. I'm picking up the ball of string and it's definitely a physical object. Not simply a mirage or a hologram. It has all the normal properties. Weight texture. It's slightly warm to the touch, but in every other respect, it's exactly how I'd expect a ball of twine to feel. Can you make something else appear something more complicated, like a million dollars in cash? Dr. Neruda yes. Sarah okay. Let's see it. Dr. Neruda you see this is the problem with these discoveries and capabilities. If I produced a million dollars in cash right now, you'd have a dilemma. What to do with a million dollars? Could you bear to see me make it disappear as easily as I make it appear? Sarah are you crazy? Since the first moment I met you, I've never believed in what you've said until now. And I'm not even saying I totally believe you even. Now, but I'm a hell of a lot closer. I know, people in general, need to see things. With our eyes. We need to believe in what our eyes tell us because they have all. The senses seem to have a fix on reality. And you've finally shown me. Something that is tangible. That my eyes relate to. I'm just asking for one more. Confirmation of your abilities. I mean, a ball of string doesn't seem like such a. Huge deal. Not that I'm not impressed. But if you could produce a million dollars. In cash. Now that's a huge deal. Dr. Neruda and the dilemma? Sarah okay, I have a proposition for you. I'm going to need to quit my job for. At least a few months to get this story out to the public and maybe even relocate. Or move page 79. Underground somewhat. What if I kept just $10,000 to help me? Through the next two months. Could that work for you? Dr. Neruda yes, I could do that. 
Sarah I'm now looking at a loose pile of $100 bills that appear to be perfect replicas. I'm touching them. Again they feel slightly warm to the touch. But these would definitely pass as the real thing. Wow. I can't believe it. But this can't be a million dollars. You only manifested 10,000 didn't you? Dr. Naruta yes, give or take a few hundred dollars. Sarah you do realize that you just undermined your own credibility to those who will read this transcript. You just made yourself unbelievable. I'm not even sure I should include this because no one will believe it anyway, and it may instead hurt your credibility in all the other areas of our discussion. This is truly not a believable experience unless you see it with your own eyes. Which should I do? Dr. Naruta Sarah, whether anyone believes me isn't important. No one believes anything anyway unless they experience it, and even then, most people fall back into doubt. Belief is short-lived and always questioned, as it should be. Even the most devoted believer is in doubt most of the time, regardless of what they say. So don't worry about whether this impairs my credibility or not. I don't care. It doesn't matter because I'm not trying to convince anyone of anything. I'm only trying to get information about the wing makers to people who can make their own determination of what is true and believable. Sarah okay. So much for my concern. It'll be the last time I worry about your credibility. If you can manifest money like this so easily, why do you need to get paid? I mean who needs money from work? Dr. Naruto when this technology was discovered, it was only shared within the labyrinth group, and it was only used for experiments approved by 15. The same principle would apply to BST or any other technology discovered by the labyrinth group that could be used for personal gain or benefit. Sarah Mann, you must be a very disciplined group. I don't think I could resist. Dr. Naruta the truth is, I'm sure all the members of the labyrinth group have, from time to time, experimented with this technology in the privacy of their own homes. Page 80. Sarah why do you refer to it as a technology? It seems to me that it's a mental thing. You weren't using anything other than your mind were you? Dr. Naruta it's a technology only from the standpoint of understanding the mental process. There's nothing electronic or mechanical if that's what you mean. But it's more than mind control. It's really a belief in LERM and it's an erringly perfect processes of creation moving quantum objects from non-space and non-time to the world of matter in our time and space. It's more closely related to faith than technology. As odd as that may sound. Sarah actually, I was figuring that if Jesus and others who've walked the earth could do these things thousands of years ago, it must not have much to do with technology. But when you see it happen with your own eyes, you have a tendency to think there's some technology behind the scenes that's doing it. That it couldn't just be a natural power of humans. That doesn't seem possible to me. For some reason. Dr. Naruda I understand, but nonetheless, it's really a matter of perspective. And once you have the perspective on LERM and it becomes a fundamental construct of your belief system, it becomes amazingly easy to do this. It's a little like a sophisticated optical illusion based on a hologram that takes you several months of concentrating to see the picture that is subtly embedded, but the moment you see it, you can instantly see it the rest of your life without effort. That's how this operates. Some people can pick it up in a matter of a few days. Others require hundreds of hours, but what everyone has in common is that once you get it, it becomes as natural as breathing. Sarah and you think you could teach me in a matter of a few weeks, when it took some of your colleagues with genius IQs, I might add hundreds of hours to learn the technique. Dr. Naruta it's not related to IQ. It's related to understanding and belief. The understanding comes from seeing the existence of LERM and understanding how it operates at its fundamental level. Whether you have an average intelligence or are a genius, it doesn't matter, so long as you understand and believe what you understand. Sarah so how do you get me to believe in LERM? 
Dr. Naruta you already do deep inside you. It's your conscious mind that rejects your deeper belief in understanding. So I would help you to consciously understand what you already know at a deeper level of your being. And I would do this by showing you LERM. Sarah and how would you do that? Dr. Naruta you would need to come to the Labyrinth Group's research facility. In page 81. Southern California. It's the only place in the world where I can show you the indisputable evidence of LERM. Sarah under the circumstances, that doesn't seem like a scenario that will ever happen. There must be another alternative or said another way, what is it that I'd see at this research center that I couldn't get somewhere else or through some other means? Dr. Neruda I'm not saying that the only way to acquire this ability is by seeing LERM in action, but it is very convincing. The Labyrinth Group has a technology designed by 15 himself that quite literally enables an individual to experience LERM. There are also the mystical or shamanic means. But these are far less likely to occur in a two-week period of time. These methods seem independent of circumstance and more dependent on some deeper, predestined or pre-encoded awakening that the individual is not aware of consciously. In some instances, this awakening includes an ability to manifest physical objects, but generally, it's done without a conscious knowledge of how it's done. It just works. Sarah okay, so let's assume I'm not cut out to be a mystic or shaman, what would I see with this technology that would convince me of my abilities to do what you just did? Dr. Neruda I can't really tell you. It's one of those experiences that words are wholly inadequate to describe or explain. About all I can tell you is that LERM is experienced through this technology, and it essentially, as a result of the experience, rewires your internal electrical system. In this process, new circuits are cut in your nervous system, and these new circuits enable you to utilize LERM as an outgrowth of your experience of it. I doubt this explanation does you any good whatsoever. I've never tried to explain it before, and I can see by the look on your face that I failed miserably. Sarah no, it's not that. I'm just tired of always feeling like I've lived on a different planet all my life. That I've missed out on all of this. It's really distressing to me when I think about it. I remember reading a biography about Einstein, and he was quoted saying, something like we humans only use about 2% of our intellectual capability. Well, that's about how I feel right now. That I've lived my life at about the 2% level of that and I'm just beginning to see what he meant. I never had a comparison before now that let me see what the other 98% might be like. It's not altogether pleasant to see what's been left out or overlooked or undervalued. Dr. Neruda I understand. Page 82. Sarah on to something else. You said earlier that certain technologies like LERM and BST weren't allowed to be used for personal gain by members of the Labyrinth Group. Yet, if BST did exist, wouldn't everyone line up and ask to use it? I know I would. There are a lot of events in my life I'd change if I could. Once the cat's out of the bag, how could BST ever be kept under wraps? Dr. Naruta like everything, there are implications and moral and ethical considerations that have to be weighed. One of the things that 15 and more generally the Labyrinth Group is good at is to consider these implications in the broader scope of the social order. 15, from an early age, always felt that the technologies of BST and LERM would only be granted to those organizations that would properly honor the ethical considerations that were required by the technology itself. This is one of the fundamental charters of the Labyrinth Group, and all of its members take it very seriously. As a new technology is being developed, there are always members of the team who are concerned with the ethical implications of the technology and are responsible for usage guidelines and deployment rules. This is an integral part of any project's development. Sarah that's good to hear, but couldn't such a charter also be used to prevent the spread of these technologies to a broader audience? Dr. Neruda unquestionably 
a technology like BST once developed and tested could, in time, become a consumer technology. But as long as the Labyrinth Group exists, it would protect BST from any and all outside forces. Within the Labyrinth Group there is a committee called the Technology Transfer Program or TTP Committee. This committee has two missions, one, to assess the incoming technologies that are assimilated from ETs, and two, there responsible for which technologies and in what state of dilution they're transferred to our private industry partners, NSA, or the military. The TTP committee is in control of the pure state technologies that are developed by the Labyrinth Group. These pure state technologies are virtually never transferred to outside organizations. Even those staff members in the ACIO who are not part of the Labyrinth Group are unaware of these pure state technologies, and when Sarah but if I place these interview transcripts on the internet or some media publication picks up this story, more than just the ACIO staff members are going to know about this stuff. Isn't this going to screw up the Labyrinth Group's cloak of secrecy? Dr. Narud Dano. The Labyrinth Group is more than a secret organization. For all practical purposes, it doesn't exist. The ACIO doesn't exist. No one will be able to trace the ACIO let alone the Labyrinth Group. Their security technologies are so vastly page 83. Superior they are completely invulnerable in this regard. Nothing I say, or you publish, will make them more vulnerable. As I said before, their only concern will be the precedent of my defection and how it could create more defections over time. Sarah why, why would anyone want to leave? I mean I understand your case. You didn't want your memories changed or removed. But they don't commonly do that do they? Dr. Narud do not often, but I'm certainly not the first to be targeted to undergo memory implant sessions or other forms of invasive security measures. There. All part of the culture of the Labyrinth Group and the ACIO. Everyone who enters either of those worlds understands what they must subject themselves to. It's very clear why the paranoia must be part of the culture. But over time, certain individuals find it suffocating. And these individuals are the ones who are most at risk to see my defection as a reason for their own. I may be entirely wrong about this, but I believe there are 10 to 20 individuals who would leave the ACIO or even the Labyrinth Group if they were given the choice without repercussions. Sarah but I thought you said last night that these people were in love with their jobs because of the special access to technologies and research labs that were so advanced to anything else available. If that's the case, what would they do in normal society? Dr. Neruda I'll find out. I'll be the first to experience normal society as a normal person. Sarah well, at least you won't have any problem getting a job. What am I? saying, you won't even need to work. I forgot, you can make your own money. Out of thin air. Dr. Naruta you'd be surprised to know that I live a pretty simple life. I own a 92 Honda Accord and live in a modest three-bedroom home in a suburban neighborhood of modest homes. Sarah you're kidding? Dr. Naruta no. Sarah you make $400,000 a year tax-free and, and have a money tree in your mind. And you live like I do? If you don't mind my asking, what do you do with all your money? Dr. Naruda I have blind trusts. Sarah are all the Labyrinth Group members like you? Page 84. Dr. Naruda you mean in regard to money and possessions? Sarah yes. Dr. Naruda must live at a higher standard of living than I do, but it is part of our culture to live modestly and none of the members live a pretentious lifestyle. 15 pays people what they're worth, not because he wants them to throw money around and live flamboyantly. He's a big believer in this, and he himself, even more than I, lives humbly. Sarah I find this really hard to believe. I think of just about everything you've told me so far, this is one of the hardest things to believe. I'm totally baffled. Here. Dr. Naruda I can appreciate that, but what I'm telling you is the truth. Initially, 
the way new people are recruited to join the ACIO is largely because of the monetary incentives. These are extremely bright and capable people and could easily secure positions in academia or private industry making two hundred thousand dollars per year and more. The ACIO lures them by at least doubling their salary and offering them lifetime employment contracts. But those who ultimately earn the right to enter the 12th level are then inducted into the labyrinth group, and by the time an individual has risen to this status, money has become increasingly unimportant particularly after the Cordium Intelligence Accelerator Experience. After the LERM experience, it's diminished even more. You'd probably find it interesting that 15 lives in a small, three-bedroom home in a regular community where the average property value is about $250,000. That's not much of a house by West Coast standards. His automobile must have at least 100,000 miles on it, no air conditioning, and he's perfectly content with his situation. New ACIO recruits are always amazed at 15's thrift. I think bewildered is a better way of putting it. But over time, they learn to respect him not as an eccentric, but as an extremely dedicated genius who simply likes to live like other people and blend in. Sarah OK. I've got to get personal here, and I know I've totally betrayed my agenda, but you've got to tell me a few things about. Well like, what do your neighbors think you do? Dr. Neruda I don't know my neighbors very well. I've worked 70 hours per week since I was 18 years old. When I socialize, it's generally with my colleagues. There's very little time for establishing other relationships. But to answer your question directly, I don't know for sure what they think I do. I've only told them I'm a research scientist for the government. For most people that settles their curiosity. Page 85. Sarah but what if you met a woman and fell in love? She'd want to know what you did and how much money you made and so forth. What would you tell her? Dr. Neruda I work for a government weather research center. I'm a research scientist in applied chaos theory and I make $85,000 per year. Sarah so you'd lie? Dr. Neruda it's part of the culture of the labyrinth group. We can't tell the truth, and if we did, the vast majority of people would think we were crazy. It's also why we keep to our own. We can tell the truth among ourselves. Sarah when I first heard about the ACIO and its secret mission, and that you were defecting and afraid for your life, I thought the ACIO was an evil-minded, control-the-world type of organization. Then I heard about the kind of money you all made and I pictured a bunch of intellectual snobs driving bulletproof. Mercedes Benz isn't living in posh mansions and you just dismantled my image. You completely destroyed it. So why are you so afraid? Dr. Neruda the Labyrinth Group, because of its connection to the ACIO, is still very much connected to the secret network of organizations who control a great deal of the world's monetary and natural resource assets. This network of organizations will know about my defection the instant these materials I've given you gain any visibility in the press or on the internet. They will know of its authenticity by simply reading these two interviews. While there's nothing they can do to the ACIO or the Labyrinth Group, they can make my life difficult to live. And they will most definitely try. I know all about their technologies and how they deploy them. I know the people behind these organizations and I know how they operate. I have knowledge that I've only shown you a small fraction of. And this knowledge would make certain individuals very powerful. Individuals very uncomfortable. It's extremely rare, but when high level. Operatives defect, they're hunted like dogs until they're found and disposed of. Or, if they serve an ongoing purpose, their memories are selectively wiped clean. It's one of the unfortunate realities of having dealt with these organizations. Sarah but you were just a scientist. A linguist, for God's sake. How does that make you a threat to these secret organizations? Dr. Neruda I was the one that created the underlying encryption technology for their security system that overlays their predictive modeling software for the 
world stock exchanges. I may be a simple scientist in your eyes, but my talents for linguistics is not the only talent I possess. I'm also gifted in the field of encryption. And within the world of economics, I'm simply the best. And this talent was given to certain page 86 organizations to help them, and in the process of doing so, I learned about these organizations and how they operate. It makes me a security risk. Sarah Why? I mean if the ACIO and Labyrinth Group have so much money. Why work with these evil groups? Dr. Naruta first of all, they're not evil. These organizations consist of well, educated elitists who are self-absorbed perhaps, but not evil. They look at the world as a biological experience where the strong survive, the powerful thrive and the secret of control. They like being in control of the experience. They are the ultimate control freaks, but not for the sake of adoration or ego gratification, but for the sake that they genuinely believe they're the best at making policy. Decisions that affect the world's economy and security don't confuse control with evil intent. It's not necessarily one and the same thing. That's the game they choose to play. The fact that they make incredible Sums of money is simply part of the game, but it's not the reason they sit in the driver's seat of the world's economy. They simply want to protect their life's agenda like anyone else would. It's just that they're in the position to actually do it. They get their security from being at the top of the economic food chain. Sarah but they're manipulating people and keeping information from them. If this isn't evil, what is? Dr. Naruta by your definition, our national government, our local government. Virtually every business and organization is evil. Everyone manipulates and keeps information hidden. Governments, organizations, and individuals. Sarah you're twisting my words. It's a matter of degree isn't it? I mean, it's one thing if I don't tell you my true hair color, and it's another thing if, as part of this secret network, I withhold information about how I'm manipulating the world. Economy. They're entirely different in scale. You can compare them. I still think. It's evil when organizations manipulate and control things for their own gain. Dr. Naruta believe me, I didn't set out to be the defender of these. Organizations, but you need to understand this because it's important and it may. Affect you in the days ahead. This secret network of powerful organizations are more aligned with the goals of the Labyrinth Group than our world's governments, and, in particular, our military leaders. If you're worried about anything, you would be well advised to worry more about the administration, Congress, and the Department of Defense. Not only in the United States, but in every country. Sarah how can you say that? Are you saying that our government and military Leaders are trying to cause us harm in these secret, manipulative organizations. Are trying to help us? Page 87. Dr. Neruda I'm saying that the leadership in the world's community of nations is inept and can be bought with the holy dollar. And that it's not the secret network that I've been talking about who's manipulating our government and military leadership to invest huge amounts of money in destructive forces like nuclear and biological weapons. This, they're deciding on their own. The secret organizations that I'm pointing the finger at are opposed to these military buildups because they interject a degree of uncertainty in their models for controlling economic and social order. The politicians and military leaders are the ones who are investing time, energy, and money in weapons of mass destruction, and these, if there is such a thing as evil, are it. Sarah OK. I see your point. But you implied that these secret organizations would try to kill us if we published and distributed all of this? I still don't see how that makes them so noble. Dr. Neruda I don't think you have to be concerned about these secret organizations. You don't know enough to be dangerous to them. Besides, they're used to journalists snooping around and trying to expose them. None have succeeded in any meaningful way. Dozens of books have been written about them. So they're not going to bother you. Their interest will be in me and me alone. 
It's one of the reasons why I'm careful in what I tell you. I know they'll read these transcripts, as will the NSA, CIA, OSIO, and the entire labyrinth group. I'm allowing you to record these conversations because I know who will hear these exact words, and I want them to know precisely what I have shared with you, and through you, to others. I'm not making a value judgment as to whether these secret organizations are noble or not. I'm merely pointing out that they're not the ones wasting huge sums of money and intellectual capital and weapons of mass destruction. They're significantly more competent to rule than our politicians and military leaders are. And this is simply my opinion. Sarah I still don't get it. If the Labyrinth Group, the ACIO and this secret network of organizations are also noble and benevolent, why are you afraid for your life? And why are they hiding from the public like cockroaches? Dr. Naruta to answer your first question, I fear for my life because I know information that could cause irreparable harm to a variety of secret organizations. Though I have no intention to do so. Sarah but simply because you know these things they'll hunt you down and kill you? Sounds like a nice group to me. Certainly not evil. Page 88. Dr. Naruta remember. They're control freaks. They don't like having anyone loose who could cause them potential harm. If I wanted to, I could bring them down. I know that much about their computer algorithms and encryption technologies. Sarah but how would you get access to their system? It would seem to me that you'd be placing yourself in great jeopardy if you tried to get into their system. Dr. Naruda I don't need to get into their system to cause them harm. I need to get into their system to prevent harm. They will invite me into their system. Sarah I don't understand. Dr. Naruda when I developed the system initially, there were certain time delayed algorithms that were scripted to occur at specific times, and if they were not maintained accordingly, the program would essentially self-destruct. Something that these organizations cannot afford to happen. Sarah why did they agree to this? Dr. Naruda it's part of the fee that the Labyrinth Group extracts from its clients. More importantly, it ensures that our technologies even in their diluted states are operated according to our agreement and not misused. I have the access codes for this system and the maintenance key that will prevent it from crashing. I've made certain that I'm the only one who has this knowledge. Sarah you're telling me that with all those photographic memories running around at the Labyrinth Group, that you're the only one who knows the code? Dr. Naruda I didn't exactly report the right number when I did my last update of their system. So, yes, I'm the only one who knows the correct code. I design it that way to ensure my safety. Sarah but with all the geniuses in the Labyrinth group, you're telling me that they could solve this problem themselves? Dr. Naruda not without a significant amount of time. Which is something 15 won't agree to do. It's too wasteful and a major distraction to BST. Research. Sarah do they already know about this? Dr. Naruda oh, yes. I informed them shortly after I defected. Sarah they must have been pissed. Dr. Naruda it wasn't a pleasant conversation to put it mildly. Page 89. Sarah I was thinking about all of this sophisticated technology that the Labyrinth Group has, but I don't understand something. How do you manufacture it? I assume Intel isn't doing the manufacturing. Right? Dr. Naruda correct. There's no one on this planet that can manufacture these technologies. They're all based upon the Cordium technology, which is about 150 generations ahead of our best computer technologies here on Earth. For example, the LERM project used only one domestic technology in the total array of about 200 different technologies, and it was a relatively insignificant part of the project. Sarah what was it? Dr. Naruda it's a derivative of a laser telemetry technology that the ACIO developed about 20 years ago, but it filled the specific needs of the LERM project because it was based on analog protocols, which were required for the application in that specific part of the experiment. Sarah so the Cordium performs all the manufacturing of what the Labyrinth group designs. 
What if the courtium decide, for whatever reason, not to share? These technologies all of a sudden? Wouldn't the labyrinth group cease to exist? Dr. Naruta perhaps. But 15 is shrewd and these put certain contingencies in place to help ensure nothing like that would ever happen. Bear in mind that the courtium are at least as motivated as we are to develop this technology, perhaps more. They have tremendous respect for 15 as well as the other human contingent of the labyrinth group. However, when the labyrinth group was first formed, 15 negotiated with the courtium to share all source code for the projects that came out of BST research. All base technologies were replicated in two separate research labs. There's complete redundancy right down to the power supplies. Sarah won't the leaders of these secret organizations try to pressure 15 to find you with their remote viewing technology, can't they find you easily? Dr. Naruta the leaders of these secret organizations well know they have no leverage with 15. After they read this information, they will know they have even less leverage. 15 and the labyrinth group designed and developed all of their security systems. Every last one. They knew they had to be indebted to the labyrinth group for certain technologies that made them, speaking metaphorically, invisible. 15 cannot be pressured. In fact, it's just the opposite. 15 can pressure them, though he never would. To 15, these organizations simply represent the best alternative to letting our own governments take control of the economic engines and social order of the world. Infrastructure. Hence, he sympathizes with them and tries to help them to the extent he can afford the time and energy. Page 90. Sarah so how will you hide from them? Dr. Naruta as I told you before, I began to systematically disentangle myself from the ACIO's invasive security precautions, which include electronic sensors implanted underneath the skin and the back of the neck. I effectively stripped myself of these devices so I'd have a chance of remaining underground until a reasonable solution could be negotiated. Sarah but you said they had RV technology that can locate you. What about this? Dr. Naruta there's little doubt that they will try this, but it's not an exact science. An RV could see this room, but not have a clue as to how to find it. They might be able to key in on a particular object like that clock, for example but unless it was the only clock of its kind and they could trace its location, it wouldn't help them. Sarah is there anything I should be worried about, then? Dr. Naruda I think we need to move around a bit, and vary our meeting time and place. We should conduct the next interview in a new environment perhaps. Outdoors. Something generic without landmarks. Sarah so they can read my street sign and then look at my house's address I mean if they were doing an RV session right now? Dr. Naruta they would try, and it's possible they'd be successful, but not likely. Sarah I suddenly got very nervous. You're not making me feel comfortable with this. Dr. Naruta I can only be honest. Sarah what would they do with me and my daughter if they found us? Dr. Naruta I think you could assume that they'd perform an MRP of the entire experience of meeting me. Sarah they wouldn't kill us? Dr. Naruda I don't think so. 15 doesn't resort to violence unless it's absolutely necessary. Sarah shit. I wish I knew about this before I agreed to get my daughter and me involved. Just tell me one thing. Do you know when they're doing an RV session? I mean, can you feel it or anything? Page 91. Dr. Naruda I can sense it but it's not something that's absolute. Sarah is. There any defense against it? Dr. Naruda none. Sarah so all we do is hope that their damn RV is incompetent? Dr. Naruda I'll only stay for short periods of time, and it'll be late at night when. They're far less likely to perform an RV session. It'd be a good practice to vary. Our meeting place, as I suggested before. Other than that, I don't know what. More we can do. Sarah I assume there's nothing the police or FBI could do to help? Doctor. Naruda nothing that I'm interested in. Sarah but what will you do to protect yourself? Doctor Naruda as you can imagine, Sarah, 
there's certain information I can share with you given the nature of these interviews. This is one instance I can't tell you more than I already have. Sarah I'm feeling the need to bring this session to an end. My mind is quite literally filled to the brim. I think if you told me anything profound right now, it'd just go in one ear and out the other. Can we meet again on Tuesday and perhaps pick up where we left off tonight? Dr. Naruta yes, that's fine with my schedule. Sarah okay. Signing off for tonight. End of session page 92 TWOM slash KW The third interview of Dr. Jamison Naruta by Sarah What follows is a session I recorded of Dr. Naruta on December 30, 1997. He gave permission for me to record his answers to my questions. This is a transcript of that session. This was one of five times I was able to tape record our conversations. I have preserved these transcripts precisely as they occurred. No editing was performed, and I have tried my best to include the exact words, phrasing, and grammar used by Dr. Neruda. It's recommended that you read the December 27th and December 28th, 1997 interviews before reading this one. Sarah Good evening, Dr. Neruda. Are you ready? Dr. Neruda Yes, I'm ready when you are. Sarah One of the things that I find hard to embrace about this whole affair is that the concept of time travel always seemed like a fairly easy technology to develop. I know I've gotten that impression from Star Trek and various other movies and television, but still, what you've described seems like it's so difficult to develop that we'll never succeed. Is it really that hard to develop? Dr. Neruda The way time travel is presented in the movies trivializes the complexities of this technology, and interactive time travel or BST, as defined by 15, is the most sophisticated of all technologies. It's the apex technology from which virtually all other technologies can be derived. So, in creating BST, one is creating a shortcut or an accelerated pathway into the acquisition of virtually all other technologies. This is why BST is so difficult to develop. Science fiction violates most of the scientific premises that are related to our understanding of time travel. And BST in particular is an extremely sophisticated application of scientific principles that are simply not stated in science fiction. Mostly because people like the effects and plot lines of time travel, more than they have an appetite for understanding the science behind it. So writers, especially for television and movies, trivialize the degree of complexity that surrounds this apex technology. Sarah but you didn't really answer my question, will we succeed in developing it? Dr. Neruda there's little doubt in my mind that the Labyrinth Group will succeed in developing BST. The question is whether it's in humanity's best interest in the long term. They were weeks from beginning their initial tests for broad-scale testing just before I defected. There was widespread anticipation at the director level that BST was a matter of four to six months away from a successful test. Page 93. Sarah saw what's the biggest obstacle to success? Dr. Neruda simply stated, it's whether the Labyrinth Group has the ability to define and access intervention points as prescribed by 15 that have the least impact on related events in horizontal time. It's the most subtle, yet most important component to this whole chain of technologies. Sarah can you explain this in lay terms? Dr. Neruda it's an extremely difficult technology to develop defining the optimal intervention point, accessing the intervention point, and returning from the intervention point without detection. This is all about splicing time at the causal level with a minimum of disruption. It's the equivalent challenge of throwing a boulder into a pond without any ripples. Sarah why all the concern about minimizing disruption? I mean, in the case of the animus, aren't they trying to completely annihilate humankind? Why should we care so much about disrupting their way of life? Dr. Neruda first of all, the animus are not coming to annihilate humankind. They're coming to control the genetic library known as Earth. Their intention is not completely understood, but it's not to kill our animal populations or the human species. 
it has more to do with genetic engineering and how their species can be modified to enable it to house a spiritual consciousness. They want unfettered access to our DNA in order to conduct experiments. Beyond this, they want to colonize Earth, but for what ultimate purpose we don't know. To your question, the concern about minimizing impacts from BST intervention has to do as much with selfish interests as altruistic ones. When events are altered or changed, they can have unintended and very unpredictable consequences. For example, we could successfully divert the animus from our galaxy, but in the process, unintentionally send them to another planet. This act would have consequences to our planet that we could never predict. Sarah are you talking about karma? Dr. Naruda no. It has to do with physics and the inherent nature of complex systems. Causal energy is eternal. It simply bounces from event to event. In some cases, it shapes the event. In others, it creates the event. Causal energy is the most potent force in the universe, and when it's redirected on a global scale it will rebound in unpredictable and innumerable ways. Sarah So, this is the flaw of BST, not knowing the consequences of changing events. Are you suggesting that we could succeed in diverting the animus from our page 94 planet, and then some years later fall victim to some other form of catastrophe that wipes out our planet? Dr. Naruda no, it doesn't happen quite like that. The energy system that was redirected would simply rebound to the point from whence it was redirected. How it would rebound is so complex that it would be impossible to predict the nature of its reaction. I suppose it could invite a cataclysm of some kind, but it's not to say humanity would be punished, if that's what you're trying to imply. Sarah I guess that's what I was implying. But isn't it true that karma exists? And if we turned the animus onto another planet viaduct BST, we'd be setting ourselves up for a negative reaction? Dr. Naruda no. It means we'd receive a reaction, and the nature of the reaction may be so unrelated to the causal energy redirect that no one would know it was a reaction. This is the nature of causal energy it rebounds of its own force and intelligence. It's not a simple reaction to an action. Sarah I thought karma, and even physics, held that for every action there's an equal and opposite reaction. What happened to this principle? Dr. Naruda it's alive and well. It just doesn't apply to causal energy systems. Or the dimension of vertical time. Sarah okay, I'm going to avoid another discussion of physics in favor of finding out why you think BST will succeed given our discussion of the past few minutes. Dr. Naruda it's one of the main reasons I defected. Sarah how do you mean that? Dr. Naruda this issue of uncertainty regarding causal energy systems has always been the breaking point of BST at least theoretically. 15 believes he knows how to manage this. I'm not so certain it can be managed, particularly after my exposure to the wing makers and gaining a bit of understanding into their solution in dealing with the animus. Sarah I know you've talked a little bit about this already, but refresh my memory. What is their solution? Dr. Naruda I have only a few pieces to go by, so I'm not going to be able to talk definitively about this. Sarah and what's the nature of these sources? Page 95. Dr. Naruda there was an RV session that elicited some insight. I read more about it in the introduction of the text from the optical disc Sarah this being the text that literally disappeared? Dr. Naruda yes, but I've stored the entire text in my memory. Sarah anything else? Dr. Naruda I had a direct communication with what I believe was a representative of the wing makers. Sarah how? When? Dr. Naruda it's a complicated story, but Samantha, the RV assigned to our project, was having increasingly strong connections to the wing makers. Unfortunately, they were so strong that 15 had little choice but to subject her to an MRP. I met with her just prior to the procedure, and she suddenly began channeling a presence to me that I believe was from the central race. Sarah and from these three sources you have a pretty good idea as to how the 
left-wing makers plan to protect their genetic library? Dr. Neruda correct. Sarah and what did this channeled entity say? Dr. Neruda its primary emphasis was that our technology would fail us. Sarah and by technology, it meant BST? Dr. Neruda that was my interpretation. Sarah so you trust this Samantha? Dr. Neruda I have no doubts about her whatsoever. She was simply our best. RV, and quite possibly the best natural intuitive we ever had within the ACIO. Sarah let's go back to something you implied a minute ago. Did I understand? You write that you defected from the ACIO because of a disagreement you had. With 15 about BST and the wing maker's solution of defense? Dr. Neruda yes, it was a primary factor. Sarah can you elaborate on this a bit? Page 96. Dr. Neruda 15 believed that Samantha our RV could jeopardize our mission because of her ability to make contact with the wing makers. Into of the three RV sessions she performed, they detected her presence, and they had begun to probe her. 15 once he had confirmation that these beings were, in all probability, from the central race became quite alarmed and put a stop to any further RV sessions. When I asked him why, he seemed to have some apprehension about their ability to sense our work on BST, and feared that they may put an end to it. Sarah why? Dr. Neruda because they are very powerful beings. What most people consider God, amplify by a factor of a thousand and you would be close to the range of capabilities and power that these beings can wield. Sarah are you saying these beings are more powerful than God? Dr. Neruda the problem with your question is that I don't know which God you're referring to. The conception of God in the Bible, or in most of our planets. Holy books, bears no resemblance to the image of God that I hold in my mind. Sarah okay, I want to come back to this topic because it really holds an interest to me, but I also want to complete our discussion around your defection. Can you explain what happened? Dr. Neruda simply put, I began to feel that the defensive weapon installed on this planet by the wing makers stood a better chance of succeeding than BST. Well, logic dictated this to be true. 15, however, disagreed. He would allow further investigation into how to find the remaining wing makers sites and how to bring them online, but he would never share the technology or anything related to the discovery with the general public. Sarah and so your differences over this issue caused your defection? Dr. Neruda yes. Sarah back to the topic of God. Tell me how your version of God is defined. Dr. Neruda God is a unifying force, primal and eternal. This force is the original force that summoned life from itself to become both its companion and journey. The life that was summoned was experimented with many times until a soul carrier was formed that could take a particle of this force into the outer expanding universes. Sarah I assume this soul carrier you're referring to is a central race? Page 97. Dr. Neruda correct. Sarah are these the same as angels? Dr. Neruda no, the central race is more akin to genetic planners and universe. Architects. They're not well known or understood, even in the most insightful. Cosmologies held by the Cordium. Sarah so, I presume if angels are real they're yet another creation of the central. Race? Dr. Neruda correct. Sarah then God, or this force as you were describing it, didn't really create anything other than the central race, and then return to his abode in the center of the universe. It sounds like the central race does all the work. Dr. Neruda the central race is simply a time-shifted version of the human race. Sarah ha? Huh? Dr. Neruda the central race holds the genetic archetype of the human species. No matter what form it takes on. No matter what time it lives in. No matter what part of the universe it lives in. This archetype is like a magnetic force it draws. The lesser developed versions of the species towards it. All versions of the humanoid species are merely time-shifted versions of the central race or at least that's the view of the cordium. Sarah stop a second. Are you saying that I'm made from the same DNA as the central race? That I'm essentially the same, genetically speaking, just in a different time and space? How's that possible? 
Dr. Neruda it's possible because the central race designed it that way. DNA is not something that only transmits physical characteristics or predispositions. It transmits our concepts of time, space, energy, and matter. It transmits our conscious and unconscious filters. It transmits our receptivity to the inward impulse of original thought, and this receptivity is what defines the motion of the being. Sarah the motion of the being? Dr. Neruda all beings are in motion. They're going somewhere every moment of their lives. If not physically in motion, their minds are in motion. Their subconscious is always in motion, interacting with the data stream of a multiverse. The motion of the being is simply a term we used at the ACIO to define the internal compass. Page 98. Sarah and the internal compass is Dr. Neruda is the radar system of the individual that defines its path through life at both the macroscopic and microscopic levels, and everywhere in between. Sarah I have this feeling that this topic could go on forever. Dr. Neruda it's not that complex, Sarah. Think of the decisions you make in your life. Which ones would you say were made for you by external sources? Which ones were your own, and which ones were a combination of both external and your own decision? Sarah you mean as a percentage? Dr. Neruda tried to estimate. Sarah it depends on what stage of my life I consider. When I was a baby, my parents made all my decisions Dr. Neruda no. This applies to all stages from birth to death. Just make a guess. Sarah I don't know, maybe 40% external, 30% my own, and 30% a combination. Dr. Neruda then you'd be surprised if I told you that you deposit an image within your DNA before you're born that defines your motion of being. And when this deposit is made, your motion of being is defined by you, not someone else. No external force makes your decision, an external force can only inform and activate a decision already made. Sarah you lost me. Are you saying that every decision in my life was already made before I was born? Dr. Neruda no. Every causal decision was. Sarah so what's the difference between a causal decision and a regular decision? Dr. Neruda think of how many decisions you make in a day. Wouldn't you? Agree that it's probably hundreds if not thousands every day? These are as you put it regular decisions. Causal decisions are defined by how integral they are to the substrate of the individual being. Are you receptive to new ideas? Are you able to synthesize opposing thoughts? Do you process information dominantly in a visual or numeric context? These are causal decisions that you define before being born and they're encoded within the DNA that activates your decision. Matrix External forces like page 99 Parents, teachers, and friends only inform you of what you've already defined as the motion of your being. Sarah is this according to the cordium, too? Dr. Neruda this is part of the learning I personally gathered from my LERM experiences. The cordium subscribed to a similar belief, however, Sarah you're telling me a variation of reincarnation, aren't you? When you said that we deposit an image within our DNA before we're born who exactly is the depositing? Dr. Neruda only the formless consciousness can deposit an image onto the DNA template. Sarah I assume you're talking about soul? Dr. Neruda it depends again on your definition of soul. The formless consciousness is that which observes and experiences through forms our structures, not just physical embodiments. For example, consciousness can be contained inside a structure or form, but not be physically based. The mind is such a structure. While it's not physical, consciousness when physically embodied peers through a mind structure like someone looking through a window. Soul is often confused with the mind and vice versa. The formless consciousness is that particle of God that is decelerated from the frequency of the God state, into individuality, where it can become autonomous, and exercise free will. Think of it like a photon, or subatomic particle that is cast, into a web of interconnected particles of like-mindedness. That is to say, 
All the particles have a similar frequency, or spin rate, and they're able to step down their frequency, at will, in order to enter membranes of consciousness that can only be entered by taking on a form. So the formless becomes form, and just before it enters the body, consciousness activates the DNA template according to its desired experiences within the membrane of reality it chooses. Sarah what do you mean by the term membrane? Dr. Neruda the multiverse is a collection of reality membranes, clustered together in a dimensional matrix that responds to the thought circuits and gravity fields of our formless consciousness. We've been trained, through evolutionary time scales, to accept the three-dimensional world as our reality. These reality membranes are not structured like parallel planes or rungs of a ladder, but rather are like lattices of interlocking cells. If you want, I can describe them in more detail. But I think it becomes so abstract from here forward that I suspect your eyes will glaze over. Page 100. Sarah all of this seems unbelievable. I'm beginning to wonder if you're the reincarnation of Jesus or Buddha. Dr. Naruta laughing I'm reincarnated, and that's as far as I can attest. Sarah do you remember any of your previous incarnations? Dr. Naruta previous is a relative term. I prefer to think of my incarnations not so much as a function of memory, but something more akin to a bleed-through of a simultaneous reality membrane. The comparisons into which human experience is divided are not so watertight that they exclude one life from entering, or influencing, another. And from my experience, these comparisons represent parallel moments in the life of an individual across a broad sweep of time and space. Sarah so you're implying that our past, present, and future lives are all lived out at the same time, even though they seem to be taking place in different places and times? Dr. Naruta yes. Sarah okay, then explain how it's possible, because it doesn't make any sense to me. Dr. Naruta our formless consciousness is like a sphere with many, many spokes leading outwards from its central core. Each of these spokes connects into the vertical time continuum through forms, and these forms human or otherwise feed the formless consciousness with insights about the different reality membranes in which it has form. In this way, the forms of the formless bring an awareness of different reality membranes, which in turn is processed by the formless and passed on through the unification force to God. Sarah God's the recipient of all this information or experience, from every living thing, from every time and place. How? Dr. Neruda I don't have any idea. Sarah but this is what you believe, and I have to assume you wouldn't believe it if you didn't have some evidence to support your belief. Dr. Neruda sometimes you follow a trail of evidence to a point where it comes to an abrupt end, but you can still imagine how the trail continues despite the lack of proof that it moves forward in a particular direction. You can intuit its pathway. Call it imagination or pure conjecture, I don't care, but it's what I've done in this case. I truly don't know how this magnitude of data could possibly be processed for any useful purpose, but I believe it. Page 101. Sarah OK, give me a second to review my notes. Because I want to go back to something you said earlier. Here it is. You said that everyone defines his or her motion of being at the causal level. If that's the case, and assuming that soul is intelligent, why would any soul choose to be impaired mentally, emotionally, or physically? Dr. Neruda how do you mean that? Sarah let's say that soul entered a body, but chose to be closed-minded, stupid, and generally a blob. Why would an intelligent consciousness choose this end? Then imprint it on their DNA so their life is made more difficult or at least more. Boring? Dr. Naruta let me ask you a question. Why would God impose this same condition on a person? Sarah ah, but you're starting with the assumption that God exists. Dr. Naruta make this assumption and then answer my question. Sarah I know what you're implying, but why would either God or soul impose? These at least from my point of view stupid decisions? Dr. Neruda it has to do with complex systems and their inherent rules of dynamics. 
Sarah could you be a bit more specific? Dr. Neruda in order to expand and ultimately support diverse life forms, the universe required an incalculably complex system of interrelated principles and rules. The more complex this system is, the more dynamic are its poles of interaction. Think of it like an uncut diamond. When you shine a focused beam of light on it in a dark room, there's only a muted glow, but if you facet the diamond, making it more complex, it spreads light in a radiant pattern upon all the walls of the room. Complexity works in a similar manner with consciousness, it facets human experience and spreads the light of consciousness upon all the walls of experience, including ignorance, stupidity, wickedness, beauty, goodness, and every other possible condition of human experience. The formless consciousness is not stupid in choosing to experience something that we might deem difficult or boring. It's simply acknowledging that the reality membrane of Earth requires it. No one can live within this reality membrane and be untouched by the dynamics of the human experience. No, one's exempt from difficulties or pain. Does that prove that every one of us makes stupid decisions? No, it only proves that we lie within a complex world. That and nothing more. Page 102. Sarah not to sound offensive, but you'd agree that some have easier lives than others. Dr. Neruda yes, but it's not relevant to the intelligence of the formless. Consciousness. Sarah okay, so is it related to the age of the formless consciousness? Dr. Neruda are you asking if the formless consciousness as it gains? Experience becomes better at selecting its motion of being? Sarah exactly. Dr. Neruda the formless consciousness looks upon hardship and ease, the way you might look upon the negative and positive ends of a battery. With relative indifference, I would imagine. Sarah there's no difference, is that what you're saying? No value to being an Einstein versus a Hitler? I don't believe that. Dr. Neruda the choice is not made to be evil or wicked, or to select a life path that is excruciatingly difficult for oneself and others. Nor, in the case of Einstein, did he choose to contribute to humanity's understanding in a way that permitted the creation of nuclear weapons in the formless consciousness of these individuals prior to their most recent incarnations they didn't make choices to harm or help humanity. They made choices to experience aspects of this reality membrane that would contribute to their own understanding. Sarah So, you're saying that the soul chooses its motion of being according to its selfish desires? It doesn't think about the greater good at all? Dr. Neruda it doesn't need to think about the greater good. That's what the Unification force does. Sarah it's an interesting philosophy. We can be as selfish as we desire, and leave it up to God to make our selfish, clumsy actions into something that contributes to the common good of humanity. Is that what you're really saying? Dr. Neruda no. I'm saying that God, working through its unification force, orchestrates the intermingling of life in order to bring about transformation in the universe. God is like the cosmological alchemist who transforms the selfish interests of the one into the transformative conditions for the many. Page 103. Sarah then you're saying that God solves all of our human frailties. We can do anything and it doesn't really matter because he'll fix it. If this philosophy were taught in our world, we'd be in sorry shape. Dr. Neruda while it may not be taught in a formal way, humankind is unconsciously aware that this is the way it works. Sarah on this point, I have to disagree with you. Selfish interests, evil intent, stupidity. These are not the traits of a responsible society, and I don't know of anyone who believes that we should act in this way and then let God perform damage control or mop up after our poor judgments. Dr. Neruda you misunderstand. Perhaps I'm not explaining this very well. Let me try again. First, the selfish interests of the formless consciousness are to facet its consciousness in such a way that it can receive and radiate the unification force. In so doing, it can become consciously connected to this force and knowingly become a conduit for it into a broad range of reality membranes. Now, the 
formless consciousness selects reality membranes to enable the faceting of its consciousness. None of this is done with an attitude of universal contribution or noble purpose. However, this isn't a result of selfish behavior as you think of it. It's a result of its nature. The way it was designed. I'm not saying that God cleans up after our messy mistakes. I'm saying our messy mistakes are not messy mistakes. Again, we live in a complex system of interdependent reality membranes. You can think of these membranes like scales on a snake, and the snake represents the collective human consciousness. Each scale protects the human soul and, collectively, propels it through its environment in this case, the multiverse. The messy mistakes that we individually and collectively make are as responsible for the existence of the multiverse as are the noble contributions. Sarah let me see if I got this right. You're saying that our mistakes both as individuals and as species make it possible for us to exist, so, therefore, they're not mistakes? Dr. Neruda as I said earlier, complex systems require a near infinite range of dynamics in order to sustain the system. Our reality membrane is form fitted to the complexity of our universe, which in turn created the environment of Earth and its various life forms. Yes, our mistakes, our individuality, are a central part of our ability as a species to sustain itself in the face of a complex interconnected structure of the quantum world and the cosmos. The selfish motivations harvest the experience that facets our consciousness which in turn are harvested by the unification force and used to transform reality. Membranes page 104 Into passages through which a species can return to the God state. The mistakes weigh equally in this process, as do the unselfish contributions. Nothing is wasted. Sarah and if this is all true, why even worry about the animus or anything else? Just let God take care of everything. Dr. Neruda because the animus are not connected to the unification force. Sarah why? I thought you said everything was. Dr. Neruda the formless consciousness doesn't select soul carriers that don't. Utilize DNA as its formative structure. It knows that these structures are not able. To connect to the unification force, and therefore, cannot be trusted. Sarah and they can't be trusted because? Dr. Neruda because the unification force is what brings coherence to incoherence and purpose to chaos. Without it, physical structures tend to ebb and flow in stasis, which is to say, they don't transform. Sarah how did this happen? Dr. Neruda what? Sarah that the animus became an independent race unconnected to God? Dr. Neruda you've heard the story of the fallen angels? Sarah you're talking about the Lucifer rebellion? Dr. Neruda yes. This story is misrepresented in biblical texts, owing to the fact that the authors of these texts didn't have a sufficient understanding in which to define cosmology or physics. The central race designed the higher life forms, and this includes a wide range of beings that operate within the quantum world and the reality membranes. Therein, among these beings are what we commonly refer to as the angels, who are intermediaries between the soul carriers of humanoids, and the central race. There were some within the angelic realm that believed the central race was too controlling of the soul carrier structure. They felt that a structure should be created that would enable angels to incarnate within the reality membrane of Earth and other life-bearing planets. They insisted that this would improve these planets and the physical structure of the universe at large. However, the central Race refused this proposal and a renegade group left to design a soul carrier. Independent of the central race. Page 105. Sarah hold on a moment. You're saying that Lucifer led this rebellion to create. A soul carrier that could house the spirit of an angel, and the animus are the. Result? Dr. Neruda it's more complicated than that. Lucifer, or what we have come to. Call Lucifer, was a very devoted servant of the central race. He was one of the forerunners of the angelic species, capable of powers that were diminished by the central race in subsequent prototypes. Sarah are you saying that angels are created? That they can reproduce like humans? Dr. Neruda correct. 
Lucifer's personality included a strong sense of independence from his creators, and an even stronger sense that his creators were flawed because of their insistence that the humanoid soul carrier would exclusively house the formless consciousness, and not the angelic form. To Lucifer, this seemed unthinkable, because the angelic form was superior in its capabilities and could be of great assistance to the physical life forms on Earth and other life-bearing planets. From Lucifer's perspective, humans and the higher order species would be unable to transform themselves because of the severe limits of their soul carriers or physical forms. Lucifer felt certain that without the collaboration of the angels, humanoids throughout the universe would become increasingly separated from their purpose as spiritual beings and throw the universe into disarray, which would eventually cause its destruction and life within it including, of course, angels. Sarah Denier suggesting that the Lucifer Rebellion was simply a disagreement over this one issue? Dr. Neruda Lucifer wanted to incarnate into this reality membrane the same way humans do. He wanted to become a collaborator with humanity to assure its ascension. While the central race saw his intentions as noble, they feared that the angelic incarnations would become known as gods to their human counterparts, and unintentionally mislead humans, rather than co-create the latter to the god state. This matter underwent a tremendous debate, ultimately forming a division between the angelic realm and the central race. The loyalists to the central race argued that Lucifer and his sympathizers should be banished for their radical ideas that could potentially create a lasting division in their reality membrane and caused them tremendous turmoil. Lucifer, in wide-ranging deliberations with the central race, negotiated a compromise that enabled him to take his group of sympathizers and prove the value of their plan on a single planet. Page 106 Sarah Are you saying that Lucifer was allowed to experiment on a planet? Dr. Neruda Yes. Sarah Okay, before we go any further, are you talking about this in the context? of myth or are you essentially representing the Cordium view? Dr. Neruda there are three ancient manuscripts in the ACIO's possession that describe this story in an allegorical form, but the Cordium view as you put it, is much more descriptive and definitive as a record of this cosmic event. Sarah so, Lucifer conducted this experiment. Where and to what result? Dr. Neruda the planet is in a galaxy known as M51 to your scientists. Sarah this is the same galaxy of the Animus? Dr. Neruda yes. Sarah so you're really saying that Lucifer and his band of sympathizers created the Animus to be soul carriers for angels? Dr. Neruda it's more complicated than that. Sarah I certainly hope so because this story is too strange for me to believe. Dr. Neruda be patient. We're moving into uncomfortable territory for most people. So take a deep breath and bear with me as I try to explain this. Lucifer created a synthetic physical structure that could accommodate the quantum requirements of an angel. It was a very effective structure, but induced a strong survival complex within the species, which eventually overpowered the angelic tendency of altruism and cooperation. Sarah Why? What happened? Dr. Neruda when the formless consciousness enters a reality membrane, through a structure like a soul carrier, it immediately feels disconnected from all other forces, but its own. It's literally thrown into separation. In humans, this is more or less controlled through the subtle realization that it remains connected through the unification force, and this is because its DNA is designed to emit this feeling of connection subconsciously. However, in the case of the soul carrier designed by Lucifer and his followers, this connection was severed both consciously and subconsciously because the structure was page 107. Not based on DNA, which is strictly controlled by the central race. Consequently, it inclined this experimental species toward a very strong survival. Complex because it feared extinction so deeply, which is the result of feeling. Complete separation from the unification force. The survival complex created a species that overcompensated its fear of extinction by developing a very powerful group mind. The group mind compensated for the loss of connection to the unification force, creating its physical and mental corollary. 
it was the equivalent of unifying the species as a whole in the physical reality membrane of their planetary system. Thus, the angels that entered this system lost their memory of their angelic natures and became more interested in operating as a single collective, than as individuals. They became a concern for the central race, and Lucifer was asked to dismantle his experiment. However, Lucifer had become attached to the species that he had helped to create. These angelic beings had developed over a number of generations a very sophisticated set of technologies, culture, and social order. It was like an extended family in many ways to Lucifer. So, he negotiated to modify his creation so they would no longer accommodate the angelic frequency or quantum structure, but that they could become self-animated. Sarah how do you mean self-animated? Dr. Naruta that they would become soulless androids. Sarah and so this happened and that's how we got the animus? Dr. Naruta. Yes. Sarah it doesn't make any sense. Why would God, or the central race for that matter, allow Lucifer to create a race of androids? Didn't they know that these beings were going to become the scourge of our universe? Dr. Naruta yes, of course they knew. However, God doesn't design something as complex as the multiverse and then control how everything operates. Sarah but you said earlier that God orchestrates what happens through the unification force. Dr. Naruta God orchestrates how the dynamics of the multiverse come together to form a unified, comprehensible data stream that can inform the next evolution of the multiverse. Most people would think that an all-powerful God would banish a species like the Animus, but it doesn't work this way because the dark Side of predation, as in the case of the Animus, sparks resourcefulness and innovation in its intended prey. Sarah and we're the prey. Page 108. Dr. Naruda not just us, but the humanoid species as a whole. Sarah evil begets good. That's what you're really saying, right? Dr. Naruda again, it's not evil against good. The Animus don't consider themselves to be evil doers when they invade a planet. From their perspective, they are simply executing their plan to become reconnected to their sense of individuality and become as strange as it may sound more spiritual. Sarah but when I asked you earlier if you knew what their intentions were with Earth, you said you didn't know. Dr. Neruda I don't. However, I do know something about their intentions to re-engineer their soul carriers to be more DNA compliant. They want to introduce DNA to their soul carriers in order to transform their species. This is essentially what any race would do under their exact set of circumstances. In fact, you could even call it noble. Sarah Noble? I don't see anything noble in trying to commandeer our planet and subject our citizens to genetic experiments and tyranny. Dr. Neruda to us, no. But from a completely objective viewpoint, one can Appreciate that the Animus are just trying to transform their species for the better. They don't have any other choice because without DNA, they're simply unable to connect to the Unification Force. Sarah why can't they contact the Central Race and ask for help? Dr. Neruda the Central Race is well aware of the Animus, and consider them their most potent enemy. Perhaps they consider them unsalvageable. Or perhaps... The central race invites the drama of having an ancient enemy that forces them to protect their most valuable assets. I don't pretend to know. But for whatever reason, the central race is not able or willing to assist the animus in becoming reconnected to the unification force. Sarah saw whatever happened to Lucifer and his plan? Dr. Neruda according to the Cordium, he's alive and well and completely reintegrated into his species as a member of high standing. Sarah just so unclear, we are talking about Satan aren't we? Dr. Neruda theologians are left with a tattered tapestry of myth and legend, and from this, they've injected their own interpretations down through time. What? We're page 109. Left with is little more than the fiction of a thousand voices, but it somehow manages to become known as fact. Satan, as we think of him, never existed. There is no countermeasure to God. God encompasses all dynamics. 
it has no polarity of itself that is beyond its reach, or personalized outside of itself. The story of Lucifer at a very high level was just described to you. I assume you can see some similarity to the version of the Lucifer rebellion depicted in the Bible, but the correlation, I'm sure you'd admit, is sparse at best. Sarah but if there's no source of evil, why does evil exist in such abundance? And before you answer, I know you'll disagree with my assumption that evil exists, but how can you reconcile terrorism or any other predator force of humankind as anything but evil, even if Satan never existed as you claim? Dr. Neruda if you watch movies like Star Wars or Star Trek they imply that extraterrestrials populate every planetary system in the galaxy and beyond. However, it just isn't true. Our planet is an extremely rare combination of animals and organisms. The universe that comprises our physical reality. Membrane is in fact hostile to life at an extreme level. And yet life somehow managed to emerge on our planet in the black depths of our ocean. Sarah what does this have to do with my question? Dr. Neruda be patient, I'll get to it. I promise. Sarah okay. Dr. Neruda the habitable zones within our universe would be analogous to extracting a drop of water from the Pacific Ocean every cubic mile, and defining it is the only part of the ocean that contain all of the potential conditions to bear microbial life. Then, extracting a single molecule from each of these drops of water, and defining it is the only part of the drop that could sustain multi-cellular life. And from each of these molecules, Extracting a single quantum particle and defining it is the only part of the molecule that could sustain complex, sentient life forms like humans. The genetic library that thrives upon Earth is a form of currency that has no price tag. All I can say is that its value far exceeds anything that human thought could imagine. And with this incredible value, our planet attracts interest from a wide range of extraterrestrial races, and this is as true today as it was a thousand years ago or a hundred thousand years ago. Objects of inestimable value and rarity, such as Earth, attract beings from outside our planetary system that desire to control them, which makes Earth an extraordinary object. Page 110 of Attraction It's precisely this attraction that has brought the concepts of evil to our psyche. Sarah I followed you right up to the last sentence and then lost you. How did this attraction bring evil to our consciousness? Dr. Neruda aggressive ETs, seeking to quite literally own Earth, visited our planet approximately 11,000 years ago. These ETs brought their genetics to our native DNA, and in so doing, modified our human DNA adding a more aggressive, domineering drive to our personalities. This predisposition divided the human species into the conquerors and the conquered. Sarah I don't get it. You're saying that ETs impregnated thousands of our native population with an aggressive gene that brought evil into our consciousness? Dr. Neruda these ETs were not so different in physical form than the native humans, and they were treated like gods because of their superior technologies and capabilities. It was considered a great honor to have intercourse with these beings, but only a few were selected. Sarah so how did their DNA become so influential that it literally brought evil into our lives? Dr. Neruda one of the yet to be discovered properties of DNA is that it can communicate traits particularly aggressive traits without physical interaction. Sarah explain, please. Dr. Neruda there are carrier circuits within the DNA that transmit traits and even forms of intelligence through a reality membrane that is sub-quantum. It's a tributary ingredient of the unification force that propagates new traits and understandings in the future the many. It's what enables the transmission of a new insight or potent trait across a spectrum of a species that resonates with the insight or trait, and it does it without physical interaction. Sarah you're saying that a single person could have an idea or trait that is deposited within their DNA, and then their DNA transmits this trait like a broadcast tower and everyone on the planet that's like them is affected? Dr. Neruda let me clarify some things you said. First, it's not one person. 
it requires a critical mass of several hundred for a personality trait to transmit, and perhaps only 10 or 20 to transmit a new concept or insight. In any case, one person is not sufficient. This is not an exact science yet, even to the ACIO. Page 111. Secondly, it's not transmitted like a broadcast tower. It's transmitted selectively to resonant DNA, and the effect it has isn't dependent on whether the recipient is like, or even similar to, the donor. It's dependent on the receptivity of their DNA. Some people open their DNA up to new innovations, others don't. This is a critical factor in whether the new trait or idea is successfully transmitted. Sarah O.K., ETs with their aggressive personalities infected humans, and this brought evil tendencies to our race. Why would the central race allow this to happen? Dr. Naruto, we don't know. Sarah, but you said earlier that they would protect our planet with their best technology. Why didn't they protect it thousands of years ago? Dr. Naruto, this is a mystery. We don't know. Sarah, I assume this must be another reason that 15 doesn't want to rely on the wing makers for our protection. Dr. Naruto, he doesn't talk about it, but I'd agree with you. Sarah, I'd like to return to the topic of God, and just for the record, I'm well aware that I'm off the subject of the wing makers, but I can't resist talking about these things. Okay? Dr. Naruta, it's fine with me. I'll discuss any topic you choose. Sarah, you explained earlier that to you, God is a force, but is it the force? Dr. Naruta, do you mean is God plural or singular? Sarah, yes. Dr. Naruta, God is both. Sarah, both? Dr. Naruta, God is found everywhere because it's the unification force, but, paradoxically, being the unification force it is also unique or singular. Physicists will explain to you that there are four primary forces at play in the universe. Strong nuclear, weak nuclear, gravity, and the electromagnetic. These forces are actually facets of a singular force, more primal and absolutely causative. Page 112. Einstein worked nearly 30 years trying to prove this with his unification theory, but never found his answers. No one supposedly has. I can only report that the Labyrinth Group using its LERM technology has discovered this force. And this force possesses an unmistakable consciousness. That is, it is neither chaos nor order. It is both, and flows between the two worlds of chaos. An order like a sine wave flows between positive and negative amplitude. Sarah and can our physicists prove or disprove this? Dr. Naruda, no, our physicists cannot prove or disprove what I say. They're too shackled in specialized theories that are in crisis. Sarah, what kind of theories? Dr. Naruda, like quantum mechanics. To name one example, nearly all physicists, regardless of their specialty, would stand before you in all sincerity, and advise you that quantum mechanics is the correct and complete theory underlying our understanding of the universe. But it doesn't honor the consciousness of a particle, and it has no way of detecting the infinitesimal magnetic fields within which these particles reside. Sarah Y. Dr. Naruta, this is not a layperson's topic, Sarah. I don't know how to explain this in words you'll understand. It has to do with the fact that our physicists in academia lack sophisticated force amplification technology that can detect the extraordinarily tiny magnetic fields that subatomic particles nest within, which in turn, creates an interconnected web of thought circuits. These thought circuits taken collectively represent the exterior structure of the unification force, and they permeate the multiverse. The magnetic fields represent the interior of the unification force, and they permeate the form's formless consciousness. Sarah, okay, I get your point about it not being a layperson's topic. You've completely lost me in the abstract nature of this discussion. I thought we were talking about God and now I'm not sure what we're talking about. Dr. Naruta keep focused on the primal force. God has decelerated itself to display its physical embodiment in the four known forces I spoke of earlier. Sarah so, this is truly how the universe works, 
and I should just accept it? Dr. Naruda no, no, no. I don't want to leave you with the impression that what I've said is the way the multiverse works. If there's one truth I can state unequivocally, it's that my understanding of the multiverse, while constrained with the tools of particle page 113, PA, physics, cosmology, and mathematics, is partial at best, and completely inaccurate at worst. Sarah well, that leaves us essentially nowhere, doesn't it? If what you've said tonight is just partial understanding or complete misjudgment, where does that leave our brightest scientists and theologians? You have all the advantages of advanced technology and alien cosmology, and still you can't explain the universe with any confidence. Even with your proof of God, you claim to know essentially nothing that's absolutely true. How can that be? Dr. Neruda no one who's invested in astronomy, cosmology, or physics likes to think that their discipline is misguided by false or incomplete assumptions. But they are. And there's a good reason. Sarah which is? Dr. Neruda imagined that the observable universe is the middle rung on a ladder of unknown length. Each of the rungs above and below our observable universe represents an order of magnitude beyond our senses. For example, let's say that the rung above the one that represents our observable universe is the outer perimeter of our Milky Way galaxy. Using a telescope we can see the next rung above us, but the rest of the ladder is lost in a thick haze. Looking downward at a microscopic level with an electron microscope we can add another rung below our observable universe, and with a particle accelerator, we can even theorize what the next rung below that might be, but the rest of the ladder trails downward into a thick haze no different than when we try to look up. With all of our technology and theory, we still have no idea how tall the ladder is or even whether the ladder is straight or begins to curve like a double helix. We don't know if perhaps the top end of the ladder curves to such a degree that it actually connects with the bottom end of the ladder. And we don't even know whether there might be additional ladders. Sarah okay, I think I know where you're going with this, but then why does it always seem that science knows more than they really do? Dr. Neruda the largest population of the planet perhaps 99% has no experience beyond the middle rung of the ladder. And those that are privileged to observe the next rung above or below by the use of technology, falsely assume, or perhaps hope, that the ladder retains the same form and holds to the same principles. The ACIO has observed another rung of this ladder beyond the technology of academia. Nothing more. However, in doing so, we've only become humbled by the depth and breadth of our ignorance. We've learned that the ladder does change. It page 114 begins to modify its form and we theorize that its shape is no longer predictable or even stable. Sarah so doesn't that mean that our physics is wrong? Dr. Neruda I like the way an obscure writer by the name of Gustave Nackett put it. Whenever knowledge takes a step forward, God recedes a step backwards. Each rung of the ladder may require a different physics or set of laws and instruments. Is the Neanderthal wrong in the face of the modern human? He was merely a precursor or early prototype. And this is the same as physics or cosmology. It must be understood as a valid prototype that has its purpose in time but will ultimately be displaced by a new model that encompasses more rungs of the ladder. Sarah, it's still hard to imagine how all this technological advantage that the ACIO wields could only make clear how little we know about our universe. It doesn't leave much hope for us. Dr. Neruda, how do you mean that? Sarah, well, it seems to me that if we don't know what we don't know, we're doomed to make assumptions about things that are taken as fact, when in reality, it's just opinion. In this regard, science is no better than religion. Right? Dr. Neruda The interesting thing about science is that origins reveal how things work. If you can follow particles to their origins, you can understand how inner space works. If you can follow the cosmic particles galaxies, quasars, and 
black holes to their origins, you can understand how outer space works. When you put the two halves together within between space, or the observable universe, you can understand how the whole multiverse works. The problem is that no one has the lens or technology to observe the origins. And this is where theory takes over. The difference between science and religion is that science applies theory while religion applies faith. Both theory and faith, however, fall short of revealing origins. So in this regard, they're similar. Sarah but if what you're saying is true, then we live in a world we don't really understand. Dr. Neruda exactly. Sarah if we don't understand our world, and science and religion are inadequate, where do we turn? I mean, how are we supposed to cope with our ignorance? Page 115. Dr. Neruda The danger of ignorance is only in believing you're not ignorant. If you know that you lack insight into the inner dimensions of how things work, you know that you have blind spots. You can keep a wary eye open for any advantage that enables a deeper insight or more profound sense of meaning. You have to learn to live with incompleteness and use it as a motivating force rather than a point of desperation or indifference. As far as where do we turn? That's a hard question to answer. It's the reason that all the dramas have become packaged and sold via the media. The media is where most people turn. They flick on their televisions, radios, computers, newspapers, magazines, and even books, and these deliver the packets of information bundled together by the media. The media know very well that people are ignorant enough so that they lack the ability to discern the incompleteness of the information packets they serve to their customers. Information is incomplete, and this drowns our population in ignorance, which enables manipulation. Sarah by whom? Dr. Naruta Sarah, no one entity is the master manipulator, if that's what you're asking. It's more like everyone in the media manipulates information and disclosure. It's all part of the drama that causes people to turn to the media for their answers, and citizens are responsible for this state of affairs because they don't demand that their educational centers secure clear, full disclosures of information and distribute it to the public domain. Sarah, are you saying that our schools and universities should be the stewards of this information, and not the media? Dr. Neruda in the ideal world, yes. This is how the courtroom designed their information structures. The educational centers dominate the distribution of information through a collective and well-reasoned system of journalism. The journalists are specialists across the disciplines of theology, the arts and sciences, government, business, and technology. These journalists document the best practices of each and every discipline and share this information through full disclosure. Nothing is left out. The research is meticulous and completely untouched by the political spectrum of special interests. Sarah OK, being a journalist myself, we finally hit on a topic I know something about. When I was a beat reporter, I never felt the hand of politics influencing how or what I reported. I know at the national level particularly, reporting in D.C., that might not be entirely the case, but the stories we've been talking about the past few nights weren't even on my radar screen. That's the real problem. These stories are completely secreted away. And given that our politicians don't even know about the existence of the ACIO and all of the other things affiliated with it, how can you blame the politicians? or the media for that matter? Page 116. Dr. Neruda I didn't intend to blame anyone, really. The system is imperfect. Anyone involved in the system knows that it's larger than life and can't be changed by one person or even one group of people. The media know their limits, and they know their markets. People want to know the truth about the things that affect them in their pocketbook. The regions of cosmology. ETs, the ACIO, and things that go bump in the night are considered light reading to the masses reserved for entertainment not serious news. Sarah this is anything but light news, and you know it. Why do you sound so cynical? 
Dr. Neruda if I'm cynical about the media, it's not for you to take personally. I'm of a mind that the media will not change significantly until the education system changes significantly and produces students that demand more than news, dramas, sports, and weather. Sarah so our schools should not only produce students with an appetite for cosmology, but they should also produce the news. Pretty tall orders for schools. Don't you think? Dr. Naruta perhaps, but it's what's needed before the ACIO or any related organization would share its knowledge with the masses. Sarah and why is that? Dr. Naruta Academia would absolutely be turned on its head if the ACIO stepped forward and provided its research findings, technologies, and evidence of ET interactions. It would be attacked. And it would be a vicious attack. At least that was 15's intractable conclusion. The ACIO, therefore, had no other way to bring its findings to the public than through the private sector and the alliances it had with the NSA's Special Projects Laboratory. Sarah give me an example of something a technology or discovery that was first uncovered by the ACIO and then exported to the private sector. Dr. Neruda the transistor would be a good example Sarah you're telling me that the ACIO invented the transistor? Dr. Neruda no, Bell Labs invented the transistor, but the ACIO worked with Bell Labs, or more specifically, Mervyn Kelly who ran its operations in the mid-1950s. Mr. Kelly had attached a rather brilliant physicist to this project by the name of Bill Shockley who became aware of the outermost edges of the ACIO. Page 117. Sarah how did that happen? Dr. Neruda a little known fact Mr. Shockley, working with a friend of his, invented the world's first nuclear reactor. The defense deprint heard about it through Mr. Kelly and wanted it badly. This was before the Manhattan Project got underway. Mr. Kelly wanted a patent for the discovery, but the government threw up every conceivable roadblock. They kept the whole discovery under complete confidentiality and negotiated to have one of our scientists work with Mr. Shockley in secret. Sarah when was this? Dr. Neruda this was happening in 1944 and 1945. Sarah why did our government squabble about the patents? Dr. Neruda they knew Mr. Shockley could play a role in the war, and they wanted to use this as leverage to secure his command to help. He was a difficult man to work with, so I was told. He never stepped forward and volunteered to do anything unless he knew it would somehow benefit him. So, our government held the patents up until he would enlist. Sarah and did he? Dr. Neruda yes. Sarah and how did it benefit him? Dr. Neruda there was, within our government, a newly formed intelligence agency it was the forerunner of the NSA. It was known as the General Services Special Projects Laboratory, and to this day, very little is known about it. The SPL was later folded into the NSA in 1953 as an unacknowledged deprint, and Ultimately the ACIO was folded into the SPL as an unacknowledged research laboratory. So, the ACIO was two levels deep or what is called, black root. Sarah what was the motivation for all the security? The war? Dr. Neruda it may surprise you, but the war wasn't of great concern to the forces that the ACIO were dealing with. The concern was ETs and who would be able to first utilize their technology in military applications. In the early 1940s, UFO sightings were quite common even more so than today. And our government was convinced that these sightings were real and that they were indeed off-planetary forces. They wanted two things steal the technology from down spacecraft, or establish an alliance. They weren't too particular about which way it happened. Sarah but how did all of this pertain to Shockley? Page 118. Dr. Neruda I got off track a bit. Mr. Shockley was introduced to the SPL and was made privy to many of the secret initiatives of the SPL. If not for his personality traits, he would have been recruited to join the SPL. He was that brilliant. Anyway, he was given access to some of the research in field effect transistors that was underway within the SPL. This was before the Bell Labs 
Discovery of the Joint Transistor, which was made by colleagues of Mr. Shockley. Mr. Shockley was allowed to utilize some of the research within the SPL2 create his own version of the field effect transistor and become widely known as its inventor. This was done in exchange for his cooperation in helping Army and Navy strategic operations during the war. He was aware of the SPL and knew part of their agenda, and I was told that he wanted to join the SPL after the war because of its superior laboratories, but again, his personality traits prevented his admission. Sarah So, Bell Labs received the patent for the transistor in exchange for Shockley's assistance with the war. What exactly did he do that was so important? Dr. Neruda I don't know for certain, but in general, his role was helping to optimize weapons deployment. Sarah what was the role of the NSA during all of this? Dr. Neruda the NSA wasn't in existence until November 1952. During this time, the SPL and ACIO were the two most advanced, secretive labs in existence. And they each had only one private sector lab they worked with Bell Labs. And this is because Mr. Kelly was a friend with the executive director of the SPL. Sarah so what was the relationship between the SPL and ACIO? Dr. Neruda you mean in the 1940s? Sarah first, how far back does it go? Dr. Neruda the SPL was formed in 1938. There was a strong development, particularly throughout Europe in fission energy. The SPL was initially conceived to examine fission as an alternative energy source as well as its possible military applications. Sarah why was it kept so secret? Dr. Neruda in the late 1930s there was significant political unrest in Europe. And the US wasn't sure whom it could trust. It had a notion that fission was the answer to superior technical warfare and didn't want to share it unwittingly. It was also alarmed at some of the sudden advances that were taking place in the European Physics Page 119 community, and felt it needed to concentrate some of its best resources to equip a world-class laboratory, and staff it with some of the best minds of the planet. Sarah how could the best minds of the planet suddenly be plucked up by the US government and not be noticed by the scientific community? I mean, how? Do you keep this a secret? Dr. Neruda they didn't take established leaders in the field of physics. They sought out the young, budding geniuses that were still relatively unknown, but under the right guidance and with the best available technology, could produce something extraordinary. Sarah liked the transistor? Dr. Neruda liked the transistor. Sarah so if the SPL was established in 1938, when did the ACIO come into? Existence? Dr. Neruda it was established in 1940 shortly after the SPL was organized. Sarah Y. Dr. Neruda first, in part, it was because management within the SPL feared discovery by Congress. So they decided to construct Black Root, which was the cotton M of the ACIO, in order to build a laboratory that was untouchable by political forces or the media. Second, they didn't want the research agenda of the SPL competing with ET issues. When all of this first occurred, ETs and UFOs were still a subject of great debate within the SPL. Most of the SPL leaders didn't believe in them. There was no hard evidence. But when the first spacecraft was found intact, it changed the minds of everyone within the SPL and it was decided that a separate research agenda needed to be developed and that it was the more urgent and secretive of the two labs. So, Black Root, or the ACIO as it became known later, was established behind the SPL at a deeper level of secrecy. It was an acknowledged two levels deep. Sarah were you referring to the Roswell incident just then, about the recovered spacecraft? Dr. Neruda no. This was an abandoned spacecraft found in waters off the coast of Florida in 1940. Sarah it was just abandoned? Who found it? Page 120 Dr. Neruda as the story goes, a recreational diver found it in waters about 60 feet deep. It was perfectly preserved. Sarah whatever happened to the diver? Dr. Neruda it was an anonymous tip given to the Navy. The person who 
discovered it was never found. However, we later learned that the discovery was a staged event. Sarah a staged event? Dr. Neruda meaning that the discovery was orchestrated by the Cordium. Sarah so this was a Cordium spacecraft left behind to be discovered by the Navy? Dr. Neruda it's how they chose to make first contact. Sarah by leaving behind one of their spacecraft in the ocean, and then calling our Navy and telling them where to find it? Shit this is strange. Dr. Neruda yes, but it took three calls to get someone to investigate according to the log entries. Sarah okay, so this is how the ACIO came about. When did you get involved? Dr. Neruda in 1956, my father discovered a damaged spacecraft in the jungles of Bolivia during a hunting trip. It was a triangular vessel about 70 meters from end to end, nearly equilateral. It included 26 crew. All dead. Sarah Cordium? Dr. Neruda no. This craft was later confirmed as a Zeta ship. It was on a scouting mission similar to my father hunting for animals. Unfortunately, it malfunctioned in flight during an electrical storm. My father was an electronics dealer, mostly for the Bolivian military. Sarah I know you told me this story before, but please repeat yourself for the sake of the record. Dr. Neruda my father recovered a specific technology from the ship and then contacted a military official within the Bolivian government that was a trusted friend. Initially, my father was interested in selling the craft to the Bolivian military, but it quickly became a concern of the U.S. military specifically the SPL. A director from the SPL met with my father, ascertained the ship's location, and performed a complete salvage operation in the span of three days. Page 121 this was done in exchange for U.S. citizenship and a role within the SPL for my father. Sarah why did your father negotiate for this instead of money? Dr. Neruda we knew it was the only way to preserve my life and his. He retained control of a navigational technology that was aboard the ship and turned everything else over to the SPL. Sarah and what about the Bolivian government? Dr. Neruda they were handsomely paid. Sarah that's it? Dr. Neruda in the seven years between 1952 and 1959, six additional spacecraft were found under similar circumstances as in the case of my father. Only one of these was found in U.S. territory. The other five were willingly handed over to our military in exchange for money. Sarah I take it these countries didn't want to deal with the political implications? Dr. Neruda that but they also wanted the money and a friendly alignment with the U.S. military. They saw future benefits in the form of shared technologies, military protection, loans, and many other intangible benefits. In short, it was smart politics. Besides, no other country, outside of the Soviet Union, had any laboratories like the ACIO. What would they do with these spacecraft? Sarah your father and you end up in the United States, what qualified him for? Admission into the SPL and what did he do there? Dr. Neruda my father was not simply a salesman to the Bolivian government. He was an electronics expert with the equivalent of an advanced electrical engineering degree. He had several patents to his credit, but was considered something of a dreamer and a lost soul I suppose. Sarah is he still alive? Dr. Neruda no. Sarah I'm sorry. What about the rest of your family? Was it just you and your father that came to America? Page 122. Dr. Neruda I was an only child. My mother died shortly after I was born. I was only four years old when we came to the States. I really don't have strong memories of my home in Sorata. Sarah where's Sorata? Dr. Neruda north of La Paz on the east end of Lake Titicaca. Sarah maybe I've watched too many episodes of the X-Files, but it seems a little hard to believe that your father could negotiate a job in U.S. citizenship with the SPL. Can you explain how he did that? Dr. Neruda we asked. It wasn't such a hard thing. Here's a man that speaks perfect English, knows electronics, and has some political clout. 
More. Importantly, he led the SPL to a very important discovery, worth billions of dollars in research and development. And, my father was smart enough to photograph the craft and secure electronic components that pertain to navigation. He had these carefully secured with instructions for their distribution. Should anything befall him or me? Sarah don't take this the wrong way, but didn't you say that only young geniuses were hired into the ACIO? I assume your father didn't qualify. Dr. Naruda no, he wasn't a genius. But he was smart enough to add value to some of the reverse engineering experiments that were ongoing within the ACIO especially those that pertain to semiconductors. Sarah and all of this was happening in the mid-50s? Dr. Neruda yes. Sarah was 15 there at the time? Dr. Neruda no. He joined the ACIO in the spring of 1958. Sarah so you knew your father? Dr. Neruda my father, believe it or not, became a high-level director of the ACIO toward the latter part of his tenure, thanks largely to 15, who took an immediate liking to my father. Remember 15 is Spanish? My father knew 15 as well as anyone, and had the most respect for him. Sarah was your father part of the labyrinth group? Dr. Neruda yes. Page 123. Sarah when did you find out about the labyrinth group and its mission? Dr. Neruda 15 introduced me to it in a meeting I'll never forget. Sarah what time was this? Dr. Neruda September 18, 1989. Sarah what happened? Dr. Neruda 15 showed me a suite of technologies that had been part of a TTP technology transfer program with the cordium. He explained it activated parts of the brain that used the unconscious data stream with the conscious. It enabled a much more potent flow of data to be captured by the conscious mind. Sarah can you explain how it works? Dr. Neruda I'll do my best, but it's a technical explanation. I don't know any other way to do it. Sarah try. I'll signal when I'm lost. Dr. Neruda there's a part of the brain known as thalamocritical system. The cordium technology activated this specific section of the brain, inducing a small functional cluster within the system to expand the higher order consciousness. These are the neural coordinates of consciousness, pertaining to higher order reasoning, which is very useful to scientific inquiry, mathematics, in general. Problem solving. Yes? Sarah I'm not totally lost. But what's the role of this technology to the labyrinth group? Dr. Neruda when 15 first became acquainted with the cordium TTP he was the first to use this technology on his own brain Sarah yes, I remember now he got the vision of BST shortly afterwards. Right? Dr. Neruda correct. Sarah and this was why he established the labyrinth group to pursue the development of BST. Right? Dr. Neruda yes. Page 124 WING makers TL Sarah so, everyone who was handpicked by 15 got to use this cordium technology and everyone got smarter as a result. And no one outside the labyrinth group suspected that the labyrinth group existed? Dr. Neruda no one to my knowledge. Sarah okay, back to your story with 15. What happened? Dr. Neruda everyone who knew anything about 15 knew he was intensely interested in time travel, but I had no idea as to the degree of his intensity until that day. He explained the physics behind his BST plan and how the cordium played a vital role in its development. He wanted to reassign me to a new project that was related to BST development, and when he explained the nature of the project, I shook my head in disbelief that he felt I could do the job. Sarah what was it? Dr. Neruda it was a project that involved designing and developing an advanced neuronal selection technology for the human brain. A subject that I knew very little about. I raised this objection, but 15 explained that no one else did either, so it was just as well that I undertook the research. And then he casually explained the cordium technology for brain enhancement. This was when he told me how all personnel with a security clearance of 12 were invited to undergo the process. Sarah I assume everyone accepted the invitation. Dr. Neruda it's a safe assumption, although there are some drawbacks to the 
technology. Sarah like Dr. Naruta the information capacity of the conscious mind is very limited. When you intensify the connection between the conscious and unconscious, the conscious mind rejects the data stream's breadth of information and tends to become observational of the alternative states of consciousness. In other words, the brain enhancement process triggers a rapid and fluid shifting between states of consciousness, not unlike a slideshow in fast motion with each slide, representing a different state of consciousness. Sarah I think I follow you, but isn't it worth it if you can control this side? Effect? Dr. Neruda I thought so, as did everyone else. There were some that were more affected by this than others, and typically it only lasted for a few weeks until the higher mind began to integrate this into its dynamic core. Page 125 Sarah OK, enough about the brain, I'd like to return to the topic of the labyrinth group. You mentioned in the first interview that this is the most secret of all the organizations on the planet, even though it's one of the most influential. How does it operate in secrecy and yet exert its influence? Dr. Neruda the labyrinth group is a subset of the ACIO that's absolutely secret. Its main purpose was to create a staging organization for the pure state. Technologies that were part of the TTPs that 15 negotiated with the Zetas and Cordium. 15 didn't want these technologies within the ACIO where they were within striking distance of the SPL and potentially the NSA. He wanted to be able to review, analyze, and synthesize these new technologies before he figured out how to dilute them into less powerful technologies that could be exported to the SPL or the private syndicates we worked with. We used the best security technologies in existence. By that, I mean that we could secure our technologies from any hostile force. This enabled the labyrinth group personnel to focus on applications of these pure state technologies for the advancement of our BST agenda. Our influence is not understood by anyone because we've managed to release these diluted technologies into behind-the-scenes technologies that are used by our military, the NSA, DARPA, and private syndicates of our own choosing. Sarah I thought you said you even work with private industry? Dr. Naruta the Labyrinth Group doesn't work directly with the private sector. But some of our technologies filter into the private sector. Sarah like the transistor? Dr. Naruta no, actually the field effect transistor was more the development of the SPL. Sarah then gave me an example of something more recent that involved the labyrinth group and the private sector. Something I might be aware of. Dr. Neruda I can't think of anything that would be known to you at this time. Our technologies don't appear on the cover of Newsweek or Time. Sarah I just want to get some information that I can validate later. The transistor story, while interesting, doesn't give me anything I can follow up on. I doubt. Shockley's still alive. Is he? Dr. Neruda first of all, if he were alive, he'd never divulge the influence of the SPL in his research. Second, he died about eight years ago. Page 126. Sarah so what can you share with me that corroborates even to a tiny degree that the labyrinth group might exist? Dr. Neruda nothing. There's nothing you could do to trace things back to the labyrinth group. I can't stress it enough. Our ways of filtering technologies into the private sector are extremely subtle. Sarah OK, then. Just give me an example. Dr. Neruda the Labyrinth Group developed a computer system, which we call ZEMI. Part of the unique characteristics of ZEMI is that its information structure is based on a new form of mathematics for information storage, recombinant encryption and data compression. It was a mathematics that provided quantum improvements in each of these areas. And we shared it with scientists involved in the design of the MiG-29. Sarah Russia? Are you saying the Labyrinth Group works with the Russian government? Dr. Neruda no, we never worked with governments directly. In this case, we worked with the Fazitron Research and Production Company in Moscow. We supplied them with an assortment of algorithms, which they in turn adapted for use within their information and fire control radar systems aboard the MiG-29. 
These same algorithms were discovered by American interests and are now being adapted for use in broadband delivery systems for the global market. Sarah who's the American interest? Can you give me names? Dr. Neruda it's not a well-known company, but they go under the name of Omnigan, based in San Diego. Sarah and Omnigan has this technology, which was originally developed by the Labyrinth Group for Computer Storage, and now they're using it to build broadband delivery systems? In layperson's terms, can you tell me what these networks will do? Dr. Neruda assuming they use this technology appropriately, it'll enable Omnigan to embed a significant amount of functionality in the switches of the A network and not rely on server-side solutions, which will increase the speed and custom functionality of a network. Sarah by my definition, that wasn't in layperson terms. But it doesn't matter. Did the Labyrinth Group create this technology or reverse engineer it from ET? Sources? Page 127. Dr. Neruda a little of both, actually. They were created within the Labyrinth Group, but some of the initial thinking came from the Zetas, which was reverse. Engineered from one of their spacecraft. Sarah how did the organization in Russia get this technology from the Labyrinth Group? Dr. Neruda 15 knew one of the senior scientists at Fazitron and presented him with the idea. It was a friendly gesture, which he believed would later be useful in recruiting the scientist. This method of sharing creates loyalty and it can be done in such a skillful way that the recipient of the idea can believe it was their idea and not simply given to them. Sarah but you must track these technologies or how else would you know it? Ended up in Omnigan's hands? Dr. Neruda we have operatives from the intelligence community who feed us information. They're essentially moles that live within the major government research labs and the military industrial complex. In this case, one of our operatives at General Dynamics brought this to our attention. We even use our remote viewing technology to track some of our more advanced technologies that we've placed within major syndicates. Sarah maybe we should leave off there. I know you'd prefer to keep these sessions brief, although I'm very tempted to plunge into this topic of syndicates. Is there anything you'd like to add before we call it a night? Dr. Neruda no, not really. I think we covered a lot of information tonight about my personal philosophy, and for what it's worth. I'd like to remind you that it was my philosophy. I'm not trying to press it on anyone. And I'm certainly not trying to preach a particular message or lifestyle. I would hope that in our next session, with your help, we can concentrate on the wing makers and perhaps minimize my personal views on cosmology and the like. Sarah I'll try, but I can't make any promises. I had a complete list of questions to ask you tonight about the wing makers, but somewhere along the way I thought it would be interesting to better understand how you think. I'll try my best tomorrow night to keep on the subject of the wing makers. Do you have any suggestions? Dr. Neruda I think the artifacts are extremely interesting, so I'd recommend that. We focus on that topic. Sarah I'll do my best. Thank you. Page 128 The third interview of Dr. Jamis and Neruda Drive Neruda You're very welcome, Sarah. Thank you as well. End of Session 3 Page 129 TWOM slash KW By Sarah What follows is a session I recorded of Dr. Neruda on December 31, 1997. He gave permission for me to record his answers to my questions. This is a transcript of that session. This was one of five times I was able to tape record our conversations. I have preserved these transcripts precisely as they occurred. No editing was performed, and I have tried my best to include the exact words, phrasing, and grammar used by Dr. Neruda. It's recommended that you read the previous three interviews before reading this interview. Sarah as promised, one of the things I want to focus on in this interview is the ancient arrow site. From what you said the other day, the ancient Aero site was essentially stripped of its artifacts. Where are they now and what do you think the ACIO intends to do with them? Dr. Neruda as of the time of my defection, the site's Antecamber and 20 
three subchambers were carefully measured, analyzed, and each of the artifacts were catalogued. All of the artifacts that could be taken from the 23 chambers were moved to the ACIO lab for rigorous testing. The initial hope was that they contained accessible technologies that could somehow accelerate the deployment schedule for BST. However, I think that expectation changed. Following the discovery of the 24th chamber, Sarah you never really talked in any detail about the chambers before. What was so special about the 24th chamber? Dr. Naruto what was interesting about the chambers apart from the artifacts that contained was that the site was as sterile as an operating room, except the 23rd chamber. Remember that these chambers protruded outward from a central corridor that spiraled up through solid rock. From the top of the 20. Third chamber to the antechamber below was approximately 50 meters. We knew there were 24 chapters or segments on the optical disc, but we assumed that the antechamber even though it didn't have any artifacts was included. Thus, we falsely assumed that the 24 chambers were accounted for. Sarah they weren't? Dr. Naruda no. There was another chamber that had been hidden. Sarah how? PAGE 130. Dr. Naruda the 23rd chamber had a significant amount of rock debris on its floor. It had all the markings of being unfinished, as if the constructors had to leave suddenly or simply ran out of patience before they completed their mission. We invested a reasonable amount of time and analysis studying the walls and debris of the 23rd chamber, hoping to discern the methods of construction but we never suspected that there was a hidden passageway beneath the debris on the floor of the chamber. Sarah so, there was a trap door? Dr. Naruto shortly before my defection, a trap door was discovered by some ACIO researchers who were conducting a form of X-ray photography of the interior of the site. Sarah for what purpose? Dr. Naruto they were trying to determine if there were any structural deficiencies in the site that could cause instabilities within the site in the long term. We had, in effect, broken the seal on this site and introduced a significant amount of stress to the structure. 15, being the thorough person he is, wanted to be sure we hadn't inadvertently compromised the structural integrity of the site. He felt certain that the site's preservation was potentially critical. Sarah okay. So these X-rays showed a trap door to another chamber. How was it overlooked before? Was it completely hidden? Dr. Naruda not really. We had been told to leave all the chambers as we had found them other than to remove the artifacts and catalog everything we found. What we didn't realize was that the six inches of rock chips on the floor of the 23rd chamber concealed a vertical passageway. Sarah it went straight down? Dr. Naruda correct. It dropped nearly 50 meters Sarah but I thought the antechamber was 50 meters underneath the 20. Third chamber. Dr. Naruda it is, but not directly underneath. The 24th chamber is. Only separated by 4 meters from the nearest wall of the antechamber. Sarah was there a passageway between the two, or was the only entrance from. The 23rd chamber. Dr. Naruda the only entrance was from the 23rd chamber which made it near impossible to get to. Sarah Y. Page 131. Dr. Naruta because the passageway was cut too small for an adult body, and it was a long distance to traverse. Sarah with all your technology, couldn't you have made it wider? Dr. Naruta it was an alternative, but 15 didn't feel it was warranted. Sarah why not? It seems like a pretty important discovery, maybe the key to the whole site. Dr. Naruda the ACIO had technologies that allowed us to drop cameras down the passageway and photograph the entire chamber remotely. Sarah what did you see? Dr. Naruda it was the largest of the 24 chambers in all dimensions. Its wall painting was the largest, and like the 23rd chamber, was oriented horizontally instead of vertically. There was a technology artifact that we removed from the chamber that, as far as I know, is like all the others, inaccessible to the ACIO probes. Sarah other than the chamber being larger in scale, were there any other differences? 
Dr. Neruda it was very similar to the 23rd chamber in the sense that it was also unfinished in appearance, but it was about three times as large in volume. There were a series of glyphs incised on the wall opposite the painting that were organized in seven groups of five characters. Sarah I know you showed me photographs of the chamber paintings, did I see? This one? Dr. Neruda no. Sarah what's it look like? Dr. Neruda it's the most abstract and complex of the collection, and consequently, hard to describe. Like all the chamber paintings, we invested considerable effort and time to decode the symbols and analyze the content of the painting, but we only had speculation as to its real purpose. Sarah any hypothesis on why the 24th chamber was hidden? Dr. Neruda remember that the site was interpreted by most within the labyrinth group as being loosely based on our human genome Sarah because of the helix shape? Page 132. Dr. Neruda that and the fact there were 23 chambers the precise number of chromosomes or pairs of chromosomes in a normal human cell. These factors, along with some of the detail contained within the chamber, paintings and philosophical text we decoded, led us to conclude that the site was designed to tell a story about the human genome. Sarah okay, but why was the 24th chamber hidden and how does that relate to the human genome? Dr. Neruda I don't know with certainty, but remember that the 23rd chromosome determines the sex of the individual. The wall painting from the 23rd chamber is the only painting that shows albeit abstractly the genitalia of both a man and a woman. We assume that this was deliberate. The fact that the 23rd chamber was unfinished suggested that the 23rd chromosome was also somehow unfinished, implying that there may be some other function of the sex gene that has not been completed yet. Sarah but isn't the entire genome unfinished? I remember reading that 95% of the genome is unused. Isn't that true? Dr. Neruda it's true that the instructions contained within the genes are mostly unused, but the genes themselves, as far as their instruction set, are not incomplete so far as we know. There are, of course, genetic mutations that occur from time to time, but again these are not states of incompletion so much as spontaneous adaptation to genetic interfusion. Sarah then what's the case with the 24th chamber? Are there instances when some people have 24 chromosomes? Dr. Neruda first, it's 23 pairs of chromosomes, and yes, there are people who have an extra chromosome, but it's generally not desirable, and is often lethal. In our research, we've never seen 24 pairs of chromosomes in a healthy, normal human. Sarah but isn't it possible that it's not about pairs of chromosomes? There aren't any pairs of chambers, so maybe they're talking about 24 chromosomes period. Dr. Neruda this possibility was certainly explored. Sarah and Dr. Neruda there was no reliable evidence, so the theory was discounted. Sarah so nothing human has 24 chromosomes or 24 pairs of chromosomes? Why would the wing makers construct something so obviously genetic in its shape and make an error like this? Dr. Neruda no one within the labyrinth group believed there was an error. Chimpanzees, orangutans, and gorillas possess 24 pairs of chromosomes. Page 133. Sarah Apes? Dr. Neruda any molecular biologist will tell you that our genome is a 98% match of the chimpanzee. Sarah are you suggesting that the wing makers produced this site in homage to the chimp? Dr. Neruda no. I'm simply relating the truth. Until 1955 scientists believed that humans had 24 pairs of chromosomes just as a chimpanzee or a gorilla. But then it was discovered that somewhere in time, humans fused two chromosomes into one Sarah and how does this all relate to the discovery of the 24th chamber? Dr. Neruda it probably doesn't. The human genome is like a set of encyclopedias with 23 volumes. It's quite possible that the 24th chamber, in this case, is the equivalent of the index or navigation volume. Sarah but it's not visible like the other 23 chromosomes? Dr. Neruda we thought there was significance in the fact that the 24th 
chamber was hidden, and was only connected by a narrow, vertical passage to the 23rd. It's possible, in theory, that the 24th chromosome isn't a molecular-based gene repository. There may be a genetic mutation that is being foreshadowed in our future, or the 24th chamber is a metaphor for a new functionality of the human species that is as yet dormant or non-coded. Sarah So, what does 15 think it all means? Dr. Naruto ZEM I have done an exhaustive search of the variables, and I believe 15 had more or less accepted its most probable alternative, that the 20 Third chromosome was destined to mutate and create or catalyze the creation of a 24th chromosome that would act as a navigation system or index for future geneticists. Sarah and ZEM I deduced all of this from a single painting. Dr. Naruto ZEM I had 62 different analyses of the 24th chamber painting, and each of them had probabilities of over 40%. This is Unheard of unless an object is coded in sufficient complexity, and this coding is consistently applied to produce a web effect of possibilities. This painting, along with the glyphs on the opposite wall, achieved that end. The ACIO calls this phenomena, complexity interlocks, with factors on a scale of 0 to 1. 100. If an object or event has a CI of 15, it's considered a coded object. The artifacts of the 24th chamber had the highest CI of all the chambers 94.6. To put it into perspective, the next highest chamber, chamber 6, had a CI of 56.3. Page 134. Sarah why is that important? Dr. Neruda because 15 looked at the 24th chamber as the key to understanding the ancient arrow site. ZEMI's analysis was very specific, much more so than I'm able to relate in this conversation. Sarah can you give me an example of how ZEMI determines this CI index? Dr. Neruda the painting or object is scanned and reduced to its digital components. Color, scale, position, shape, and repetition are all established and analyzed. For example, one of the abstract figures in the 24th chamber painting appears to be floating upside down and happens to have 23 stars within its midsection. ZEM I would associate significance to this, and this would become a thread of the web effect. ZEM I would continue to create these threads, looking for a consistent pattern. If a pattern emerges with sufficient mathematical coherence and context, it deduces that the object is designed for a purpose. Sarah in other words, a higher CI indicates a higher purpose, Dr. Neruda yes, but especially if the distinction is significant as in the case of the 24th chamber. Sarah if all these pieces are fit together, the picture that emerges is that the ancient arrow site was created as a metaphor of the human genome, and that it's predicting a mutation that will produce a 24th chromosome, which leads us right back to our hairy cousins. Wouldn't this be devolution? Dr. Neruda no. Sarah why not? Dr. Neruda the molecular environment of the 23rd chromosome is the most antagonistic and dynamic of all the human chromosomes. This makes it a cauldron for potential mutation. Molecular and evolutionary biologists are only now beginning to recognize this inherent reality of the 23rd chromosome. ZEMI's analysis was that the 24th chamber painting was concerned not with our sexual identity as in the case of the 23rd chromosome, but our spiritual identity. Sarah how so? Dr. Neruda it would take me at least 20 minutes to explain the rationale. Do you want me to proceed? Sarah can you give me a summary? Page 135. Dr. Neruda I'll try. There are several connections between the 23rd and 24th chambers. The most notable being that the 24th chamber is only accessible from the 23rd chamber. This suggests that the 24th exists as a result of the behaviors and conditions of the 23rd. In a sense, the tunnel connecting the two chambers is a birth canal, and the 24th chamber is the baby. Since the 23rd is a sex chromosome, that is, it determines the sexual and physical identity of the individual, its purpose is largely binary. It's quite 
logical to conclude that if it were to give birth to a new chromosome, it may have something to do with our spiritual identity, particularly in light of all the other information we have about the central race. Sarah I get the feeling that you believe this. Dr. Neruda I think it's a viable hypothesis, but the exact purpose of the ancient aerocyte is yet to be determined with high confidence. Sarah are there any other sites similar to the ancient aerocyte that the ACIO got involved in? Dr. Neruda no, nothing of this magnitude, but the ACIO involves itself in anything anomalous that may have ET influence. Sarah can you give me an example? Dr. Neruda there was an underground installation of engraved stones found in Peru in the mid-1960s. Some of the circumstances regarding the site are similar. Sarah how so? Dr. Neruda it was an underground installation of considerable complexity and it contained tens of thousands of stones that had been intricately engraved with pictographs that depicted a vast historical record of earth and the prehistorical culture all carved on a stone known as andesite. Sarah and was this site also kept off the record? Dr. Neruda no, quite the contrary, but it was targeted with heavy disinformation and ultimately discredited by academic institutions that no doubt felt threatened by the revelation. Sarah I still don't see how a government organization like the ACIO can operate behind the scenes and our own elected officials be completely unaware of both its existence and agenda. Page 136. Dr. Neruda not all of your elected officials are unaware of the ACIO, but you're right about one thing they do not know its true objectives. Sarah so who knows and who doesn't? Dr. Neruda it's not such a simple thing to provide you with a list of names. Those who know, and are elected officials, form a very short list Sarah how short? Dr. Neruda I would prefer not to say at this time, only that it is less than 10 in number. The world body politic is not divided into Republicans and Democrats or liberal and conservative parties. They are divided into a stratification of knowledge and vital intelligence. The financial oligarchy of the secret network I mentioned last week possesses superior knowledge, some of which it shares with the military force and some of which it shares with the isolationist forces. These three forces are the principal way the world is organizing itself, and the presumed alpha organization is the incunabula because they control a dominant share of the world's money supply and hard assets. Sarah OK, stop a moment because I did some research since our interview Saturday, and learned a little bit about the organization called the Illuminati. Is this the same organization you're now referring to as the incunabula? Dr. Neruda no. The Illuminati is part of the secret network, but it's not the Alpha Organization. The Illuminati is affiliated with other Blue Blood organizations, mostly originating from European roots, but its goals and objectives are not aligned to the Incunabula. Sarah in what way, because from my reading it seemed like it was the secret network you were referring to. Dr. Neruda first, you need to understand that the secret network, as I was, referring to, is loosely assembled and not well aligned because of competing agendas. Nonetheless, there is a sense of camaraderie between some of the more powerful groups mostly because they share an elite status in business, academia, or government. However, these groups are generally designed to help its members build greater wealth and influence through the members' network of business and government contacts. It is somewhat comparable to a high-powered networking organization. Sarah are you sure we're talking about the same organization? Page 137. Dr. Neruda there are many stories about the Illuminati that are based more on legend than evidence. Too many conspiratorial objectives are credited to them. And they are not organized in this way. Their leadership is too visible and carefully scrutinized by the media. When you have this condition, you can, in most instances, dispel the notion that global, conspiratorial objectives are in the works. Sarah what about the occult references to the Illuminati? Are they true? Dr. Neruda the supposed leaders of the Illuminati are not occultists or Satan worshippers as they are sometimes accused. Again, this is conspiracy theory run amok.
usually by those who seek to define enemies that can embody Lucifer, which in their mind is synonymous with the occult. The Illuminati, while it exists as an elite organization, is made up of men and women that do not conform to one belief system. The spiritual beliefs of their members are not used as criteria to acquire membership. What's important is a member's personal network of contacts. Sarah but don't they have a tremendous influence on politics? Dr. Neruda yes, they have influence, as do the Masons, and Skull and Bones, and 27 other organizations that make up this loose-knit network of the elite, but the people who control the master plan are not directly affiliated with any one of these 30 organizations. The reality is that these organizations really operate in one of three forces that do have alignment under the controlling hand of the Incunabula. Sarah so you're saying that within these three forces the world's political stage is organized, and the group with the most money also has the best knowledge and basically controls the other two groups? Dr. Neruda the Incunabula doesn't dictate to the other two forces. It strategically releases information that lures the two forces in the direction it wants them to go. You can look at these three forces as part of an equilateral triangle, with the Incunabula at the apex, and the global military force at one base and the isolationist force at the other. This is the real structure of global power. Sarah I'm not clear about the different objectives of these three forces. Dr. Neruda the Incunabula is concerned with the globalization of monetary channels and vital supplies like petroleum and natural gas. The military force is concerned with spreading and preserving democratization throughout the globe, and in so doing, protecting the self-interests of the dominant superpowers of America and Western Europe. And the isolationist force is focused on industry and wealth building for its citizens at the state level. Page 138. Sarah but how does the Incunabula lure these other two forces to do its bidding? Can you give me an example? Dr. Neruda why do you think Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait? Sarah to grab its oil wells and make a lot of money. Dr. Neruda on the surface that is close to the truth. Following the Iran-Iraq war, Saddam had depleted too much of his country's wealth, and to be sure, he was interested in the wealth production of Kuwait, but he also knew that his military was not designed to invade and annex countries, and he was aware that the superpowers would protect their interests in Kuwait. Saddam had a real dilemma, he had upwards of a million soldiers that were without jobs after the Iran-Iraq war and there was no place within Iraq's broader economy to absorb these men. The military force was aware of Saddam's dilemma, and through a consistent disinformation campaign by the military force, Saddam was led to believe that he would be allowed to invade Kuwait without superpower retaliation. There are high-level operatives within the military force that are also the eyes and ears of the Incunabula. It was well understood that Iraq had weapons of mass destruction that it had developed during the course of its war with Iran. The military force saw this as a destabilizing element of its long-term policy to bring democracy American style to the oil producing region. The Incunabula does not have control of the Middle East oil. It is the only vital asset in which they do not exercise prime authority. Saddam Hussein was seduced by disinformation to attack Kuwait so that the military force could with the whole world looking on dismantle Iraq's defenses. This was a staged event of global impact exercised by the Incunabula and carried out by the military force completely unaware that they were being lured into this conflict in the same way as Iraq. Sarah and all because some elite trillionaires want to control the world's oil supply? Dr. Neruda it's much more complex than that, though that is a part of the equation. I'm not sure how much you want me to go into it. Sarah it's hard to stop after you drop this revelation on me. Where is this all headed? I mean what is the end goal of the Incunabula? Dr. Neruda do you mean in the context of the Middle East? Sarah yes. Dr. Neruda they want to control crude oil production. They want to exercise authority over this critical asset that is so fundamental to shaping world economies. They have page 139. 
controls over refining and the distribution of end products, but they lack control over the production, particularly in the Middle East. This is the fundamental goal. But it's surrounded by the tributary objectives of bringing a Western culture to the region and slowly, but surely, homogenizing the world's culture. They want this global culture as a framework in which to create global regulation. Sarah and how long will this take assuming they're successful? Dr. Neruda from the perspective of the ACIO, it has a probability of occurrence no more than 35% within the next 10 years and jumps to a 60% probability in 20 years. Thereafter, it becomes more probable with each passing decade, until it reaches near certainty by the year 2060. Sarah and when you say global regulation, what do you mean? Dr. Neruda the ability to regulate the vital resources of the planet is a singular global political body. Sarah Wood makes this such a critical goal of the Incunabula. Dr. Neruda the diminishing oil and natural gas supplies. These are non-renewable energy sources, and what required a billion years to create 3.2 trillion barrels of usable oil has only taken 110 years to reduce to 1.8 trillion barrels. The planet's oil supply is its economic lifeblood. As this diminishes, so does the economic system in which the world's people live. As the economic conditions erode, instability arises, and if left unchecked, chaos ensues. Sarah again you're saying that this is all about oil? Dr. Neruda tried to understand that to me it's astounding that this isn't obvious. Anyone who knows the condition of the world's oil supply can perform simple extrapolations and conclude that the world is approximately 50 years away from oil depletion and that assumes you use the more optimistic analyses. 1. The pessimistic side, it could be as little as 25 years. Sarah how can that be? I don't recall anything being said about this in the media. I would think this would be a huge story if it were that obvious and that ominous. Dr. Neruda there are many versions of this story that circulate in the media, but they never quite capture the attention of the mass media and the masses because they deal with the distant future a topic not held in high regard by citizens in love with their western lifestyles. Nevertheless, this future is precisely where the Incunabula place their focus because this is what determines the tactics of the present day. The depletion of the world's oil supply, coupled to the growth in human population, is the dominant influence that is shaping the policies of the Incunabula and its timetable. Page 140 Sarah so the agenda of the Incunabula is to control the diminishing oil supply. In order to do what? Dr. Neruda at the highest levels of the Incunabula, the planning horizons are typically 20 to 100 years, depending on the issue. They are well aware that as the oil supplies diminish, oil will become increasingly more difficult to extract from the planet's reservoirs, and consequently, require at minimum a 30% delta in refining costs. This will have a profound effect on price, which can have the effect of producing a persistent recession in the world's economy. The planners of the Incunabula believe that by consolidating control of the oil supply and its distribution it is the best way to impose rationing at a global level without setting off Armageddon. Sarah, it's really that serious? Dr. Neruda I don't mean to sound like an alarmist, but this is the fundamental problem that the world must address in the 21st century. The brightest minds of our planet are well aware of this and have known this for 20 years or more. Sarah why then aren't the leaders of the world, and the brightest minds, working on alternative energy sources? Dr. Neruda in some instances they are. There are several alternative energy Sources that are under consideration some are not even released to the public yet. This time because they stem from technologies that also carry great potential as weapons. But the bigger issue is how to change the energy system of our modern day civilization from petroleum to a new energy source, or perhaps to change the manner in which we live in other words, our oil-dependent lifestyle. Sarah why is that such a big deal? I would think that as the world wakes up to the reality of dwindling oil supplies it would be very receptive to a new energy source. 
Dr. Neruda have you ever heard the quote by Machiavelli about the difficulty of changing a system? Sarah I don't think so. Dr. Neruda he wrote, there is nothing more difficult to plan, more doubtful of success, nor more dangerous to manage than the creation of a new system. 4. The initiator has the enmity of all who would profit by the preservation of the old system and merely lukewarm defenders in those who would gain by the new. 1. Sarah OK, so this requires a lot of preparation and planning, and probably persuasion. But what choices do we have? Page 141. Dr. Nerud This is the realism of the next 50 years. Sarah I presume the Incunabula plan to orchestrate this change of systems. M. I write on that? Dr. Neruda yes. As I said earlier, they believe the global regulation of energy, resources and the ability to manage population growth are the convergent issues of our time that if managed properly can avert Armageddon. Sarah you've said that word twice tonight Armageddon. What do you mean by that? Are you talking about World War III? Dr. Neruda Armageddon is defined by the ACIO as the chaos of humanity. It is the time when humanity plunges into chaos and the interfaces of global commerce, communication, and diplomacy are destroyed in favor of national self-preservation. If this were to happen, weapons of unusual power could be used to destroy 30% or more of the human population. This is a Definition that we don't like to talk about, but it's well known within the ACIO. As a possibility in the 21st century. Sarah so I assume you have your probability forecasts for this as well. Right? Dr. Neruda yes. Sarah and what are they, dare I ask? Dr. Neruda I'd prefer not to say. They aren't really relevant anyway because. They fluctuate based on world events. Sarah but this is what the Incunabula's planners are trying to steer clear of. Dr. Neruda yes. This consumes their agenda more than any other issue. Sarah what other organizations are consumed by this agenda? Dr. Neruda there are none. Sarah what? Dr. Neruda this agenda is unique to the Incunabula because they're the only organization that is focused squarely on averting this particular crisis condition. Based on the convergence criteria I stated earlier. Sarah you mean they're the only organization that's worried about Armageddon as it relates to dwindling oil supplies and population increases? Page 142 Dr. Neruda yes. Sarah but you're not telling me that other organizations aren't worried about World War III or Armageddon, however you define it. Right? Dr. Neruda every nation's leadership is concerned about these issues, but it's by no means the focus of their agenda. It is a small co-parentalized component of their agenda. This is precisely why 15 is involved with the Incunabula's planners, the threats to the human race are both real and persistent, and with each passing decade the conditions are only growing more fertile for fragmentation and chaos the very kind you would observe in tribal warfare. There is no fundamental difference. Sarah and the leaders of the military force know about this objective, Dr. Neruda no. They have their own agenda, which is related, but quite different as well. They don't aspire to regulate oil production. They intend to defend its availability and influence its price as a result. They're not concerned with globalization as it relates to economic or cultural platforms, but rather they're concerned with exporting democracy in order to ensure stabilization in the region and eradicate instability in the form of terrorists and dictators alike. Sarah but that seems at odds with everything I've heard about the military. Dr. Neruda in what way? Sarah you make it sound as though the military force is trying to bring stability or peace when everything I've ever read implies that the military feeds off of conflict and instability. If the world is at peace, then the military becomes a simple police force. Its power is reduced and its budgets are slashed. Dr. Neruda I understand your question. However, the military force is not the same thing as the military. While it is very pro-military, it operates in a longer planning horizon than military personnel. The military force is made up of high-level politicians, business people, intelligence members, 
academics, think tanks, and so on. Its members are from the United Kingdom, America, Germany, Canada, Australia, Israel, and many other countries. Its cohesion, as a group, is not so much a function of formal structure and meetings, but rather it's by publishing classified papers that are shared among its elite members. These papers define the platform, goals, long-term objectives, and essentially map out the strategy and tactics by which the military force intends to execute its plan. The military force is working on hybrid defensive and offensive weapons that relate to space, bioweapons, the Internet, and other environments that are as yet not viewed as battlefield arenas. They would contend that R&D budgets should be increased in order to develop these new weapons in order to secure the rights of free people to live without fear. Page 143. A preemptive attack. They intend to remove this reality from the face of the earth and at the same time, propagate democracy. Sarah but isn't this a noble goal? Dr. Neruda their goals are not necessarily misguided, but their methods to achieve these goals are. This is all about projecting power, and, as a consequence, dictating the prevailing political platform by which the world achieves peace. It is enforced peace. It is peace through power and manipulation. Sarah but it's still peace and it's still democracy. It's certainly better than the alternative of wars and anarchy or dictatorship. Dr. Neruda there are other means to achieve the same end. Sarah you said that the budget for military spending would only increase over time if the military force has its way. How would that happen amidst world peace? Dr. Neruda new threats will be determined that will create this need even though our countries of the world are at peace. Sarah are you talking about ETs again? Dr. Neruda among other things. China will likely be the last island of opposition that the wave of democracy will land upon, but when it does, the military force desires to have unique weapons at its disposal in order to swiftly bring the changes it seeks. Bioweapons will likely be the choice Sarah how is that possible when the US has banned bioweapons? Dr. Neruda unfortunately the discoveries in the human genome are too compelling for the military force to ignore as it pertains to bioweapons. Development. Research is already underway, and has been for two years, to develop bioweapons that target certain genomes indicative of a specific race. Sarah like Chinese? Dr. Neruda yes, but it doesn't mean the weapon would ever be deployed. It would simply be a known capability of the military force and that alone would make the change of regime irresistible. Sarah I have to stop here and make a confession. Part of me wants to cry when I hear this and bury my head in a pillow, and part of me wants to keep asking more questions. I'm really torn on this one. I don't think I want to talk about this anymore. Okay? Dr. Neruda I'm only answering the questions you ask of me as honestly as I can. Page 144. Sarah I know, and I'm not complaining about you or your answers really. I just needed to say what I was feeling. Dr. Neruda I understand. Sarah do you want to take a break and stretch your legs? Dr. Neruda I'm fine, but if you want one, I'll be happy to take a stretch. Sarah no, I'm fine. Tell me more about the isolationist force. What's their story in all of this? Dr. Neruda again, I don't want you to think that the military and isolationist forces are formal groups that have memberships and party platforms. They are informal, tacit coalitions at most, and they operate through the well-placed leadership of incunabula operatives. Also, it is important to remember that they're all part of the tribe of leadership that the Incunabula has forged over the last 57 years. In the case of the isolationist force, it's the least organized of the three forces. It's designed to spur economic policies and activities that generate wealth for the elite class throughout the world. As a force it is concerned with domestic state issues that drive economic growth and vitality. Its focus is to influence local state and national governments to facilitate commerce. Sarah am I correct in thinking that Republicans are more affiliated with the isolationist force? Dr. Neruda no. 
these three forces are not affiliated with any party or political organization. Someone can be aligned with both the military and isolationist force and not have any conflict doing so. They are not antagonistic. They're compatible forces. Also, these forces are not exclusively American. They are global forces albeit with dominance from American and European interests, but they're not party affiliations like Democrats and Republicans, nor are they state sponsored in any way. Sarah if the oil production is in the hands of the Incunabula, what will happen to the Arab state regimes that currently hold this power? Dr. Neruda it depends on the regime. The Incunabula is expert at influence through financial services and legal maneuvering. They will assert their influence slowly, gradually, and in a manner that will catch the royal families and cartel by surprise. Their patience is unmatched and they operate on multiple levels of influence, which is why they win nearly every time. Page 145 Even at the present time many of the royal families exert influence in domestic affairs, but not oil production. They reap the rewards of the oil financially, but others within their regimes are truly operating the production and interacting with the cartel, developing the core relationships of trust and influence. These are the ones that the Incunabula bring into their fold, and slowly win over as operatives in their plan. The military force, at the appropriate timetable, will overturn the regimes in conflict with the plan, and those regimes that are friendly, will be allowed to retain their domestic presence and influence. These are carefully orchestrated events. Sarah and once the Incunabula has control over oil production, what then? Dr. Neruda the dismantling of hard currency. The Incunabula desires to have an electronic currency because it tracks everything and enables a more thorough analytical insight into the affairs of the individual. Sarah so what do they want to do with all this information? Dr. Neruda they want to observe patterns and manipulate events in order to protect their dominance as a leadership body, and, as I said earlier, they want to define the new systems and manage system change. Once this dominance is perceived as reaching a critical mass, the Incunabula plans to create a global body of governance that brings stability to Earth and a set of policies that aid humanity at large. Sarah again you're telling me that their goal is to help humanity, but I find it hard to believe. Dr. Neruda in a way it is the only way they can retain power. If they concentrate wealth and services too much, they will lose control of the population they seek to govern. Rebellion is never far away when empty. Stomachs grumble in unison. Sarah how will they dismantle our hard currency? Dr. Neruda there will be a gradual devaluation of the stock markets. Worldwide. Americans in particular have become accustomed to easy money. Production within the stock markets, as well as lavish lifestyles. This will not be permitted to continue indefinitely. Recessions will occur in waves until the value of currency is called into question. This will begin in third world countries first. And as these become the initial victims of feeble economic policies, the Incunabula will essentially force these countries to sell their assets at rock bottom prices in return for helping them out of economic crisis. In the best of times, the world economy is a fragile patchwork of economic Systems that run at different rates without a smooth interface or a macro system in which to operate in the worst of times, it is a house of cards vulnerable to the faintest of winds. Hard currency and the monetary system that supports it will become a scapegoat of the economic slowdown, and electronic currency will increasingly become the solution to the general malaise of the global economy. Page 146 Sarah I'm not an economist so I don't even know what questions to ask, but it leaves me with a queasy feeling in my gut. I get the feeling that there's only one real power in the world and it's the Incunabula, and we're all just puppets of this elite group of monomen. Isn't that pretty much the subtext of all your comments? Here? Dr. Neruda no, not at all, but I can understand how you arrive at that. Conclusion given that we've been focused on the tried of power, or TOP, as we 
refer to it within the labyrinth group. T.O.P. is a reality on Earth, and it probably will be for many generations to come, and it's certainly in the best position to dominate world affairs and development, but there are other powers that can intervene and bring fresh opportunity to the world's people. Sarah like religious powers? Dr. Naruta yes, that's one, though they will never rival the Incunabula in terms of impacting on world affairs. Sarah so who are you talking about? Give me some names or examples. Dr. Naruta the rise of personal computers and the internet was never intended to occur according to the Incunabula. It was one of the developments that genuinely surprised the planners within the Incunabula and proved to be a very vexing issue for nearly a decade. Computing power was supposed to remain in the hands of the elite. The internet grew organically and at a pace that no one thought possible, and it caught the Incunabula completely off guard. Saraso technology is a power that frustrated the plans of the Incunabula? Dr. Naruta it's one example. Sarah I imagine the ACIO is another. Dr. Naruta the single greatest weakness of the Incunabula is its lack of scientific expertise within the ranks of its leadership. While it has technical and scientific members in special projects within the global military industrial complex, they are not leaders, and it is the leadership of the Incunabula that establishes its agenda. Sarah but I thought you said that 15 was part of the Incunabula. Dr. Naruta yes, but the ACIO is simply seen as a resource to the Incunabula. 15 is perceived as an anarchist whose vision could never be aligned with the leadership of the Incunabula. They don't even identify with his vision. Sarah if the Incunabula relies so heavily on ACIO technology, and they need scientific leadership, why don't they replace 15 and place someone they can control better? Page 147. Dr. Naruta they originally tried to have a director who would be more compliant, but it didn't succeed. Sarah how do you mean that? Dr. Naruta one of the first directors of the ACIO was a member of the Incunabula's military force and was very much an insider in terms of working with some of its higher ranking leaders, especially in America. Sarah can you disclose his name? Dr. Naruta Vannevar Bush. Sarah how do you spell his name? Dr. Naruta spelling it out. Sarah is he related to President George Bush? Dr. Naruta no. Sarah so he ran the ACIO when it was still in its infancy? Dr. Naruta yes. Sarah what happened to him? Dr. Naruta he was too visible, and it was rightly feared that he would not be able to retain secrecy. Sarah why? Dr. Naruta Dr. Bush was a gifted individual who exercised both technical vision and leadership skills. He had access to the leadership of the government and the Incunabula. He could manage a large team of scientists and engineers as well as anyone could. He essentially built the infrastructure for military research. But his celebrity status was troublesome to the founders of the Incunabula. Sarah give me a sense of the timetable because I have to admit I've never heard of this man. Dr. Naruta it was right near the end of World War II that Dr. Bush was asked to head up a team of research scientists that had supposedly been assembled from the NDRC and SPL to reverse engineer a recovered alien spacecraft that had been recovered in 1940 off the coast of Florida. These were actually top scientists from the newly formed ACIO. The page 148 spacecraft had been placed in cold storage because of World War II as the war ended, Bush became privy to this discovery through his network and offered his leadership to the project. As I understand it, he was just coming off the Manhattan Project when this opportunity presented itself. Sarah so he was considered a security risk and that ended his tenure at the ACIO? Dr. Naruta yes. This reverse engineering project was held in the highest possible secrecy. Dr. Bush ran the operation within the SPL through special funding from the OSS, which was the forerunner of the CIA. However, after a year's time, little progress was made and there were rumors attributed to Bush that alien spacecraft consumed his agenda. Bush reported directly to James Forrestal, who at the time was heading up the Navy but shortly thereafter became the first Secretary of Defense. 
Truman was president. The spacecraft that had been recovered was sufficiently intact to conduct reverse engineering studies on its propulsion system, which was the most critical knowledge that Forrestal hoped to extract from the project. Sarah what year are we talking? Dr. Neruda this would have been between 1945 and 1946. Sarah so what happened? Dr. Neruda bear in mind that my knowledge of these events is based on my study of the ACIO archive. I wasn't personally involved in any of these happenings, so I'm not vouching for their absolute accuracy. Sarah understood. Dr. Neruda Dr. Bush was asked to replicate the propulsion system of the recovered craft in 12 months, and was given the resources of the ACIO in order to do so. Sarah and did he succeed? Dr. Neruda only partially. The electromagnetic fields were not fully replicated in terms of their sustained intensity levels in metals because of electron drift, which, and I'm struggling to keep this in layperson's terms, was the primary reason they failed. Nonetheless, there were prototypes built that replicated aspects of the alien craft's propulsion system, and these were sufficient to galvanize funding and support for the ACIO. Sarah then why didn't Dr. Bush join the ACIO? Page 149. Dr. Neruda we knew it would require that he go underground and essentially become anonymous. He didn't want anonymity because he was a prodigious inventor and liked the limelight accorded him from government officials as well as the scientific community at large. Also, I don't think the head of the OSS thought his mental capabilities were sufficient to the task. Bush was a great organizer of talent, but he liked the commanding intellect in physics to lead the ACIO as it was envisioned in those days. Sarah how many people knew about this project? Dr. Neruda I'm not sure. Perhaps five or six knew the total scope of the project. And another fifty new elements of the project. It was, as I said before, a very well guarded secret. Sarah how do you keep something like this a secret? Dr. Neruda there are entire departments within our government that have responsibility for this. It's a very well-engineered process that includes legal contracts, clear penalty reminders, and known deterrence factors that include very invasive technologies. In the worst case, if vital information was disclosed, a different but related deprint would step in that would masterfully spread disinformation. It was, and still is, virtually impossible to bring this information to the public. Sarah they had invasive technologies even in 1945? Dr. Neruda yes. While the invasive technologies were more crudely applied, they were certainly effective. There was nothing more vilified in these undisclosed organizations than traitors. The entire organizational culture was designed to reward loyalty and severely punish disloyalty in any form. Sarah I want to switch topics for a moment. It seems that we're in a new stage of world peace and economic stability, but when I hear you talk, it seems that this just isn't possible given the nature of the Incunabula and the tribe of power that you were talking about earlier. Is this true? Dr. Neruda it is an illusion. There may be lulls in the movements of war, but look at the past 100 years. Isn't it an assemblage of wars? Sarah and all because war feeds the tribe of power as you call it? Dr. Neruda no. There are forces that truly believe in good and evil. In their view, countries like people are essentially cast into three categories good, neutral, and evil. Those that are good must dominate the world political structures and ensure that those that are evil are identified and reduced to a non-threat status. Sarah but the Cold War is over, right? The Soviet Union is no more, and what's left of it seems more or less friendly to the interests of the free world. Isn't this true? Page 150. Dr. Neruda when power is concentrated in a single person, and that country or organization develops long-range missile technology, it immediately becomes a target for concern within the intelligence community. Sarah and am I correct in assuming that the intelligence community you're Referring to is global and managed by the Incunabula? Dr. Neruda yes, but it is not formally managed by the Incunabula. Sarah I understand, but the results are the same, right? 
Dr. Naruta, yes. Sarah, I apologize for the interruption. Dr. Naruta, the perceived enemy is missile technology in the hands of a concentrated power. There are many, many countries that have this technology. So it ensures distrust. Organizations like the UN, United Nations are not sufficiently empowered to deal with these threats, so multilateral coalitions are developed between nations to deal with the perceived threats, often completely undisclosed to the public. Iraq is a perfect example. North Korea is another, though it lacks the strategic geography to place it on the top of the list. So, geography also plays a central role in this assessment. Sarah so essentially the world is coalescing into three camps. I understand that. But who determines who is evil, neutral, and good? I mean isn't this a terribly subjective call? Dr. Naruta whoever exerts the greatest global leadership in terms of projecting military force, economic vibrancy, and foreign policy makes this determination. And yes, it is certainly subjective, but it's precisely why the U.S. has adopted its imperialist attitude. It wants to define good and evil for the world, and in so doing, it can more effectively export its own definition of peace and democracy. Sarah sounds so simplistic when you put it those terms. Dr. Neruda it's a natural outgrowth of how a state engineers its power. The state requires its enemies in order to convince its citizens to accept its authority over their lives. The greater the fear the state is able to provoke in the hearts and minds of its citizens, the more power its citizens are willing to give to it in order to protect them from its enemies. All states, to varying degrees, do this. Sarah are you saying that the U.S., just to pick an example, engineers its enemies? You're really saying that America creates its enemies in order to increase its power domestically and internationally? Page 151. Dr. Neruda I don't mean that the U.S. literally creates its enemies. The U.S. has potential adversaries in many parts of the world. Its policy of military presence as a global protector is all that's required to create enemies. Its forceful export of its political belief system is also troublesome to many countries that see American interests as a prelude to cultural colonization. Sarah because we're the only remaining superpower? Dr. Neruda no. It's because the U.S. has a global military presence and economic lever that it wields with relative virtuosity. It is skillful at aggression without appearing aggressive. It protects and defends, and sometimes it will do this in a preemptive strike and sometimes in a reactive countermeasure that is usually at a force response that is several fold the original intensity. America's self-interests have become the standard of the free world, and there are those who fear it will dominate to the point of imperialism. Sarah how does all of this fit into the work of the Incunabula or the ACIO for that matter? Dr. Neruda the Incunabula uses the U.S. as a force for globalization. It is the lead horse pulling the nation states of the globe into a common economic and political platform. As far as the ACIO is concerned, it has thoroughly analyzed the various scenarios presented by U.S. global domination and find that there are only two scenarios in which the United States can achieve its ambitious aims without catalyzing a world war and plunging the global economy into a severe depression. Sarah can you disclose these? Dr. Neruda no. Sarah why? Dr. Neruda they are based on a mixture of remote viewing, advanced computer modeling, and preliminary BST tests. I am not willing to disclose this information at this time. Perhaps at a later date. Sarah I fully realize that we've gotten completely off the subject. But you seem to be leading me into this conversation. I can't help it. Dr. Neruda I understand. Sarah are there plans for making this all happen? I mean does the Incunabula actually engineer the globalization or does it sort of happen as a result of a nudge? Here and a nudge there? Page 152. Dr. Neruda it's a carefully orchestrated process. The planning is deep, penetrating, and exhaustive. It is not flawless nor is it carried out with perfect precision. Nonetheless there is certainly a plan and it's executed by the tried of 
power as I stated earlier. Sarah and you've seen this plan? Dr. Neruda I know of it through the Labyrinth Group. Fifteen requires each of us to know these plans on an intimate basis. Sarah can you disclose any of this plan? Dr. Neruda I think I have been alluding to it in this interview. Sarah yes, but you haven't been clear about how events will culminate in such a way that the Incunabula will rise to power. Dr. Neruda it is not preordained. There is no certainty in what I am about to disclose. It is a plan, albeit a plan created by very ambitious and capable people. Sarah duly noted. Dr. Neruda there are serious flaws within the global economy, and the United States will, within the next seven years, begin to express these flaws in ways that ripple through the globe and cause financial unrest. The best way to ensure that these flaws are controlled is to tighten corporate loopholes that allow greedy executives to exploit their shareholders and to seize control over the price of oil. Sarah wait a minute, I thought the greedy executives were exactly the profile of the Incunabula. Why would they lock down on their own turf? Dr. Neruda the Incunabula leadership is not comprised of greedy executives. It is made up of anonymous individuals. They are not sitting on corporate boards. They are not the Bill Gates of corporate America, nor are they the Blue Bloods of European royalty. They are anonymous, and through their anonymity they wield great power. They are the strategists of the tribe of power who plot and plan at such a level as to make corporate executives and politicians seem like preschoolers fumbling to hold a pencil. Sarah so if you gave me a name of the leader of the Incunabula, I couldn't look him up. He doesn't exist? Dr. Neruda that's correct. Sarah so these people are not really very different from those of you within the ACIO. Page 153. Dr. Neruda they are very different. They produce globalization and uniform economic and political platforms, while we produce breakthrough technologies. They practice hegemony, while we practice science. Sarah I didn't mean to offend you. I thought you said earlier that the Incunabula used white papers and think tanks to promote its vision for the future. Dr. Neruda no, it is the military force that does this. The Incunabula is multi-tiered, as I've said before. It produces ideas and frameworks that produce the right conditions for the think tanks and other forces of the elite power base to exert influence. It is a very complicated process. If you would like me to go into it, I will. Sarah no, I sort of interrupted you. You were talking about the Incunabulus. Plan. Dr. Neruda they desire a paperless currency coupled to a global leadership. And to carry this out they require a restructuring or perhaps more precisely, a complete re-engineering of resource and power sharing. Sarah can you elaborate on this a bit? Dr. Neruda the plan requires new leadership in the Arab states. There is general concern that the Arab states will consolidate much like Europe is in the process of doing, and new superpowers will be created out of this consolidation. Multiple superpowers make consolidation of the global economic platform a thorny proposition. Because of its natural aggression as a superpower, the United States is the spearhead of the Incunabula to usher in the required changes of their plan. It will be positioned to exert a strong military and cultural presence in the Middle East, in Asia, partly for oil considerations and partly for the purpose of gradually westernizing the indigenous cultures. Sarah hold on a second. Our military bases are as much for the protection of our allies as for ourselves, and as for culture, we may export our movies and pop stars, but other countries are just as eager to be trendsetters in the culture game. Dr. Neruda there's a difference. The U.S. protects and defends because it can establish military bases in those regions after it is done defending. Agreements are made sometimes without the public's knowledge to have military bases and protective forces therein for domestic peace issues and normalization. The U.S. has over 170 military bases on foreign soil. This number will continue to grow as dictated by this plan. In regard to the export of culture, yes, you are right, the U.S. is not alone in this. 
but it leads the way through its capitalistic leverage of pop culture. No one does. This as well as American corporations. They have set the world standard for monetizing content and brands. Other countries mimic this standard and add their weight. Collectively, the culture of capitalism reaches the Arab nations. China, North Korea, Southeast Asia, and the people of these countries. Especially the new generations are seduced by its allure. Page 154 Wumakusara I can't help but get the impression that you're not very patriotic. Dr. Neruda the plan I share with you is rooted in the success of the United States to secure unilateral superpower status by the turn of the century. The U.S. will, as a result, be required to assert itself because there will be many challengers and discreditors. However, in this process, it will increase its worldwide presence as the leader of the free world. This is the goal that many throughout the world hold dear to their heart, whether they voice the sentiment or not. I don't hold any grudge against the U.S. for this assertion. Any nation would do the same thing if given the opportunity. The United States is relentlessly aggressive in all the important dimensions military, culture, capitalism, applied technology, foreign policy, space, economic policy, and intelligentsia, to name the most critical areas in nature, the alpha male dominates through strength, cunning, and aggression. It is no different in the world of humans and statehood. The alpha male also has a responsibility for protection and sustenance. And the Incunabula planners selected the U.S. as being the most suitable country to lead the pack of other nations to the global platforms it has designed and is readying. Sarah okay, it sort of makes sense, what you're saying, but the Incunabula wants the U.S. to lead the world to a global community of free, democratic states with a global culture based on capitalism. How do they know the free world will elect them to govern them? Dr. Neruda they don't. There are, as I've said many times here tonight, no guarantees. All I can say is that they don't miscalculate very often, and when they do, they adjust to the changes presented them. Again, the planners of the Incunabula, the real architects behind these events, are not interested in being the leaders of Earth in terms of visibility. They want to appoint the leadership while giving the world a sense of choice. Sarah, it's very hard to imagine how the world would select one leadership. It sounds like something that is hundreds of years in the future if ever. Dr. Neruda, I understand your conclusion, but what seems implausible today can rapidly evolve if the proper conditions are created. This is precisely what the Incunabula are focused on above all else. They realize that this may not take place until the year 2040 or even later, but they are convinced that consolidation of power at a global level is necessary in order to prevent planetary destruction or what we talked about earlier as Armageddon. Sarah what do you mean by planetary destruction? Dr. Neruda there are many decay forces that can take hold of a planet and cause its decline as a supportive living environment. In our interactions with extraterrestrials, this is a common theme that is expressed because this condition frequently accompanies the rise of post-Sadurn civilizations. Page 155 When macro human populations fragment across a planet, developing their unique cultures, language, economic systems, and state identities. Certain states have the good fortune of natural resources and some do not. As these natural resources of the planet are converted into commercial advantage, some states flourish economically and some flounder. As the stronger states begin to dominate the weaker, military forces and weapons are created. Applied technology becomes the ultimate weapon. If multiple superpowers are allowed to develop they can bring destruction to the human populations of the planet. If population densities reach a critical level, it can have the same devastating effects. The human residents increasingly bring the planet under pressure. If left unchecked, the planet can reach a critical stage of destruction whereby human populations no longer find the planet a suitable habitat. Sarah so you're saying that the whole reason the Incunabula are engineering the globalization of Earth is because they want to save Earth from destruction? 
Dr. Neruda I will put it this way. The leaders of the Incunabula are very clear about the threats that Earth will undergo in the 21st century. They believe their orchestration of human events better serves the human population than to leave it to the forces of competitive politics. They genuinely believe that the self interests of the states will prevent a consolidation of global power. Sarah remind me again, why is this consolidation, as you put it, so critical to our survival? Dr. Neruda because the threats that will confront the human population in the 21st century will be global issues whether they are intractable. Recessions, dwindling oil supplies, food distribution, overpopulation, pollution, nuclear fallout, or extraterrestrial visitations, they will require a global coordinated response. Unless the nations of the world are united, they will respond too slowly to the threats, and the decay forces will have such traction that they may be impossible to reverse. Sarah but isn't this why the United Nations was formed? To deal with these very issues? Dr. Neruda the United Nations is a prototype that the Incunabula designed to serve as an experiment to test the format for a world government. It was never considered to be the format for consolidation. The issues of which I'm speaking are not confronted in the United Nations. Even if they're discussed and debated, Resolutions are designed to help remedy the problems, but ultimately it depends upon the will of the individual state to implement, monitor, report, analyze results, and make a juicence, and this is not enforced in any reasonable manner. A world government, to be effective, will require the ability to enforce and adjust resolutions base page 156 on sound analysis. Otherwise these threats will arise and the world's people will not be able to speak with a single voice, and more importantly, to act as a unified force against threats. Sarah so this is the real end game of the Incunabula? What happened to the greedy elitists you disclosed earlier? Dr. Neruda Greed is alive and well within the ranks of the Incunabula. But I've been talking about the planners of the Incunabula the people who have the real grip on power. They don't operate out of greed. They have assets that are beyond the imagination of even wealthy people. The acquisition of wealth is completed for them. The planners are concerned with securing humanity's future, rather than generating wealth for themselves. Sarah OK, I understand you're a sympathizer of the Incunabula, but what happened to the insatiable greed and self-interests? I know you mentioned this before. Dr. Neruda it exists. But the Incunabula, like any undisclosed organization is composed of multiple levels. Operatives at the lower levels function within a set of rules and norms that do not apply to the higher levels. In other words, planners operate in a completely different organizational culture. There is a sophistication and penetrating insight at the highest levels that are not existent at the operations level. Planners within the Incunabula are of a special character and they feel a genuine responsibility to manage the global affairs of humanity. They are most certainly better equipped than heads of state to perform this function, and so they compose and orchestrate world events instead of merely participating in their unfolding. Over time, this role has made them very responsible and even paternalistic to humanity as a whole. They're not motivated by greed as are many others within the Incunabula and the broader tribe of power, but they earnestly desire to save the planet. They're like captains of a ship that know where the dangers lie in the waters below and steer quietly away because they do not want to go down with the ship. Sarah OK, when you say these planners are anonymous, they must have names and identities, right? Dr. Neruda no. They operate outside of our system. They cannot be tracked or identified. If they were to be hit by a car and sent to a hospital, they would have diplomatic papers and immunity. They would not have any record of existence outside of this. And even if their identity were researched, it would lead to a fabricated identity. Sarah what about family and relatives? I assume they were born into families, weren't they? Page 157. 
Dr. Naruta yes, they are human if that's what you're implying. In most cases, they're groomed for their positions from an early age. When they reach their early 20s they're typically brought into a direct mentorship with one of the Incunabula planners and a very specific succession process has begun, which usually lasts for about 10 years. When the person is in his mid-20s his loyalty is tested in every conceivable manner over the next five years. If he passes these tests, he is allowed to preview the inner workings of the Incunabula. For most, this is near the 33rd birthday. At this point, a new identity is transferred to the person and they die quite literally so far as their family and friends are concerned. These deaths are arranged as covers for their new identities and usually involve drowning or a fire accident, where physical evidence is minimal. Prior to their arranged death, insurance policies, if they exist, are cancelled to ensure minimal investigation. And usually the death is staged during a trip to a specific third world country, where police investigators are more easily controlled. After their death event, the new planner is inducted in a secret ceremony that I do not have details of. This inner circle becomes the surrogate family for the new planner, and as they develop in their skills, insights, intuition, and knowledge base, they develop a very protective sensibility to the long-standing goals and objectives of the incunabula. Sarah okay, but don't they ultimately get married and have children? How do they keep all of this separate? I mean how do you go to work during the day and plan the future of the world and then come home to dinner with the wife and kids? Dr. Naruta the planners are not married. It's frowned on by the incunabula. It is one of the tests I mentioned that they undergo in their mid-twenties. Sarah so it's a priesthood? Dr. Naruda not at all. No one is asked to be celibate, but the role of the planner is all-consuming. It requires minimal distractions and commutes outside of their role as planners. It's a sacrifice and it heightens loyalty within the circle of planners. Sarah how do they find future planners if they don't have children? Dr. Naruta there are only five to eight planners at any one time within the Incunabula. Five is the core number, but there are usually two or three in training as well, but these do not have voting powers. I mention this because it is a very small number. Now, as to your question, candidates are identified early one. Usually when the person is a teenager. Sarah is this is a result of them doing something noteworthy or does it result from something else? Dr. Naruta they are, with rare exception, identified as a result of their genetics. Sarah how is this done? Page 158. Dr. Naruta it's a result of extensive tracking of lineages and genetic traits, including mutations. This is something that is well understood by the Incunabula, and is given a significant amount of time and invisant genetic. Candidates are identified and observed over a period of about three years before any contact is made. Sarah how many, at any one time, are being tracked? Dr. Naruta about 50 in number, but out of every generation only two or three are chosen. Sarah and those that are chosen don't even know they were passed over? Dr. Naruta yes, that's correct. Sarah how did the planners come about? I mean, how did they rise to? Leadership? Dr. Naruta the Incunabulo came to its power as a result of the inefficiencies of the intelligence community to gather information and position its strategic value relative to the long-term crises that were forming on the horizon as they pertain to the global economy. Shortly after the Second World War, many nations, including the United States, restructured or initiated their intelligence organizations particularly as it related to foreign policy intelligence gathering. However, these organizations were still locked into the Cold War mentality and didn't formally share intelligence as a result. The Incunabula arose out of a need to consolidate global intelligence as the best means to strategically maneuver the nation states to a unified platform of commerce. Sarah so it was less about saving the world than it was about making money, at least initially. Dr. Naruta yes. Sarah but how did it all start? I mean who decided it would be a good idea to 
create an organization that shared intelligence? Dr. Naruta if I gave you his name, it wouldn't mean anything to you. I assure. You his name is not recorded in any directory or reference material you could. Research. Sarah but there was only one person that started this organization. Dr. Naruta no. There were five men that started it, but one sparked the vision. Page 159. Sarah as you're talking I can't help but think that these planners sound a lot. Like the Hollywood portrayal of the Antichrist. I mean don't they wield the godlike power? And yet I haven't heard you say anything about a religious or spiritual connection. Dr. Neruda I think the power they wield is directed at the survival of humanity. They're not evil in the sense that they're intent on destroying Earth or humanity. They're trying to guide humanity to new systems before the old systems decay and create the conditions that could bring annihilation to a substantial percentage of the species. The choices of a fragmented state leadership or anarchy are not suitable systems for modern, civilized man. They invariably lead to imbalance and an inability to move from the old system to the new system. Before the advent of long-range missile technology, nuclear, biological and chemical weapons, this migration of the human race from one system to another was not as critical. But the chasm that exists between systems as complex as economies and energy, and in light of modern weapons technology, the Incunabula serve a vital role. Sarah do the planners believe in God? Dr. Neruda I presume they believe in a higher power. Perhaps they don't call it God because of the religious overtones contained in that word, but they certainly are aware of the unification force because 15 has acquainted the present generation of planners with the LERM technology. Sarah that's interesting. So they've all seen LERM and know how it works? Dr. Neruda yes, to your first question, but I don't believe they understand how it works at the microfactual level. Sarah when someone like an Incunabula planner interacts with LERM, assuming he didn't believe in God beforehand, in other words he's an atheist. Does it convert him? Dr. Neruda again, it depends on the definition of God. If they don't believe in God as defined by a certain religion, and then experience LERM, they will not be persuaded by LERM to believe in the religious version of God. Sarah I think I followed your explanation, but what I mean is different. Assume they didn't believe in any higher power, that the universe is a big mechanical formation that became the way it did by some evolutionary quirk. Would someone of this mindset become a believer that there's a force orchestrating things even if you don't choose to call it God? Dr. Neruda everyone who has undertaken the LERM experience concludes that a unifying intelligence pervades the universe in every measurable dimension, and that this intelligence is both personal and universal simultaneously, and because of this feature, it is absolute unique, singular. Page 160. It's a life-changing experience even if you already believe in God. You are converted, as you put it, no matter how strong or weak your previous beliefs in God were. Sarah it's too bad you didn't bring this technology with you when you defected. I'd love to experience this. So, back to the Incunabula for a moment, it would make me feel better if I knew they believed in God and you're saying they do. Right? Dr. Neruda they believe in this unifying intelligence that I spoke of, and I suspect that if you asked them, they would tell you that they're guided and perhaps even inspired by this intelligent force. I don't know if they would call it God or some other name. But I trust they are believers in what some would call the unification force. Sarah but it's not like a religion to them? Dr. Neruda that's correct. I know of nothing that would suggest that the Incunabula planners follow a specified religion or desire to start one for that matter. Sarah I don't know why I'm asking all these questions tonight, but it's fascinating to hear more details about the Incunabula. I find it an irresistible topic. How is it that you know so much about such a secretive organization? Dr. Neruda as I mentioned previously, the ACIO is a major contractor with the Incunabula and receives funding and support from them, including shared 
intelligence and mutual protection. As a result of this long-standing relationship, directors at the ACIO have considerable insight into the organization. 15 is not a planner, but is held in very high esteem by the planners and meets with them perhaps once or twice a year. 15 is well aware of the objectives of the planners, and he shares his insights with members of the Labyrinth Group. We also discuss how the Incunabulas plans might bear on our own. The Incunabula is a factor in the ACIO plans, but they don't dominate its agenda. Sarah how much do the Incunabula know about the wing makers and the ancient aerocyte? Dr. Neruda very little, as far as I know. 15 begrudgingly provides some information to his direct agency supervisor, but the NSA is not aware of the ancient aerocyte. There are two operatives within the NSA that are aware of the original artifact that was found, but 15 placed the existence of this artifact in question due to its self-destruction. Sarah I assume from your response that whatever is shared with the NSA, at least in the case of the ACIO, it is shared with the Incunabula planners. Page 161. Dr. Neruda no. There are information filters that reduce clutter. Only certain information, as deemed necessary by 15, is forwarded up the command chain to the Incunabula planners. Sarah the wing makers are understood to be a force to be reckoned with. Correct? Dr. Neruda do you mean by the Incunabula planners? Sarah yes. Dr. Neruda the planners know about the central race and the legend pertaining to their existence. There are several important references to them in various books and prophecy, so even if the ACIO didn't share anything of their discovery in New Mexico, the Incunabula especially its planners are well aware of the central race. Sarah why did 15 choose not to share the ancient arrow discovery with either the NSA or the Incunabula? Dr. Neruda 15 designed the Labyrinth Group largely for security reasons. Information that pertains to BST is held in the highest secrecy. As I mentioned earlier, 15 was hopeful that the ancient arrow site and the other related sites would somehow accelerate the successful deployment of BST. It's a simple matter of not wanting to alert the Incunabula or the NSA. For that matter, to the technology prowess of the Labyrinth Group. If they knew what the Labyrinth Group had in terms of technology, the planners would want to have detailed knowledge of this technology, and 15 doesn't trust anyone outside his directors with this knowledge. Sarah the part that I find bewildering in all of this is that you have all of this knowledge about the universe, extraterrestrials, global plans, and futuristic technologies, and because you have this knowledge you're essentially a prisoner. Now, Dr. Neruda I prefer conscientious defector Sarah whatever you call it, you've got to be a little paranoid about the remote viewing capabilities of the ACIO and their various technologies. How can you outrun the ACIO or the Incunabula if they're anywhere as powerful as you say? They are? Dr. Neruda I don't know that I can evade them. I don't feel invincible or vulnerable. I'm simply operating on a moment-to-moment -moment basis, trying my best to transfer what I know so you can help me publish this information. It's never been done before to defect from the ACIO. I know 15 is searching for me, I can actually feel this. Sarah you mean you can feel when they use their remote viewing technology? Page 162. Dr. Neruda yes. Sarah how often have you detected this since you left? Dr. Neruda I'd prefer not to say how many instances, but I'm aware of each incident. Sarah have you ever felt this during our interview? Dr. Neruda no. I would stop the interview if this were the case. Sarah how would this help? Dr. Neruda I would prefer that they not hear our conversation even its general tone. Sarah is this why we meet at the times we do? Note our meetings were always in a different place, late at night, and they were often outdoors in nondescript places. This was the case in this fourth interview. Dr. Neruda yes. Sarah so how do you protect yourself and me? Dr. Neruda by meeting at odd hours and changing locations, at least until you can get these interviews published on the internet. Sarah how will this help you exactly? I know we've had this discussion before. 
but I still don't understand how this information will help you if it gets into the public domain. It seems to me that it would only anger them. Dr. Naruta they won't be pleased at this disclosure there's no doubt in this. However, it will not touch them in any significant way because very few in power will believe what I share with you, assuming they even read it. Sarah and why is this? Dr. Naruta they are totally consumed in their own agendas and personal dramas. The information I'm disclosing defies categorization. It ranges from poetry to physics, from esoteric philosophy to the conspiratorial forces within MIC the military industrial complex. And because it defies categorization, it will be difficult to critique and analyze. Most will consider it an interesting piece of entertainment and leave it at that. Also, and more importantly, there's a real feeling of acceptance because intelligentsia and the political body of dissent don't feel equipped to stop what is presumed to be the inevitable. There are those within both of these groups that have a general awareness of page 163. What is emerging, but feel completely powerless to change it, and there is a sense of fate that accompanies their silence. The ones that will find it most disturbing are the planners within the Inkinabula and 15 himself, and not because politicians or the media will be stepping into their arena, but because they don't want their secrets revealed to their followers or, in the case of 15, to the planners of the Inkinabula or his contacts at the NSA. Sarah so this is a purpose of these disclosures to infuriate the Inkinabula planners and your boss? Dr. Narud Dano. I don't have any vested interest in making their lives more difficult. It's simply a result of my candid disclosure that they will undergo the resulting pressures from the constituents. This is the only thing that they'll find unpleasant in this whole disclosure. Once the information is out I will be less in interest, other than for pure analysis. Sarah Pure Analysis? Dr. Naruto what I mean is that the ACIO 15 in particular will want to Analyze what went wrong in their security system to ensure that another defection will not take place. There's always the lurking fear that one successful defection would encourage others. If they captured me, they would be able to do a more thorough analysis on the psychological state, precipitating factors, methods of evasion, and so on. Sarah you've talked before about the website. What is it that you want to achieve with this? Dr. Naruta to simply make available what the wing makers have left behind. It will not threaten the ACIO or the Incunabula. It would be impossible to do so. And they know that I understand this. I can only cause a temporary embarrassment at best, but they can manage their way through that. As I've said from the beginning, I wanted to share this information from the ancient arrow site and any subsequent sites that I can. Sarah any subsequent sites? Are you planning to find additional sites? Dr. Naruda I believe there are seven sites on Earth. I also believe they can be found. Sarah how, exactly? Dr. Naruda I can't disclose this. Sarah have you found something within the ancient arrow artifacts that gives you directions? Page 164. Dr. Naruda again, I don't want to disclose the details of this. Sarah OK. Since we landed on the topic of the artifacts, I'm reminded that in our last session you mentioned that you'd like us to talk about the artifacts from the ancient arrow site. This might be a good time to do so. Where would you like to begin? Dr. Naruta one of the most interesting artifacts was the original homing device. Sarah this is the one found by the students at the University of New Mexico? Dr. Naruta yes. It was enigmatic in all respects. Sarah gave me some examples. Dr. Naruto when it was first discovered, it was laying on top of the ground as if it had been placed there. This was not a buried object as it should have been. It was left in the open, albeit in a very nondescript section of northern New Mexico. When the students handled it, it immediately induced vivid hallucinations, which they couldn't understand. Sarah what kind of hallucinations? Dr. Naruta they saw images of a cave-like structure. It later turned out to be the ancient arrow site, but of course they didn't know what it was, 
and were afraid of it because they linked the hallucinations to touching the object. So they wrapped the object up in a jacket, stuck it in their backpack, and took it to a professor at the university, who examined it. We discovered it within hours afterwards and dispatched a team to secure the artifact. Sarah how exactly did you find out about the artifact? I assume the ACIO isn't listed in the phone directory. Dr. Naruta there are certain keywords that are monitored in email and phone communications especially within academia. The ACIO simply taps into this technology that was developed by the NSA and can intercept emails and phone calls anywhere in the world that relate to keywords that it monitors. Sarah like alien or extraterrestrial? Dr. Naruta yes. It actually works a little differently because the ACIO can define how many characters in the case of email or how much time in the case of a phone conversation it wants to monitor on either side of the key word and then extracts entire sentences or even paragraphs in an effort to verify context. It also correlates this to the email's IP address or phone number to a credibility index. If all of these variables meet a specified level, the communication event is relayed to analysts at the ACIO who then perform more invasive techniques to ensure context and content are matched and verified. All of these steps can take place in a matter of an hour or two. Page 165 Sarah and once you have this information verified you swoop in and take possession of whatever you want. Dr. Naruto we have uncovered our most important discoveries in this very manner since the system was activated and the ACIO operates differently depending on the situation. In this case, operatives were dispatched to the professor's office posing as NSA agents in search of a missing experimental weapon. It was believed by the professor to be in his own best interest to release the object without delay since the artifact was deemed to be imminently dangerous. Sarah I'm surprised. Didn't he wonder how you knew he had it? Dr. Neruda I'm sure he did, but there's an element of shock that the operatives make use of and they're also highly skilled in the use of mind control. I'm sure he was very cooperative. The artifact was secured without any major objection by the professor or the university. Sarah if I contacted the University of New Mexico would I be able to confirm that this occurred? Dr. Naruda no. Every event of this kind is com cleared, which is an ACIO term, meaning contracts are signed and all communications are monitored for one year to ensure compliance. Sarah so they signed contracts and won't talk because of a piece of paper? That seems a bit outlandish. Dr. Naruta, do you know the penalty for treason? Sarah, no, I mean I understand it's not a good thing and all, but I just find it a little strange that someone like a learned professor would be intimidated by a signed contract. What about the students that originally found it, are they also come cleared? Dr. Naruta, yes. Sarah, okay, back to the artifact. What happened when you retrieved it? What? Was your role specifically? Dr. Naruda I was asked to lead a team to assess the artifact using our internal sanitaire process. Sarah what's this process do? Dr. Naruda whenever an extraterrestrial artifact is recovered, it's initially put through the sanitaire process, or what we sometimes refer to as the I-steps, which includes four stages of analysis. The first is inspection where we examine the object's exterior and map its page 166 exterior features in our computer. The next is inference, which is the stage where we take the results of stage 1 and compute the probable applications of the object. The third stage is intervention, which is related to any issues that pertain to the defense or security mode of the object. And the last stage is invasion, which simply means we try to access the inner workings of the object and find out how it operates. Sarah how difficult was it to go through this four step process with this artifact? Dr. Naruta it was one of the most difficult we had ever examined. Sarah why? Dr. Naruta it was designed for a very specific purpose and unless it was used for this purpose it was completely impenetrable to our examinations. Sarah didn't the hallucinations affect you? 
Dr. Naruto we knew of the hallucinations reported by the students who recovered the artifact, but we didn't find any evidence of this at all in our labs. We assumed the students were imagining this due to the unusual nature of the artifact. It wasn't until later that we discovered that the very subtle markings on the exterior of the object were actually three-dimensional topographical maps. Once we overlaid these to real maps of the area in which the object was found, we uncovered its real purpose, which was a homing beacon. The hallucinations were site-specific, which is to say that there was a proximity effect encoded within the artifact that caused it to operate when two conditions were present. First, the object needed to be within the geographical range of its map coordinates as etched on its casing and two, it needed to be held in a human's hands in order for its guidance system to activate. Sarah and by guidance system you're talking about the hallucinations? Dr. Naruta yes. Sarah and throughout this whole process you didn't know where this artifact came from, right? Dr. Naruta we knew it was extraterrestrial and we knew it was situated. Sarah what do you mean by situated? Dr. Naruta that it was placed there to be found. Sarah who do you think did this? Page 167. Dr. Naruta representatives of the central race. Sarah so what happened next after you realized it was a homing beacon? Dr. Naruta A team was dispatched to the area and we essentially followed the device to the interior structure of the ancient aero site, which you're already aware of. Sarah you said earlier that this artifact was the most amazing of the entire find. If it was simply a homing device, then the other artifacts I assume were fairly mundane. Dr. Naruta to be more accurate, I can say it was the most interesting since I defected before all the other artifacts were sent through the ice steps process, but it was a very advanced technology and one of the most enigmatic we had come across in quite a while. For example, once our team came within a certain distance of the site, the artifact animated under some undetermined energy source and scanned our group. It was literally reading our bodies and minds, presumably to determine if we were suitable to discover the site. Sarah and if you weren't suitable? Dr. Naruta it was never discussed, but I think everyone assumed it would probably have destroyed the site and all those present at the time of the scanning. As it was, it only destroyed itself. Sarah and you had no idea that it was capable of these feats when you examined it? Dr. Naruta none whatsoever. Its casing was resistant to all of our invasive analyses. It was a real source of frustration. In fact, the artifact in the 23rd chamber was similarly vexing and required significantly more resources to complete the ice steps process. Sarah are these the only two artifacts from the site that you've completed the ice steps process? Dr. Naruta yes, prior to my defection. But there were artifacts in every chamber, although the one discovered in chamber 23 seemed the most important. Sarah and why was that? Dr. Naruta remember that I described the interior of the site as a helix-shaped tunnel system? Sarah yes. Dr. Naruta the uppermost chamber was the 23rd chamber and in it was the optical disc. While the other chambers held artifacts similar in size and composition to the page 168 homing artifact, the artifact in the 23rd chamber was an optical disc that had a degree of familiarity to it and we considered it the key to the entire site. Sarah because it was so different from the other artifacts? Dr. Naruta yes. It was also the highest chamber in the formation and it was unique in its structure in that it was the only chamber that was unfinished. Sarah I understand that all the information you showed me know you've explained in some detail about how you were able but you've alluded tonight. It's something within this site point sites. Can you elaborate on this at all? Dr. Naruta there's nothing in this information that points to the location of the other six sites. However, I believe there is, encoded within this information, location markers to the next site. Sarah you mean the sites are supposed to be discovered in a specific order one at a time? Dr. Naruta I believe so. Sarah can you give me some hints as to where the next site is, based on your analysis? Dr. Naruta if I gave you some information, you would need to promise that 
This interview would not be released until I contacted you and confirmed it was okay to do so. Would you agree with this? Sarah certainly. I would honor anything you asked. Dr. Neruda there is an ancient temple just outside of the city of Cusco, Peru. Called Saxe Hulman. It is somewhere near this temple that the next site will be found. Sarah and do you know where exactly, or are you simply saying near to be evasive? Dr. Neruda no, I believe I know the exact coordinates, but this detail I won't disclose. Sarah this is your homeland isn't it? Dr. Neruda yes, I grew up not too far from this area. Sarah have you been to this site before? Dr. Neruda no, but I'm somewhat familiar with the city of Cusco. Came from the disc, and I to decode the information, to the location of 6 other page 169. Sarah this question may seem to come out of left field, and I'd understand if you don't want to answer it, but why do you think the central race would design a defensive system upon Earth and then leave its discovery and activation to an organization like the ACIO? Dr. Neruda I don't think it was left in the hands of the ACIO to find and activate these sites. Sarah you, then? Dr. Neruda I'm not able to say at this time. Sarah but you're certainly an important part of this aren't you? Dr. Neruda I hope so. Sarah okay, here's another left curve. Why are five men the Incunabula planners allowed to control the destiny of humanity? I mean it's only five men and we're five billion world citizens. No. One elected these guys, and virtually no one knows who these guys are, what their plans are, capabilities, insights or even if they truly have our best interests at heart. After hearing your story tonight, I'm left with this sense of indignation that five guys no matter how well-intentioned are deciding the fate of humanity and no one knows who they are. At least with politicians I can see them, hear them talk on television, and get to know their unique personalities. There's comfort in this. Whether I believe them all the time, well, that's a different story. But most of the ones I voted for I think are good and honorable people. Dr. Neruda when you ask the question, allowed to run the world, to whom are you referring? Sarah doesn't the central race have something to say about this? After all, as you mentioned the other night, all of these seven ancient sites are part of a defensive weapon designed to protect the earth. They also placed this homing device in clear sight for the ACIO to uncover which proves they're interacting with us in our present time. Wouldn't the central race need to allow these planners to have such authority over humanity's destiny? Dr. Neruda let me try to answer your question this way. Presidents and senators, members of Congress, and governors, presidential cabinets and military leaders, all ebb and flow, which is to say, they have their influence for a period of years, and then they move aside for others to take their Place. Their agendas express short PAGE 170. Term power to pass new legislation, appoint new judges, or amend laws. They are so focused on the politics of the near term that they lose sight of the importance of the long term. The Incunabula planners have the safety of permanence and place their whole focus on the long term objectives of humanity. This is the nature of the Incunabula. They bring continuity to the major issues of our time and the times to come for the next three generations. They operate in this realm to ensure they are not influenced by the short-term goals of special interests. As to your question about who allows them to perform this function, I'd have to say that no one does. No one has control or authority over the planners, no. More than anyone has control or authority over 15 or the labyrinth group. Sarah what about the central race, though? Doesn't it stand to reason that they know about these planners and watch them? I thought you said earlier that this unification force, or God, advises them or something like that. Didn't you make this comment? Dr. Neruda what I meant is that the Incunabula planners believe in this force that unifies all sentient life throughout time and space. They believe very strongly in their personal destinies or they would never have been placed in the position of a planner. It is a very esteemed position despite its anonymity. 
I have no doubt that the central race is aware of the Incunabula planners and perhaps there is even some influence or exchange. I don't know. As I said before, my knowledge of the planners is based exclusively on the reports from 15. Sarah so it's possible that 15 made all of this up? Dr. Neruda you mean about the planners? Sarah isn't it possible? Dr. Neruda no. But it's possible that his perception is not completely accurate. Though I doubt it. 15's ability to grasp the character of someone is uncanny. He understands human psychology better than those writing the textbooks. I think it would be impossible for the planners to pull the wool over his eyes without him being aware of it. Sarah but you said you never met these planners only 15 has. Dr. Neruda I understand your concern about the validity of this. If I could give ye names to check out, or some other form of proof, I would. These organizations exist right up to the Incunabula, and they can be traced and researched. Certainly many journalists and researchers have done so regarding Freemasonry or Skull and Bones and some with good success. But they never look at the broader order and what organization manages these larger, more abstract forces that make up the tribe of power. Page 171. Sarah but why? Dr. Neruda there's nothing to drill into. There's no research traction. The organization is purposely abstract and amorphous. Sarah but leaders like Clinton and Blair, aren't they really pulling the strings? How do the planners within the Incunabula have greater power than these leaders who are signing new legislation into law or deciding whether we go to war or not? It just doesn't make sense. Dr. Neruda everything within a democracy is consensus and the game is designed to shift consensual opinion and fix it on a specific galvanizing target. If there's sufficient resonance with the people, the shift can be manipulated. If there is not the political will is stymied. Leadership all over the world, unless it's in a country like North Korea, is bound to this certainty, and nation's leaders are generally well-schooled to operate within this reality. Yes, the world's leaders appear to wield a great deal of power, but it is really aggression not power. True power is contained in the acts of implementing a plan that is designed to enhance or optimize the position of humanity relative to its environment, and to protect it from formidable threats. The key word is humanity, which is an analog for the collective soul of every person on the planet. It is not defined by ethnicity or geographical boundaries. World leaders apply aggression to achieve their agendas, which always include a healthy dose of state greed and self-aggrandizement. The concept of humanity is not a critical ingredient in their agenda. Their power, if that's what you want to call it, is a collective will of a small inner circle of political zealots who want to secure the benefits of their power for themselves first, their state second, and their citizens third. Sarah that's a pretty strong condemnation of our political system, assuming I understand you correctly. Dr. Neruda then I would say you understand me quite well. Sarah so our political leaders lack real power because they're absorbed in state. Agendas that exclude humanity as a whole? Dr. Naruta please understand that I'm not condemning the individual leaders. So much as I am the provincial state system, which has been engineered to excite. Nationalism. The individual leaders assume the identity of the state system, which is largely contrived around the single concept of patriotism. Sarah so now you're saying patriotism is the problem? I'm confused. Dr. Neruda patriotism is the state catalyst. It is the means by which citizens are stirred to a response. It is also the means by which leaders are directed to respond to issues or threats. Under this singular banner, wars have been prosecuted and aggression veiled. It's the ideal method that the state uses to enjoin its citizens to support its leadership. Page 172 I'm saying that the citizen's identification with the state, or patriotism, is the real stumbling block to effectively deal with the issues of humanity. The individual leaders are simply pawns within the structure that was engineered as a means to colonize the weaker states. 
Sarah I think my brain can only handle one more question and then I'd like to call it quits for tonight. Okay with you? Dr. Naruta yes, whatever you'd like. Sarah in this whole discussion tonight most of which has been centered on the Incunabula or maybe more appropriately I should call it the world power structure I don't hear much about the spiritual implications. It really sounds oddly impersonal and unspiritual, if that's a word. Can you comment on this? Dr. Naruta what is occurring in our world is a manifestation of how a species migrates from statehood to speciesthood. It is a stage within the migration plan. Humans must move from the patriotic, believe what I am told mentality, and elevate their thinking to encompass and embrace the holistic community of humankind. It will require enormous leadership capacity in order to accomplish the conclusion of this migration, because the world's people will require a watershed event to erase its memory. Sarah hold on a moment. What do you mean to erase its memory? Dr. Naruta there's a persistent memory in the psyche of humans particularly. The weaker cultures that have been trampled on by nations bent on colonization. These grievous indignations to the weaker nations of the world have left a deep mark on their collective memory. It's vital that this memory be erased or purged in order for humankind to become unified in its governance and fundamental systems. This event can be orchestrated or it may occur through natural means, but it's generally agreed that an event must arise that galvanizes the world's people to unite, and in this process, purge the memory of all peoples, but especially those who have been dealt with as victims of colonization. Sarah I know I just said I was only good for one more question, but as a journalist I can't resist this line of thought. Give me some examples of what kind of event you're talking about? Dr. Naruta the most probable event with global implications is an energy shortage. Sarah this is what you said earlier, but wouldn't an energy shortage only create more friction between the haves and have-nots? Dr. Naruta if it were managed properly, no. The kind of energy shortage I'm talking about will have devastating effects on every aspect of our world. All infrastructures would be page 173 when impacted, and the impact would be harsh and persistent. A global body to regulate production and distribution of existing resources, coupled to a well-managed search for alternative, renewable sources would become a necessity of this condition. Still behind the scenes, the Incunabula would help to manage this event in such a way as to restore equality to the world's people. It would stand above the special interests and dominant powers, and ensure fairness. This fairness would establish its instrument of global leadership as the preeminent force for globalization, and the memory of all would metaphorically speaking be erased. Sarah is this my answer for where is the spiritual in all of this? Dr. Naruda no. Admittedly I got sidetracked a bit. Also, I want to make the disclaimer that what I'm disclosing is the broad concept, and anyone reading these disclosures in the future, I hope you will bear this in mind. I'm not able, owing to the circumstances and time constraint, to provide a detailed rendering. However, these details do exist and when one has the luxury of studying them, all of what I am disclosing will appear more plausible. Now, regarding your question, the spiritual element is very strongly integrated to the whole theme of tonight's discussion. If I were to sum it up, I'd call it the human migration plan. Humankind is evolving on one level, and migrating on another. In the instance of its evolution, humans are becoming more advanced. Technologically speaking with the ability to multiprocess more sophisticated visual, oral, and intellectual data. In other words, the brain system is changing to become more holistic in how it processes information. Computers are a big part of this evolutionary track. Humans are also migrating from separation by means of statehood to unification through globalism. This is a completely different but related track. Humankind is coalescing, even though it may not seem like it because we continue to have wars and conflicts throughout the globe. It's happening in micro steps. Sarah and the spiritual? Dr. Naruta yes, thank you. 
the spiritual is that these two tracks are leading humankind to something that the wing makers call the grand portal. It is the connection to our human soul, which has been broken into hundreds of pieces and strewn across the globe in the form of different colors, cultures, languages, and geographies, and is now in the process of an unalterable reunion. This is the spiritual aspect, and it touches everything in our lives. It penetrates every single atom of our collective existence, imbing it with a destiny that is yet unseen. Sarah you just mentioned the grand portal. What is it? Page 174. Dr. Neruda in the glossary found on the optical disc, it talks about the Sarah just so you know I did read the section of the glossary you gave me, but only once, and it didn't stick with me too well. Can you explain it again, please? Dr. Neruda the Grand Portal, according to the wing makers, is the indisputable scientific discovery of the human soul. Sarah sort of like LERM isn't it? Dr. Neruda similar, but LERM is more the demonstration that the unification force exists and interpenetrates all dimensions of existence. It is the proof of spirit, if you will. The human soul remains elusive to our technology. Sarah but you're not saying that soul and spirit are different are you because I was always taught that soul and spirit are essentially one and the same thing. Dr. Neruda soul, or what the wing makers refer to as the wholeness navigator, is the replica of first source God, only comparanalyzed into a singular, immortal, and wholly individualized personality. Spirit is more of the connecting force that unifies the individual soul with first source and all other souls. Sarah I'm not sure I followed that description, but it may be that my mind is saturated right now and nothing you said would get through my thick skull. Anyway, what will be gained by having this discovery? The Grand Portal? Dr. Neruda everything that keeps us separate locked in statehood and provincial concerns will be obliterated when this undeniable proof is obtained. Sarah why would the basic nature of man, which has taken hundreds of thousands of years to form, suddenly change when science steps forward and announces that it has proven the existence of soul? It doesn't seem plausible to me. Dr. Neruda according to the wing makers this is the evolutionary path of the human species, and the discovery of the grand portal is the culmination of a global species. It creates the conditions whereby the things that separate us are stripped away, whether their color, race, form, geography, religion, or anything else. We find ourselves staring into the lens of science and we see that all humans are composed of the same inner substance whatever you choose to call it and it is this that truly defines us and our capabilities. Sarah so everything we've been talking about tonight, the globalization of humankind culminates in this discovery? Is that what you're saying? Dr. Neruda yes. Page 175. Sarah and the Incunabula planners will be there, waiting to guide us. Is that also part of the plan? Dr. Neruda I don't know if there'll be a role for the Incunabula in this new world. Perhaps, perhaps not. Sarah if an individual would experience this grand portal and establish for themselves that they are composed of a soul and immortal soul wouldn't it profoundly change the way in which they live? I mean I'm just starting to think of the ramifications, and they're kind of scary. For example, what if someone saw that they don't really die? Wouldn't that change their attitude towards death in such a way that they no longer fear it? Perhaps people would become more reckless and daring, more dangerous. Dr. Neruda some may there will undoubtedly be many different reactions. And I don't pretend to know how it will all be managed. Sarah another thing I find interesting in this whole thing is the role of science. Versus religion. It seems that religion has tried its best to define soul and failed. Whatever its definitions, they seem to be based entirely on faith, and there's no real consistency in the model. This grand portal is a scientific discovery, not a religious one. Correct? Dr. Neruda yes. Sarah so science will get a try. What if they fail as well? Maybe there's something so elusive, so hidden in all of this that science does no better. I mean I 
know some people who can be shown something and they will deny it with all their strength. How do you convince someone who doesn't want to see it? Dr. Neruda you can think of the grand portal as the interface for the consciousness of vertical time. This interface will be discovered sometime in the 21st century. I don't know all the details. I don't know how it will impact on the individual. You may be right. Some will accept it and some will not. I only know it is part of the destiny that humankind is led to achieve. Sarah according to the wing makers? Dr. Neruda yes. Sarah did you know about this prior to reading the glossary? Dr. Neruda do you mean did I know about the existence of the grand portal? Sarah yes, that, or simply the technology to prove the existence of the human soul. Was it being planned or worked on by the ACIO? Page 176. Dr. Neruda no. Sarah are there any other organizations working on this proof even now? Dr. Neruda not that I know of. Sarah and if no one's trying to discover this grand portal, who will? Dr. Neruda that's why I want to get these materials out. The Wing Makers. Materials are designed to activate those souls that are incarnating who will play. Active roles in the discovery and creation of the grand portal Sarah are you saying that souls are incarnating specifically for this purpose? Dr. Neruda yes. There are very advanced souls who are incarnating in the next. Three generations who will design, develop, and employ the grand portal. This is. The central purpose of the wing makers materials stored within these seven. Sites. Sarah I thought you said they were a defensive weapon. Dr. Neruda that's one role, but there is another as well. And I believe it has to. Do with the artistic elements. They are encoded. They are catalysts of. Consciousness. I'm convinced of this based on my own experience. Sarah I've read many of these writings, and listened to the music. I like it, but it. Hasn't catalyzed anything in me. I certainly don't feel like I want to help design. Or build the grand portal, not that I have the mental capacity to contribute. Anything of value. Dr. Naruta perhaps your role is different. Sarah or I have no role at all. Maybe you have to have the qualities inside you. Before the materials can activate anything. And in my case, I have this feeling. That there's nothing there to awaken. Well, as much as I'm tempted to dive into more information about this grand. Portal, I think my mind has reached its full ration for the night. Let's plan to talk. More about the grand portal in our next interview. Okay. Dr. Naruta that's fine with me. Sarah anything you want to say before we sign off? Dr. Naruta yes. If you, the reader, wonder how the information I have presented. About the Incunabula relates to all of the various conspiracy theories about the. New World Order, Intelligence Community. Illuminati, Freemasonry, and all the other supposed clandestine page 177. Organizations of the world, I would respectfully ask you to suspend your prior notions about the motivations of these various groups. These are not evil-minded organizations regardless of how some portray them. Their members have children and families just like you, and they take pleasure and disgust in the very same things as you do. They are humans with all the same weaknesses for vice and greed, but they also have a strong energy to improve the world. It is simply that their definition of what a better world is may differ from yours. If your interest is to conjure an antagonist for your amusement, that's your prerogative. But the issues I have related tonight are too serious to be amusing. They are deserving of your attention and discernment. Do your own investigation into the energy supplies of our world. You may come up with Different numbers than what I mentioned, but only because the technology of the ACIO is more advanced than the petroleum industry. Nonetheless, you'll see confirmation of this general condition. Look at the current events of your time whenever you read this interview. You'll see how this plan is progressing. It may seem to take detours, but the general course is what I've described. It is moving in this direction not out of accident or because of the whims of the world's leaders, you can be sure. It is all part of the orchestration of events that are played out according to the well-designed blueprints of the Incunabula planners. 
you may feel a certain anguish that you're being led to a future not of your choosing, but if you want to have influence, then you need to be educated and aware of the real forces that are defining your future. This is a free will universe. There is no hierarchy of angelic beings guiding the destiny of Earth. There is no ascended master who dictates the pathway to enlightenment for humanity or the individual. If you truly want to express and apply your free will, make it a personal religion. To know the facts. Learn how to look behind the stories that are being sold by the media and politicians, and form your own conclusions. Keep your doubt intact about everything you're told from the political stage, especially when you're induced to be patriotic. It is one of the clearest signals to be suspicious of what you're being told. When enemies are created especially new ones, be wary of the motivations of those who claim them to be enemies. Investigate the facts. Look under all the rocks and verify your evidence. Each of you must become investigators and learn the art of research and analytical study if you want to feel more a part of the movement to globalization. Your insights and understandings may not change humanity's course one millimeter, but they will change your ability to feel a part of this migration and have a sense of where humanity is moving and why. And to those who prefer to strike out on their own path and believe that globalism is pure folly, I can only explain to you that it must happen. It is the outward expression of Hui page 178. And it is the natural progression of our species to unify around the inner essence of our identity, instead of the outer foul god of our particular nation or religious belief. I believe everyone understands this to varying degrees, but it is the methods of this unification that concern people. And I share this concern. If we're collectively informed about the plan and understand the end goal is something that holds a great promise for humanity, we can pursue this goal with greater velocity and with added confidence that the methods will be in everyone's best interest. This must be our goal. And finally, many of you may feel that globalization is a concept of the new world order and therefore dismiss it as a movement born out of greed and the lust for power. Yes, there are always those who will take advantage of this movement to achieve personal gain, but the reason to become a unified people on this earth is far greater than the personal gains of a few. Remember this as you read your conspiracy stories. I'm finished, Sarah. Thank you for your indulgence. Sarah thank you for your comments. End of session. Page 179. By Sarah what follows is a session I recorded of Dr. Neruda on January 2, 1998. He gave permission for me to record his answers to my questions. This is the transcript of that session. This was one of five times I was able to tape record our conversations. I have preserved these transcripts precisely as they occurred. I've tried my best to include the exact words, phrasing, and grammar used by Drive. Neruda. Editors note this interview number five has been unpublished until March 2014. The reason is based on Dr. Neruda's timing. The specific reasons for this Timing have not been communicated. Sarah what we discussed Wednesday night has been swirling around me ever since. I think I become a bit obsessed with all of this. What for me, anyway, is new information. I'm trying my best to process it into my mental framework. And I have to admit, I'm not sure it's working. Dr. Neruda I understand. I've held back some information for this very reason not only for you but also for those who will ultimately read this. Sarah when we ended the last session we agreed to spend more time on the Grand Portal 1 is that what you're referring to, or is it something else? Dr. Neruda it's all related. It's a very, very big picture, and broad timeline. Sarah can you share it now? Dr. Neruda let's take it one part at a time. With your questions, I hope it will all come clear, but I have to warn you that it will seem a little unwieldy or odd until the whole of it is out. Sarah OK. Where do you want to start? Dr. Neruda I think we need to go back to the beginning to understand the true context of the Grand Portal. Sarah OK. 
The grand portal is defined in the wing maker's materials as the irrefutable scientific discovery of the human soul. Page 180. Dr. Neruda Earth was and is a very unique planet. It was entirely of water. Originally. But what made it interesting to beings was the fact that its core enabled it to have a gravitational force that supported manifestation. Sarah what do you mean by manifestation? Dr. Neruda that it began to traverse from an interdimensional planet of sound frequencies to a planet of matter of physical matter. Its gravity producing core or nucleus was able to literally create the conditions that allowed it to materialize itself over eons of time. Sarah how do you know this history? Dr. Neruda there are records of this on the disc that was taken from the 23rd chamber at the ancient Aero site. But some of this we knew from other documents we've retrieved from the Sumerian record that have not been widely distributed. We've also had discussions with the cordium that bear this out. Sarah so Earth started out as a water planet and it wasn't physical? Dr. Neruda correct. This was when the Atlanteans lived within the planet. They were the race of beings that inhabited Earth at the time of its formation. The Anunnaki came to them and negotiated an agreement to allow the Anunnaki to mine a substance near the core of the planet that would be in its essence what today we would call gold. These races of beings known as the Atlanteans and Anunnaki were not three dimensional. They didn't possess bodies as we think of them today. Their existence was contained in a different range of frequencies what we would call higher dimensional frequencies. Sarah why did they want gold? Dr. Neruda the Anunnaki required it. The exact reason is unknown, but it had something to do with the way that gold modulated the frequency of their body. Gold was an essence to their race. It held a property that was vital to their survival. The record is a little vague as to exactly why it was so important. But these records mention that their entire planet had 12 major cities and all of them were made of a semi-transparent gold. Even the Book of Revelations refers to this. Sarah who were these beings? I mean, I've heard of the Atlanteans, but never the Anunnaki. Dr. Neruda they were a race of trans-dimensional beings. The Atlanteans were the only race of beings on Earth at that time, and they the Anunnaki sought permission to set up mining on Earth, which the Atlanteans agreed to. The ancient aerosite is known within the wing maker's materials as the extraterrestrial time capsule that was discovered in Chaco Canyon, New Mexico. Page 181. Sarah Y. Dr. Neruda they didn't see any harm in helping the Anunnaki. They weren't a competitor because the Atlanteans were more numerous. The Atlanteans wanted to have an agreement with the Anunnaki if only to befriend them for their technology. Also, the gold mining was in an area of Earth that was of little consequence to them. Sarah I don't see how this relates to the Grand Portal. Dr. Neruda it's a long story, and we just started, but I promise I'll come to that in a bit. Sarah okay, that's fine. I'll be patient. Dr. Neruda the Earth began to materialize more and more. It began to harden in a sense. The gold with it, the Earth, and everything on it, was solidifying. The mining of the gold would soon become impossible for the Anunnaki, because they'd be unable to mine the gold if it were in a dense, physical state. Sarah why not? Dr. Neruda their bodies were etheric. They could not mine the gold if it was physical. They needed to have bodies that would be able to operate on Earth and mine the gold. Sarah how quickly did this happen? Dr. Neruda I don't know. Our records don't stipulate the time scale, but I assume it was over tens of thousands of years. The point is that they needed to create a physical vessel like an astronaut would require a spacesuit to inhabit space. They tried hundreds of experiments and had the help of both the Atlanteans and Syrians. Sarah I assume this vessel is the human body? Dr. Neruda yes, we call them physical uniforms sometimes. The wing makers. Refer to them as human instruments. Sarah so the Anunnaki created a physical body to mine gold. You mean like a 
Robot or are you saying these were humans? Dr. Naruda no. These were the equivalent of ape men. They were pre-human. By a long shot. But they were our predecessors. We sometimes refer to them as Human 1.0. Sarah but were they robots or biological? Dr. Naruda they were completely biological, but Human 1.0s were not fully physical. They were partly etheric. You see, the Anunnaki and Syrians design done to synchronize with the evolving densification of the Earth. So as the Earth solidified, so did the human instruments. Page 182. Sarah if they were biological, did they have a soul? Dr. Naruto we wouldn't call them human if they didn't. Remember I mentioned the Atlanteans? Sarah yes. Dr. Naruto the Anunnaki and Syrians placed them the Atlanteans inside. These human uniforms. These were very advanced beings, but apparently naive. Sarah they wanted to be in these, ape men bodies and mine gold? Dr. Naruto no, that was not their interest at all. In fact, they allowed the Anunnaki to mine their gold, but as the earth began to solidify, they told them that if they could engineer a vessel to enable them to continue to mine their gold, that would be acceptable, but on a small scale. The Anunnaki had some kind of a falling out with the Atlanteans, and began to conspire with the Syrians and another race referred to as the Serpents. Each of these three races was interested in figuring out how to embody physical planets. They saw Earth as a laboratory of sorts to figure it out. The Anunnaki already had a human uniform. They simply needed to power it with a life source or soul. The bigger issue was how to get the Atlanteans into these embodiments and keep them there. In effect, these three races conspired to enslave the Atlanteans within these prehuman vessels. The Atlanteans were the power generators that made these biological entities operate. Sarah are you saying these primitive ape men had powerful souls inside them? I don't understand how that would be possible. Dr. Naruda it's a very complicated subject. The wing makers wrote about the implantation of programs inside the human uniform even version 1.0. The Syrians were mostly credited with this invention, but it was the offspring of Anu 3 that really perfected these implants by programming them. The human uniform version 1.0 was designed by the Anunnaki, the implants were designed by the Syrians, and the programming of the implants was designed and evolved by a being known as Marduk. Sarah that doesn't answer my question as to how a powerful soul would suddenly be plugged into an ape man vessel and behave like like a Neanderthal. Anu is the leader of the Anunnaki. He was known as the Sky God, in Mesopotamian times. The Anunnaki were the deities written about in the Sumerian text, known as the Royal Blood. Page 183. Dr. Naruto Well, first, these were much more primitive than Neanderthals. But, the answer is in the implants. You see, the biological entity or ape man, as we're referring to it, was not able to operate in the physical world. They needed survival skills, how to eat, how to hunt, how to clean themselves, how to even move their bodies. All of these very fundamental functions were necessary to actually include or program into the vessel, which was the purpose of the functional implants. The implants were akin to the brain of the human 1.0, but it wasn't just in the brain. These implants were placed inside the body within various parts like the chest area, middle back, wrists, ankles, etc. The primary ones were contained in the skull. But generally these implants were networked to operate from the head or brain area. Sarah why do you say the head or brain area and not simply the brain? Dr. Naruta because it wasn't in the brain. Remember that human 1.0 was still part etheric and part physical. The implants also needed a similar consistency or sound vibration. They were placed into the bone or skeletal structure mostly, and some in the muscle tissue. These functional implants fused into the muscles and bone, including the DNA. The wing makers put it this way the DNA integration was for the intelligence of the plan. The muscle tissue allowed the life essence to 
power the functional implant. There was a central coordination point, and that was in the brain, but the implants were located throughout the body. This was an integrated system that was installed in the human uniform to allow it to be controlled, monitored, and programmed over time. It was the evolutionary stick and carrot. Doing it this way allowed the early humans to dig out gold, which, as I said, was their primary purpose initially. Sarah I'm sorry to sound like a broken record, but I still don't get how such an advanced race as the Atlanteans could power these ape men and become slaves. It doesn't make sense to me. Dr. Neruda you have to understand that the implanted functionality was partly to make the human 1.0 and its power source the life essence of an Atlantean to function efficiently and effectively as miners. That was the prime goal. The second, however, was to suppress the power source, or in this case, the Atlantean beings inside the human vessels. They did this by making the power source ignorant of its origin and the reality of its true expression as an infinite being. When the Atlantean beings were placed inside the human uniform, they were essentially 100% focused on physical survival and functional performance. There were no relationships, no marriage, no reproduction. These were essentially clone beings. They were all the same in terms of their appearance and abilities. Human drones, piloted by implanted functionality that the Atlantean beings inside became associated with, as them. The infinite inside the body believed it was the body and the implanted functionality, and nothing more. Sarah what happened when they died? Page 184. Dr. Neruda let me be clear, these beings the Atlanteans were infinite. Meaning they did not have space a time regulation. They lived after the body died. However, the Anunnaki created a set of planes or dimensions of experience that was the equivalent of a holding plane, that's what the wing makers called it. Where they could be recycled. Sarah recycled as in reincarnation? Dr. Neruda yes. Later on this became the basis of reincarnation. It allowed the Anunnaki to recycle the Atlanteans. Some aspects of the implanted functionality were interdimensional, which is to say, it could assist in the delivery of the beings to the proper location within the holding planes of consciousness, and assist in their reincarnation back into a new vessel. Sarah but you said that they, the ape men didn't have reproduction? Dr. Neruda not in version 1.0. These were very basic. But the Anunnaki could create them in large scale, so when one human uniform expired let's say they had a mining accident another would be made. These were clones. The ability to self-reproduce came in version 2.0. That was mostly because the amount of effort required to manage this process was enormous on the part of the Anunnaki. They wanted to create an automated system, something that wouldn't require them to orchestrate all of the variables. So the Syrians helped them to create the implants that could propagate through reproduction. This enabled automation of the recycling of the beings from the holding planes to be born into the physical dimension through a baby. Sarah so, this was all automated by programming technology? I don't know. This is too weird. Dr. Neruda the universe is made up of dimensions that are a result of mathematical equations. It is constructed from mathematics. Some beings understand how to apply mathematical equations to organize and plan space a time. It's all created. This world is created, it's not real. It's a programmed reality. When I say plan, it can also be construed as control of space a time. That is to say, this is a programmed space time reality. Once you can program space time reality within a species like humanity, you can program at the individual level of a person, right down to when they itch their nose, if you want to. It's all mathematical equations. Sarah I don't know what to say. For now, I'll go along with you, but it really sounds like fiction to me. So, what happened to the ape men? Dr. Neruda I mentioned Marduk. He was intimately involved in the evolution of the species. That was his role. 
Of all the Anunnaki, he was the closest to the human 1.0s. He understood them and even admired certain aspects of them. Unconsciously, perhaps, he began to alter their programs so the human 1.0s behaved more like the Anunnaki. As they began to take on the characteristics of the Anunnaki, Anu and his sons, Enki and Enlil, were concerned by this. Marduk was programming emotions and feelings. He was page 185. Evolving humans too quickly, but remember, this was the evolution of the functional implants, the interface between the power source Atlanteans and the human physical body. So it was the interface that was being evolved, which enabled the human body to show emotion, to communicate, to sense more of a three-dimensional world called Earth, etc. The other thing that was happening was that as the Earth continued to become more of a three-dimensional solid, so did the human 1.0s and their functionality. Implants. This growing densification also made it easier to control and suppress the Atlantean power source inside the human uniforms. It was like a compression was taking place in and on this earth plane, and it was deepening the gravity of focus on earth plane survival. Sarah I wrote down the word serpents. Are you talking about literal serpents? Dr. Naruda no. Serpents as a race of beings. They simply were another race of beings based on reptilian DNA, but distinct from the Anunnaki. You could say they were related. They were known as life carriers. They seeded planets. They built food chains. You could say they were the grocers of the planet. Sarah but they didn't get involved in the creation of the human 1.0. Dr. Naruda not in the technical sense. Their job was more to provide food and sustenance for it. Sarah I understand how the Atlanteans were suppressed in the human 1.0 because of the implants, but why did they go there? If they didn't volunteer as you suggest, how did they get forced into slavery when they were previously these powerful, sovereign beings? Dr. Naruda we don't know exactly how it happened. The record we read was not specific on this topic, but the tone, or word that was used, was that the Atlanteans were naive. They had no reason to think it would be possible to become enslaved. It would be like a concept that was never used in their culture. No one ever did that. Nor could they. You can't enslave an infinite being, unless, of course, you lock them into a human uniform. And that was the cunning of the Anunnaki and their Syrian partners. They launched this attack from such a bizarre angle that the Atlanteans couldn't see it coming. I think it was an ambush or surprise attack. Sarah you said earlier that the human 2.0 could reproduce. How long of a time existed between 1.0 and 2.0 and what were their primary differences? Dr. Naruta Human 1.0 rose to a pretty high level in terms of being able to speak or communicate. That was the major add-on that Marduk brought to Human 1.0. However, the psychological state of being a clone was too hard for Human 1.0. They all looked alike and had the same thoughts, so communication was helpful to a point, for example, coordinating a task, but actually having individual ideas. No. And this led to depression and psychological states where, according to the wing makers, they literally went mad. Page 186. This flaw was a huge problem. Anu decided to wipe them out, and this is a story of the Great Flood. Marduk managed to save some of the human 1.0s from the flood along with other flora and fauna, but it was the end of human 1.0. Human 2.0 was then created. This was the stage where the humans could self-reproduce. And when this happened, some of the Anunnaki impregnated female humans and brought in their bloodlines to the human species. This began the variations. This began the idea that humans were no longer clones. The concern, however, was that human 2.0s might become too powerful and self-aware. What? If the Atlantean power source became aware that it was an infinite being? This was when Anu decided that he should be God. Humans needed to have a 
lord or ruler over them so it was clear that they were inferior to an external ruler. This was a key part of their program of indoctrination. Working with Marduk and the Syrians, they created the environment of Eden and created the paradigm of Eve as the instigator of the fall of humanity. This was, you might say, Act 1 of Anu as God. It was staged to provide the human 2.0s with a clear sense of an external authority, and that they were expelled from paradise because they tried to be self-realized. It was like rebuking humanity with the fist of an angry creator who wanted his creation to remain identified with their human uniform. Kind of like saying do not think for a moment that you can be like me. Sarah and the wing makers wrote that this actually happened kind of like the Bible said. Dr. Neruda yes. Sarah so the God of the Bible is this Anunnaki Lord, called Anu? Dr. Neruda yes. Sarah why are you telling me this all now? It seems like this information changes some of the previous information you've shared. Dr. Neruda to really understand the Grand Portal, you have to understand this evolutionary process, and the only way you can understand it is to go back to the beginning of the human race. Sarah so why did Anu want to be God? Dr. Neruda remember that the original goal was the acquisition of gold. But, when the Atlanteans rejected Anu, he began to conspire with the Syrians. It was, just before the flood that Anu discovered that the gold he'd mined was sufficient. He didn't require more. However, the notion of being a god over the Atlanteans, was seductive. The Syrians and serpents felt that the idea of enslaving infinite beams in planet ecosystems was their invention. They had something that was totally unique. They were creator gods, and every other race could be ensnared in a similar type of vessel. Page 187. They begin to do just that. Sarah you mean enslave other races? Dr. Neruda yes. You see the earth had a unique quality to its core. This core was of extreme interest to the Anunnaki when they first visited Earth. It was this core that created the gravitational field that enabled the planet to become fully physical in such a way that it could support physical life. Of course other conditions needed to be present, too, but it was this core that was the real key. Working with the Syrians and serpents, they began to do the same enslavement on other planets. They replicated the core of Earth and engineered a method for implanting this core on other planets. They were essentially terraforming a planet by cloning and installing Earth's core. Sarah so I guess the real question is, if you believe this, what are humans today? Are we simply more of the same? Are we human 2.0? Dr. Naruto when I said the human uniform evolves, it does, but this evolution is on a track a pre-programmed track. The intent was to have a new return on a cloud, the whole second coming was going to be the staged entrance for Anu. Humanity would evolve in such a way that his re-entry into our consciousness would be understood to be a good thing. Humanity's salvation. We would all be his children, and the glory of God would be upon the earth. That was the plan. From before the time of Jesus, that was the plan. Marduk programmed the entire Sarah how long can these beings live? Dr. Neruda again, the beings like Marduk or Enki or Anu are not based in space time. They are infinite beings, meaning they have no end. They don't have an age. Neither do we. Sarah I'm trying to wrap my mind around all of this, but I'm finding it very hard to believe that human beings are simply uniforms for a programmed existence. Dr. Neruda let me go back to your previous question about what humanity is. Now, the functional implants of the human interface are perfectly integrated within the human vessel. They operate seamlessly. So seamlessly, we do not know that they are not us. We have no choice in a way. We think our thoughts and emotions are us, that this past a time is what our thoughts and emotions exist in. Even the thought of the God. Heaven, Hell, Soul, Masters, all of these things. They're part of the program. It is integrated in both the dimension of the Earth plane and the afterlife. The afterlife is part of the deception. 
Sarah tell me more about this interface and its functional implants. Dr. Naruta the eye brain was the key element that the Anunnaki needed to design to make the functional implants operate. This is in human 1.0. In human 2.0 it was the DNA. Once this was achieved, the Syrians could design the consciousness framework the human page 188. Consciousness. Human consciousness is the key to suppressing an infinite being. Human consciousness, or the triad of consciousness, is composed of three interactive layers. The first layer is universal mind or unconscious, and this forms the link between the individual human and the entire species. This layer is what enables all of us to see what everyone sees, feel what everyone else feels, know what everyone else knows. It is the perfect way to unify a species in separation. In fact, that is the way we feel unification, through the unconscious mind. The next layer of consciousness is the genetic mind, as the wing makers refer to it, or subconscious, in the case of Sigmund Freud. This forms the link between the individual and their family tree or genetics. This is where bloodlines are expressed. And then there is the conscious mind. This is the unique individual perception. An expression what most of us call our personality and character, which is built on this layer. The conscious mind of the individual is heavily influenced by the genetic mind, especially between birth and the age of seven or eight. By the time the influence is all-encompassing. Remember that the Anunnaki created the biological form, the body, the Syrians created the functional implants, and Marduk executed the programming of these functional implants so they would evolve along a program path, leading to the return of Anu. This was expressed in the hierarchical structure of humanity that speaks of God and masters in religious and esoteric texts. This was all part of the design to create various religions and esoteric cults that would support a vast hierarchy and order the human species into master-student relationships, and then create a multi-leveled afterlife that would reward those who believed and were obedient to their god or masters. You see, the whole principle that was behind this entire endeavor could be summed up in one word separation. Everything exists in separation within the earth plane and its afterlife planes as well. But, according to the wing makers, what is real is that we are all imbued with equality and oneness not through the unconscious mind, which only links us in separation, but rather through the life essence that is us. And this life essence is sovereign and integral. It is I am we are. No one is above, no one is below. No one is better, no one is lesser. Sarah but you're saying everything is a lie? Everything, I mean everything. We've been taught to believe in as a deception. How is that possible or or even believable? Dr. Neruda it's possible because the beings that have enslaved humanity designed a world to which we adjusted over eons of time. We evolved into it in such a manner that we became lost in our world. The veils that have been placed over us are opaque. So much so that people operate as human uniforms unaware that everything around them is illusory. It is a programmed reality that is not real. The wing makers say everything is simply sound holographically organized to look real. Sarah it's depressing. Page 189. Dr. Naruda only when you consider the scope of the deception and the way in which humanity has allowed it to rule their behaviors. The good news is that you're hearing about this now. Sarah it doesn't feel like good news. Dr. Naruda each person can step out of the illusion. There is no master here. No God is going to come down and make it happen for us. No ETs. No one. It is. Each of us. This is what is meant by I am. I, it's like one. One me, and one. All of us unified. I am, meaning exist now. In this moment. Not in history or. Memory. Not in some future time or goal. Now. Sarah it doesn't feel real to me. I was raised a Christian. I have no reason to. Believe that Jesus was an inside. Agent for this plan of deception Dr. Neruda I'm not saying he was. 
Many of those who have come to earth as human teachers have tried to reveal how deep and broad and high this illusion has been made. It is as far as the edge of the universe and as close as your DNA. Everywhere in between is illusion. Jesus came to reveal much of this, but the writers of the Bible decided what would be acceptable within the paradigm of life as we humanly know it. They elected to make Jesus a part of the deception. They saw it was time for a redefinition of God to accommodate an evolving human 2.0. God was suddenly a loving father, and all of humanity was brother and sister. Sarah so you're saying Jesus was aware of this deception, but his words weren't included in the Bible? Dr. Neruda our opinion was that his words were so against the conditioned beliefs that people could not understand them as he said them. And so, over time, they were translated into the form you know them today. The biblical translation simply lacked the original potency with which he said them. Besides, there are two methods that can make exposing this illusion a very difficult proposition. Sarah what do you mean? Dr. Neruda the first is that the unconscious mind system is inside everyone. It's like a field of information that everyone can access. It can affect or infect everyone. A revelatory idea can be passed to a small number of people, but it lacks sufficient influence to generate mass awakening. So there's unconscious mind inertia. The other, and this is more pernicious, is that the functional implants are programmed, and like any program, they can be upgraded or even turned off. Page 190. Sarah as I listen to this story, I, I feel a little overwhelmed at how to proceed with the interview. I'm not sure what to ask or what direction to take things. If I look at my notes, I see my handwritten note there is no God, is this really what you're saying? Dr. Neruda the wing makers refer to the tribe of consciousness as having the God consciousness installed within it in the unconscious mind layer. But they also report that as the individual develops from about the age of six or seven, they begin to assemble their individual personality from the elements of the subconscious layer. By the time they're 12 to 14 years old, they have their unique personality well in place. For some, this uniqueness is shutting out the existence of a god. From Anu's perspective, this is fine. He probably likes having atheists and agnostics. It's more separation. More diversity. In fact, the greater the diversity in the human family, the greater the separation. The greater the separation easier it is to keep the program of enslavement intact. Choose sides and disagree with your opponents. Compete. It fuels wars and social unrest. As for the existence of God, we, collectively, are the closest thing to God. We are. That's the clear message of the wing makers. There is a first source, for a center, point in existence that created the framework of existence through sound Sarah but what about the ones who are enlightened or spiritual masters? They're all made up? Dr. Neruda no, it's not that they're made up. They exist. It's just that their existence is within the human interface or functional implants. They exist there. We, us, the being that is I am, that being is not of that reality. It doesn't really exist inside the holographic stage that was created by interdimensional beings millions of years ago. Rather, it is being used as a power source that animates the human interface or uniform. Over time, we've spiraled deeper and deeper inside of this created world, complete with its afterlife and different planes of existence. You could look at it this way Anu installed a program inside the human 2.0 and in this program, humans would evolve from knowing absolutely nothing about the world to knowing God. Humans were designed to have God. Consciousness meaning, to have the same understanding and awareness as Anu. But then Anu took this evolutionary line and positioned God consciousness so far out into the future that humans would essentially be chasing this God consciousness forever. They'd be chasing shadows, because until they awaken from the deception, the only God that exists in the world is Anu. Once awakened as I am we are the sovereign integral, a human being. 
lives as an expression of this consciousness. According to the wing makers, no. One has achieved this at this time. It is, however, our future to live in this consciousness in a human instrument. Sarah no one has done this. You mean anywhere? The wing makers refer to first source as the creator of the life essence. Page 191. Dr. Neruda on this plane, Earth, no one has done this. But remember, the wing makers are human in a future time. They have returned to our time to crack. This shall open a bit. They have traveled to our time to remind us of what they discovered. They left this enslavement, so we will do it. Sarah but you already said that Spasa time is an illusion. Dr. Neruda that's true. It is, but it's hard to imagine that the universe in which we exist is really a hologram projection that was programmed inside our unconscious mind and we're really inside this hologram, wearing a human uniform that was outfitted to perceive only this hologram. The wing makers say that the real world is sound. Everything is sound and resonance of sound. Everything we have in our human uniform for sensing our universe is millions of years of evolutionary design to tune into that hologram and only that hologram. Sarah how does that hologram extend beyond this physical world then? You said even the afterlife is part of it? Dr. Neruda there are many aspects to the afterlife. There is God, first and foremost. There is the light of illumination. There is the universal spirit and individual soul. There is a hierarchy of angels and masters. There is the concept of karma and reincarnation or sin and salvation. The concept of heaven and hell. The concept of the chosen. The concept of an ascension path. The concept of the book of records or Akashic records. All of these concepts were designed into an upgrade of the human 2.0 interface. Certain human beings are programmed to find these concepts in their unconscious mind layer and share them. As a result, religions sprout. Philosophies rise sometimes in support of the religions. Sometimes in contradiction. Esoteric cults rise. All the while the human being remains lost. It remains muddled in its illusion. Everything tied to an empty promise in a belief, and in all those beliefs, one thing remains constant. Separation. The program is vast in its reach, and the Anunnaki, once they had mined sufficient gold, had an entire race of beings enslaved. Anu, along with his allies, in the Syrian and Serpent races, decided it would be best to turn the human 2.0s into a worthless creature that forever sought enlightenment through belief. And, who do you suppose would provide the things to believe in? Anu and Marduk. Everything became learning lessons. The earth was a schoolhouse. If you learn your lessons, you won't have to keep incarnating. Learn, learn, learn. But what are you learning? You're learning to believe in the afterlife, as it was described and prescribed by Anu and his designers. You're learning to don your human uniform obediently. You're learning to discern how humanity is different. You are learning to link every self-image you have to the world of three dimensions. While hoping there is more after death. The sober reality is that after you die, the being inside you is met by a guardian. Who will take you to your destination, based mostly on your deeds in this life. However, most beings are taken to a life review where you face your life in every detail, and based on that experience an authoritative figure will prescribe your next life options for reincarnation. You page 192 are essentially recycled into the same program with a new mother and family. And a programmed life path is laid out for you to follow. The afterlife program and process is all part of the master program to retain the enslavement of the beings. Remember, we're interdimensional beings meaning we exist in 3D in the higher planes. It's just that these higher planes are designed by the Anunnaki. They are not of the real dimensional planes. Otherwise, we would die, discover who we really are, and we would never reincarnate or if we did, we would tell everyone on earth that this is all an illusion. Sarah why? Why do it this way? It doesn't make sense. 
Dr. Neruda would begin as an experiment in three-dimensional exploration. From a higher dimensional reality became what is here. Every human being will confront this reality eventually. It cannot be avoided. We can agonize about the lack of fairness or ask why, but whether it makes sense to you doesn't change. The fact that we live in a world of design separation, divide and conquer, the wing makers write of the tone vibration of equality. Dr. Naruta pulled out some papers at this point. Here's the exact choice of words by the wing makers. When all manifestations of life are genuinely perceived as fragmentary, expressions of first source, the vibration of equality that underlies all life forms, becomes perceptible to the human instrument. Life initially emerges as an extension of source reality, and then, as an individuated energy frequency, invested within a form. It vibrates, in its pure, timeless state, precisely the same, for all manifestations of life. This is the common ground that all life shares. This is the tone vibration of equality that can be observed within all life forms that unifies all expressions of diversity to the foundation of existence known as first source. Sarah it's so abstract. How does it help? Dr. Neruda maybe it doesn't. I don't know. But the thing is, to change, to step out of this illusion, it requires each of us to wake up and stay awake. It's not reading words that will change this. It's the profound nature of new behaviors. Because these behaviors signal that our consciousness layers are understood as separate from who we really are. We have to operate as I am we are. Sarah where does the Incunabula 5 or Illuminati belong in this narrative? Dr. Neruda I'll answer that later. I want to continue the story a little further. Sarah OK. Dr. Neruda Human 2.0 S and Earth continue to densify. We become increasingly three-dimensional. We are actually denser now than we have ever been in terms of physicality. There was a time, about 40 years ago, when we thought alien races were actually leaving five in the tribe of power. The Incunabula is the capstone also known as the capstone of the elite. Page 193. Spaceships behind on purpose, but what we discovered, more recently, is that most of the aliens were not physical beings. They were observing Earth, and there, spaceships actually became entrained by the gravitational circuits of the Earth's core, which caused their spaceships to materialize in three-dimensional space. Because many of the materials used in the ship's construction had chemical properties, they were prone to densification when exposed to Earth's atmosphere. Sarah you mentioned the Earth's core as being the cause of all of this, what's so special about it? Dr. Neruda the magnetic fields associated with Earth's core are unique. They are, in the words of the wing makers, alive. We can only assume that alive is an aspect of intelligence. The point in this, however, is that everything's densifying. It is compressing. It is compressing for a reason the old systems can fall in unison when density reaches a certain critical mass. And that is what will happen. Sarah Wen? Dr. Neruda all I can say is that it is soon. I don't want dates and times associated with it Sarah but do you know? Dr. Neruda we know a range. Sarah more than 10 years? Dr. Neruda yes. Sarah more than 20 years? Dr. Neruda all I will say is that the wing maker's term for this is SIN, or the Sovereign Integral Network. SIN is the definition of the new system. They said it can come in an instant once the right conditions are in place. What is unclear is how SIN develops after the Grand Portal and Human 3.0. Sarah that's the first time you've mentioned Human 3.0. What is it? Dr. Neruda if human beings are trapped in a prison of illusion, as human 2.0s. And their interface to the holographic universe is the reason for their being trapped, then a new model needs to step forward. Human 3.0 is this new model. It is the formula of self-realization. It is stepping out of the constructed universe, or reality, and living as a self-expression of I am we are. Human 3.0 is the sovereign integral. I call it Human 3.0 SI. You see, 
the grand portal is a way to synchronize humanity to a new inception. Point where it is living in the expression of oneness and equality, sovereign and integral, I am and we are. It is a way for humanity to move from separation, which was its previous page 194. Inception point, the one that generated human 1.0 and 2.0. Human 3.0 s I will have a new inception point, and the reason for the grand portal was to enable synchronization, because how can you have a network of equality and oneness if the beings were not synchronized? Sarah Wood is soul, then? Dr. Naruta soul is an idea or paradigm that has become part of the human reality program. Soul is the part of you that contains all memory of your existence as a human 1.0 and 2.0. For most of us, this is a vast repository far too large for the consciousness framework to deal with. So the soul holds this information for each individual being. Soul is a paradigm of infinite expression within a finite reality. But you can't be infinite in a finite reality if that reality is a programmed reality. So soul is not the life force that powers the human consciousness. That is the sovereign integral. That is what each of us is when we are stripped naked of all illusion, of all deceptions, of all limitations of all veils, of all functional implants including the soul. It is the redefinition of human identity and expression as I am we are from a human perspective. The wing makers do not see humans as lesser entities, but simply beings with inception points that enslave them. It is not a judgment that humans are worthless or bad or sinful or weak or needy. None of those things. Humanity needs a new start. A point in which they can synchronize in one realization, and that is the expression of I am we are living those words as behavior. Sarah wears the creator of Anu. The real God? How can we be allowed to live and operate in this kind of deception? Dr. Naruta the wing makers talk about the transformation mastership model. Hold on. Dr. Naruta went to a page among his folders. This is how they put it. The time has come to integrate the dominant model of the hierarchy. Evolution saviorship with the dominant model of source intelligence. Transformation mastership. This integration can only be achieved at the level of the entity. It cannot occur within the context of a human instrument or an aspect of the hierarchy. Only the entity the wholeness of interdimensional sovereignty imbued with source intelligence can facilitate and fully experience. The integration of these two models of existence. Sarah so what does that have to do with my question? Dr. Naruta each individual being is responsible for this. God or source. Intelligence isn't going to come down from the heavens and correct human faults. Or obstacles. Humans need to take responsibility for this Sarah but seriously, how? We're wrapped in so many layers of deception Dr. Naruta it's not easy. The wing makers write about the heart of virtues as the behavioral construct for this time, and how these words can be applied and lived, not simply held in the head as a worthy concept. Page 195. Sarah I don't think you've mentioned these before. What are they? Dr. Naruta appreciation or gratitude, compassion, humility, forgiveness, understanding and valor or courage. It is the combination of nowness being in the now and applying these words in our behaviors. It's being impeccable in this practice. Sarah what happens if you do? Dr. Naruta the unconscious mind is a doorway into all beings. These behaviors go out to all beings. They support the building of the sovereign integral network human 3.0, which is the replacement of separation. Consciousness of human 2.0. So this is the application of insertive behavior. Which is to say, I will insert these behaviors in my nowness. They will become the palette of my behavioral choice. The other half of this equation is the resistive behaviors, and these are withdrawing and stopping behaviors that support separation and deception. These are active resistances. Saying no to behaviors of your own and others. Without judgment. Again, whether you operate in the insertive or resistive behavioral mode, you are affecting the whole. You either support oneness and equality, the I am we. 
are, or you support separation and deception, also known in our reality, as the status quo. The starting point of behavior or expression is in the now. This is the creative nerve center. Every single now is a potential to support oneness and equality in this world and help birth the human 3.0 and the sovereign integral network. Sarah how long? I mean, how long will this take? Dr. Naruta the Grand Portal enables the sovereign integral network. The wing makers suggest that around 2080, conditions should be ideal for this human 3.0 to reveal itself. But they also stipulate that it could happen sooner or later. Sarah why wouldn't Anu, since he's God, simply stop it or, if Marduk could program with such amazing accuracy, how could human 3.0 even come about? Unless he wanted it? Dr. Naruta there have been several interventions. While Anu and his Syrian cohorts were focused on the human 1.0 and 2.0 uniforms, they didn't pay as much attention to the interaction of Earth and the human vessel. Earth is an anomaly in itself. Remember that the Earth's gravitational fields interact with all life. Even non-physical beings if they get close enough and stay long enough can be materialized in this plane of existence. Anu did not want to be materialized in this dimension, and he could only appear on this plane of existence for short times, maybe a day or two. In this time, our time, right now, the Anunnaki cannot enter this plane. They're locked out. The earth plane is too dense. So that is one reason. Anu's ability to interact directly with his creation has been curtailed. The second intervention point is that non-physical beings have woken up to this issue of enslavement. They see how it affects everyone. It was permitted in part because the page 196 Anunnaki and their alliance partners were strong and threatening to many other races and beings. However, this notion of enslaving infinite beings as a concept or inception point was infecting all of existence. It was a fear-based, separation-based idea that beings eventually began to see as a degenerative force to existence. The native state of existence, which includes spacitime and non-spacitime expressions, is oneness and equality. Obviously, enslavement is only possible in a separation-based paradigm. The third intervention point is the wing makers. They were the part of humanity, also known as the Atlanteans. But even before the Atlantean race, they existed in a pure state genetic template, and eventually these genetics were used by Anu to create in part the human 1.0 and human 2.0. Although with the 2.0 version, it was less pure, because Anunnaki and Syrian genetics were introduced, among others. But the point I'm trying to make here, is that the wing makers, as a future expression of human 3.0, have entered our space time and have begun to crack open this prison reality the fourth intervention point is each of us practicing the sovereign integral process Sarah I presume the incunable and Illuminati have something to say about this whole human 3.0 plan am I right on that dr. Naruta yes the tribe of power however you want to define it in terms of titles is programmed to create their own human 3.0. This version will be predicated on the convergence of technology in support of biological enhancements that make the human vessel even more of a welcoming environment for the functional implants. The goal is to make an infinite human on the earth plane, infinite by virtue of immortality. The fusion of human and technology or what some call transhumanism is the goal. So, Human 3.0 for the Tried of Power is very different from Human 3.0 SI, as envisioned by the Wing Makers. You see, transhumanism is separation. It says we are frail, weak, finite, brutish, diseased, incomplete. All of these ideas for technological implants and cognitive enhancement were parts of the ACIO agenda. Sarah the ACIO was building Human 3.0? Dr. Naruta yes, certain key aspects of the transhumanist model. Not the SI. Version. You see, 
The whole idea of transcending is linked to the inception point of separation. It is the I am supreme model. It says, the human vessel can be and should be enhanced in such a way that the functional implants can live forever. There are several things missing, according to the wing makers. 1. The unconscious mind cannot contain the data streams of a continuous species, and 2. The search for who we are, as the true source of life, will only be further obscured by technological enhancement. The realization of I am we are is not a technological realization, nor is its manifestation accelerated by or through technology, at an individual level. It is a self-learning and behavioral process. Nothing more, nothing less. Page 197. Sarah so transhumanists want to transcend human suffering, ignorance, and mortality through technology, and the OSIO 6 was providing some of the technology to do this, but who would have access to the technology? Dr. Neruda the elite, of course. It would only accelerate and accentuate the separation. It is simultaneous empowerment and disempowerment. The economic models for the transhumanist diffusion, as it was called in the labyrinth group, were not widely considered. The Incunabula being the only exception. Sarah you mean they actually wanted to build a plan that made the transcending technologies available to everyone? Dr. Neruda they looked at it from two angles one, if the technology could be introduced at birth, it would mitigate the cost issues of health care and education, offsetting diffusion costs but it would have to be a government implemented service. No private company could secure sufficient trust. So a critical component was to make the United Nations the credible world organization that could introduce transhumanism to the global stage. The second angle was to allow class distinctions and free markets to eventually make the technology irresistible to everyone, and then allow government subsidies to bring down the costs sufficiently to enable its dispersion. All of this sounds very altruistic, but the quality of the technologies would be variant. Elite classes would be able to secure higher quality implantations, coupled to more responsive genetics. This would simply be a human civilization. That would be attempting to purge discontent and disobedience, in favor of participation in a ruled system of government by elite transhumans. Technology will evolve from external and personal, to external personal, to integrated personal, to internal personal. Transhumanism is the last phase, and it is the phase that the elite are moving to. The internal personal is based on exactly the same paradigm of what is now the human condition namely, Humans have a programmed interface that's integral to their human body, and is powered by the infinite source of which they truly are. Humans are unwittingly trying to be anew to themselves. It's part of the program. According to the wing makers, humanity will play God to itself. It will try to engineer a better human and a better civilization. It will do this because it can't imagine how humanity can save itself through simple behaviors and the realization that these behaviors can make. They will do it because they are programmed to become integrated with technology. This is the path that the wing makers seek to avert. They write that human beings are complete if they can step out of their consciousness frameworks and realize what is actually powering their systems, their artificial realities, their programmed existence. The integration of technology internally will only make this realization more difficult. 6ACIO is an acronym for Advanced Contact Intelligence Organization. Page 198. Sarah I think you said on Saturday that there were prophecies of a synthetic race overtaking humanity. This sounds like what those prophets saw. Dr. Neruda 15 felt the same way. He never assumed that they were off. Planet Aliens. These prophets could have seen human 3.0 transhumanists in some distant timeline and assumed they were alien. Sarah what about the military force? Dr. Neruda as you can imagine, this is where it will be tested first. There is a whole field of psychological technology that has laid the groundwork for the real internal technologies to flow into the military. It will be released there initially so 
it can be properly defended for testing purposes. Once it's proven there, it will converge with the integrated personal technology programs of the corporate elite. Sarah when you say integrated personal, what do you mean exactly? Dr. Neruda miniaturization of the technology will enable it to adorn the body. It will not be internal yet, but it is part of the human body, like clothing, glasses, watches, and jewelry. Sarah bear with me, but let me see if I have this straight. Human 1.0 was a creation of a godlike being Dr. Neruda no. Anu is the same as us or the Atlanteans. He was no more intelligent or godlike. He was deceptive. That is the only distinction. Sarah okay. But Anu created Human 1.0 and then found them to be too similar to his own capabilities and feared they would one day figure out that they were Atlanteans enslaved by the Anunnaki. And he was worried about the consequences of that discovery. So, he wiped them clean with a planetary flood. Dr. Neruda according to the wing makers, the flood was one part of the extinction program, but there were also nuclear weapons that were discharged on the planet most of which have been explained away as meteorite impacts. But, the wing makers write that these were advanced weapons used against human populations that had avoided the flood. Sarah OK. In whatever way human 1.0s were eliminated from the planet. They were replaced by human 2.0, and these included upgrades like self, reproduction and more advanced programming. And central to this programming was the notion that Anu was God and would return to his creation. Correct? Dr. Neruda yes. 15 is the genius leader of the Advanced Contact Intelligence Organization. ACIO in the Labyrinth Group. Page 199. Sarah and the next upgrade to Human 2.0 branches out like a fork in the road. One version of Human 3.0 goes down the path of technology integration or transhumanism. The other version, 3.0 SI, is a more organic process of using behaviors to support this process of becoming a Human 3.0 or Sovereign Integral, and then becoming part of a network of these Sovereign Integrals is that correct? Dr. Neruda you have the general idea, yes. Sarah and the Tried of Power wants Human 3.0 to go down the path of technology integration, because that is how they are programmed to emulate their god, Anu. Right? Dr. Neruda yes. Sarah so it's kind of like humanity sits at a crossroads. On the one side is the Tried of Power that is programmed to develop Human 3.0 as a a cyborg, I guess. And the other side is the future existence of humanity urging us to do it internally. One person at a time, through a behavioral process. I guess the part that's missing for me is the role of the Grand Portal, which remains unclear. I thought it was a technology that proved the existence, the irrefutable scientific existence of a human soul. How does that figure into this? Dr. Neruda there are humans here who are designers of the new unconscious mind that will bridge human populations everywhere on the planet to feel and express equality and oneness. It will connect humanity in the I am we are consciousness, instead of the separation consciousness. It will not be based on hierarchy. That deception is coming down. One of the things that was never disclosed in the materials including my previous four interviews is that certain information was to be withheld. Some information was even veiled to not raise the ire of the tribe of power. This information, the fifth interview, will not be disclosed in the same timeline as the previous four. Sarah Y. Dr. Neruda the designers of the new unconscious layer of the human 3.0 are on the planet now. They are doing some of the preparation required to move. Humanity who will be sitting at the fork in the road in the next 40-50 years to choose the I am we are path. Sarah so I can't release this interview? Dr. Neruda no. When it's time, I will contact you. Sarah you said some of the information was veiled. In what way? Dr. Neruda the wing makers will only release some of the information now, in 1998. That is the information that will not feel too revolutionary. Too radical. 
it needed, in their own words, to cross into the human interface and activate a willingness to listen to their voice. For example, they used the term wing makers to describe themselves, knowing it would have a connection to the angel construct. Page 200. Sarah but you said the wing makers were a future representation of human beings presumably, from this disclosure version 3.0. Right? Dr. Naruta yes, but there is programming within the human interface where the functional implants are networked as a system that will tune out certain information. A person will hear it, but they will not act on it. They will hear it, but they will object to it. They will hear it, but they will not share it. All of these programs were created not originally, but they can be upgraded. The program can be updated with new instructions. It makes cracking into this reality. Exposing it for what it truly is a very difficult proposition. This is why it requires a degree of stealth. The deception is so thick and opaque. In this reality, that the ones who are trying to come into the prison and create a crack in the wall. They also have to use a form of deception. Sarah Y. Dr. Naruta the programming, Sarah. If the pure state information was given out, and it contradicted everything that people have been told to believe, if it was the literal reverse of what was logical and acceptable in this world, who would listen? The wing makers needed to awaken certain people to bring them inside their information field, to warm them up to the truth. It has to be done in degrees for the vast majority of people. Sarah what about me? Dr. Naruta you are not among the vast majority, but then you're only getting a taste of it. Sarah does everyone within the labyrinth group know this, too? Dr. Naruta yes, to varying degrees. Sarah but they were going down the transhumanism path. Did this information change their mind? Dr. Naruta no. That's really why I'm here. Sarah you just said I'm only getting a taste of it, so there's still more materials that will be released later? Dr. Naruta yes. Sarah but you're not going to tell me when. Right? Dr. Naruta correct. Sarah as intelligent and aware as the labyrinth group is, why didn't this information change their minds? Page 201. Dr. Naruta I had the benefit of having direct interactions with the wing makers. None of my peers did. This was the difference in my willingness to act on the information, and not simply consider it as a contradiction to my invested reality. Sarah this is fucked up, isn't it? Dr. Naruta what part? Sarah all of it. It's all fucked up and we did it. Dr. Naruta whatever it is, it's important to know what's behind the deception. To look with sober eyes on the truth. It may not be a beautiful picture to be sure. But how else do you realize your own truth until you know the truth of the big picture? So, however screwed up it seems, it is an inception point for the individual to redefine themselves. Would you rather stay in the illusion of a soul in a human body that will be saved by God, ascend into heaven and hang out with angels who strum harps? That whole idea is repulsive once you know this. That picture is based on separation, selfishness, lack of empathy and understanding. Or, you can simply say it's all a big illusion, including the notion that we are infinite beings, and that when you die, you're done. The part of this new picture that is promising is that we exist infinitely despite the fact that we have been suppressed and enslaved. We also can play a role in supporting this redefinition of the human being through our thoughts and behaviors. And maybe most importantly, we have the wing makers our future selves providing us with evidence that I am we are prevailed. When I first read these materials, these were the things that provided some sense of hope and I share them with you, for what it's worth. Sarah thanks. All of the things that you told me in the first four interviews. With this new information, does it change it? Dr. Naruta yes. Everything is affected by this. Sarah give me an example. Dr. Naruta Sunday night I mentioned LERM or the light encoded reality. Matrix. LERM is what the labyrinth group thought was God in terms of proof. But what was really discovered was the essence of Anu and how he operates in. This reality is an all-encompassing observation field that is inside our 
consciousness interface to this reality existence called Earth. L-E-R-M is Anu. Projected. Sarah what about ETs? Don't they know about this and can't they intervene? And save us from this situation? Page 202. Dr. Naruta remember, everyone inside our universe is part of this deception. Whether they know it or not. There are four classes of beings one, those who know the deception and are actively supporting it. Two, those who know about the deception, but are unwilling to do anything about it. Three, those who don't know the deception and are unknowingly supporting it. And four, those who know about the deception and are actively trying to step out of the deception and engineer a process for everyone else to do the same. That's it. It doesn't matter if the being is physical or non-physical. Everyone falls into one of these four categories everywhere in our universe of existence. The beings in group 3 are waking up. Some of them understand that the deception in one part of the universe infects all. It requires corrective action. It requires collective understanding to ensure that it will never happen again. Sarah how can everyone in this universe be a part of this deception? I don't understand. Dr. Neruda our entire universe is created. I'm not saying it is the universe. I'm saying that what we call the universe, as far as we can observe, is part of the hologram implanted within our consciousness framework and human interface. Our mind consciousness established the spatial temporal relationships of everything we see, and as I said, this is part of our program. And this includes the universe. Why do you think that our best minds on the planet cannot define consciousness, let alone the subconscious and unconscious mind? It is programmed this way. Anu did not want us to figure it out. We'll look at neural information and decide it can be sliced a thousand different ways, but it still doesn't explain how it's experienced. As Aristotle said some 2,300 years ago, to be conscious that we are perceiving is to be conscious of our own existence. That is a good description of I am. So, are we an isolated life form that confronts our external, separate reality? No, we are connected to all. That is why I am we are as the critical inception point for our identity. Any being that does not confirm their belief in this, is not aware of reality. It doesn't matter where they exist or what vessel they wear. It doesn't matter if they want to save humanity. They must first act from this inception. The universe, as immense as it appears, is a hologram inside a programmed existence which every human being agrees is reality. That agreement informs the unconscious mind again, a part of the human interface that Anu created and collectively we all see our world the same way, more or less. We have been told there are trillions of planets with life. That the universe is abundant with life forms in various dimensions, but what we know is here. One. Earth. The tangible, visible Earth. Are there other beings? Of course. I've seen. Them. Will they save humanity? They can't. They can only support. It isn't about. Anyone or anything saving us. It is about a redefinition process that can only. Occur within each individual entity. It isn't about being beamed up or ascending. To some higher, protected dimension. This will be done in the physical body as human beings, by human beings, for human beings. Page 203. Sarah I know the interview on paper won't show a hint of how you just delivered that last answer, but I wish it could. I think it helps to see it. Dr. Naruta the words are enough. Sarah why you? Why do you suppose you can interact with the wing makers? And were asked to release this information? Why didn't they interact with? 15, 2. Dr. Naruta first of all, it isn't just me. However, within the labyrinth group, they selected me for reasons that I had a certain resonance to their information that others within the labyrinth group lacked. In terms of releasing the information, perhaps I was the only one who would go to the extreme of defecting from the ACIO to make this information available. I don't look at myself as unique in the sense that I am the only one involved in 
getting this information out. There are others, many others, both physical and non-physical, who are assisting in this transformative process. The Wing Makers refer to it in their philosophy papers as the two portals. Sarah I've only heard you speak of the Grand Portal. I assume it's one of the two portals. Dr. Neruda yes. The Grand Portal will be released in the Wing Makers literature as the irrefutable scientific discovery of the human soul, and in a way, that's true. But it's not the whole story. The two portals are defined as the crack and the wall demolition. Sarah I hope you plan to explain that. Dr. Neruda yes, well, the crack is the first portal. It is the portal between worlds. It is a human, and that's about all I know at this time. Sarah a human who does what? Dr. Neruda that can step between worlds. I realize that thousands of people, even famous people, have claimed to have visited heaven, but according to the writings of the wing makers, it is not true. They have wandered into the astral world, which has many dimensions, but this astral world is part of the creation of Anu, in terms of our programming. Our true dimensional existence is not of Anu's creation or formulas. The human portal will be a communication portal between our origins, as a race of infinite beings, and this world the hologram of deception. Sarah what about the wall demolition, as you called it? Dr. Neruda the grand portal is the wall demolition. That's when the wall comes down through the efforts of all beings that are undergoing the sovereign integral process. And this makes it possible for all human beings to step forward into their infinite self or life essence. Page 204 Sarah so the sequence is first the human portal and then the grand portal? And from a timing perspective, what can you say about it? Dr. Neruda the human portal anchors the inception point on earth for the grand portal. It will come in about 10 years. The grand portal, about 70 years after that. Those are the rough time frames I've been given, but always with the stipulation that these times can shift and change. Sarah what does science say about this? Dr. Neruda science in terms of what? Sarah I mean the whole notion of the universe being a hologram or illusion. Created inside our head. Dr. Neruda science is not able to explain it. The counterlogical nature of the universe in terms of quantum behavior is impossible to explain. Some scientists have relented to explaining it all the way as hidden variables. But frankly. What the wing makers have explained is that we're creating the universe through the human interface Anu provided us by reinterpreting sound vibrations through our five senses. Sarah but it doesn't make sense. How can I see the moon a two year old? Can see it exactly the same way? How can it be the same? Dr. Neruda no, this is what the unconscious mind provides the human 2.0 interface. It gathers the interpretation of the sound vibration of the moon, based on billions and billions of sightings throughout time. These evolve and change based on environmental conditions, but generally the notion that the moon is silver and generally the size that it is, is stored and shared in the DNA and unconscious mind system and reinforced by culture, family and education. This is the universal collective field. It's a field effect that transfers information through vibratory fields that interconnect humans. Sarah maybe it'll just take me a while to get that one. I hear your explanation. It just doesn't make sense to me. Let me change the topic slightly. If everyone's life is pre-programmed, why are you and I talking about this? I mean why are we able to discuss this? Why would Marduk's program allow us to even glimpse this? information? Dr. Neruda it's a good question. Maybe the best way to understand this is to consider a thought experiment. Imagine that our universe is a bubble. It was created by a group of entities that used deception against their equals who had never experienced such an evil vision of separation and therefore couldn't conceive of a defense against it. This bubble universe seemed complete and always expanding. In many ways, it was an ideal platform for life, and yet only one sentient life form seemed to exist on one tiny planet inside this vast, near 
infinite universe inside this same bubble, there were vibratory dimensions that became known in religious circles as heaven and hell, and in spiritual and psychic circles, as the etheric and astral planes. These planes exist inside the bubble, but are not visible with the human interface or five senses. We'll call this bubble one. External to bubble one, imagine there is another universe or dimension of existence. It is vast and encompasses bubble one wholly. Within this second, larger bubble is the dimension from which our life essence originated prior to its insertion into bubble one. Now, beings in bubble two can enter bubble one and experience it fully. However, if they get too close to the populated planet called Earth and stay too long, they will manifest and not be able to return to Bubble 2. Earth is the focal point in Bubble 1. The entities, who fancy themselves as gods, create more bubbles. They entrap other races in the same paradigm of deception and cast beings from Bubble 2 to new bubbles that are similar to Bubble 1. These entities essentially plan to take over Bubble 2 for themselves, while making their equals, who formerly shared Bubble 2. Enslaved worshippers who look to the rulers of Bubble 2 as their gods. Meanwhile, there is a larger bubble that surrounds Bubble 2. We'll call it Bubble 3. Are you with me? Sarah I think so. Dr. Naruta good. So Bubble 3 encompasses Bubble 2 and all of the smaller bubbles related to Bubble 1. There are beings in Bubble 3 that are Aware of the deception perpetrated on the bubbles and the beings within them. But infinite beings are patient and curious. They wanted to see what this separation construct would create. In dimensions that had only known oneness and equality, the concept of division in material form was interesting. Sarah but all the human misery, just to run an experiment? Dr. Naruto remember the human machine is not real. It's the equivalent of a spacesuit with artificial intelligence and a sense and respond sensory system. The astronautus is infinite. It cannot be killed or hurt or destroyed. While the experimentation looks miserable from a human perspective, it is vibrant with learning on many other levels, one of which is to build the awareness in all beings of never allowing this deception to occur again. The unconscious mind system of the human being exists in a similar, but significantly more advanced modus operandi in the interdimensional beings that can interoperate between the three bubbles. It is what allows the equality and oneness to be maintained in vast worlds of space-time and quantum space-time. Now, within this thought experiment you can see that the dimensions of space-time are more dimensional than one universe. That entities exist in these various bubbles, experimenting with their creation. Sometimes in this experimentation, they decide to enslave page 206 through the constructs of separation and deception. This occurs with issues that human beings can relate to like scarcity, preservation of a race, unintended consequences of decisions, service to self instead of service to truth. All of these elements were in the behavioral equations of Anu and his Syrian accomplices. At some point, the lessons are learned. The entire experiment solidifies and hardens to such a degree that it cannot really compress any more. Its value rapidly diminishes from that point. When this happens, beings will intervene. In our case, we intervened in the form of humanity returning to warn of this reality. Hence the wing maker's intervention. As for why we are talking, it's simple. Marduk is not the only one who can program. Sarah and what does that mean? Dr. Naruta in today's world we have programmers who can write code that take the user of that code from one experience to the next. It moves them from point A to point B programming is an aspect of time. It's a directional process. You're aware of hackers. They come in all sizes. Earlier this year a 15 year old kid hacked into the US Air Force. Even Microsoft is finding it impossible to protect its NTOs. The hacker mindset is again a manifestation of separation. It is a polarity. A mind game of sorts, complete with ego and sometimes greed. Mostly, 
it's a reminder that whatever's a fortress remains vulnerable. The program that Marduk created is similar in concept to our software programming, but infinitely more complex and advanced. However, as any hacker will tell you, anything can be hacked with the right technology and skill. Our programs have been hacked. We've been altered. We're not connected in the same way to the grid lines that rule this hologram that I call Bubble 1, a little earlier. Sarah who? Who did the hacking? Dr. Neruda I can give you a name. I don't know. I've been told that there are many resources that are being used to create the crack in the wall, and then, from the inside that's us, humanity will push the wall down collectively and walk out of this prison. We're part of the crack. Sarah I don't remember volunteering. Dr. Neruda for what it's worth, neither do I. Sarah okay. I'm going to shift the conversation a bit. In my notes from Saturday you said the following that the wing makers claimed that the three dimensional five sensory domain that humans have adjusted to is the reason we are only using a fractional portion of our intelligence. They claimed that the time capsule would be the bridge from the three dimensional five sensory domain to the multidimensional seven sensory domain. How does that relate to tonight's conversation? And what exactly is the time? Capsule? Page 207. Dr. Neruda the time capsule is the content of the wing maker's project. It's called a time capsule because it's a designed intervention to shift time. It's called a capsule because it is a delivery system of information that is designed to assist people to unlock from their grid lines their pre-programmed life path where they were essentially a human robot marching through their life path as they were programmed to do. Until the wing makers disclose this aspect of their intervention Sarah's note the fifth interview of Dr. Jamis and Neruda, they can disclose the real meaning behind their words. Again, they cloak their words in the accepted standards of this world's rules relative to the new age, new world order, spirituality, religion, philosophy, etc. This gave them an accepted anonymity. After all, it was all presented as a myth. There's nothing in a myth that could cause Anu to censor or strike back. They tested the explicitness of the language, and decided to place some of the activational elements in other formats like art, poetry and music. In other words, when they couldn't state something explicitly, because of retaliatory concerns, they would encode it into the art. Sarah but you've asked me to hold it back this interview. What if it never gets released? Dr. Neruda then it wasn't necessary. Sarah but then that would make the rest of the materials less than true. Wouldn't it? Dr. Neruda I would say it would make them less direct or explicit, but to your point, yes, I would agree that their truth is diminished without the framework of this disclosure. Sarah who are these materials for? I mean, I can tell you right now that when you were describing the first four interviews, I could count on one hand how many people I know who would listen to this perspective with an open mind. Most of my friends and family. I wouldn't even mention it. But with this interview, I don't think anyone I know would be open to it. I can't think of one. To be honest. Dr. Neruda I understand. The number of people who show up to look through the crack in the wall will be very small. In terms of the whole population, a tiny fraction. But the real definition of the grand portal is that enough people will look through the crack and recognize there is more much more to realities existence, and they will work collectively to push down the wall. When the wall falls, that will be when the infinite beings inside step out and operate the human instrument, not as a separate thing, not as a vessel or something they wear as a uniform, but they will operate inside the human body free of the interface and functional implants. Sarah you mean they won't ascend into bubble number 2 or 3? Dr. Neruda they will stay right here earth. But they will stay here, in the body. As infinite beings, not enslaved shells of themselves. Sarah you said there were other beings involved in this intervention. Can you disclose them? Page 208. Dr. Neruda I'd prefer not to say anything other than to mention that it will be disclosed soon. 
This whole enslavement of humanity is like the six blind men. Touching the elephant. Many people are feeling parts of the elephant and describing the part they are touching, but with blindfolds on, it is very hard to describe the whole deception. Sarah are these blind men humans? Dr. Naruta yes, of course. They see parts of this enslavement and they know something is happening. Something isn't right. You could have godlike beings walking around the earth coincident with murder, rape, child abuse and war, and they don't feel this separation and deception. Something is terribly wrong. Why? Are we letting this happen? According to the wing makers, there are people who are incarnated now who would be the equivalent of outliers. Are you familiar with this term? Sarah no. Dr. Naruta the term is typically used in statistics. Think of it like an anomaly. A person has what is called a transient malfunction to their interface, but in this malfunction, they are able to see through the crack. It might only last a second or two, but they glimpse what is behind the walls. And again, I'm not talking about the astral plane that's just a more rarefied plane of the hologram of deception. People with these transient malfunctions often end up being diagnosed autistic, or in extreme cases, are considered schizophrenic, but because the malfunction is transient, they slowly merge back into the human hologram and lack the contextual meaning of what they saw anyway. They learn to forget. The program draws them back in. But before they forget, before they return to normal beliefs, before they are drugged or quarantined, they share their experience to the unconscious mind. And this begins to express itself through culture. It'll come out in movies, books, theater, art, poetry, and many of these expressions will help to feed the unconscious mind and open it up to the possibility that the scale of our prison encompasses even the light, even science, even angels, even God. Sarah do we wear a target on ourselves when this gets released? I mean will Anu decide to take us down if this goes out? Dr. Naruta believe me I probed on that issue. There's risk involved. How? Much, I don't know. The wing makers explain that the creators of this plan have resigned themselves to the intervention, but that their equivalents here on Earth are not as excited by those prospects. It'll work its way out but it'll take some time. Sarah what happens between now and the grand portal? When the wall gets pushed down? Page 209. Dr. Neruda all I can tell you is that the tribe of power will continue to consolidate. The money system will continue to spiral away from the many into the hands of the few. This was part of the original programming Sarah relating to the return of Anu? Dr. Neruda yes. Anu would step in and solve the world's problems and be anointed. Anu would use the centralization of the money system to integrate technology into biologic systems so they would be able to have infinite existence in bubble one earth. That way, Anu reasoned, he could be God in this world forever. But as I said, this plan was not perfect in the sense of its infinitude. Anu underestimated the beings in bubble three and beyond. Sarah has it ever been tried before? Dr. Naruto what? Sarah this crack in the wall, and then pushing the wall down? Dr. Naruto no. Not in our world. This is the first coordinated effort to liberate humanity. Sarah but what about Jesus or Buddha? Dr. Naruto according to the wing makers, each of the avatars nine who came to this planet did so as invited guests. Humans were explained as lost beings. It's literally how we are defined in the planes of existence outside our planet. Remember what I had said about the higher dimensional beings that would visit Earth and become manifested? Sarah yes, Dr. Naruta that was how many of these avatars came to Earth. They did not go through the birth process, they literally manifested in the Earth plane with their dimensional consciousness intact. They did not want to be born into this world and inhabit a human body, because they knew they would sleep and forget. Avatars had to directly manifest. The problem was that people were afraid of them and stayed away, or people acted as guardians of the old system and wanted to destroy the avatar, or some 
people looked to the Avatar to save them. This was what spawned the Evolution Saviorship Model of the Universe. Evolution, as defined here, is the process of being saved and absolved of one's sins. The sinner evolved into the disciple. And the disciple evolved into the teacher. And the teacher evolved into the hierarchy of teachers and leaders. Saviorship simply meant that an outside force or avatar would save the individual from their sins or reprehensible behavior. An avatar is an incarnate teacher of truth. Page 210. And connect them to the light or spirit of God. The Savior was an intermediary of the hierarchy that plugged the individual into the light of illumination and enlightenment. Sarah so didn't these avatars open a crack? Dr. Neruda of sorts, but mostly it was to demonstrate what was really inside the human vessel. It was not to show miracles for the sake of convincing people to follow them or to create a religion. The resurrection, for example, was not a piece of theater to underline Jesus' unique stature as the Son of God. He was not. That. That was written in later. As his popularity grew, it was understood that Anu and Marduk could utilize Jesus to strengthen Anu's hold on human culture, and reposition himself as a loving God the father of great entities like Jesus. Avatars were generally considered an annoyance by Anu. Usually they were killed or locked up to wither and die. Stories would be created to either cement them to Anu's glorification, or they would be vilified and deemed to be of Satan. There was no middle ground with avatars. Jesus was really the first avatar that Anu decided to embrace and create a world religion around. Each of the other world religions were modeled after Christianity, even those whose founder was not technically an avatar. Avatars were very rare. They wanted to come in and push down the walls, but they needed a large enough following to bring the whole wall down. A crack wouldn't be enough. And if they came simply to show the nature of the infinite being inside each human uniform, they risked a religion being built around them that would become, over time, welded to Anu and the holographic, multi-layer deception that hung over humanity like a dome. The wing makers refer to a new type of being called the sovereign entity. These are pre-sovereign integral beings, but they are seated with the capacity to step out of the hierarchy, and in doing so, they allow themselves to examine information that others would attack or ignore. Unfortunately, the information that will liberate people is the very information they are programmed to attack. Sarah when you use the term hierarchy, what are you referring to exactly? Dr. Neruda the wing maker seemed to use this interchangeably with Anu at the top his leadership within the dimensions, or bubble two, and his leadership on earth in the form of a tried of power. Collectively, this is the hierarchy. Sarah can you help me understand how it is that no one knows about this? I mean, out of six billion ten people that walk the earth now, and I don't know how many over the whole history of mankind, but it must be. I don't know, about a hundred billion or so. How could it be disguised? Dr. Neruda that's how many life expressions, perhaps, but not beings the total population of Earth in 1998 was approximately 6 billion, which was when this interview was conducted. Page 211. Sarah because of reincarnation, right? Dr. Neruda yes. But to answer your question, it's done through the interface of the human vessel. The interface is what most people consider to be them. That is, their consciousness. The interface fuses with the physical body and the dimensional being that powers and animates it. There's an old saying that the last thing a fish notices is water. It's an apt expression of our circumstance, too. Humans have been living in this consciousness of a human body ever since they were first created. It is all they have ever known, and because of the Sophistication of the technology that underlies this entire deception, we are thrown distraction after distraction to never, ever consider the possibility that everything is a part of an illusion. Everything. While it seems impossible that a hundred billion lives have existed and not one has peered through the crack, it would be like going to the deep sea where the 
bioluminescent fish live, and explaining to them that a world exists of light and warmth. Maybe one or two would venture from the depths if they were told of this world, and they would return and report that they had experienced this strange, mysterious world. But never would they imagine that a whole world of land and air existed above that, where beings of entirely different natures walked on dry dirt and breathed air and looked at stars a billion light years away. Humans are a lot like those bioluminescent fish. Sarah okay, I understand the analogy, but no one? Dr. Neruda momentary glimpses through cracks. That's all. The avatars that manifested here have operated the closest to our true nature on this planet, but those who have gone through the birth process and have human DNA, they are locked into their interface or they are quickly removed. Sarah Tuesday you talked at length about Lucifer and his creation of the Animus, where's that factor into this? The story? Dr. Neruda until last night I didn't know if this interview would even take place. I knew you wanted to speak in depth about the Grand Portal, but I wasn't sure at what level I would be allowed to disclose it. This is very guarded information. It's both a break-in and a break-out. The break-in is difficult to engineer amid the misinformation and deception that occurs on this planet. Relative to humans, Lucifer and the fallen angels was a nod to the fallen humans who were booted out of Eden. It is the same story with the same purpose place fear of rebellion in the consciousness systems of humans. Make it strong and potent in the unconscious mind, and make sure that Lucifer, Satan and the devil mirror the trinity of good the Father, Son and the Holy Ghost. Anu realized that the best way to make his human creation lean his way was to make the path to his kingdom appear virtuous and morally acceptable. And how do you do that? You have evil embodied in demons that are bent on enslaving humans and preventing them from following the virtuous path. Page 212. It created the perfect polarity of human beings progressing to the kingdom of God. While demons seduced and ensnared them, angels and ascended masters were guides to show the way to the waiting kingdom. Eastern traditions used demigods, hierarchies of masters, meditation, but it was based on the very same polarity, which at its most basic level was light is good, and darkness is evil. So with that said, let me return to your question about Lucifer and the Animus. The story of Lucifer is like a prop on a stage. With Lucifer in play, the stage is more dangerous. You can place blame. You can deflect blame and responsibility from the morally righteous and God-fearing humans. You can infer that you're Enemies are enslaved by demons that do the bidding of Lucifer or Satan. This creates conflicts that lead to wars. This creates histories of conflict which saw generation after generation of people who are living their forefathers. Conflict. Amid all of this, God grows in stature and importance. Everyone wants to claim that God is on their side. Lucifer was a catalyst to enlarge the importance of Anu to make humans dependent on him even though they never saw him, heard him, tasted him, smelled him or touched him. He was in the universal field vis-a-vis -vis the unconscious mind. It was programmed this way, and religious culture only made it feel more real. The Animus were the human 3.0 in the trajectory envisioned by Anu to support his infinite supremacy over humanity. His goal was to synthesize humanity with technology. The Animus were us in a potential future. There are government, organizations, corporate entities and research institutions that share the same goal even as we speak. Sarah how did the decision get made not to release everything? Dr. Neruda I've said that the wing makers materials are extensive. There are 24 philosophical papers, but only 4 will be released. The 4 interviews we previously done, as I told you. These four will be released. Possibly not all at once, but those have been sanctioned. This interview and the remaining 20 philosophy papers will not be released. Until certain conditions are met. What those conditions are, I don't know. I assume it has to do with the discovery of the portal the human portal I mentioned in getting the crack in the wall established in this world. 
Once a foothold is made in establishing the inception point, perhaps then the other materials can be released. As for how the decision is made, let me be very clear that this is not my decision. It is determined by the wing makers. On intervention from time. Travelers is a very sensitive operation. Many variables need to be weighed and considered. Sarah forgive my blunt question here, but how do you know that the wing makers are part of this whole deception? Page 213. Dr. Neruda at some point you have to trust your feelings and intuition. Otherwise everything is just a purposeless mental exercise. I can say that I'm 100% confident. As a scientist, I'm disbelieving by nature, but everything I've read and studied is consistent to their stated goal, which is to establish a new inception point for human beings in this specific time. Their first disclosure is a cloaked message of hope. An energetic rewiring of the spiritual philosophies of this planet away from masters, organizations, hierarchies and belief. It is more focused on becoming a spiritual activist or practitioner of behavioral intelligence. It is about activating pre-sovereign integrals who are able to understand the evolutionary scope of the human being and help it to veer in the direction of the sovereign integral. The next or second disclosure will be the activation of the human portal. I don't know yet how this will unfold, only that it will happen relatively soon. The third disclosure will be the fifth interview and possibly other material. When the fifth interview is released, it signals that the inception point has already been made. According to the wing makers, this means that the grand portal will occur on this planet. Once the new inception point is anchored, it will unfold you. Plan. I have made the decision that if the second disclosure occurs, I will commit to this plan 100%. Until then I have told the wing makers that I am with them and will conduct my actions according to their insights and guidance, but I will always have doubt in my mind until I see that the second disclosure occurs. Sarah what if no one believes this, Dr. Neruda? What if you release this fifth interview sometime in the future and no one can relate to it or, as you suggested, they attack it? What then? Is the human portal sufficient to make this whole thing happen? Dr. Neruda yes. That's what I have been told. Once the inception point is anchored, it will all unfold to plan. Sarah so no one needs to believe this. It'll just happen. That doesn't sound right. Dr. Neruda this information will remain in the underground, but science, according to the wing makers, will be the force to actually prove out this information. Sarah how? Dr. Neruda science will find the walls. They won't expose the crack or necessarily assist in the demolition, but they will expose the walls Sarah but you said that LERM was discovered by the ACIO, and they thought of it as God or universal intelligence or whatever it was. Dr. Neruda yes. I am not saying that science will define the hologram of deception as an insidious ruse perpetrated on humanity to enslave infinite beings. To operate as finite fear-based diminishments of themselves. That's not my point. But those sovereign entities that page 214 stand around the crack in the wall will need help from legitimate sources that validate the possibility of the hologram. I don't expect science to label the hologram good or bad, or imbue it with philosophical issues like deception, polarity, separation, etc. The wing makers have explained that around the time that the human portal is activated, a scientist of great stature will emerge with a theory that will support the inception point. It is all being facilitated by their hacking into the program of these and other individuals. Sarah do you know the name of this scientist? Dr. Neruda no. Sarah do you think it's you? Dr. Neruda no. I have no stature. No one has ever heard of me. Wing makers were speaking of someone who held a high degree of credibility in the scientific community. Sarah I still don't see how it will happen. I mean the wall coming down. If things are as screwed up as you say, people will follow their programming. They'll have too much fear to release everything they've learned to be real and true. 
I just don't think people can make such a radical shift. Dr. Neruda I agree. They can't, not in the face of the status quo. But the status quo is part of the wall that will be taken down. You can't paper over this. You can wave a magic wand and pretend it doesn't exist the wars between races, religions, classes, geographies, relationships of every scope, these cannot be pardoned by a savior or ET race. They have consequences, and these have to be dealt with. The status quo the old normalcy, the comfortable distortion will be removed, because you cannot build a heaven on earth as simply as plopping a new reality layer on top of the status quo. It would be like adding the Grand Canyon on top of a skyscraper. The skyscraper can't support it. Sarah the amount of change that's coming sounds overwhelming. Dr. Neruda if there's one thing I've learned in this interaction with the wing makers, there is a programming track, and then there is a super consciousness track the latter is involved with how quantum reality membranes intersect and can create chain reactions that ripple across every dimension. These chain reactions are guided by event strings designed by beings from very high dimensions. As I previously said, every being has the IAM sovereignty, but they also possess the WEARE integration. As the IAM asserts itself through the expression of behaviors either resistive or insertive the IAM disentangles itself from the program, the human 2.0 interface. It begins to reconnect with the WEARE frequency or the tone of equality as the wing makers have referred to it. It broadcasts this through the unconscious mind or universal field, making it easier for another being to touch into the same perspective and adopt these behaviors. Page 215 My point is that either the designers of the higher dimensional planes or humanity as a collective could potentially accelerate or decelerate the grand portal. Sarah what if there was a tug of war like the higher beings wanted it sooner and humanity wanted it later? Dr. Neruda I don't know. I suspect the higher dimensional beings would listen to the resistance. I really don't have an opinion on that one. Sarah one day, hopefully in the not too distant future, a person will read this interview. What advice would you give them? Dr. Neruda everyone has thoughts and emotions. Everyone shares a reality called Earth and the human body. We're all on the same stage, playing different roles, but the stage unifies us to some degree. None of us can look across the stage and see a beautiful world of peace and harmony, or goodwill to all men. It isn't the reality that encompasses us. The question is how do we move closer to a reality that supports our most innate truth, that I am we are? How do we create a stage and write a play that supports our transformation into the sovereign integral that is in fact what we each are? Has religion shown the way? Has spirituality? How about science? How about our education system? Government? My point is that nothing that is currently in play is uniting us in equality and oneness. If you look at everything in your world after you read this interview, you will see that our world is designed for a very specific function, and this function is to feel separation. It can be as obvious as the color of skin, gender, and different cultures, to the subtler distinctions between religions and spirituality, but the design is fractal and it infuses everything in this world in this common unity I have called separation. Ironically, our unity is separation. If you agree, if you also see or sense this separation, you might also decide that it's escalating, not moving in the direction of unity, but further towards diversification and distinction, as if the more granular humanity becomes in its information access and expression, the more it drifts apart into clumps of similarity that feign unity within the clump, but expresses separation to the whole. The leaders of this world, whether they come from political, economic, military, religious or cultural perspectives, know how to speak the language of unity and oneness, but their actions are the result of programs that often act in reverse. This isn't about thoughts and language. This is about behaviors and actions. People know how to disconnect from their thoughts and say one thing, and then do another. 
They know how to feign care, but their actions demonstrate hollowness. This is not an indecent to every standing solution, but nothing has worked. Religion's failure has birthed the nihilistic and disillusioned organizations of darkness and occult experimentation. They feed off one another. It's symbiotic. Survival. But what is lost in this is page 216. The reality that confusion and disaffection reaches into the world's populations and dulls our collective minds and hearts. There is hope. Hope resides in the vacuum of unity and oneness that is unaligned to anything on this planet. No one owns it or controls it or administers it. There is no mediation or a go-between. It is completely unique. For all intents and purposes, it has never been seen or heard. It is on the other side of the wall. This is our hope, as foreign and strange as it may seem. What is in this world is not working, and it is because of separation. I don't care. If you read the most esoteric, spiritual information on this planet, it is of separation. I've read esoteric spiritual documents over the past 20 years that would make most people swoon and say to themselves this is the highest information or this information is true because it is so detailed, no one could possibly know this much detail unless it was true. The most esoteric information on this planet was not written by human beings, but through human beings vis-a-vis -vis channeling. The channeling speaks of wonderful spiritual realities, of how humans and aliens are one, of how the deep psychology of human beings is constructed, of the complex cosmological environment in which humanity is nested. All wonderful information except no one mentions how we are enslaved, or why, or by whom. Not one. If these wonderful sources of information knew about how humanity is enslaved, wouldn't they share it? Isn't this the most basic point of information? What the wing makers call the inception point. Why hasn't any of this esoteric literature shown this? I'll tell you, because the beings are either inside the hologram and don't realize it themselves, or are part of the deception and are guarding its discovery from humans. They're no different from us us, as infinite beings. They're lost in this hologram of deception as much as we are. For those of you who read this interview and are unsettled by it, I can only say, good, you should be. It's a reality check on a cosmic, universal and individual level. You can bathe in the splendor of spirituality and quench your thirst with the presented masters, or you can deepen your understanding of the reality that confronts us and stand up committed to apply your self-expression in service to truth, to walk your life in the expression of resistive and insertive behaviors, to be sovereign and integral. It isn't about spouting high spiritual concepts in thoughts and words. That is the reflex of the consciousness system it's parroting and robotic. Live the I am we. Are in your behaviors and leave the mind. Shudder it. The mind is programmed to compare and analyze, which feeds the me-you separation. Sorry about that, I got a little carried away with my answer. Sarah no, it was good to hear your passion for this. I guess the thing that's interesting to me is that the wing maker's materials are esoteric, at least to me, and they seem to be explaining cosmological systems and psychological structures. How is it different than what you were just saying about the channeled? Information? Page 217. Dr. Naruta sometime this year the wing maker's site will be released on the internet, at least a part of it. Its only goal, according to its authors, is to introduce one concept the sovereign integral. That is the fractal seed for the inception. Point. The second phase will introduce practical behaviors to support the sovereign being in their deprogramming of what it means to be a spiritual person. The third phase is to anchor the inception point and create the crack in the wall. Sarah you've talked about the crack in the wall as the inception point. Can you elaborate on that a bit more? Dr. Neruda I will, but first let me state something that I want to mention before I forget. The youth of this world are impressionable. They're transitioning from the subconscious implants of their parents and forefathers to the creation of their own personality. They want to be different, they want to express themselves. 
uniquely, and this opens them to influence. Where does this influence arise? Increasingly it comes through technology and the culture creators of music, entertainment, games and books. They bring the tools for youth to knit their unique layer of personality that can fuse atop their genetic layer of consciousness the subconscious. The glamour models, as the wing makers refer to them, convey a powerful elixir, which is to be selfish and self-obsessed. Narcissism is okay. Nihilism is the philosophy. This is prevalent and it will continue to spread, because this is our news program. When technology is unleashed in the form of global platforms, the impressionable youth will inform their consciousness and personality layers by means of this underlying philosophical belief in nihilism. The way this seeps into the culture, through technology that helps codify personality in our youth is one of the clearest examples of how Marduk's programming spreads. However more sophisticated the technology becomes, the more integral it is to the person, the more the culture creators will exercise this philosophical system in humanity. Sarah Y. Dr. Neruda because nihilism is the belief in nothing, and if kids build their personality and belief system from these ingredients, they will be more obedient to their internal programs. Sarah Y. Dr. Neruda if you don't really believe in the higher reality of our world, you are more inclined to relinquish your sovereignty or the I am consciousness. The phrase selling my soul to the devil is simply code for I surrender to the will of Anu and desire to let him take my life for his purpose. The unstated objective of that renouncing of the I am is that Anu will give me something in return for my sacrifice. But the only thing that is returned is slavery to the system. You walk your life according to your program, and the program ensures you are a puppet whether you are rich or poor. Page 218. Sarah I'm glad you mentioned children, do you see them getting this? And if so, at what age? Dr. Neruda if you mean will children understand the information that I have shared tonight, yes, of course. In many ways, they'll get it better than their adults. Counterparts whose human 2.0 interface is more welded or infused into the human uniform. But the wing makers have written the material so that they will be understood by the prepared, and age is not the key factor. It is the preparation. Sarah like what? I mean what constitutes preparation? Dr. Naruta preparation is willingness to change. It is a lack of fear to embrace a completely new paradigm, and just as much, to release the old. If a person is poorly prepared for this information, they defend what this information tears down, which is nearly everything. They are not prepared to step into the vacuum of change that this information brings into their life. Sarah but why? Dr. Neruda it requires a lot of responsibility to accept this information. This information is unsettling because you are on your own. We are on our own. There is no savior or army of angels or ETs who are going to collect the good and bring them to their heavenly home. This also requires work. It is behavioral. Adjusance. It is impeccability. It is authenticity. It is attentiveness. It is caring. It is not a party. It is not surface cosmetics. This is a sober journey into self. Realization no matter how that realization appears. It is a commune to that. Premise. You don't say to yourself, I'll walk that path, but only if I get to go to heaven and rest in paradise with beautiful souls all around me. That's not this path. For those who want that path, they can subscribe to the religion or cult of their choice and find those kinds of promises aplenty. This information is for those interested in breaking through to their true self and in doing so, not to rest and relax or, or party and enjoy, but to serve truth through their behaviors until everyone crosses into that reality of oneness and equality from which we came. Sarah you were talking about the insertive behaviors a little earlier. I wrote some of them down, but I didn't hear the word love. Did I miss it, or is it missing for a reason? Dr. Naruta love is not used frequently in the wing makers materials in general. 
I think in part that's because the word carries so much baggage in this world. It has a kind of sentimental, codependent energy in terms of relationships, and then in culture it's used so casually, almost like a catch-all phrase that people use to greet one another like how are you? Love is the unification force. It is only that, and yet, in many ways, that is everything. From the wing maker's perspective it is a very important word concept, even though they use it sparingly. The six art virtues I mentioned are considered the different ways in which love manifests in our behaviors. To this extent, love is expressed in these virtuous behaviors like page 219. Gratitude, compassion, forgiveness and humility. In that context, the six heart virtues, collectively, are the expression of love in the human dimension. Sarah what about joy? It also seems to be missing. Dr. Neruda I know this information seems very sobering and unsettling. Because I defected from the ACIO, I have two forces that would like me to fail. This pressure has weighed on me. It had activated a degree of paranoia within me that I didn't know was possible. For this reason, joy, at least as it pertains to me, has not yet been a part of my personal experience. I'm sure everyone will receive these materials differently, especially the information in this, the fifth, interview. I would remind you that the emotional and feeling world is a functional implant and the emotions we attribute to our heart or soul are not truly coming from those sources. Sarah then, where do they come from? Dr. Neruda the layer of the mind known as the unconscious generates emotions, but they are felt throughout the human body. The unconscious layer of the mind is interdimensional, so it extends from bubble 1 to bubble 2, which allows you to feel in the astral world or afterlife. When I express any of the heart virtues, I place them through the lens of oneness and equality. That's where they achieve their potency in expression. Then I take that experience and quite literally send it to my head region. Imagining that experience is placed in the pineal gland in the center of the brain. This is my way of mailing it to everyone through the unconscious mind. Sarah why do you call them heart virtues if emotions are generated by the unconscious? Dr. Neruda the heart is a metaphor for the portal within each individual. It is relatively free of the human 2.0 interface and mind functional implants, partly because of the electromagnetic field it produces, and partly because of its physical dynamics. The wing makers suggest that the heart virtue should be experienced and expressed first in this region of the body, instead of the mind or head region, as a way to isolate the tendency of the mind to simulate these emotions from the unconscious mind layer, where they, by definition, lack the same potency of expression, because they exist in separation. Sarah it sounds kind of complicated. Dr. Neruda I prefer to look at the flip side. If I do nothing, if I go sit quietly in my chair and meditate or study religious scripture or pray, how am I supporting the progress of this reality? If this world remains ensnared in deception, that's complicated not just for me, but every being in Bubbles 1 and 2. Page 220 Sarah one of the things you've mentioned frequently is this notion of oneness and equality. I understand the meaning and import of the words. But these are certainly not new concepts. Doesn't every spiritual teacher say this? Dr. Neruda not all, but some do. You can go back 2,500 years to Heraclitus, who announced that all things are one. It is an important concept of human philosophy and to some extent modern day physics. With regard to religions, often the founder says one thing and the followers who organize and interpret the Founders' words and teachings alter it, but oneness and unity have not been mainstays of religion, particularly in the context of behaviors. The wing makers are focused on behavioral intelligence expressed through the lens of oneness and equality. The I am we are is rooted in this principle. It may not seem like a big deal to adopt this simple philosophical perspective, and frankly, it isn't, because they're simply words and it's only a concept. But if it's genuinely adopted and anchored in the core of your belief system, then you can 
possess the necessary commune to express this in your behaviors. And this is where most people will probably have a problem. The human 2.0 interface is full of programming from Marduk and the human unconscious. It is weighed down in this quagmire like a person caught in quicksand, struggling to find a rope or anything solid to pull themselves out. The rope in this case is the simple framework of I am we aren't applying it through our behaviors, but it has to line up. If you adopt the framework, but your behaviors do not reflect this, the rope disappears. The unification of all beings in all dimensions exists. It's only when you step out of quantum's pass a time that you realize the illusion of separation, and retaining this basic truth of oneness and equality in a human 2.0 space suit is no simple task. That's why it must be more than words, and the words must be practiced in the now. Sarah, why are the wing makers doing it this way? It seems so innocent. I mean, asking people to become self-aware and practice insertive and resistive behaviors. After hearing all of what's happening in the tribe of power, it seems like we're using slingshots against their stealth bombers. They want a money system that makes us perpetually indebted slaves to the dollar, and they want this money system to be one currency. The most powerful people on the planet with access to the best technology, the best weapons. How can we expect to prevail if they want transhumanism? Dr. Neruda to understand why the wing makers are focused on the sovereign integral process, you first need to understand why the tribe of power is focused on their plan. The tribe of power believes their one world concept is the right concept. They want to unify humanity through a money system that they control, utilizing technology as another means to unify. Unity, in their minds, is more like shepherding the human herd into easy-to-manage corrals and monitoring them for any rebellion. Their form of unity is a chimera. It is theater for display purposes, and nothing more. Their form of we're all in this together, let us protect you is simply more illusion and deception. Their plan for human 3.0 remains fused to the same functional implants that constitute human 2.0, and that is separation. Page 221. As I said earlier, they are here to prepare for Anu's return, whether they are conscious of it or not. All aspects of the power system, including major religions, are here to prepare. That is their watchword prepare. The Anunnaki have one dominant belief in humanity we are weak because we live in fear and separation. We do not stand up to the drip 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 of indoctrination or the slow but persistent evaporation of our personal liberties. Now, remember that the Anunnaki and their tribe of power are both calculating and patient. What they established in our distant past is beginning to come to fruition. The finite 70-year life of a human being lacks patience. It is programmed to be impatient. This is against infinite beings that see timelines in hundreds of thousands of years and can program individual human beings within those timelines to achieve precisely what they want if human beings agree to it, if they don't stand up. The Anunnaki do not embrace the sovereign integral process. The notion of oneness and equality seems like a weakness to them. They believe they have the upper hand in this chess match. They foresee checkmate. Humans will fold. The sacrifice of Princess Diana last August was symbolic of the vibrant queen being lost on the chessboard. Those are the kind of messages they make, the kind of bold announcements. They do this out of a feeling of certainty in their programming and patience. When I say programming, I don't mean just the internal interface that Marduk has programmed, but also the programming of the unconscious mind through the media, culture, religion, politics and economic structure. The combination of these forces is really the cause of their confidence, because they see our fall as an inevitability. Now, to answer your question, human beings, even those with Anunnaki DNA, can become self-realized of their true nature through a simple process. It doesn't require that they meditate and pray all day or retreat to an ashram. 
the sovereign integral process becomes a natural part of the life expression of the individual. If enough human beings can embrace this process or something like it, the crack in the wall will expand, the wall will become less stable, and the world of separation, in its brittleness, will begin to crumble. The life essence is what we have on our side. This is not a slingshot as you put it. It is the infinite force that powers every object in the universe. Life is inside us. And it exists in one and only one state equality and oneness. The entire hologram of deception, as created and curated by the Anunnaki and their cohorts, that is not life, it is the exemplar of separation. Life is truthful and authentic. Separation begets deception, unworthiness and fear. If enough human beings awaken, if we begin to realize what's afoot, what plans are being made to further enslave us and ensure that we remain a part of the hologram of deception, life will move inside us and we can collectively stand up and stop this, but it has to be done in the right way, with honesty, forgiveness and compassion. The alternative to separation must be expressed in our movements and practices. We have to model these behaviors as a collective entity. That is the definition of the grand portal. Sarah you've talked a lot about separation. Can you elaborate on why this concept is so prevalent? Page 222. Dr. Neruda if you look at the material that comes from religion, spirituality, philosophy, psychology, even the arts, you will see that much of this material is designed to be an owner's manual for our functional implants. They support the human 2.0 interface. They instruct us on the methods and attitudes to activate these systems inside us. I've previously mentioned the three layers of the consciousness interface the conscious mind, the subconscious and the unconscious. The unconscious is where we mostly operate in terms of our behaviors and perceptions. The unconscious mind layer is deep and penetrating, and it is universal. As I said, it's how Anu uses the oneness concept to his benefit. We are one in separation. The unconscious mind is one. Separation is a fractal energy. It infects everything within the hologram of deception to such a degree that it's not recognizable. No matter how well intentioned a person or organization might be to convey true information, what often lurks behind the information is this fractal energy of separation and its use of comparison and judgment and all the other tools of separation that distill down to fear and unworthiness. It's as if the internal programming of Marduk and the external programming of the tribe of power echoes around in all content of all times and cultures, so common and accepted as to be unnoticeable. We have accepted separation because it seems normal. Thus our behaviors and perceptions, driven largely by the unconscious mind, embody separation, and the vast majority of us do not even know it. Sarah okay, but then how do we become aware of it? Dr. Neruda a person must understand that they are being programmed. That's a starting point. If you don't accept this basic premise, then why would you choose to change? If you do, then observe the programming inside you, within others in your environment, the larger world and begin to see how subtle this programming is. In many ways, to observe this programming requires us to be neutral, so we can simply observe our internal states and the messages therein, as well as those of the external program, which come via television, the internet, email, newspapers, magazines, direct mail, and so on. It isn't critical that you know how every program is expressed into your life or what its esoteric meaning is. What's important is that you understand you are being programmed and you seek an internal source of direction, inspiration and movement. The sovereign integral process is focused on you the individual directing your own self-life essence to express itself in oneness and equality. That's it. If you do this, then you are releasing the hold of the programming. For some this can be done quickly, and for others it might require more diligent practice. Sarah can I do this and still be a Christian or whatever I was raised in? Dr. Neruda I suggest that anyone who resonates with this information try it out. 
see how it moves them through their life path. If they want to remain in their current structures, see if elements of the sovereign integral process could be applied. But if you don't see page 223, separation in your current practices, then stay there, because you won't have the motivation to be a practitioner. Sarah but you just said that most of us don't see separation Dr. Neruda I said that if you don't see it in your current practice, then you won't be motivated to change. This process is all about change. Make no mistake about it. It is not selfish in any way. There is no burrowing into the bedrock of a belief system here that will make you feel superior or privileged or wise. There really is no belief system here other than the sovereign integral process. There is no structure, no organization, no master, no hierarchy, no one is above another or below another. Do you see? This is not an organization of this world. It cannot be of this world. Otherwise it is subject to separation. The only way the human 3.0 SI manifests is inside enough human beings who exemplify this process, who anchor this new consciousness of conduct on this planet and share it through their behaviors and unconscious mind. That's the only way, and not everyone is prepared to do that. Sarah what happens if we see separation, but still don't have the motivation to make the changes in our behaviors? Dr. Neruda the functional implants of the human 2.0 interface are seldom easy to release. They will hold on to your life essence as long as they can. They want to drive the human vessel, not hop in the back seat and watch as mere passengers. That's against their program. Sarah so talk about this resistance from the functional implants. How does it manifest? Dr. Neruda I'm sure it's an individual thing. I don't pretend to know how it is. For anyone else, I can tell you from personal experience that I initially dive head first into this process and rearranged my life. I thought I was doing a good job. And then a week or two later, I found myself back to square one, exactly where I'd started. It felt like amnesia. It was as if I had forgotten I was even doing a new practice. Admittedly, in my case, I had a lot of distractions in my life, but everyone can probably say the same thing. So I think this tendency to return to the habits of the consciousness system inside our 2.0 interface is the main way that resistance is expressed. Change of this scope is not an easy proposition. The human 2.0 mind doesn't like the back seat. Sarah so what did you do to return to the sovereign integral process? Dr. Naruto well, for me, I needed to direct the techniques inward. Sarah explain what you mean. Dr. Naruto I was directing the heart virtues outward to others, but I wasn't turning them inward to myself. It dawned on me that the inward was probably the most important place to start. Page 224 Sarah how did you do that? Dr. Naruto it takes great alertness to live and express in the now. Human. Beings have the tendency to live in our past memories or future concerns. This was what I was doing and it took me from the now. And the now is where our life essence expresses. It isn't in the past or future, only the consciousness. Framework pivots between past and future, so if you find yourself in there, you know you are not in your essence. When I realized this, I read from the wing maker's philosophy that breath was the magnet of nowness. It was the element that brought the human being into nowness by being aware of their breathing. I also learned that there were different kinds of breathing that enabled this sense of nowness to penetrate more vividly into the hologram of deception. The point is that simply being aware of my breath helped, as the wing makers put it, to center me in stillness. This, by the way, doesn't mean that you're in a quiet room. You can be in a meeting at work, and center yourself in stillness, through your breath. But by being in this internal centeredness I was in a better position to feel my own sense of expression, and that's what was missing in my initial efforts to integrate this process. I didn't have a good starting point for my practice of the heart of virtues, and I was directing them outward to other people, or events, 
and not myself first. Once I made that adjustment, it helped me to identify my essence and distinguish it from my mind system. Life essence is authentic in oneness and equality and exclusively moves in nowness. The consciousness framework pivots between the past, present and future and operates in separation. If you express the heart virtues from the consciousness framework, especially outwardly, they won't have the same potency or effect. Sarah you've mentioned the idea of resistive and insertive behaviors, and I think I understand the insertive behaviors in terms of expressing the heart virtues to oneself and others, but talk a little bit about the resistive behaviors. What are they, and how does they work? Dr. Neruda again, you need to start from the point of distinguishing your life essence in the now. Center yourself in nowness through being still and breath aware. Initially this may take some time, but it happens quicker with practice. Thought patterns that connect you to separation need to be stopped. Behaviors. 2. You can simply say, I've identified a behavior that supports separation in this world. Let's say I have believed that Muslims are less moral than atheists, and therefore less likely to get into heaven than someone who doesn't even believe in God. This is a belief or thought form that relates to separation. I can say, stop that, but it's not really effective for most people. I can resist the belief every time. It expresses itself in my life, but many of these beliefs are so subtle and subconscious that we don't even realize how they express themselves in our behaviors and choices. If you apply the heart virtues to yourself, like forgive yourself for having these perceptions, have some compassion for yourself that everyone is infected with these separation beliefs from their subconscious and unconscious mind layers. Be humble that making this resistive page 225. Alteration is not just about you, but in a way, it's about everyone, because we are. 1. Appreciate the fact that you're working on this for the good of all. Have. Valor that you can stand up and resist these separation complexes that lurk in your programmed consciousness framework. You can see how I used the heart of virtues to effectively deal with a belief or perception that separated me, not just from Muslims, though they were the target in this particular example, but when you draw separation lines around anyone, you are operating from the consciousness system implant, and it only supports the hologram of deception. Sarah okay, but you're not suggesting that I look at rapists and murderers as one with me are you? Dr. Naruto well that's just it. They are. You can't have oneness and equality. And then say, well, that's true, except for this population of society or these felons of the human race. There is no leper colony where humans are excluded. Outside of the circle. The circle is all inclusive, or it is an illusion. This is an absolute. Remember my statement about the hologram of deception is a prison? Sarah yes. Dr. Neruda there is no other prison inside the prison. We're all in the prison. All of us are prisoners, even those who are in the incunabula. There is no one who stands inside the prison walls and truly knows oneness and equality. Sarah but then how does it change, if no one knows this? Dr. Neruda it's a process both for the individual and the human race. We work on it, together. We resist behaviors of separation and insert behaviors of oneness and equality. We disengage from the thoughts, ideas, beliefs, principles, people, organizations, currencies, food, clothing, fashion, toys, and everything else within the hierarchy whose roots are nourished by separation. Sarah when you put it that way, it sounds daunting, even impossible. Dr. Neruda it has to be done, and it has to be done by us. The question is, if it has to be done, when does humanity want to do it? Now? A hundred years? A thousand years? Ten thousand years? The wing makers are clear about this in their writings that if we wait until after human 3.0, when man and machine become integrated, it will only become more difficult. Enslavement of life must end at all levels. Sarah I want to shift to something that's been bothering me about this whole conversation, 
and that is the issue of the God. From your description, God, as we've come to think of him or her or it, is an illusion. It's really a being who presents himself as God. So the question is, is there a real God? Page 226. Dr. Neruda thanks for asking that question. I meant to bring it up on my own. And I think I sidetracked myself. Let's go back to the thought experiment about the bubbles. There is a presentation of a god, which as I've said, is Anu. This is the god that Muslim, Jew and Christian alike revere and worship. This is the god who desires to return and provide a clear supremacy over humankind to direct humanity to a human. 3.0, one world transhumanist existence that would stretch into forever. As I've said, there's a life essence inside all beings, including the Anunnaki, and this life essence is infinite. If you understand infinite, then you understand it is outside of space-time. If a being is outside of space-time, it is not defined by polarities like birth and death, creation and destruction, good and evil, and so forth. It is beholden to none of our vocabulary and concepts. Thus, when the wing makers decided it was time for this information to become available on Earth, it was offered, in terms of its text, as a bridge. In other words, it was decelerated to our language construct Sarah and other forms of media, too, like the music and art. Dr. Neruda yes, but in a different application. All of this information needed to be encoded in a way that would be acceptable to two sources of scrutiny. One was Anu and his hierarchy, the other, the individual. Which is why the material in this interview will only be released when certain conditions are met, and the wing makers are reasonably satisfied that the information will not be taken down by the hierarchy or dismissed as a fairy tale by the individuals they are trying to reach. Now, when this deceleration occurred, they elected to release the information in phases. Phase 1 would be encoded in a way that would allow people to understand the world outside of the hologram of deception, but in a framework that's somewhat familiar, that's resonant with the evolving beliefs on the planet. Hence, the idea of first source, source intelligence, 11 sovereign integral human instrument. All of these concepts will be provided without contextual details, because if they were included, the information that I'm telling you tonight would be purged by the hierarchy. The entire event string would be taken down. The inception point of the portal and grand portal would have been mired in doubt. So, it will be dispensed in the manner it must. This is not in my control. Sarah what does this have to do with the existence of a god or not? Dr. Neruda I just wanted to clarify that the word god means multiple things and it needs to be clear what meaning is being used. That's why, in part, the wing makers don't use the source intelligence is the energy intelligence of first source that serves to accelerate the expansion of consciousness and supports those who desire to unlimit themselves. Page 227. Word God but instead use the word first source. However, in their later philosophical writings, after Chamber 6, they don't use this word, for the reasons I mentioned but these are very subtle intonations in their writings, as they try to weave their messages into our modern day culture without being targeted by hierarchical censors. Sarah there are literally people who censor this information. Dr. Neruda there are people who censor and control information. Everywhere in the media, the government, the military, the sciences, education, religion. Everywhere. The hierarchy has a complete army of censors. The vast majority don't know who they really work for, they're just enforcing what they've been hired to enforce. It's just a job. But technology platforms exist primarily for censorship. Intelligence gathering enables NSA censorship and information control. It's their job to filter, control and manipulate information. The system of mass surveillance isn't deployed to protect the masses. It's to control them, to keep them inside the prison from Anu's perspective, and controllable from the elite perspective. Sarah you're not saying that the NSA cares about things like this, are you? 
Dr. Narudda not in the sense of how God is defined, but it's through their surveillance platforms that those in the hierarchy are alerted to information that details critical aspects of their hologram of deception. That kind of information is fed upstream to those who do care. Sarah, if that's the case, then whenever this gets released, it'll get censored, so what's the point? Dr. Naruta, this is all about timing. If this gets released it will be because the wing makers have confidence that it will pass censorship. Something will have happened to enable it. Sarah, I'm aware you haven't really answered my question yet on God, so I do want to come back to that, but with the internet these days, couldn't you just drop this whole information on the public at one time? It'd go out to a few thousand people and then they could put it out on other sites and it would just grow in geometrical progression. How could they hold it back or censor it? Dr. Naruta, it would be modified. It's a complete set of information. Once it got out in that format, some would claim their version is the original and others would claim that their version was the original, and they might be as different as black and white in some areas. It only creates confusion, and once there's confusion, it's impossible to bring clarity. In intelligent circles this is called reputation destruction. Think of it like this. You have a set of information that is targeted to specific beings that live everywhere on the planet. You wait until there is a communication system that can get to each of these beings. You have to make sure that the information is as pure as it can be, but still get past the sensors, so you encode it and release it in phases. Page 228. The first phase is released as a real event, to test the waters of reaction. The second phase is released with new content and modifications, emphasizing that it's a mythology. This is to reassure the sensors. The third phase will get more involved in practices and behaviors, but without full context. The fourth phase will probably be the human portal. The fifth phase will probably be this interview. And the phases that follow will depend on how this interview is received. So every release is being observed by both the hierarchy and the wing makers. Sarah, okay, let's go back to the God discussion. Dr. Naruta, yes. So, to answer your question, is there a God? There are many gods. Some beings present themselves as gods, and some beings manipulate others to such a degree that they become regarded as gods. And then there are collective intelligences that move between the quantum membranes and simulate godlike qualities of omniscience and omnipotence, but they are not gods in the sense of being the creator. There are even some beings that present themselves as God through a human channel. The view of the wing makers is that the oldest civilizations in the universe believe there is a creator, but that this creator, known in the wing makers, philosophy as first source, is so fundamental that it is the fractal essence of all life in all variations. It is the quantum zygote of life at the most foundational level. It is not truly knowable as we think of knowledge. It is experiential through sound that evokes this tone of equality spoken of in the wing makers. Philosophy. It's not apprehended through the mind, which makes it hard to describe or convey. This is the problem with anything so elemental that it all but disappears. How do you convey it in such a way that it can hold a human being's attention? Sarah, so there's a god, but it's unapproachable, is that basically it? Dr. Naruta, yes but I want to mention that the relationship is to a creator, not a God. The creator is in all life. God is more of a parent, and in religious circles, a father figure who is humanized to such a degree that we can pray to God to give us things, help us remove obstacles, crush our enemies and so on. Creator is aligned to oneness and equality, while God is aligned to separation and fear. First source is the creator of life the manifest reality of all existence. The creator lives within life as the infinite spark that connects all life as equals in oneness. It is not here to be humanized. It cannot be humanized, or for that matter, reduced to any other life, form or thing. 
the Creator is the conjoining of all existence in the equality of oneness, and when that occurs, then God exists. When it does not, there is no God. In existence, only a Creator. It is really that simple. As it is said in various religious texts that God created man in his image or likeness. And provided you understand Anu as God, then this is a reasonably true statement. However, the Creator created the infinite spark that animates the human form, and so the sovereign integral is the creation, and Anu had nothing to do with this. He merely figured out a way to enslave it. Page 229 the last thing I'll say about the concept of God is that it's used by religions to separate ourselves from responsibility. It allows us to say, I'm not responsible for poverty or war or child abuse. There is a God who is much higher than us. God created the world, He is in charge. If He allows war and poverty, who am I to bear responsibility? The wrongdoers will pay in hell, and the tormented will reign in heaven. So God, or the concept of God, releases us from responsibility. The Creator, one. The other hand, is not this way, because we're all bound in oneness, and what happens to one happens to all, and therefore, we're all responsible for allowing separation to rule our behaviors. It's important to recognize the difference between the constructs of Creator and God, especially within the hologram of deception. Sarah after hearing all of this explanation not just about God, Creator, but the whole interview tonight, why couldn't it have just been released as it is defined in this interview? Why even release the first phase as if they lack this context? Dr. Neruda I've tried to answer this already let me put it this way, but understand that this is speculation, so take it as such. There's no assurance that this will get released or stay released. That's one reason. There may be other individuals that need the earlier phase information, because it bridges their current beliefs better than the later phase information. That's another reason. Remember, this is as much about redefining the unconscious mind as it is anything else. The unconscious mind is the back door that the Anunnaki left open in their designs. That's where the hacking vector can come in, and that's how the wing maker's information was brought in. Sarah what do you mean by hacking vector? Dr. Neruda the wing makers are hacking the program of our consciousness. Framework as designed by the Anunnaki. Programmed internally in the DNA and functional implants by Marduk. And programmed externally by the hierarchy. A.K.A. The Illuminati, Globalists, New World Order Elite, Bilderberg Group, etc. The wing makers must come into these programs from vectors that are less protected or defended by sensors, and have the potential for quick spread. Bear in mind, that while the functional implants of the human 2.0 interface are programmable, should they become hacked or altered, they can be upgraded or patched just like software. So the ideal method to enter the human domain is to enter through a back door, appear harmless, even part of the order, and then quietly see the fractal process that can spread through the unconscious mind layer. That vector is not altering the program from the hardware or software perspective. It utilizes the consciousness framework in the human 2.0 interface without changing its programming. It's like an app riding on top of the operating system. It needs to be invisible until certain conditions are met. Once those conditions are met, it can be released, and once it is spread, it cannot be stopped. Sarah I'm not familiar with the term app, what does it mean? Page 230. Dr. Neruda it's a software application that's not part of the OS, but uses the OS or operating system. Sarah if it isn't changing the consciousness framework, then what's it doing? Dr. Neruda it allows individuals to initiate their own sovereign integral process which allows them to release the hold of these systems on their life essence. It's less about modifying or changing the program than it is about releasing the hold that these programs have on the consciousness of the life essence. Sarah okay, I think I understand. So I want to go back to this process. You said 
It has two main parts, insertive behaviors and resistive behaviors. You also mentioned something about breath, but I didn't hear you say anything specific about it. Dr. Naruta, yes, the breath is an important way to bring you into self. Awareness, it's like a quantum light turning on that illuminates your life. Essence, that part of you that is not of the human 2.0 interface. You're able to sense and begin to re-experience this infinite being that is you. The breath is something that anyone can use without a lot of complication, and obviously, it's always with you. It doesn't require any technology or expertise. It's really just a way to shift attention to the core of yourself. The Wing Makers Write about quantum breathing or quantum pause. It's a technique from Philosophy 7. Sarah can you explain it? Dr. Neruda it's very simple. You breathe in through your nose for about 2-4 seconds or whatever's comfortable for you. Once you've filled your lungs, you pause or hold your breath for the same amount of time you breathed in. While you're in the pause holding your breath feel it like a suspension of time, and fill that space with the feeling of I am. Sarah okay, sorry to interrupt, but tell me again. What is the I am feeling? How? Do you define it? Dr. Neruda it's the sovereign aspect of consciousness. It's not the personality that defines your human experience, or you typically associate with as yourself. It is the infinite consciousness of you. It is also one. I is one. It is one thing. Infinite life. It is not the mind, nor the heart, nor the body, nor the feelings and emotions of the personality. It is singular in its depth and silence. Sarah okay, go on. Dr. Neruda after you hold the breath in your lungs, and anchor it with the I am feeling, you exhale through your mouth, again for the same period of time. And then you pause again your lungs are empty, and as you pause, you hold the feeling of we are. Then you repeat this cycle until you feel you're done. Sarah can you explain the WARE feeling, too? Page 231. Dr. Neruda this is a sense of connection to all. The sense that you are connected and that the I am feeling you held a moment ago is being shared with all. I use the out breath pause to place any of the hard virtues that I'm working on at the time. For example, I might be working on the virtue of compassion in my personal life, and I can hold that feeling of that out breath pause and imagine it is being shared with all. Sarah I think I understand what you're saying, and I don't want you to take this the wrong way, but how can this possibly compete with the globalist agenda of world takeover? Dr. Neruda it's a fair question. But look at the reality. There are many who protested this enslavement. Throughout history there have been people that have come to this realization through various means, and they alerted people to this deception. They may call it a conspiracy without really understanding the depth of this deception or its ultimate plan, but in whatever way they know of this and at whatever level, they all experience fear. The fear is that we're powerless to stop them. The capstone of the elite have been planning this for more than 11,000 years, before Human 2.0 even existed the plot was devised. They have powerful interdimensional beings that know humanity on an intimate level, because they literally created the human being, and they can program humanity with such granularity as to define our life paths down to our day-to-day -day choices. How can one possibly defeat such an antagonist? They have the money, they have the politicians in their pockets, they have the defense and protection, they have the powerful relationships everywhere in the world and they have the most powerful technology in terms of surveillance and weapons. Their innermost Circle is impenetrable. We can be wide awake and aware of what's happening, but awareness doesn't suddenly in itself change the chessboard. They taught us to protest. Wave your signs, publish your websites, fling your fists to the sky, investigate all you want. It won't change a thing. They will tell us to our faces that their power is inexhaustible. This is how they think. They want us to feel this futility and have this overriding sense that the endgame is unavoidable. They want us to believe that we are powerless. Remember, they 
are securing the world and its populations for the return of Anu. That is their program, and while only the capstone of the elite understands this plan, it is enough, because the downstream operatives are loyal, programmed entities. All one needs to do is to watch Madeleine Albright in that 60 Minutes interview. And you will understand how they have been programmed to think Sarah I don't think I saw that, what did she do? Dr. Neruda about a year and a half ago, Leslie Stahl of 60 Minutes asked the U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations, Madeleine Albright, if the death of a half million children was worth the price to essentially punish Saddam Hussein. Albright responded that page 232. It was. You see, this is the enemy that holds power if they can justify killing children, they can do anything. The wing makers have written that it isn't the protests that will change this enemy. If we shout at them and practice resistance with our guns in the street, they will only squash us. To bring their objective to a halt, we need to push down the wall, and we can do this by being practitioners of the sovereign integral process or anything similar. If human beings become self-aware, deprogrammed entities, who understand specifically how we have been enslaved and for what reason, we can collectively push down the wall that separates us from our true selves. This creates a chain reaction that affects everyone, including the capstone of the elite. The wall falls for them, too. It's using the consciousness of the life essence to reveal the human 2.0. Consciousness is an invented reality. It's weaning from the hologram of deception to the reality that all life exists infinitely as equals in oneness. Sarah okay. But how do we know that will be successful against them? Dr. Naruto we don't. Other than what I said before, that the wing makers are humans who have time traveled to share this sovereign integral framework. I realize this sounds like science fiction meets David and Goliath. I can appreciate that, but I'm explaining what I know as directly and honestly as I can describe it. If anyone reads this interview, assuming it's released sometime in the future, then you can decide for yourself if what I say stands up to your scrutiny. I would just caution some to consider the possibility that should you dismiss it, your reaction could be a programmed response. It is your consciousness framework that is sensing and responding. Consider this before you dismiss this information as fiction. Sarah but how would a person know this? I find myself doubting this. Disclosure. I don't find it very plausible. As a journalist I'm trained to be suspicious of sources, and as much information as you've shared with me, I find myself wondering how this is possible and I haven't heard about it. Dr. Naruta the hierarchy practices deception by controlling the buttons on the Machine of absolute power. This machine is Sarah but you yourself said the internet was not something that they wanted to get out. Dr. Naruta true, but whatever technology is released, they will find a way to use it to their advantage. It doesn't matter what the technology is, they will find a way to subvert it, modify it and use it for their agenda. These are extremely bright beings that are obsessed with the centralization of power and control so that Anu can insert himself without resistance. Sarah what if enough people woke up and rebelled? Couldn't we start a revolution and overthrow these crazy criminals? Page 233. Dr. Naruta they are not crazy. They are deceptive intelligences who have lost all sense of connection to their true selves. In many ways, they are the ones who are lost, and because they are so lost, they have led the unsuspecting to their haze. Of obedience. We have followed them. That's our responsibility. The material is here, in this interview, to wake up. But it's one thing to wake up, and it's another thing to know what to do about it. You mention a revolution, according to the wing makers it would be a waste of life. They are not going to relinquish what they have worked so hard and long to produce. This will only change when the wall is pushed down. The wall is the human 2.0 consciousness framework that is programmed within every human being. The wall needs to be pushing down, and the way this occurs is not through protest, storming the gates, or shaking our collective fists in their face. 
it must be done through individual self-realization, and this, because of our programming, requires us to follow a process that enables us to become self-realized of our life. Essence. If we remain in separation, we can't solve the problem of separation. If we remain in deception, we can't reveal anything of our true nature. So we need to see all as one and equal in this hologram of deception, and that includes the capstone of the elite, as much as the poor and hungry. Sarah I don't see how people will be able to do that. Maybe I'm a pessimist, I don't know, but will enough people really be able to do this? Dr. Naruta at the heart of this whole situation is a single reality, and that reality, as hard as it may be to touch, is that we are infinite beings. Everything that is of space time is within the hologram of deception. Everything. Which reality do you believe is more powerful and lasting? Sarah whatever is infinite. Dr. Naruta don't believe the programming that you are powerless. The sovereign integral process demonstrates that you are not merely a programmed life existence. Sarah I feel I could go on with this conversation for another couple hours, but I also sense you're trying to close it up. How are you doing on time? Dr. Naruda I can go a little longer if you have more questions. Sarah I have lots of questions. How about if we take a short break and I'll take the time to review my notes, and then I'll try and keep my next set of questions to another 15 minutes or so. How does that sound? Dr. Naruda sure, that's fine. Sarah great, then we'll begin in 10 minutes. Page 234. Approximately a 10 minute break Sarah the tape is rolling again, and I've got my questions. Are you ready? Dr. Naruta yes. Sarah okay, good. Does it seem like a strange coincidence that the labyrinth group was trying to create time travel technology and you stumbled upon the wing makers who are time travelers? Dr. Naruta not entirely Sarah but how do you really know that they're not aliens or some other non- Human beings? Dr. Naruta sometimes you just have to take things at face value when there's no evidence to the contrary and no evidence that would support any reason for them to misrepresent themselves. Sarah through all of my discussions with you, this interview is like someone coming into my home and rearranging all the furniture. What advice do you have for anyone who reads this and gets a little paranoid or uneasy about this information and what should they do about it? Dr. Naruta this disclosure is not meant to frighten anyone or make them paranoid. It's meant to support them in their own awakening as infinite beings. That's really it. That's the information's purpose. This includes all of the wing makers information in whatever form it's in. There's a core stability inside you that's been sidelined in favor of a manufactured or programmed response to life. You are programmed to fear. Because then you will abdicate your liberties to your saviors. And who do you suppose your saviors will be? Who is it that makes Saddam Hussein out to be a monster while they kill hundreds of thousands of children to prove their power? It's moral? The entities behind that power are the ones who will step forward and claim to save you. How they will do this is an unknown, but I have no doubt. They will do it. And every time they do it, the corrals grow in number and the populations inside the corrals swell in size. The fences get higher. Those who remain outside the corrals will think they have insight or special information that allows them to remain independent or free, but they're still operating inside their human 2.0 interface. The only real question, as I see it, has two parts. One, do I serve truth or deception? And two, how do I best serve truth? Page 235. If you feel that the best way to serve truth is to protest, resist, build awareness about what is happening in the world, then do that, but I would recommend doing it from a non-polarity perspective. You can fight separation with more separation, it will only polarize. It's important to feel that you are standing up, not in fear or some other programmed emotion, but that you are aligned to your life essence and an expression of that source within you, even when you protest. Others may prefer to undergo the sovereign integral process and focus on this more internal stratagem. There is no formula here, 
and certainly you can do both. But to know this information and then remain passive a pure observer is a programmed response, and that is not an answer to how do I best serve truth? It is a denial of truth. Sarah you mentioned earlier that the Anunnaki lent their DNA to the human. 2.0 it suggests then that their DNA would be present in a lot of us. Is that the case? Dr. Neruda this is a very complicated subject. Yes, according to the wing makers, the Anunnaki, in an attempt to enhance human DNA, conducted what we would call today, in vitro fertilization experiments with human women. They wanted their DNA to create a subspecies that could endure generationally to produce loyalists. The Syrians did the same thing. In terms of DNA tendencies, the Anunnaki were conquerors, and the Syrian progeny were colonists. That's being very general, admittedly, but in broad terms that was the nature of their bloodlines, when compared to their human counterparts. The DNA template for human 2.0 was Anunnaki, but it had been altered. This is where the subject gets complicated. The Anunnaki are not physical beings. They did not exist in three-dimensional density as we know it today. The Earth, 500,000 years ago, was a very different place in terms of its density and the gravitational fields that bathed it. The Anunnaki were interdimensional beings, meaning they are infinite just as we are, but without the physical body. However, all beings possess DNA. It's the quantum equivalent of a blueprint. So they experimented with how to use their DNA to create physical beings that could function in accordance to their agenda, which as I said, was initially mining gold, but later turned to the enslavement of a species who would worship Anu. When the Anunnaki fertilized human women it was with royal bloodlines, and this was not a coincidence. They wanted these royal bloodlines to sustain over thousands of generations so they could more easily facilitate their master plans. On Earth? Sarah was this a nationalistic thing? Dr. Neruda how do you mean that? Sarah were Anunnaki bloodlines mostly Arab, Jewish, or Gentile? Were there certain characteristics that were noticeable in the physical body? Dr. Neruda the Anunnaki bloodlines were initially Babylonian and Egyptian. But they have spread into nearly all races. It probably wouldn't be an overstatement to say that nearly every person on the planet today has some Fractional Percentage of Anunnaki Royal DNA Page 236 Sarah what were they, in terms of their look? I assume they look like us. Dr. Neruda yes. It was Atlantean, Anunnaki and Syrian body styles that were effectively blended to create the human 1.0 prototype. All of these beings, though less dense, looked similar to a human form. Races did not intermingle, as they were very cautious not to intermix their DNA, because they were uncertain of the effect and how it might pollute or mutate through their genetics. But, remember, the human physical body was an experiment, and they literally looked at it as physical protection, just like we would look at a spacesuit. None of these races lived in the density of Earth, or an Earth-like planet. They didn't realize how Earth would interact with their creation and cause it to evolve in directions that they couldn't control or predict. Earth, as I previously said, was like a random variable, imposing itself on the human body through its gravitational fields. The interbreeding between Anunnaki and human women took place around 6000 BCE and it was a designed event, not some lustful dalliance with the daughters of men, as it is sometimes portrayed in Sumerian texts. This was part of the design to place a subspecies within the human race that would conquer and control the Earth's resources. It was to consolidate and centralize resources for Anu, and to ensure that the world's wealth could be placed into his waiting hands when he returned. Sarah the whole thing about LERM light encoded reality matrix and how the labyrinth group had seen it as God, I don't understand that if 15 had read the same information as you how he wouldn't have come to the same conclusions as you. I know you mentioned that you had additional contacts with the wing makers, and this convinced you of the authenticity of the information. 
But why do you think 15 clung to his perspective? Dr. Neruda you can look at LERM as the connection between the earth plane and the non-physical planes of the hologram that Anu constructed inside our functional implants. LERM was the connective web, and it was bi-directional, meaning that Anu could be projected into any being's consciousness framework to be seen or heard, and it also meant that Anu could detect and view into the life of an individual being. LERM is known as the White Light, and the Great White Brotherhood is known as its guardians. They appropriated Jesus and Buddha as their foundational pillars, stole the concept of I am, mashed these elements with the white light that had been a factor in every religious, occult and esoteric doctrine throughout time, and announced in the 1950s that the Great White Brotherhood was a real organization. Soon after that, Ascended Masters began to join the swelling ranks, as human channelers began to be the spokespeople of these entities. From the Wing Makers perspective, these entities are fixtures of the polarity plan to keep human beings firmly anchored in separation, distraction and deception. Sarah what does this have to do with 15's decision? Dr. Naruta sorry, I got a little sidetracked. 15 knew of the Great White Brotherhood. It's considered a very important element in the overall hierarchy. Very near the capstone of the elite or what I earlier called the Incunabula. The Great White Page 237 Brotherhood was seen as a means to bring occult or secret information to the planet, and it was designed to balance the movement of secularization, which was to essentially rid the planet of religion and bring science to the stage. 15 was not sufficiently convinced to make a break from the Incunabula and the Great White Brotherhood. He preferred to view LERM as proof of God, and leave his world intact. This is not, by the way, an uncommon reaction to this information. And intellects, as brilliant as 15s, will make this choice to stay in the known world instead of venture into the unknown. In 15's case, he had too much to lose. Sarah why did the elite want to get rid of religion? Dr. Naruta first, I want to correct you on your choice of words. It isn't the elite, as most people think of them. The vast majority of the elite are corporate citizens, financial managers, government managers, political heavyweights, military commanders and the like. They are not making these decisions. The vast majority have no idea who or what the agenda is. That's why I refer to it as the capstone of the elite. These are ones who have been preparing the world for Anu's return. Now, back to your question, religion was seen as an obstacle to the one world order. The quantum world of science was flexing its muscles, disproving key elements of religious doctrine, and it would, if left unmanaged, verify the hologram but not the deception. The Great White Brotherhood was launched to the public in the 1950s just as the quantum world was beginning to signal its stature, but it goes back to the 18th century when it was referred to as the Council of Light, and even before that it was a concept held in many secret societies. The idea of ascended masters, communicating with one another telepathically, and instructing and guiding the affairs of men, gained some popularity with those who were disenchanted with organized religion. To be fair, some of the Channeled information did come from beings that were considerably more informed than the average man, and they could be dazzle most people with their superior knowledge of the cosmological order and the structure of things relative to God, but their description and explanation was founded in the hologram of deception. While these masters supposedly channeled the secret or hidden knowledge to their selected students, who then wrote books and created organizations, this information continued to separate the worlds of light and dark, good and evil and those in the know from those who were not. They used words like love, ascension, truth, and God more liberally than organized religions, and God was always portrayed as a loving, congealing force. Angels and cosmic beings were also associated with these organizations. They not only appropriated symbols and constructs like the soul and eternal life, but they also created the ladder of consciousness that stretched into infinity and which 
the student was forever trying to learn more to progress higher on the ladder. The elevation of one over another. This was the key concept of the separation. Tactic of the Great White Brotherhood and frankly, all secret societies. Create. Divisions of Knowledge, page 238. Add a rich lore too, and promise more power and awareness as you, the student. Walk the path. They don't talk about how to deprogram from separation, instead. They reinforce it. Sarah you've shared information in previous interviews about the central race. In my notes, you even said they were responsible for our DNA. Are they? The Anunnaki? Dr. Naruda no. No, you have to define DNA in two ways. One is the human instrument or body, emotions and mind system, and that stems from one system of DNA, courtesy of the Anunnaki and Syrians mostly. The second is the infinite being inside the human instrument, which is also based on DNA, which is the quantum blueprint of the sovereign integral consciousness. The latter is the DNA developed by the central race. Sarah in the second interview you made some pretty big claims about the seven sites of the wing makers being a defensive weapon, and that this somehow related to the individual's experience of the wing makers materials. In light of this disclosure tonight, can you explain how this works? Dr. Naruda the entire input of the wing makers disclosure is about the sovereign integral, and how humanity benefits when the state of consciousness is seated within the human expression. The requirement to keep this disclosure in the realm of science fiction and mythology was why I mentioned this defensive weapon Sarah so you're saying this was just a story? Dr. Naruda that part was. You see, the wing makers materials are, by design, composed of many strands of information. Some strands are storytelling, some are artistic, some are spiritual, some are conspiratorial and some are designed to be factual, coherent disclosures of what is really happening in our world. The strands of the storytelling encase the other strands in a way, they shield these inner strands. I've already explained why it happened this way, and while some might feel it would be easier to just give the facts, if these facts were disclosed now, you would not have seen, heard or read this information. The wing makers materials would have been censored or taken down and discredited. I'm sure there'll be a good dose of that anyway. When and if this interview is released, but the story strand was necessary to provide an acceptable container to release the sovereign integral process. Sarah but this concerns me that the information you provided in the previous four interviews is created, at least in part, as a story. How do I present it? To any reliable news source as true? Dr. Naruda you can't. Sarah so then what do I do with it? Dr. Naruda either you will release it as a story, or I will. If you prefer not to, I understand. Page 239. Sarah couldn't you just tell me what parts are story, and what parts are true? Dr. Naruda I could, but this isn't how I've been asked to release the information. Sarah but I've invested a lot of time in this already, and if I invest my reputation as well, then I need to focus on the true parts, otherwise, I can't substantiate anything when I'm asked if, in my opinion, it's a true story. Dr. Naruda everyone wants to know the absolute truth. They want someone to point to this phrase or that precept or that doctrine and explain to them that that is truth, believe it. That's been the game on this planet ever since humans began to contemplate their universe in a philosophical manner. All the shared truth has gotten us where? Where we kill children to punish leaders. Where leaders lock people up in death camps? Where religious leaders abuse children. So I would ask you, what is the value of the information that has collectively brought humanity here? You want the signpost of truth. No one can do that, and your proof is that no one has. Sarah Why? Dr. Naruda because we are sovereign and we must experience ourselves in this way, and not let others decide what it is we should or shouldn't believe, or what is truth or falsehood. I wish we didn't live in a hologram of deception, but that is our human reality, 
and whining about it will not change it one iota. Studying. The supposed masters of truth will not change it either. I can show you a library of books that expound on esoteric information. Some of these books were written as non-fiction, and by all appearances they seem to be credible and insightful, and yet if you listen carefully to the words, you see how they are separating you from one another, how they define the hierarchy, how they define a soul that is always learning, a human that is always sinning and weak, how they describe a universe that is infinitely layered, how the light illuminates those who follow certain practices. It can be very subtle. They can be talking about oneness, but there are judgments present in the words, or recriminations if you don't execute the practice properly, or suggestions that you don't mix this practice with anything else or it is diminished, or join and promote this path over that one. Part of the sovereign integral process is to practice your discernment of what enables you to believe in you, not the universe or some master or teaching, but you, stripped bare of all of your add-ons, beliefs, thought patterns, fears, guilt, stories, judgments, blames, pretenses everything that hangs on you from the past. If you could drop them all everything you have been taught and told and programmed to believe what would be left to hear? Silence. Deep, clear. Silence. That is you. When you find that, you will then know that everyone has that, too. Anu does. Lucifer does, Jesus does, your neighbor does, your spouse does. Everyone. So. What proof do you need to find that? What proof can I show you or tell you to? Give you that? I can't. I can convey a process that if you follow it, you might find. This experience inside you, but that's page 240. Well. The process is free, it only requires time. The process is not owned by anyone. The process is not part of anything but you. Once you stand at the trailhead of that process, it's yours to follow or reject. Everyone must achieve this realization of oneness and equality in life on earth. That is our call to action. As a species. And in my opinion, anyone or anything that tells you otherwise is lost. One more thing, the story's trend may be exactly what activates someone to the sovereign integral process, and I think that was the point that the wing makers took with their information. Everything about their work is signaling the individual to the sovereign integral process and the realization of the grand portal. Sarah Ifanu is what we have been taught is God, then who is Lucifer? Dr. Neruda it is precisely for this reason that you have to be sovereign. Because, in the world where Anu is God, it is easy to presume that Lucifer is the real bearer of light. But remember what I've said over and over, everyone is lost in this hologram of deception. If all are lost, how can anyone lead you to truth? They can't. The truth is self-expression of your infinite self in the human form upon Earth. That is the closest definition of truth that I know. It may not be the same for you or whoever reads this in the future, but this is my definition of truth. Does Lucifer advocate this? I'm not aware that he does. If anyone is not supporting my truth objective, then why would I let them move me in any other direction, even an inch? You ask who Lucifer is. There are a thousand ways to answer that question. Several of them I already have. To add another definition, he is not a polarity of Anu or his puppet. At a fundamental level he lives in equality and oneness the same as we. Is he awakened? I don't know. I haven't met him. I haven't talked with him. If I do, my first question of him will be, does he support the freedom of human beings, the kind I have just defined, and if he says yes then I will. Accept his word until I see evidence to the contrary. If he says no I will remove myself from his presence. If he says maybe I would have a conversation with him and invite him to support this movement. Everyone is waking up. I realize it seems like the activation is in super slow motion, but in 70 to 80 years a huge shift can occur in humanity's realization of what is really happening in this world. There is no way to hide this. 
it's already in the unconscious mind layer and it will continue to spill out until we push the wall down. Sarah this is more a comment or observation than a question, but the sovereign integral process seems existential instead of transcendental. It also seems like a solo journey instead of an organized group who are supporting one another. Is my perception accurate? Dr. Naruta partly, yes. I think the sovereign aspect is what you're picking up. 1. It's an internal process for the individual to develop within themselves, but the integral aspect is a collective, and I don't mean that it's an organizational structure. This process needs to be outside of any organizations or individuals. Hands. It's not possible to own this or control it within an organizational structure. I think people can use the internet and email to support one another. Some will want this kind of support. Others may prefer to be left on their own. Page 241. Relative to it being existential, yes, it is that. This isn't about ascending into the high places of heaven and hanging out in perfected realms of space, while your fellow human beings are lost, enslaved and corralled into ever-tightening spaces. This is about sharing the heart virtues and the truth of existence in your behaviors, here, on Earth. It is about making Earth a place where human beings can express their life essence without the interference of Anu's hardware and Martinic software, and to tear down the external programming that creates the parents of fear and separation and all of their children attributes like narcissism and hatred. Sarah if I decide to release this information, do I have to practice it? Dr. Naruda no. Sarah can I have some time to think about this? Dr. Naruda how long do you need? Sarah maybe a week. Dr. Naruda of course, you can take more if you need it. Sarah are you resigned to the idea that you'll be caught? 12 Dr. Naruda I'm a realist. I don't think the ACIO will do anything rash. They'll simply do their best to quarantine me. Sarah what does that mean? Dr. Naruda I'll end up in a holding cell, off the grid. Sarah what about Anu? Dr. Naruda Anu is simply a name of the royal leader of the Anunnaki race. His name is symbolic of more than one being, which is the capstone of the elite. You could also look at Anu as the programmed existence of the human race. He exists in everyone to some degree. Anu's presentation of himself is that he's omniscient and omnipresent, and this is true in a certain way, so I have to deal with that reality. Everyone who wakes up and practices this process will meet this resistance in some form or other. Sarah but if people hear that they will have to deal with Anu, won't they run from this? Who's going to try and fight that? That machine? 12 ACIO is an acronym for Advanced Contact Intelligence Organization. Page 242. Dr. Naruta from the Wing Maker's perspective, thousands, and then hundreds of thousands, and then millions. The wall can collapse in an instant when a critical mass is achieved. Sarah but won't this be accompanied with hysteria and panic? At one time I thought the Grand Portal was a technological discovery of the soul, and it would be on the Internet for all to see and experience in the comfort of their homes. But this isn't like that, is it? Dr. Naruda no. This is more like a collapse of reality on a mass scale, where infinite beings suddenly find themselves awake inside a human uniform and wonder what just happened. Sarah what if it doesn't happen? What if they win and transhumanism 3.0 is the new human being locked into a world of separatism? What then? Dr. Naruda I don't know how to answer that question, other than to say that the information provided by the wing makers is a new inception point which necessarily means a new path. Maybe it will take more time, but it will happen. It has to. We're infinite beings, and this fact cannot be bottled up indefinitely. Sarah I understand, but the whole concept of infinite beings that's been around a long time. Soul has been around a long time as a concept. How is this any different? Dr. Naruta yes, it's been around a long time but it's been bottled up into three paths 1, reincarnation and karma. 2, be good and obedient and join the 
ranks of heaven. And 3. Ascend to a higher plane of existence and eventually become a teacher within the hierarchy. The fourth path, though not about soul, is that we are simply human flesh and blood and we have no soul. A person's soul is construed from one of these paths, assuming you believe you are a soul. Each of these paths, as I have already said, is within the hologram of deception. They do not lead outside past the wall, and they certainly do not make the wall less stable. To be self-realized as an infinite being within a human body on Earth, decoupled from the controlling human 2.0 interface, is the fifth way. We've been living in a game show that has four doors where an announcer keeps repeating the instruction choose one of the four doors, while completely ignoring that there is a fifth door. This new inception point inserts the fifth door option. That's how it's different. Sarah I wish I could go on with question after question, but I think this is probably a good place to stop. Dr. Neruda I agree, Sarah. Sarah okay, good, then we'll bring this to a close, but before we do, I'll give you the last word. Page 243. Dr. Neruda well, first, thanks for your open-mindedness these past two weeks. Your questions were good guides, and for all your modesty, you grasp this information with great naturalness, which gave me permission to open up. You've served well those who will read this, so on their behalf, thank you. I feel that I've given everything I was asked to provide. I realize I fumbled around at the start of this interview. I wasn't sure how to bring this out. I also know that some will want more information, but the critical material is here, in this interview. I'm sure there are more details and nuances I could have provided, but then, no matter how much detail I disclose, it would never be enough for some people. This is all about action and behavior, not reading or soaking up information from another person. The glimpse I provided is a good start, and that's all that's really needed for an inception point. I realize this may seem like a fantastical journey of fictional characters and unlikely events, not to be taken too seriously, but in my view, this disclosure of the wing makers is their most important. Sarah thank you, Dr. Neruda. End of session page 244. What is within us was present before the universe was created. Our inner, pre, quantum core existed previous to space time, before any extra dimensional race enslaved us. We are not weak or defenseless. We are not mere human beings. With 80 year lifespans, we are infinite, and we are all that is needed to transform reality so that each of us serves truth, because we see truth. Earth is not a playground or a schoolroom any more than we are gullible children. There is no new age or end time. There is only the infinite platform upon which we all belong, where we rise up as sovereign integrals upon Earth. James Mahu page 245 appendix appendix 4 interview 5 introduction to quantum pause quantum pause is a primary tool of the sovereign integral process the wonderful thing about breath is that it is always with you from the very first to the very last experience of this world it is portable everyone has it and it is what anchors you into the now below is a step by step process that is recommended to use when you practice Quantum pause, however, it is also suggested that you remain open to adapting this process to your own style, preference and capabilities. Step 1 Declarative Purpose The first step is called Declarative Purpose. This simply means that before you begin, declare your intent. There are two general states when one performs. Quantum pause 1. I am doing this for the whole of humanity too. I am doing this for a specific subset of humanity myself, friends, family. The first state is obvious, but the second varies by a considerable degree. For example, you could apply quantum pause for a situation that requires forgiveness or compassion within your immediate family, or perhaps yourself. Whatever the purpose is, it is recommended to declare it before you take your first breath. This is your inception point for the entire session that follows. Step 2 Breath Baseline 2-4 Measures from a Breath Perspective 
there are four equal parts to quantum pause. In breath nose pause out breath mouth pause. This four part process is called a measure. Each measure is divided into two segments one in breath pause segment which is the IAM2 out breath pause segment which is the where after you have declared your purpose then perform 2-4 measures of breath without visualizing or thinking or feeling this step is simply to quiet your internal state center your awareness and bring you fully into the now step 3 conceptual attention 3-5 measures after you have your baseline established imagine that during the in breath segment that a vertical line or column extends from the center of earth through your pineal gland in your brain and upwards to infinity the beginning of the in breath starts in the core of earth and as you inhale the vertical line extends through you and into infinity above when you reach the pause after your in breath imagine that the field of i am consciousness during the pause is coalescing or uniting within the vertical column page 246 appendix during the out breath segment visualize a horizontal bar or line that originates in your heart area and extends outwards from your arms deltoid muscles encircling earth when you reach the pause after your out breath imagine that the field of WARE coalesces within the horizontal bar the WAR visualization connects you to humanity and life on earth it is not critical that you visualize in high resolution that is color and fine detail these are conceptual attentions without any judgment as to your performance or how much detail you can imbue to each segment you are directing your attention on high concepts and this is enough these concepts of I am and WARE when compared to your programming on television internet and daily life environments support your service to truth there is no judgment to how you perform this it is simply that the conceptual attention in itself loosens the bonds from the programming of the hologram of deception step 4 body lens of the heart of virtues 3-5 measures during the in breath segment of each measure you can bring in one or more of the heart virtues for example as you breathe in you imagine forgiveness as a lens forming around your entire body you can look out through this lens that encompasses you through your entire being you are saturated in forgiveness in the pause you simply allow it to intensify and encompass you like a transparent energy field when you transition to the out breath segment you release this forgiveness or whatever heart virtue you are focused on the release as it pertains to the declarative purpose is either to humanity at large or a subset which could include just you your family members work colleagues friends neighbors pets animals plants etc it is important to direct the heart of virtues upon yourself as you move through this process you require self-forgiveness self-compassion self-understanding and self-appreciation sometimes it is best to do this at the end of the day and focus on others and humanity during the day but this is an individual process and you decide what works for you step 5 completion when you feel you are done you can send appreciation to the creator in that conceptual framework of infinity that you held earlier then take the entire session and imagine it is compressed into something the size of a pea or small stone and it is wisely placed within your pineal gland to be absorbed and transmitted then dissolve the entire session by opening your eyes and declaring it is done you do not hold any bias or outcome favoritism you are neutral as you step out of the session additional suggestions condensed versions of quantum pause once you have practiced this for a period of two or three weeks consider how it can be condensed and applied in real-time circumstances that allow you to transfer the experience of a five stage session into a 30 second session then a 10 second session and finally into a three second session the idea is to condense the experience not the page 247 appendix breathing aspect of quantum pause into a smaller time segment that can be used in real-time experiences so you can be on a phone call in a meeting driving your car talking with your spouse and call up the experience without the formality 
and time requirement of the five-step structure. Breath control There is no judgment that the longer your breath parts are performed in each of the segments, the better the result. There is no correlation. However, as you get into the later steps of the quantum pause process, your attention is less centered on your breath. You allow it to become self-directed, so your attention can move to a more imaginative and feeling-oriented state. Purpose The purpose of quantum pause is not to leave the body or have a spiritual experience or conjure any positive experience upon completion. It is purposely not of that realm. It is not designed to create an experience for your mind or provide visualizations of another world. If you see, sense or feel anything that is unrelated to your purpose, gently, but firmly, remove it. Posture Unlike meditation, quantum pause is not related to specific postures. You can practice sit lying down when you wake up or go to bed. You can be standing up or sitting down. There is no posture requirement. Quantum pause is not meditation for the human instrument. It is a behavioral exercise to reveal the sovereign integral state of consciousness. Synchronize if you practice quantum pause, and you begin your session at the top of the hour, it will synchronize your experience with others and expand the energy. It doesn't matter which of the 24 hours you start with, but if you can begin at the top of the hour. About the author James Mao who is the anonymous creator of the Wing Makers and related websites, a handful of novels, a large collection of philosophical discourses, a dozen papers on spiritual practices, poetry, short stories, visual artwork, and nearly a hundred music compositions. His works have been translated into nearly 20 languages. In 1998, his first published creation was Wingmakers.com, which established James its creator as a multidimensional storyteller who was focused on sharing deep, original perspectives to the conversations of spirituality, cosmology, extra-dimensional existence, myth and the importance of the heart in one's personal mission. James has made no effort to create a visible role for himself in the field, no organization has ever been started in no relationship with any other organization exists. James' works are to help people activate, and make accessible, their unique view into truth. He draws on deep symbolism, archetypes and mythological characters to help people sense the deeper realities that underlie their personal worlds. The primary goal of his work is to be a midwife for the birth of the grand portal as described in To live in service of truth, you must first identify the layers of deception that encompass you. This is the equivalent of deprogramming. It is central to the sovereign integral process. Then you can live the words and ideas that arise from this internal field of truth that is inside you and nowhere else. It is completely unaffiliated with anything that is a feature of the hierarchy. This is because what is truth is singular sovereign and universal integral at the same time. No organization can contain that. Only you can. The end. Note copyright disclosure of the Neruda interviews you are free to share copy and redistribute the material in any medium or format. The licensor cannot revoke these freedoms as long as you follow the license. Terms. License terms attribution please give credit to wingmakers.com. Non-commercial you may not use the material for commercial purposes. No derivatives if you remix, transform, or build upon the material, you may. Not distribute the modified material without the consent of wingmakers.com. Contact webmaster at wingmakers.com. No additional restrictions you may not apply legal terms or technological measures that legally restrict others from doing anything the license permits.